a small pixel knight stood in front of a defeated enemy, and a plaque of congratulations towered above him. The boy clenched his fist joyfully. He had finally made it through. He had made it. There was no limit to his joy. The game chat was bursting with messages. He's crazy. He passed that shit. He's the first to do it. A game that boasts unreal difficulty. Defense of the Empire. And ten years after its release, someone managed to successfully pass it. The boy smiled broadly, pleased with his accomplishment. No matter how difficult a game is it exists to be passed, he was a streamer. Sitting at his workstation, he stared passionately at the monitor. Someone sent him a very large donation. Three hundred dollars. He started thanking his viewer. Streamer leaned back in his chair and exhaled. But honestly, his playing technique is just so cool. For the gamer, there was no better accomplishment other than passing the game. However, there was something he regretted. Someone in chat wrote that it was very sad that Saint died in the final battle. For an A-rank character, she had been through a lot. The guy was a little upset. He stared at his computer screen. Well, his goal wasn't to reach the end without loss. The game character stood in front of the defeated enemy. The game location had been passed. The hellish difficulty in Iron Man mode has been passed. The boy was a little silent, still recovering from the hard game. For a while, the boy somehow felt bitter over the loss of his companion. He propped his face with his hand and continued to stare at the monitor. He felt a little sad afterward. A message popped up in the chat. Why shouldn't the developer give him a prize or something? The guy grinned. Why would the developer give him a reward? However, the viewer replied that they were criticized for this level of difficulty. But this guy proved that the game could be passed. However, he was perplexed. Why would they give him any reward? He doesn't need one. As long as he can have fun like this, he doesn't need anything else. However, the discussion continued in the chat room. The audience could see the greed in his eyes. He definitely wanted some kind of reward. The streamer looked at the game disc. In ten years, the developer hadn't bothered to make a sequel. The boy leaned back in his chair again. It was impossible to contact him during this time. Suddenly, a message from the developer popped up on the computer screen. He greeted the player. Streamer raised an eyebrow in surprise and moved closer to the monitor looking at the message. The chat room also reacted violently. Smiley faces were seen everywhere. The developer said that now he would like to thank. He had already given up and thought that no one could succeed. The boy didn't understand anything. He looked at the monitor in surprise and said that he shouldn't be thanked. And I couldn't believe it myself. The developer said he was very glad that the boy still had hope. The boy was surprised by this message. The developer said that the boy had proven his worth and the height of his skills. The boy was still flapping his eyes in surprise. Does it look like some noob is just looking for attention? There's no way it's the creator of the game. He still couldn't believe that it was the developer talking to him. He started making fun of the strange man. He wanted to say something else, but the space around him began to change. His eyes began to darken. The guy seemed to lose knowledge. He himself still didn't understand what had happened. It seems he had been playing for too long, and his body just shut down from overexertion. Something very large and massive crashed into the ground at high speed. A loud explosion was heard. The guy woke up and immediately began to look around frightened. A scream came out of his mouth. There was a look of incomprehension and fear in his eyes. What was that sound? He stood like a statue in front of an incomprehensible structure from which one stone had broken off and was flying straight at him. The boy finally realized that he was about to die and screamed in terror. What the hell is that thing? He was scared and prepared to be crushed, but the stone flew past him. The boy was breathing heavily and there was a distinct smell of smoke around him. The boy covered his face with his hands to protect himself from the acrid odor. Several people stood near a large cannon. They were dressed in knight's armor. After a second, the cannon fired with a loud sound. The boy bounced aside, not understanding anything, and just looked at them frightened. He was trying to understand where he had gotten to, and what the hell was going on here. He didn't have time to finish his thought as the cannon started rumbling again. Now it was starting to get annoying. He screamed for it to finally stop. What he saw shocked him even more. His eyes opened even more. In front of him stood a veritable army of knights. Each of them was dressed in shining armor, and in their hands was a huge bayonet. He was in the very center of the battle. There were shouts everywhere. People were bustling about. He looked around and flapped his eyes uncomprehendingly. Meanwhile, there was a real bacchanalia going on around him. Explosions were heard. Fragments of stones were flying everywhere. Knights dressed in armor were rushing into battle. They were firing crossbows to prevent something terrible from coming up to them. Suddenly a thought crossed his mind. 
Were they really in the middle of a war? He still stood like a statue. When he turned his head back, he saw a knight rushing towards him. The man was frightened by something and called him emperor. It was obvious that the knight was terrified. He shouted and tried to find out, is his lord all right? The boy was at a loss for words. Is that an enemy soldier? He recoiled in horror from the man and covered himself with his hands in an attempt to defend himself. The knight stopped and looked at the boy. He continued to scream in fear. When the boy saw that the knight had stopped, he calmed down a little and looked at him in surprise. After a second, the warrior knelt down and began to tearfully apologize to his lord. The boy was even more shocked. The man was apparently terrified himself and begged for mercy. Tears were streaming down his eyes. A player with this old man? Why is he apologizing to him? The boy tried to get up, still not taking his eyes off the strange man. The knight in the meantime, with his head on the floor, did not even think of getting up. The guy walked up to him and asked if he was all right. He wanted to help the man, but didn't notice the terrible fire flash coming at him. At the last moment, he managed to bounce away, and the flash hit the ground, scattering rocks. The boy fell nearby, hitting his arm painfully. He clenched his eyes in surprise. He was in pain, but immediately tried to get to his feet. He could not recover from the shock. His heart was beating very fast, and his eyes bulged. He stared in rage in front of him. What the hell was that? Was that a bomb? He raised his head and looked at where the shell had hit. There was green flames blazing all over the place. What the hell is going on here? There were people screaming in pain and in agony. Suddenly he heard someone's loud voice, someone calling out to them. The knight stretched his arm forward and ordered everyone and go to attack. The enemy was attacking them. The boy looked in their direction in surprise, a look of bewilderment on his face. Several knights ran straight to the edge of the fortress in an attempt to defend themselves. Something incomprehensible burst out from around the corner and stabbed a knight through and through in one second. The man died instantly. His lifeless body hung on a huge bayonet. A second later, his arms broke off and one of them fell right in front of the boy. Suddenly, one by one, the soldiers began to drop dead. There was utter horror on their faces. What the hell is behind this wall? Goosebumps ran down the boy's back. The answer didn't take long. In a split second, something formed in front of him. It looked like a huge spider. It had six burning eyes on its ugly face. The monster opened its stinking maw and made a sound like crackling. The boy had to cover his ears to keep from going deaf. Is that a spider? The rest of the soldiers rushed to attack the monster. They swung their balls. The monster shifted its gaze to them. Literally seconds passed and the beast sliced them in half with one swift blow. The boy trembled with terror. The bodies of the knights fell to the ground, showering it with blood. The boy's eyes filled with horror as he saw the huge monster moving towards him. For a second, he thought it was just a dream. The monster was standing only a few meters away from him, its huge fangs dripping a vile liquid. The monster squeaked and raised its huge paw more like a scythe. The monster lunged at him, venom dripping from its fangs. The boy stood right in front of it. His whole short life began to flash before his eyes. To die like this is just unbearable. Another man appeared from somewhere. He had long hair and a nice calm voice. A knight appeared literally out of nowhere and rushed straight at the monster, swinging his sword. The monster barred. The sword hit right on target, and the monster's body began to disintegrate. In front of the protagonist stood a knight dressed in shining armor. He was just like the knight in the book. The man had clear blue eyes and light white hair. He smiled and asked, Do I think it's a cliché for a boy to deny reality? The boy looked at him with a surprised look. This world was starting to seem crazier and crazier. Suddenly, knights hesitated and looked at the boy in surprise. Immediately, he jumped up to him and began to worryingly ask why he looked like that. Seeing that the knight was very worried about his lord, he examined the boy for injuries. For some reason, the man's face appeared familiar to him. Finally getting to his feet, the boy jabbed his finger at him. Lucas? The knight's face became concerned. He was silent for a moment. The man theatrically wiped a tear from his face and said he knew his lord had hurt his head. He grasped the misunderstanding boy by the shoulders and said cheerfully that he was happy to finally be called by his name. The boy was in complete shock. He shook his whole body and looked at the knight with bulging eyes. Is that the real Lucas? The knight looked at him with his blue eyes and remained silent. Another guess came into the boy's head, but it was simply impossible to believe. They were standing at the side of the battle, and next to them lay the carcass of a huge spider. A battle was raging all around. The battle didn't stop for a second. The fortress began to catch fire and hordes of black huge spiders were approaching. Burning arrows were flying everywhere. And the inhabitants of the fortress were defending themselves strenuously. 
His hunch made the boy feel sick to his stomach. Could he really be inside the game? At that moment, the guy realized he was in a real mess. It was a nightmare, and he wasn't prepared for it. A bomb fell next to him and began to pulsate like a living organism. A second later, it exploded, and the boy covered himself with his hand to avoid being hit. There was only one question on his mind. How the hell did he get inside the game? Lucas addressed him again, calling him his highness. The boy looked at him in surprise. The knight grabbed him by the shoulders and told him that the enemy was attacking them right now. It's the army of the Black Spider. These things were getting bigger and bigger, and they were approaching the entrance to the castle. And they were starting to break through the gates. The sun was nearing sunset and gradually hid behind the mountains, scattering its last rays. Lucas stood in front and shielded his master, protecting him from the enemy. He turned to his master and said that while time was still, let him do his best to hold out. All the while, the boy wondered, why is this knight protecting him? What do they call him? Your Imperial Highness? Soon the sun disappeared over the horizon and the battle ceased. The corpses of defeated soldiers lay all around. Heavily sighed, finally the sun had hidden, which meant everything was fine. He was covered in spider blood, looked fearfully at his lord. The boy looked at the foot of the castle where there were many monster corpses. There were obvious traces left after the battle. Many spider corpses were lying at the bottom. Everything was drenched in green blood. The boy looked at the knight and worriedly asked what was the date today. And where was he even? In a trembling voice, the knight replied that today was the last day of February 649 according to the imperial calendar. The boy clenched his teeth. It turns out tomorrow is March 1st. Lucas nodded his head. The boy squinted his eyes. A very familiar situation. Monster attack on a forward operating base. He bit something on his lip to the point of pain. Something in his head told him this was very bad. In the end, he remembered having sat through the game defense of the Empire for half a year. He had been to this location hundreds of times in the exact same story date, going through training. That's it, he's got it. Ash. Lucas looked at him in surprise. The guy beat his hand on his chest and yelled that his name was Ash. Ash von Hader Everblake. He grabbed his head, why? Lucas nodded his head, that's right. He found himself in the body of a game character. She's their worst commander ever. Also, worst of all, this is the character who died the most horrible death. The boy was holding his head and was terrified. The situation was the worst ever. After the battle, he went to his private home. The boy stood in front of the mirror and shouted furiously at his reflection. Bastard, couldn't you just sit still? Why did he stick his head out? The guy was breathing heavily. You're going crazy. He was the only one in the room. The reason this game is considered unplayable was the difficulty level hell. Also the Iron Man mode that forcibly saves progress. Well, he's the only one who got past that mode. Doesn't seem to care which of the game's moments he gets in. He's confident in his abilities and that he can find a way out. The boy opened the system window. He could pass everything except this location. The training was done in such a way that the player will fail sooner or later anyway. Because the story begins after Lucas single-handedly escapes the monster invasion. In this game, the story that lasts three years, you can only start hunting the army of black spiders after a year and a half. He massaged his head, trying to find a way out. Already, he needs to get his act together. He's been through this game before. He knows every pebble. If he can pull together all his knowledge and experience, he can definitely find a way out. After an hour of searching, he was desperate. There is no way out. There is no way out. The boy has already started laughing hysterical laughter. He's totally fucked, isn't he? Opening the system window, he began to study the opponent's parameters. Level 55? There's over 1,000 of them here. What the fuck was this? This was too much to learn. Besides, the weapons that were in this fortress were total bullshit. He tried to come to his senses and regained his breath again. You just have to make the save at the right moment. The moment one messes up, the whole game will be broken. He had played this game long enough to realize something in any situation. One must do something about it and try to find a way out to survive. He reached his hand toward the system window. The guy pressed his finger on the touch screen. There it was, found it. The guy opened the door with his foot and started calling for Lucas. The knight was standing nearby and looked back at him fearfully. The boy looked at him with mad eyes and ordered him to quickly assemble a squad under his direct control. Lucas looked at his commander in surprise and fear. Does he mean his guardsmen? The man looked at him in surprise. The king never summoned them. Why so suddenly? The boy growled. Just have Lucas call them in. The guy jabbed his finger at him. The knight looked at him with a completely uncomprehending look. A smile appeared on the boy's face. He said he had figured out a way to defeat them. 
Soon he was sitting at a table with his retinue in front of him. Lucas was standing nearby. It was obvious that all the knights were worried about something. However, the commander was calm and serious. He folded his arms across his chest and looked at his charges. Familiar faces, the girl with the staff was called Lily. The guy who was always dissatisfied with something was called Ken. The kid with the big glasses on his nose hugging his knees was Damien. Of course, they were familiar to him. After all, he played that game all the time. He had seen events in which these characters had died countless times. Ash looked at Damien and asked why he was shrinking like that. Lily shrieked. Indeed, Damien looked quite bad. He was scared of something, with tears glistening in his eyes. Lily smiled and said he was like that because he lost his comrade today. She asked her commander to understand that. The guy started to recall indeed because some strange status was placed on this man. He was the first to die. He nodded. Okay, so be it. Sitting in the main seat, he began to speak in a serious voice. He will start by telling everyone their roles for tomorrow. He turned to Lily. The girl looked at him with a smiling face. Her class was mage, element fire. She is the main damager on this team, able to hit with one powerful spell after another. The guy said she would be their shield, let her block the spider's attacks as a tank. The girl looked at her commander in surprise and fear. Then the boy turned to Ken. The man stood as always dissatisfied with something. Here he was, as it were, a tank capable of withstanding a large number of blows. Ash said he would have to infiltrate the mid and stealthily make a mess there. The man looked at his superior in surprise. Now that left Demi and he was a hitman. The kid still sat shrunken. He is a very important class in the game. Ash said that from now on, Demian is the shooter. The boy raised his crying eyes. Then the boy turned to Lucas. He said that the soldier would command the others and maintain the front line. There was silence between them for a second. Well, maybe they'll say something. Ken finally couldn't stand it, gritting his teeth, he growled. A man slammed his fist into the wall. He calls, that's the plan. That's some bullshit. The man was furious. Their emperor is saying this in all seriousness. Ash stood there in a bit of a daze. He didn't expect this from his subordinate. Although it was actually, and it was actually bullshit. However, this location really wasn't one of those that could be passed by the standard method. The boy's eyes lit up and he suddenly changed his face. His voice became rougher. Something predatory flashed in his eyes. He looked at his subordinate and asked in such a state he dared not respect the subordination. The man came to be horrified. He physically felt the aura emanating from his commander. The man immediately closed his mouth. Soon, Ash stood up from his seat. Okay, the plan was clear. Since what he came up with sounds like complete recklessness, something needs to be done. Lily stood beside him and was also trembling with fear. He took hold of his sword and drew it outward. Without waiting for an answer, the boy swung his sword. The others were horrified by what they saw. They could not say a word. Damien trembled with fear. A lump stuck in his throat. The sword stabbed right into the girl's chest. She didn't even have time to realize anything and just stared frightened. Ash smiled and continued to hold the hilt of the sword. Each of them is able to accomplish the tasks at hand, right? A pause hung between them for a second. If he found himself in the body of a crazy person, why not behave the same way? Ken was trembling with fear. The prince had really lost his mind. What is he doing? How could they go into battle if they were commanded by such a madman? The boy was completely adamant. Suddenly flames began to ooze from the girl's wound. It grew stronger and stronger. But the boy seemed to be expecting just that. He smiled exactly what he had planned. All the roles had hidden skills, special abilities completely contrary to their tasks. 212. The boy looked at the girl and asked, she was wounded by a dagger as a child, right? When the goblin army invaded her village, the poor girl looked at the dagger stabbed into her and almost cried. After that incident, she got the fire skin skill, right? This skill allows you to resist any injury with fire. She didn't say anything and looked at him with big eyes. The boy continued to look at her, however, Lily didn't say anything. It was a tank skill that somehow ended up in the mage's possession. It couldn't be used in the game. But reality was different after all. Now he's going to squeeze anything out of this skill. A devilish smile appeared on his face. Then he has no choice but to use cheats. The flames grew stronger and stronger. Now let the developer see how he gets through this game. He pulled the dagger out of the girl's chest, but she didn't suffer any injury. The boy apologized Zato that his method of demonstration was too rough. The poor girl came to her senses and said she was fine, however. How did he know? The boy didn't answer anything. Then he turned his gaze to another member of the team. He approached Ken. The man trembled with fear. Ash said, This guy was a petty thief when he was a kid. The man trembled. 
coming from a slum and the family had a lot of mouths to feed. The man didn't realize anything. How did this man know everything about him? He stepped back. However, the boy said it didn't matter. He came closer and closer. He asked the man if he could become inconspicuous any time he wanted to. Can hide to avoid attention. He grinned and began to stroke his sword. Or should he give another example? The man was truly terrified. He really didn't want to see his master split again. He was right, that's the way it is. The boy put the dagger on the table. Excellent, in that case, he could do his bidding. And finally, the last member of their squad, Damien. The boy continued to sit in the corner, shrinking with fear. Ash approached him with a leisurely gait. The most important person in his plan was this particular boy. He leaned over to him and asked, His most important skill is his incredibly good eyesight, isn't that right? The boy sat squirming and said nothing. His eyes began to fill with tears again. His head was all mixed up with fear. He said that he and his friend were from the same town. Grew up in the same orphanage until one nightmarish event happened. In the midst of a battle, his friend sacrificed himself for him by throwing himself on a huge spider. The boy cried again, why did their leader bring them here? Why? The boy sobbed. What great purpose did he pursue? He stood and looked at his subordinate in silence. Demian continued to cry. Or were their miserable lives nothing more than a plaything? The boy begged his leader to bring his friend back. He could no longer cope with his emotions and finally cried. A little flower was growing near the foundation of a building. It was like a little sun that grew from under the ground. Ash put his hand on his shoulder. The boy continued to sob. His gaze was completely serious. It told him that Damien could blame him, of course. If he wanted to, could even despise him. However, his friend sacrificed himself to save his life. Now is he going to sit here and wait for his death? The boy became serious. Does he really want to give up the life his friend gave him? He must be grasping at any string to avenge him. Ash put his hand to his chest. Let him kill spiders. Let him get out of here alive. Let him teach him a lesson. Ash asked the boy. Does he want to get out of here alive? To kill those spiders? The boy quietly nodded his head. Ash asked him again if he wanted to finish him off. After a second of thought, the boy answered yes. The others were dumbfounded at this answer. No one expected such a thing from this boy. Ash smiled great. He promised that if they got out of here alive, the boy would take his life, whereas Lucas wanted to object, but the boy stopped him. He said that if their plan failed, they would all die anyway. If that happened, he would let Damien be the one to take his life. At this point, the boy swore on the honor of the Imperial family. Now he would ask him for just one day to obey his orders. The boy looked at him with wet eyes. Sometimes hatred is worth using as an engine. Lowering his head, the boy stood up. Even if it is hatred directed against himself, the boy stood surrounded by his companions. He nodded his head. No need to make excuses, indeed, because of his mistake. The army is almost all destroyed. However, if they followed his plan, they could still defeat this army of spiders. The boy was completely confident in his words. So this time, just this once, let them believe him and do as he says. The boys looked at him with serious looks. You could see in their eyes that they believed him after all. He didn't know if he would succeed, but there was no other choice. The knight in armor struck a large hammer on the drum, calling everyone to a general assembly. The others looked at their leader with concerned looks. The boy assured them that everything was fine. Let them just do what he said. The huge horde of spiders was already approaching the gates of their castle with great speed. Crackling could be heard everywhere. The plan was, while his companions distracted and bought time, the others would find the queen that gave the orders. Then it would be a simple matter of killing her. They rolled out a huge cannon, its barrel glowing. When they removed the restriction on the weapon, its damage increased, so now it can damage even the queen. Location was still the only problem. Seeing the queen from this distance was impossible. Then there was no choice but to create a map. The boy's face lit up with pleasure. He stood on the edge of the tower, staring into the distance, waiting for an attack. The fortress was fully prepared to fend off another attack from the giant spiders. A bluish shield was unfolding around it, scanning the area. It passed through objects, analyzing their locations with precision. The boy opened a system window. This character's main skill is map creation. This character's skills were useless, to say the least. He looked on the system monitor for the location of this queen. If only he could find the boss marker. However, something was wrong. The boy pulled his eyes out in surprise. No matter how hard he tried, still he couldn't get a good look at where is that spider hiding. But it didn't show up on the map. Meanwhile, the spider army was rumbling toward the fortress. Ken standing at the entrance to the fortress, the gate was open. The man was on full alert. 
Before doing so, the commander gave him all the stamina potions he managed to find in the fortress. His job was to go outside and create a distraction. The man was honestly a little afraid. Lily was trembling with fear. She was clearly unprepared. However, the boy had a painful part for her. In the case of infiltrating the artillery unit, he would order her to use the skill of skin from fire and block the entrance. Lucas yelled for everyone else to get ready in position. The crossbowmen stood up and prepared their guns for defense. Everything was on full alert. Lucas stood and watched from above as the hordes of spiders were already very close. A man shouted that it was the responsibility of everyone else to hold out while their emperor defeated the queen. Lucas turned around and looked at his master, who was already in full alert. The man raised up his shining sword and addressed his army. However, Ash wasn't quite ready yet. Just a moment, he didn't realize anything. Drops of cold sweat were building down his face. However, the army didn't even notice it. Lucas gave the order to defend himself, and all the guns started firing at the spider army. Deafening gunshots were heard. The shells flew exactly on target. The spiders scattered, but they were not getting smaller. Lucas looked at his leader and gave an approving gesture. The flames from the explosion raged in the man's background. Ash glanced at his subordinate and tried to remain calm. The boy realized that the purpose of training was not to defeat the boss. No wonder it didn't show up on the overall map. The queen would probably appear after a full-scale attack. The battle was heating up. Ash walked up to Damien and pointed his finger somewhere in the distance, asking the boy, Does he see it? His hand went somewhere in the distance. There was no extreme sky and a wasteland. The boy nodded. Yes, he could see the spiders just standing there, doing nothing. Ash wondered. Something was wrong. The queen must be among them. The boy turned to his subordinate and asked if he could see her. Damien squinted and activated his farsight skill. He was able to see the monster. It had a human upper part and a lower part like a spider. Ash grinned, there it was. Everything is going according to plan. He put his hand on the implement exactly. The boy stood beside him and trembled with fear. The cannon turned around, assuming the correct position. It had to be turned to the southwest. Ash and Damien would take aim. One of the knights poured mana into the weapon and ordered it to fire at his command. Ash and Damien prepared to slay the monster with one blow. The boy all trembling with fear, he turned to his leader. It was evident that the kid was very worried. He had never done anything like this before, and here it was all so sudden. Ash calmly turned to him. He tried to look as friendly as possible. He put his hand on the boy's shoulder and calmly said yes, he might miss. But Ash would take full responsibility. In a benevolent tone, the boy said that even if the boy fails, it's okay. The responsibility will still be on him. Damien eyes wide open, he looked at the commander. All he had to do was pull the trigger. Let him remember that he was avenging his friend. The boy was transformed after these words. His eyes lit up and with fury. The skill of an eye a thousand miles away activated. He yanked the trigger and the weapon buzzed, releasing an incredible amount of energy. The gear slid into place. The gun was almost ready. A second later, there was a deafening explosion. A projectile of energy more like a pulse erupted from its muzzle. It flared up with renewed vigor. A huge jet of energy moving at an unspeakable speed. The projectile flew somewhere far away, pursuing only one target. Ash screamed furiously. The boy standing beside him and trembled with fear. A second later, there was a rumbling sound. And somewhere in the distance, a mushroom from the explosion began to rise. The soldier standing next to the boy looked through a telescope. Ash turned to the scout. The projectile hit the target. It landed in the center of the spiders. The soldiers wrapped their arms around Damien and began to praise him. The boy was embarrassed and said he was just doing what he was told. The moment he grasped the trigger, he felt his body move on its own. Ash looked at him approvingly and smiled. It was all thanks to his skill that allowed him to hit the target accurately. In the game, he was a character who couldn't hold a gun in his hands. Everything seemed to be going according to plan, however, the guy stopped and looked forward in surprise. The sounds of gunfire were still echoing in the distance. The spiders kept moving forward, and it was strange. Why were they still coming? The spiders were moving forward inexorably. The scout took the telescope away from his face and said in a trembling voice that they were still coming. What the hell? The guy was confused. They had hit their queen. He pointed his finger somewhere off to the side and said there was another swarm of spiders moving right towards them. 338. The boy grasped the telescope and stared into the distance. His face reflected extreme anxiety. And the lad and saw the queen, a huge monstrous creature whose whole body glowed with a greenish color. They were approaching directly toward them, using the square formation. 
The monster roared. A deafening squeak like the moaning of a thousand voices came out of her mouth. The monster looked truly creepy, her eyes glowing with red fire. Ash recoiled from the trumpet and cried out in fright. The spiders came inexorably to the foot of the castle. Their countless army was already at the very gates they were coming. However, there was something strange about their movements. Everyone began to look around in astonishment. Is this how it's supposed to be? The scout looked into his pipe and was horrified by what he saw. Spiders. Thousands of spiders. They're heading for the artillery unit. It was a nightmare. Ash smiled. In response to the hell, the queen was giving her orders pretty damn fast. The boy was already starting to laugh hysterically. Explosions continued to rumble around, burning arrows flying everywhere. The battle continued. Ken looked away fearfully. He had to distract the spider horde. He looked back and looked at his stamina potions, taking out the last of them. He sat under a tree, laying down his weapons. The guy was very afraid. Maybe just run away. The wind picked up around him and began to tear the leaves off the trees. Things were heating up. The man looked around fearfully, grabbing his sword. Someone was nearby, it was obvious. He began to walk around the tree to see who was following him. He looked around, confused. His heart was beating hard. The man fell to his knees and began to breathe heavily. Damien carefully looked ahead with his eagle eyesight. He had already seen the target. All that was left was to aim. A second later, there was a monstrous explosion. The target has been hit. Right in the bullseye. A large mushroom of fire rose high into the sky. Ash stood by the cannon and looked in front of him. It wasn't over yet. The spiders kept moving. Their hordes seemed to only grow. They were already at the castle walls and were trying to climb up. Even though the cannon had hit its target, the queen was still alive. She was still able to give orders to her army. The boy clenched his teeth. Did they lack damage? If so, it's not good. The original spider queen could die from two strikes. But there was definitely something wrong here. A terrifying thought crossed his mind. What if her characteristics were different? What if she had a special skill? The soldier said that because of the overload, the cannon would soon reach its limit and explode. Because of this overload and the damage to the cannon, they can't fire at the length they intended. Ash says the man is talking out of his ass. The man grimaced and said they could fire five rounds in total. Two they had already used, three to go. A chill ran down the boy's spine. Three shots. That's not enough considering the queen is still alive. They have no choice but to finish this thing off in three shots. In addition, Demian's eyes also take damage. This skill has a side effect. The boy was already almost exhausted. Only one thing was swirling around in his head. Three shots is the maximum. The cannon was loaded again. Only one question remained, can Damien last that long? Fortunately, the walls of the central castle do a good job of keeping the spiders out. The boy heard a terrifying shout. The destroyer is coming. He moved his eyes to the side. A huge spider, completely covered in armor, was approaching the castle gate. He was much larger than the others and was well protected. The destroyer is trying to break through. He was surrounded by a crowd of other spiders as defense. There was nothing like this in the game. The guy yelled to the others to direct all fire at the destroyers. The cannons started rumbling, releasing tons of explosives forward. We had to hold them back. The shells were hitting their target but didn't seem to do any visible damage. The spider kept moving. It was already at a dangerous distance. A couple more seconds and it would be over. There was a rumbling sound. The destroyer easily destroyed the main wall and the knights began to fly away like toys. The defenses had been breached. The way was clear for the spiders. Through the resulting hole in the castle, they began to come inside in a continuous stream. Ash watched the scene with horror. All he could do was watch the spiders approach inexorably fast. Lucas ordered everyone to raise their weapons. They are going down to the first floor to hold off the monsters. Ash ordered the gunners to get a grip. Those down there are protecting them. They must continue to shoot the queen. Before those things get to the artillery unit, they just have to destroy the queen. The boy became serious. Preparations were complete. The cannon ready for the next shot. They didn't have many attempts. Ash turned to Damien. The boy was almost ready. Ash looked along. The boy pointed the gun at the target. A second later, there was an explosion somewhere in the distance. A hit on the queen, but she's still alive. That thing is incredibly resilient. Ash yelled for everyone to slowly load the cannon for the next shot. Now, Lucas fearlessly fought somewhere below. He scattered the spider horde, buying his commander time. The knight was incredibly strong. He had no trouble dealing with the spiders, but there were more and more of them. He raised his head and shouted to the others to protect the artillery unit. They have a duty to protect the Imperial Prince. Ash realized that the situation was critical. 
He looked down and gritted his teeth. The defenses had been breached. The knights were piled up there and were defending the passage with all their might. The spiders were incredibly numerous. One of them pierced a knight through with its sharp paw. The man screamed, but his scream was immediately cut short. Blood spurted in different directions. The guy was desperate. The number of victims was inexorably growing. He was not prepared for this. He didn't know when he played the game that these were real people. The number of victims is inexorably growing. 142 people have already died. The soldier yelled for the others to put their hands on the cannon. We need to cool it down immediately. Lucas already very tired. And the spiders were already not getting smaller. The man looked around furiously. Ash came to be terrified. What should he do? How to find a way out of the situation? The defense is about to collapse and the artillery plant will be destroyed. Then they will definitely all die. Suddenly the general shouting was broken by someone's loud voice. It sounded like thunder. A man stood in the doorway holding a shield and a sword. The spiders stopped for a second. Ash looked somewhere in the distance and seemed to recognize the man. His eyes widened in surprise. The man drank the potion from the vial. In quick gulps, he absorbed the tincture. It was Ken. The man wiped his face and looked fiercely at the army of monsters. The man stood all alone and shouted, I am Ken, Knight of the Empire. The spiders turned on him. In a second, their entire army was already running straight at the man, leaving the rest of the knights alone. Such a monstrous sight sent shivers down his spine. But it was too late to retreat. He ran in the opposite direction trying to divert the spiders away from the main entrance. Suddenly a rock appeared in front of his face, and the man immediately thought of a good idea that might work. A smile stretched across his face. The man hid behind the rock while the spiders got to him. He made the only right choice in this situation. He applied his secret, the pickpocket survival techniques. His body began to merge with the surface of the rock. Ash shouted for him to wait. His health was at an extremely low level. The man noticed it too late. Due to his low health, his skill was not activated. And now he found himself surrounded by spiders. At the last second, he only had time to think that he shouldn't have trusted this man. The spider's fangs closed around his neck. Another man dead. The guy looked at the statistician's window in horror. He could clearly hear the sound of flesh tearing right here. A legion of goosebumps ran down his back. His commands were wrong. The spiders were killing the warriors one by one. Because of his futile commands, a life, another man's precious life, was lost. The rest of the knights saw that Ken had moved forward along the line of defense. Now they rushed after him. They had no chance to retreat. Ash watched in horror as the other men left their lives on this battlefield. It wasn't just his fault, he himself, with his own hands, was killing these people. The boy opened his eyes in horror. Playing this game, he used the knights as bait when necessary. He didn't even think about what he was doing. This game was designed to use people as expendable, but now he realized it. The boy slapped his hand on a rock and ordered everyone to stop. Finally, he realized that every death is accompanied. The boy had already shouted for those damned monsters to stop. A huge spider tank appeared in front of him. It was already snapping its fangs. Just yelling would never stop them. We had to think of another way. A second later, a light descended on the huge monster's head, in which the outline of a sword could be seen. This was Lucas's special skill. He looked at the defeated monster in rage. The man raised his eyes and looked at his prince, asking if he was all right. One of the spiders was already flying at him, opening its vile womb. The only way to make them stop was to fight. The boy struck it with his blade, severing its head. The only way in this situation is to kill these spiders before they kill the others. The soldier shouted that the cannon was loaded for the fourth shot, however, Demian can't fire. Ash turned to the boy and shouted, can he fire? It was as if he didn't hear anything. The kid was already on his last run. Bloody tears were streaming from his eyes from overexertion. But he still agreed. Seconds later, there was a deafening rumble. The cannon fired for the fourth time. A huge buildup of energy flew straight at the queen. One more second and the projectile would hit the target. The queen looked in horror at her impending death. Her subjects began to rush to her defense. A huge energy charge incinerated the spiders one by one. The spider queen's eyes reflected horror. She realized that she could die in a second. A second later, a tremendous blow rang out. It hit her in the head. Target has been hit. However, it wasn't that simple. The queen somehow managed to survive. The fire from the impact had dissipated. Everyone looked towards the spider kingdom. A look of excitement ran across their faces. The cannon was already at its limit. It had heated up so much that it was ready to explode now. Damien couldn't fire anymore either. The attacks just didn't work. 
The military's hands blistered from the heat. The knight said the cannon was about to explode. There was no way to fire anymore. If they tried to fire again, all would die. The knight knelt down and said doomfully that it was over. It was time to surrender. The player looked at him with regret. Sweat was building on his face. Is it really over? The cannon was already damaged. It was smoking from reloading. If they fired any more shots, they would definitely die. The defense line was also broken through. The spiders were advancing with even more enthusiasm. People were dying by the hundreds. The gunner can't open his eyes. Is this really the end? Ash stood there like a statue, trying to think. Was there really no hope left? However, one of the knights looked through his telescope and said that they had no doubt struck the queen. Her skin began to peel off in large shreds. The monster had suffered significant injuries after all. The guy looked at the scout with rounded eyes and wanted to say something. Even left in this situation, he was faithful in his role to the end. The man didn't notice the huge projectile of energy moving towards him. Ash stared at it in horror, unable to say a word. His eyes rounded. A moment later, there was a deafening rumble. The shell had reached its target after all. It had hit the artillery unit. Saw this, but could not help in any way. He just screamed with horror. The tower cracked and the guy went somewhere deep into the castle, along with the rest of the stones. There was almost no hope left. Ash. After a while, he was able to open his eyes after all. Luckily, he survived. The first thing he saw in front of him was Lucas's face. The knight was able to protect him. He arrived just in time and blocked the rock that could have crushed the boy. Ash immediately rose to his feet and looked at his savior. Lucas was worried about his lord even in this situation. Even though he was already at death's door, he still protected him. Ash jumped up to him and said he should be the one to ask. Is he all right or not? But the knight started coughing. His mouth was bleeding. The knight asked the boy in a quiet voice if he remembered the event of twenty years ago. However, the boy could not remember anything. As a player who occupied someone else's body, he had no memories. Lucas continued to speak. He said that when the Lord appointed him as his personal guard, such a thing he said. The knight said in a weakened voice that the Lord had once told him that even if he couldn't become emperor, he would remain the coolest man in the world. And as someone who would become his knight, Lucas should strive for that too. Lucas looked at his lord with round eyes. He was of course a teenager at the time. But the boy's words had touched him to the point where he hadn't forgotten them until today. The man smiled through his strength. He could no longer rise, the stone had pinned him down. The man said that he trusted his king. Ash surprised asked the man even now. The boy didn't understand anything. He was shocked at such loyalty. Lucas frowned and said that he trusted his commander now more than ever. The stone was too heavy and the man could no longer handle the pressure and began to fall. In the end, he never made it and the stone pinned him to death. The man was no longer breathing. The dust slowly cleared. Only the ruins of the ruined castle were around. The boy was left alone. His most loyal subject had died protecting him from death. However, the boy could not believe that this man was dead. He looked hopefully at the knight and ordered him to hold on. He is the main hero the savior of this world. The man lay with his eyes closed. Blood was streaming down his face. Ash lifted his head and looked around. He has to end this whole thing. Were they under an artillery unit somewhere? And how long had he been unconscious? He turned his head and saw that the cannon was destroyed. There were dead soldiers lying nearby. Fortunately, Shooter and the rest of the artillerymen were able to avoid fatal injuries. They were simply unconscious. The cannon, on the contrary, was destroyed. The boy hesitated and began to ponder. On second thought, why are they still alive? Where are all the spiders? A woman's voice was heard. The boy looked to the side in surprise and saw Lily. She was all engulfed in flames. The shelves were coming towards her and immediately burned. It's not over yet. A little hope appeared. The girl fought from the last strength. She burned like a torch burning in her enemies. Embraced by the flames, the girl looked at her commander and smiled. She did not want to give up until the end. The guy looked at her with horror. The girl's appearance was truly dismal. It was necessary to help her. Ash screamed, the girl reached out to him. Her face was haggard. In a weak voice, she said she wouldn't last long. For now, she could block the exit, but soon her strength would run out. And then the monsters would be able to get in and take over the fortress. And really, there was nothing but devastation all around. The girl blocked the passage with her last strength. She shouted for the guy to hurry up. They didn't have much time. And us hopefully looked at her commander and told him not to let them die needlessly. These words were like an order to the boy. 
He clenched his teeth and prepared to fight one last battle. The guy looked around and saw a few artillerymen who had recovered and were now cowering near the cannon. The man ordered the last shell to be loaded. The soldier was surprised, but the emperor had said that the cannon was at its limit. Fear was in his voice, and he had been told that she was already over the limit. If we fire any more shots, it will just explode. Ash replied that if they continue to do nothing, the spiders will eat them too, sooner or later. What do they choose to do? They must not give up at any cost. The boy looked at his subjects. Even if they are burned alive, we must keep fighting. The soldier nodded his head. However, how do they aim? You can't see anything from here. They won't be able to detect the queen. The gun rack is lost. I'll have to hold it in my hands. It was on the ground. Besides, the gunner couldn't see anymore. But he doesn't need to aim. Just take the shot. The boy ordered the last shell to be loaded. That's an order. The gunner frowned and nodded his head in agreement. Ash started to approach the gun. He didn't know exactly how the skill of the eye from a thousand miles away worked. But as long as the gunner would shoot, he would always hit the target. He approached Demian. The boy sat with his back turned to him. He turned around and the boy saw that his eyes were bleeding. But he said he had to take one last shot. The boy's vision began to blur. He could barely make out the silhouette of his commander. Demian didn't believe in victory himself. What's the point of all this? No matter what he does, nothing changes. Ash gave him a serious look. He realized that hope was almost lost. He had to give the boy some encouragement. He told him that if the boy fired one more shot, the queen would die. The boy shook his head. That's not the point. Even if he fires the shot and the monster dies, what changes? Half of his friends are already dead. Even if he destroys the queen, it won't bring them back. The boy was about to cry. No matter how hard he tries, then this cruel world is always taking something away from you. The player stopped. These words put him in a stupor. Demian said that all he wants is to end it all. Doesn't want to live in a world like this anymore. He wanted to say something else, but the player interrupted him. He screamed his name as hard as he could. It was as if the boy had come to his senses. Ash started talking. Does the boy think this world isn't justified in being cruel? Thinks that even if he overcomes a huge obstacle in his path, life will be hell. The boy looked at him with a frightened look. The commander came up to him and grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. What a jerk, right thinking. There's a reason why if there's a difficulty level in this world, it's definitely hellish. And with an Iron Man mode for crying out loud where you can't save, Ash continued to shout furiously. This place is unfair to the point of absurdity. And nothing will ever be your way in it. That's life. Who doesn't know that? Damien didn't say anything. He just listened. Ash continued to scream. Is he willing to give up and lie there waiting to die? He looked at the commander with wide open eyes. He was at a loss for words after this. Ash shouted that he would fight to the last man, would come up with new and new strategies until the very end. He drew his sword from its sheath. His voice suddenly became cold and hard. He held it out to the boy and said that if he wanted to surrender, let him open his throat with that sword right now. The boy was silent. If he has the courage, let him do it. But if he's a coward, let him be his trigger. He approached the boy face to face and the odor of blood literally emanated from him. Let him stop looking back at his dead friends. He threw the sword to the ground and said that the only one he needed to continue was himself as commander. Let him not look for trivial reasons to live. Ash told him he was a chess piece, his key, his trigger, that's all he needs. The boy fell silent and frowned. Ash looked at him with a stern look. In addition, he had a new skill unlocked. Passive skill, indomitable commander. He looked at his gunner one last time with a look that could have incinerated him. That's an order. He got down on one knee in front of the boy. Putting a hand on his shoulder told him to finally smash the ugly face of that fucking monster. Damien. For a second he understood everything. Those words acted like a slap on the wrist. And he nodded. Now the boy was ready. He would follow his commander's orders. His face became stern. The artillerymen said the last shot was loaded. But they couldn't cool the cannon at this rate. Ash didn't listen to this. He ordered him to move. He would cool it himself. The guy looked at the cannon that was smoking from overexertion. The soldiers listened in horror and said it was incredibly hot. If the boy touched it, the consequences would be far more dire than a moderate burn. Ash replied that he would rather be burned alive here than go to hell and burn in the fire there. Damien walked over to him and looked at his commander. The boy frightened said he couldn't see anything. The commander replied that everything was fine. Clutching the wooden trigger handle in his hands, he said he couldn't feel his hands. The commander said it was all right. Smiling, he said it was okay. The boy furrowed his eyebrows. 
As soon as the boy's hands touched the gun, smoke came out. The boy felt just unbearable pain. He clenched his teeth and tried with all his might not to scream. He grasped the barrel of the gun and still could not contain himself in his hands from his mouth, burst out a deafening scream of pain. The guards were terrified their commander held the gun without sparing himself. This gave them strength. And they sparing no safety grasped the burning guns and they now raised the cannon together. The huge spider was already approaching them. It snapped its fangs, spreading a stench. Ash's eyes, he endured the pain, but now it didn't matter. Demian gathered his remaining strength into a fist and opened his eyes. Blood continued to pour from them. Shoot. The cry was like thunder. The boy pulled the trigger and the cannon fired its last charge. Its muzzle was immediately torn open. From such tension, all the military men immediately blacked out. Ash was grasping at scraps of consciousness. The last thing he managed to think was only one phrase. Get in. It was initially an impossible task to shoot at an enemy that was impossible to see. However, as if by magic, the projectile flew straight into the target, ignoring hundreds of thousands of other spiders. It was like an arrow cutting through space, and inexorably approached its target. The queen had a premonition of her death and gave one last death cry. She realized her days were numbered. The shell had burst her head without a doubt. Then the boy felt as if he'd swallowed his tongue. He couldn't believe his own happiness. Didn't know how best to respond to the first message from a viewer he'd gotten since he started streaming. The boy's eyes snapped open, his entire body pierced with pain. But he was alive. Against all odds, he had survived. A voice came from somewhere. It would be better if you rested a little longer. The boy lifted himself up on the bed. He was covered in bandages. Lily sat next to him on a chair and said that Damien had healed him with magic. But since the burns he had received were quite severe, it would take much longer to recover. The girl finished writing, and putting her hand on the table said that the boy had slept for three days. She looked at him with grateful eyes. Considering what he had gone through to defeat the army, she thought he wouldn't wake up. The boy rose from his seat and looked at the girl in surprise. She had survived. Smiling, she replied that it was all just because of his command. After the last shot, the Spider Queen died and the whole army stopped moving without her orders. With tears in her eyes, the girl said that he had managed to win. Ash looked at her with tired eyes. The rest of the fighters carried out the dead and helped the seriously wounded. The battle was over. The support army collected the bodies of the allies, and the girl took care of the remaining spiders and burned them. The cleanup was more or less done with. The boy looked at himself in the mirror and frowned. Lily concerned looked at him and said he had severe burns on his hands, forearms, shoulders, and neck. Her eyes were, after all, our same frightened. She said he would have to attend church, but even after that, a few scars would remain. The guy looked over his body. Well, scars are a much more modest price to pay than life. He looked at the girl and asked, How was she? And her injuries were serious. The girl was in a wheelchair. His eyes widened with surprise and shock. The girl said that when she ran out of mono, Spider hurt her back. Immediately afterward, the queen died and was never attacked again. Her voice shook with fear and bitterness, but apparently because of her back injury, the lower part of her body won't be able to move after all. A smile suddenly appeared on her face and she told the boy not to worry. She was grateful to him for being alive at all. In addition, there were five artillerymen among the survivors. Lucas, Damien, Ash, and herself. That's it. The guy hit himself on the head. Nine men. There had been several hundred of them when the last battle had started and there were only nine left. What if there was another way? He looked at the girl who was permanently crippled. What if there was another tactic left, one he might have overlooked after all? Ken's dead too. He thought of the hundreds of soldiers who had laid down their bones to win. Shouldn't he have found a way to save at least one more man? He felt the girl's touch on his arm. She looked at him and said affectionately that he was not the Lord God. She sat across from him and tried to comfort him. There was no way to save everyone in this situation. They did the best they could. The guy still felt guilty he had brought those soldiers here. It may have been the old Ash, not exactly him and his body, but he's here. And he's responsible. No one thought the monsters would be moving in droves after so many decades. That's why no one stopped the military campaign. The girl looked at him with a smile and asked him not to be so hard on himself. The boy still couldn't accept it. Suddenly the door swung open and Lucas appeared on the doorstep. Tears glistened in his eyes. Standing on the doorstep, he immediately cried with happiness. Through his tears, he said that he was incredibly happy that he was awake. 
The knight ran up to him and asked if any part of his body felt strange. He would get a healer right away. Ash waved him off and said he was fine. The guy looked at the knight and asked in surprise, didn't he suffer severe injuries? Is it normal for him to be hanging around here? Lucas straightened up and proudly said, the overlord knows that his main strength is to be well very cool. Ash nodded his head. Well, yeah, he is a SSR rank knight after all. Lucas pulled out a piece of paper from his pocket. He said that he had finalized the list of those who had died in the battle. A lot of people whose bodies they couldn't find. However, they tried to find as many as possible. The guy looked at his subordinate with a serious look. He asked where the bodies were now. Lucas replied that on the northern plane of the forward operating base. Ash stood up, but the knight immediately started to stop him. Ash didn't listen to him. These men died under his command. He's going anyway, and Lucas is going with him. That's fine. The sun began to rise over the remains of the castle, illuminating Ayat with its rays. Luca herded his commander on his back since he couldn't move fully yet. The boy recognized that it was quite comfortable on this knight's back, but still he was a bit ashamed of his position. Damien already waiting for them there. He looked at the gap that had formed after the battle. The boy was a bit shocked. He stood near the main entrance with his back turned. He didn't seem to notice anyone around him. Ash called out to him and the boy turned around happily, his eyes already back to normal. The commander immediately asked how he was feeling. The boy confusedly said that yesterday his eyesight had begun to return to normal. Now he can see as normal again. He took his glasses in his bandaged hands. Ash looked at the kid in silence. He'd done a pretty good job. He had done more than anyone on their team. The kid had heard that he had healed all the wounded himself. Walking around using magic, though at that moment he couldn't even see. He looked at the boy who continued to smile shyly. Again he was faced with harsh realities. Ash walked up to him and told him that the strategy was successful. Only because of his efforts. And now, if he wanted, the Lord could give him so much money that he would never need anything for the rest of his life. He's a mercenary first and foremost, and he's free to do as he pleases. The boy fell silent in thought. After a moment, he said that the overlord had recently told him he was a trigger man. Ash looked at him silently. Damien continued talking. He said that he wanted to know the origin of these creatures. Who created these monsters and why, and why his comrade had to die. The boy's voice began to tremble. So now he asks his lord to let him follow him. The boy looked at him sternly. Lucas smirked, even though this kid looks puny. He has an indomitable will. Ash grinned. Good, then the boy will follow him from now on. They need a priest to honor the dead. Soon they had built an altar on which they built a ritual fire. There was already quite a crowd gathered nearby. Ash stared intently at the flames and they reflected in his eyes. Now he knew. There was no better way, nor was there a better strategy. The bodies of the dead lay everywhere, covered with white sheets. Nuns walked nearby and honored their memory. At that moment, he realized that he had to take responsibility for his actions and carry that burden to the end in order to move forward. He said that after the informal funeral was over, the rest of the corpses should be collected and have them taken to the crossroads. Lucas nodded. Every year, the human toll is in the hundreds and thousands. There is an empty field on the west side of the crossroads. We should bury them there and pay our respects. A memorial site will be erected there. On the last day of February each year, a day will be set for their sacrifice. They stood before the fire. Lucas bowed to his lord and began to follow his orders scrupulously. It will not only be the day of the dead points, it will be appointed the day of all the characters. Everyone, absolutely everyone that he's killed hundreds of times through this game. They deserve to be remembered too. This would be his redemption. The boy stood gazing intently at the ritual bonfire. He turned to Lucas in a serious voice. The fire continued to blaze with a crackle devouring the fuel. Ash frowned and said in a metallic voice that he would never fail again. No way he would fail. The boy gritted his teeth. His intentions were the most serious points Lucas looked at him from the side. They stood against the setting sun, its bright rays enveloping their silhouettes. We should head back. Back to their main base. Crossroads. This was their main outpost. A huge fortress with high walls and massive gates. At the entrance hung two flags bearing the family crests. A caravan of several wagons surrounded by a horse-drawn carriage was traveling along the wide road. After they left the forward base, three days passed as they moved towards the crossroads. There was an amulet hanging around the guy's neck. He sighed heavily. It was so boring that one could die from such boredom. Lucas drove the wagon stubbornly. 
now and then removing the horses with his whip to make them move faster. Ash asked him if they were there yet. The man replied that it would soon be over. We just have to wait a little longer. The guy sighed quietly. Deep inside himself, he thought, this is more like some bullshit mail no matter how many times he asks, it's all just excuses. By the way, there was one more thing pending. He could upgrade now and a decision had to be made as soon as possible. He had reached level five after training. And in this game, class is determined right now. He opened the system window. 295. His stats hardly increased at all, which put the guy in a state of confusion. The most interesting thing was that despite the increase in stats, he could choose any class. He clicked on the icon. There was something strange. Right there at the end of the list. This was the first time he had seen something like this. Commander Rookie. He didn't even realize what character category it belonged to. A special class available after training. Is it a so-called hidden class or something? The boy silently looked at the system window and tried to make an important decision. The skill he had gotten back then was also strange. Indomitable commander. Apparently this is a hint that he should choose a commander class. Strange skill, of course, but useless at the beginning of the game. Mental debuffs will appear for quite a while. It was all too complicated. Needed to sort out all the thoughts in his head. Bright sunlight was streaming through the window. The weather was beautiful. The wagon was quickly approaching its destination. Ash thought for a second, but he was pulled out of his musings by Lucas's shout. He said he could already see the intersection. The boy looked up and as if waking up from the pine began to look around. At last. He jumped up from his seat and leaned out of the window enough to fall out of the wagon. The wind blew in his face and the dust got into his eyes. But it did not bother him. The caravan was fast approaching. The fortress was already visible in the distance. It was truly monumental. The black walls rose up, stretching into the sky, obscuring the sun. Red flags with coats of arms on them could be seen on the towers. The rumble of the wheels continued. A few more minutes and they would arrive at their destination. Soon they came to a stop near a massive black gate. The Crossroads. That was the name of the fortress built on the southern outskirts. A powerful outpost, designed to hold back the hordes of impending foulness. The soldier waved his hand, and the powerful gate with a rattle began to rise, opening a passage inside the fortress. This bastion stood as an unbreakable hulk, and defended against the monsters that came out of the Black Lake without end. Inside, the people felt more or less safe. At one time, this fortress was the most important defense point in the entire empire. The stagecoach began to approach, and soon the column was already going inside the fortress. However, the monster invasion gradually waned, and the army was redirected somewhere else where its help was more needed. Now, this fortress stood only as a reminder. Due to the lack of an army, only mercenaries were hired to defend the fortress. Other than that, there were veterans who were preparing to retire at the end of their careers to serve one last time and make some money, or rookies with no experience whatsoever. In a word, questionable. For mercenaries, it wasn't their nationality or qualifications that mattered. The Empire simply needed human shields to support the front lines. The boy opened his eyes and took a closer look. The fortress was truly colossal. As it lost value in life itself, restaurants, hotels, and banks began to appear here. Decades later, the fortress finally turned into a normal city. Eventually, life took a completely different course here. Manufacturing neighborhoods sprang up to provide jobs, and people stopped calling it a fortress altogether. Eventually, life took a completely different course. Normal industrial neighborhoods began to appear, mainly to provide jobs. Instead, the fortress is now called Fortress City. The caravan moved leisurely inside the city. The place was very lively with people scrambling in different directions engrossed in their work. There were neat little houses everywhere and big castles. Also, this place had another name, sounding like a mockery of the mercenaries who flew to their deaths, blinded by money straight to the moths. Suicide Street, a city of coffins, etc. It was a kind of last frontier, a crossroads, but people called it a crossroads. The boy fell silent, looking around and trying to take in the life of the city. Of course, looking at the screen, it was hard to estimate the true scale of the city. He had only seen it in a computer game, but it was still clear that the city was bigger than he thought. Everything seemed different, unusual, and new. It was strange to see it in real life, not through a screen. 
Also, the city was much more shabby than it looked in the computer game. It looked like there had been some kind of battle. Everything was broken. It was more like the city was half abandoned. But there were still people here, and quite a few of them. The boy looked out of the window, continuing to look around the neighborhood. Anyway, this was the town he would be responsible for now, right? He gathered his thoughts to prepare himself mentally for the hard choices he would have to make. The column of wagons was moving down the main street. People parted and stared in surprise, as if they were seeing something like this for the first time in their lives. There was noise everywhere, and the city seemed to stop for a moment. Lucas drove the wagon confidently, holding on to the reins. People looked at the newcomers with surprised eyebrows. It wasn't every day that newcomers came to them, and now each of them was trying to get a closer look at the strangers. Lucas looked back at them with some apprehension. Ash continued to stare out the window, the bright light hitting his eyes. He tried to take a closer look at every corner of the city. He could directly feel the air getting heavier. The townspeople looked at them warily. It was as if they were not very pleased with the new visitors. They had heavy looks, some hiding their heads under their hoods. The people were obviously unhappy that their emperor had come to visit them. Apparently, the head of the country was not very welcome here. The guy swallowed nervously a lump in his throat. Well, it could be explained, given the decision of the warlord in whose body he had fallen. No wonder people didn't like him much. A recently returned commander and lord who had barely survived the last battle after slaughtering all of his troops. One thing remained unclear after all. He realized that such a thing could happen. However, a smile stretched across his face. The guy was anticipating that the reception here wouldn't be particularly warm. But he had some trump card. The wagon stopped, and the blanket covering the contents shifted slightly. Glowing pebbles appeared, so many of them that they formed a large pile. People crowded around the wagon and began to look at them. Were they magic crystals? The guy didn't miss a trick. He had purposely piled them in the cart as well to let the townspeople examine them. There were over 400 crystals from magic spiders. It was literally crackling with how many there were. The blanket shifted even more, and the stones glistened in the sun, casting sun bunnies. Since spiders were high-level monsters, these crystals were of much higher quality and possessed great value. It wasn't hard to guess how much they were worth. They were carrying a fortune in this cart, so expensive that one could forget all about money for a while. Boy, now he felt like he was on a horse. Of course he did. He must be rewarded with something of value. After all, it was the passage of a very difficult location that almost cost him his life. The townspeople piled up and continued to stare at the caravan in surprise. In order to move smoothly through the story, it is important to cooperate with the citizens of the city. Right now, their trust in the boy is tending toward zero. Something must be done to rectify the situation. However, he's not as simple as he seems, and he has a secret to increase that trust. It's the way it's always worked, and it's always worked. Well, it's time to use it. Of course, it was money. Lots of money. Everybody loves money. Even the stingiest of people become do-gooders who will do anything when they hear the sound of money. That's the nature of human greed. Just have to wait a little. The guy squinted his eyes and looked at the unkind faces of the garages. He realized that soon everything would go according to his plan. By following the most efficient method, he would reach his goal. He would buy all their hearts, and these townspeople would become his wards, who I would not even think of obeying his orders. Money. And this is an unshakable fact. The sun was near, and its warm yellow glow lit up the sky. The weather outside was fine, and the chirping of various birds could be heard everywhere. Lucas stopped the wagon, and it began to rattle its rusted brakes. The wheels stopped spinning, and soon it stood like a ditch. The man took hold of the gilded doorknob, and with a light movement he pressed it, opening the door for his lord. The man opened the door, and Teach him bowed, informing his lord that they had arrived. This man was incredibly courteous and devoted to his lord. The lad rose from his seat and with a leisurely gait stepped out of the carriage. The steps crackled under his weight, and he praised his ward for a good job. They arrived at the estate of the town. A tall, capital-like building loomed before them. The boy jumped out of the carriage and looked around. There was a wide courtyard, quite a rich decoration for such a dilapidated city. What he saw made his eyes widen several times. It's amazing. 
Of course, the boy knew that the main building of the city should be beautiful, but in front of him was a real palace. It was a real palace in no other way. It looked more like an ancient temple, especially in the rays of the setting sun that reflected off its glass windows. Casting sunlight reflections, it looked really majestic. It really didn't compare to the house, or rather the shanty town he lived in before. The guy opened his mouth in surprise, and it was as if he was dumbfounded. It took him a minute to come to his senses. He never thought that he would get such an apartment. Suddenly, his enthusiasm was interrupted by someone's scream. A man ran toward him, stretching out his arms and trying as if to hug him. The man was troubled by something, but his face glistened with wide, large-rimmed spectacles. He stopped in front of him, approaching with some inhuman speed. The man folded his arms in front of him, and as if beginning to beg, it was a small boy. He was almost crying with joy. The boy stopped and stared at him in surprise, trying to understand who was standing in front of him. The character appeared familiar to him, but he could not remember where he had seen him before and what his name was. The boy began to gibber and apologize quickly. He shouted that he couldn't call him my lord. He began to theatrically apologize, his legs shaking with fear. The player said he could be called anything he wanted. He didn't understand why he was being treated that way. The boy grasped his bandaged hand and began to frantically examine it. It was obvious that he was about to burst with excitement. He said he was worried that his highness might get hurt. He grasped his hand as if he was facing a deity, though to him it was. The boy started screaming and wailing about his victim being there threw him into a cold at the very thought that his lord might get hurt. That boy with the stench of traitor flying around him is called Aider. In the game, he's a simple NPC who runs the city. All the administrative tasks of the crossroads are his concern. From building facilities to maintaining systems. It's probably the same in this world. The wide doors opened, arriving inside the wide corridor. He should run the city with that pesky little kid. Also, we need to get ready. The doors continued to creak open and Ader ran inside. He, like some kind of realtor, began showing the arriving gentleman his apartment. The guy swirled around him like a fly and kept gibbering about something. He waved his hand and said he'd already taken a bath. Dinner was ready, and his highness could rest for the rest of the day. It was quite richly decorated inside, with carpeted paths everywhere, and the building itself inside from the outside. The lad stood in a stupor again, trying to realize what greatness had fallen into his possession. The servant circled around him and stared in surprise, probably not understanding what the guy was so surprised about. Soon he came to his senses and woke up. He ordered his courtier to see to it that the soldiers were well rested. Then he nodded to Lucas and said that he too could rest. The knight wanted to object and to say that he was supposed to guard his lord's rest, but the boy gestured to stop his protest. Let him continue his duties tomorrow. And now, let him rest. Lucas sighed heavily and lowered his eyes. Still, he obeyed his master. He was unaccustomed to such attention. But the boy did not resist for long, and turned around and went to his room. He was still muttering to himself. The servant at this time came up to his master and invited him to follow him. The player turned around and looked around the building. Lucas's room seemed to be on the first floor. The knight disappeared somewhere in the back of the building. Soon the guy came to the bathroom, which was just as richly cleaned he saw in front of him a huge bathtub, which was filled to the top with hot sizzling water, from which came steam filling the entire space of the room. A relaxing hot bath. They stepped inside and the courtiers began to spin around and show the fruits of their endeavors. Him. Also gets rid of the smell of blood after a battle. They were still standing at the entrance to the bathroom, which looked truly monumental. It wasn't a bathroom but an entire swimming pool. Tile everywhere and expensive tiles. The guy sighed, indeed, he hadn't had a bath in a long time. And a good rest he could definitely use. The trip had been extremely exhausting and a bath was just right. So he was going to get a full rest today. He took off his cloak and thanked the courtier, saying that he could rest today, too. Ader folded his arms, still staring at his master's back like some obedient dog. The guy started to take off his clothes, which were already really completely soaked with the smell of blood, which constantly cut his nose. Suddenly, the courtier's face changed. His mouth stretched into a predatory smile and his eyes gleamed treacherously. Ah, yes, this was simply unbelievable. 
and his voice changed and made itself similar to the wheezing of a snake. Suddenly a phrase came off his lips that paralyzed the protagonist. He suddenly called his game nickname, Typical Asshole. But how did he know that? The guy stopped and as if frozen in a clinch. His eyes widened and goosebumps ran down his back. He hadn't expected this and now he stood there like a statue. The servant said it literally under his breath, but the boy heard it. He tried not to betray his surprise and fear and continued to approach the bathtub. The servant at this time slammed the doors shut and propped them open with his body. A smile gleamed on his face. His master had passed the first test in ways that were simply beyond human comprehension. The guy sounded as if he had lost his mind, his voice gradually dropping to a scream. Ash turned to him and gritted his teeth, looked at him with bloodshot eyes. How did that little creep know that? The servant spread his arms as if wanting to embrace his master, shouted, What's there to hide? He's the director of the Empire's defense. The boy stood with his arms raised to the sky, staring straight up at the ceiling. His eyes were burning with happiness, but his joy did not last long. A powerful blow flew straight into his jaws, and the guy literally swallowed his words, spitting out a few teeth. His glasses flew off his nose in a flash. The little rat flew off to the side, thrown away by the mighty blow. He flew a few meters and fell to the tiled floor with a muffled groan. Principal, huh? Ash was just furious, breathing hard and gritting his teeth like a wild animal. It turns out he is now standing in front of the creep who threw him a begging sign here. The guy was beyond furious. He was ready to tear this freak apart now. However, the servant looked at him fearfully, fixing his glasses. He urged him to be calm and put his hand forward as if trying to defend himself, though he realized it was useless right now. The body he found himself in was much weaker. He fell to his knees and began to pretend to apologize. He was sorry for having to kidnap him. The guy stood there as if he was going to pray to someone. Naturally, there was no truth in what he said. Then he raised his head and looked seriously at the Lord. However, there was one thing this world needed him. The boy became incredibly serious for a second. However, to his horror, he saw that his master had pounced on him like a wild beast. The lad was swinging his fists and now looked like the spawn of hell. His eyes were burning. Soon, Ader found himself beaten to a pulp. His face was swollen and his eyes were closed. Hot tears flowed from them. With swollen lips, he apologized. He was in pain, but there was no other way out. He raised his hands to the sky as if trying to call you to reason. Ash sat down next to him and calmed down a bit and said that now we could talk. So this little parasite is the one who sent him the message, right? The creator of this world, the developer of the game. The guy sat down across from the little guy and looked at him with interest. I'm sure, the little guy said, stretching out each letter. How Ash you strength of his way of speaking. However, I still need to listen. Finally, the boy asked the only question he was interested in. Why did that parasite drag him here? The boy started digging through his pockets, trying to find something. Soon he found a small handkerchief there and started wiping his snotty face. Through his tears, he continued to speak. In this world, there is one true ending. One true ending. One true ending. The one and only one that no one has ever gotten to. The boy listened intently and he was getting more and more annoyed with what was happening. It sounded like some kind of nonsense. Though, considering the computer world, the idea didn't seem so silly. Ader, while continuing to wipe his nose, spoke. He had reset this world countless times. In order to reach this exact ending, however, he was never able to achieve the desired result. In the end, he had to resort to this method. And now he's decided to use the help of another person, Ash asked irritably. The boy snapped his fingers and nodded affirmatively. That's exactly right. After that snap, some flashes of blue color began to shine in front of them. They sat and scrutinized the information offered. The servant reached for one such flash and continued speaking. He had changed the form of this world to a game world and was representing to the players from the other world. He kept stretching out his words, which started to piss off the protagonist. Eventually, the players were able to make good progress on something he never thought possible. Except that there was one, but... The boy frowned and looked at the screen. None of the players were making progress. He said this with obvious disappointment. Ash said that he was among those losers too, after all, he had never heard of this true ending. The guy started to look around at what was going on and didn't understand anything. 
Why had he been dragged here in the first place? The creator turned to him and said that it was true. He had never seen the true ending. Yet he had managed to accomplish what no one else had been able to before. He had passed the hellish difficulty plus with the Iron Man mode. The boy pondered. Yes, he did pass the game. And that's the reason. I still couldn't believe it. It all sounded like some kind of fiction. Ader looked at him and said, hopefully, I thought he could do it. That's why he's here. The boy sat there for a few more seconds, trying to absorb the meaning of what was being said. The words were blurring, and his mind was trying to piece it all together. He finally got it, and he couldn't hold back his anger. Screaming, he lunged at the little asshole. You bastard, he kidnapped him. The guy couldn't control his emotions any longer. That little asshole had ruined his whole life. That asshole put him through a deadly ordeal. Impassable training. And he got inside that asshole's body. How's he doing? The guy remembered the horror he had to go through to get here. And now he can hear it. Petty tried to justify himself, saying something about technical problems and bugs, about how he didn't expect it. The guy covered himself with his hands so he wouldn't get hit. The guy once again prepared his fist to punch the little asshole again. He tried to ask him to let him explain something, to tell him about the reward he would get if he helped. Reward? That word had hit him like a stoplight. The boy spread his arms in a theatrical gesture, and as if proud of himself, said that if he reached the end, revealed the true ending, he would grant any wish of the player. Ash raised an eyebrow in surprise. Any wish is that Dragon Ball. For some reason, only that anime came to mind. Ader spread his arms and easily said that theoretically in this world, he was something akin to a deity. The boy bit his lip. It sounded convincing, of course, but what good would it do him? Blood continued to flow from the boy's nose, yet he smiled broadly. He said it wouldn't be a problem for him, given his ability to give the player any gift before letting him go to ground. Ash looked at him in disbelief. Anything, even that? The boy nodded his head quickly. Even if he asked for ten billion dollars, Idar fixed his glasses on his nose, only ten billion? He could give him one hundred billion. Or maybe add another begging sign the guy as if mocking him. A class and smile appeared on his face and his glasses glistened in the sun. The player bit his lip. What a freak, he's trolling him. For some reason, Hero couldn't shake the feeling that he was being cheated somewhere. It was like he was talking to a sleazy cheater. But to be honest, he was interested. He's going to get his wish? Well, so be it. Ask for anything. The thought stuck in his head. He remembered sitting at his computer chair just playing a game for days on end. Still, there was one wish he wanted to fulfill at any cost. The boy squinted. That was the wish he wanted to wish for. And if this degenerate wasn't lying, then it could work out. He looked at the small man with a look that made it clear that trust was not to be expected from him. Shorty continued to smile and said in a sweet voice, the hero already knows what he wants, doesn't he? Or is he wrong? Something more important than money. More important than absolutely all the money in the world. He has a dream that he gave up, thinking he could never fulfill it. That voice penetrated the boy's very soul. He fell silent and collected his thoughts. The worst part was that the kid was right. Indeed, he was after all. That's when he realized that it was just the way it was. Realized that this self-proclaimed deity knew far more about him than he'd ever told anyone in his life. They stood and looked at each other, while the short man continued to reason aloud with pleasure. He knew, knew what the boy had regretted all his life. Ash recalled moments from his life that he really wanted to express from his memory. Remembered something that he had lived with this regret of his heart for a long time. Shorty said in a caustic tone that he could make his dream come true. The guy shook his head. And continuing to fight the coming nausea, you said that the dream was long over. However, his trembling voice gave away that he was lying. Spreading his arms, the small man laughed and said that as long as that dream lived in his heart, he couldn't throw it away. He was right, and the boy himself realized it. It was useless to argue. However, he had one interesting question. If this kid is telling the truth and he really isn't limited in his powers, Shouldn't he be able to reach the truth of the ending himself? Shorty stopped shouting and lowered his gaze. He changed in his face and a shadow of doubt appeared in his eyes. He bitterly said that in this world his abilities are severely limited. Here, he is just an ordinary person. Nothing more than a character in a game. Ash snorted contemptuously. He looked away, 
The boy continued to narrate. That's why he needs someone to act on his behalf. After hesitating, the boy said he wanted to ask him something. The boy smiled and in his usual manner answered in the affirmative. Ash, after thinking for a bit, asked what would happen if he died here. Idar laughed coldly. Well then, if he dies here, then the earth is his resting place. The guy chuckled and that nasty laugh went like a blade through glass. Ash clutched his head. He'd hit it. Well, let's remember him. The boy continued, smilingly explaining. Life, he said, is like a game of coin. No saving and no downloading. He thought the boy had figured that out while he was playing the game, hadn't he? The player frowned, that was right. The dwarf was telling the truth. There were no saves in the game. It was originally designed for the player to have only one try. But that didn't make it any easier. It always took care of the player, but in its own way. When it came to death, she was ruthless and relentless. Shorty stood in front of the player and Riley said that if he wanted to return to Earth, he would organize everything. As soon as the guy heard that, it was like he was hit over the head. Really? The boy nodded. Yes. He was absolutely serious. Correcting the glasses on his nose, smiling, he said that truth be told. He should have asked him that from the beginning upon arrival. But there had been a glitch, so the plan had to be changed a little. Anyway, let him decide for himself. The boy was still pondering. The prospect of returning back to his world was certainly tempting, but this desire was keeping him in a state of flux. The little runt, as if sensing his strain, held out his hand, and the echidna said that if he helped him to reach the true end, he would receive the fulfillment of his most cherished wish. Then he squinted, and again changed his tone in which something predatory flashed. Or will return to his usual peaceful life and not put himself at risk. We'll become the same as before. He spread his arms out to the sides and became like a scale that holds a choice in its hands. The choice is his alone, Mr. Typical Nerd. The guy stood in front of him, still hesitant to make a final decision. At this moment, he had a cloud of thoughts swarming in his head, which turned into a lump from which it was impossible to make something normal. However, unexpectedly for himself, the guy realized that he had long ago made a decision. Under any other circumstances, he would have returned immediately, but there were two things that prevented him from doing so. The first is the opportunity to fulfill his dream. The second, and most important and interesting, doesn't sound all that impossible, does it? The guy squinted. He's been through this game before. He knows its mechanics. How it works. There are indeed bugs, however. What game is not without them at all? All you need is confidence in yourself and your abilities. That's the only way he can win. He's studied the game from top to bottom. He's made a lot of mistakes. He's learned, and he's learned again. Why not go through the game again? The boy smiled, but a small shiver still ran through his body. Now he would make a decision that would determine his future fate. Okay. The guy didn't hesitate to answer. Let it be so. The drop fell and from it went a fine splash all over the bathroom. He said it again. He agrees. Shorty was just beyond happy. Seriously. The boy nodded again. The little guy started wriggling around like some kind of worm. You could see he was overcome with emotion. He was as excited as if he'd won the lottery. The guy was jumping in place and his glasses were ready to fly off his little nose. Ash totally serious. He said he was going to get to that yours truly ending, so he's counting on mutual help and let him try to forget his promise. In the last sentence, he put special emphasis on hinting that the consequences would be bad. However, the small bespectacled man would agree to anything. Of course, he had it all to himself. He was bouncing around like a little kid who'd been bought the toy of his dreams. Well then, let's get started. The guy walked up to the bespectacled guy and pointed his finger at him. Well, first assignment then. He stood in front of him, and his voice was firm with determination. As he approached the bespectacled man, he told him to sell all the magic crystals before morning. The bespectacled man trembled for a second. What? The smile immediately fell off his face. He did not expect such a turn of events. However, the player was completely serious. He waved his hands and said in a shaky voice that all the stores were already closed. How is he going to do it? The player was furious, as if he were some wild beast. He looked at the bespectacled man with a look that made his soul go into a heel. Legs in his hands and go. He doesn't care whether he sells them at night or at dawn. He doesn't care at all. Just let it be over by morning. He adjusted the glasses on his nose. 
Okay, for 388 black spider magic crystals. He could get a huge amount of money by selling them even the last market price. But still, what was he going to do with that much money? This money could be used to buy an entire mansion, to ensure a trouble-free life for years to come. Ash Cold replied that there is an empty spot on his team. Some player is missing. The bespectacled man was surprised, but asked again. What? What does he mean? The guy grinned. Did Winter really have to answer that question? Still, the inquisitive nature of the bespectacled man was beginning to annoy him. Wasn't that too much to ask? Soon they arrived at the mercenary guild to find a suitable member of their team. Of course, he's talking about Gotcha. He flipped a coin and the shiny piece of gold flew high up with a squeak. He had plenty of money and he wasn't afraid to spend it. It was up to these good mercenaries. He pounded his fist on the table, in full readiness for the fact that he was about to lose a considerable amount of all his money. He wanted to start with 100 spins. The guy smirked and prepared to place his bets. He had so much money that all that gold had to be put into separate wagons. And even so, there was a lot of it. Nearby stood the guards who were vigilantly guarding such a sum of money. It seemed that they themselves were afraid to be near such wealth. Next to all this wealth sat a bespectacled man with literally no face on him. He had to work very hard to sell all these stones. He hadn't slept all night, and now he felt like a squeezed lemon. Ash and Lucas were standing near the guild roundabout and were wrangling over Jen's leg. From there they could hear shouting and some kind of rumbling. Something was definitely going on there. It was a typical tavern, where people spent all their money in useless games, trying to win something. But often they left with nothing. Ash smirked. They have fun there. Lucas looked at him with a surprised look. He said he wanted to go out first in case there was something dangerous out there, but he didn't have time to finish his sentence. The boy quickly kicked a lot in the door, and it flew out with a crunch opening the passage. They found themselves on the threshold of a rather large room that had a dim light. There were a lot of people sitting at tables, some of them drinking, some of them continuing to play. Several men were sitting there, one of whom, a bald man with a small beard and mustache, shouted with rage, Who the hell is he? That he wants to die. He screamed so hard that veins began to swell on his bald head. Ash screamed so much that his entire face was covered in sweat. He turned to the stranger. Hey, you degenerate. Why is he staring at him like that? He quickly walked over to the man who had carelessly started to rough him up and put his hand on his bald head. Maybe he's the one who wants to die. Maybe he's his future employer. The man trembled with fear and immediately lost all his ardor somewhere. Lucas obediently followed him. Whispers were heard all around. People were seeing this third prince for the first time in their lives. They began to whisper amongst themselves and discuss. People were well aware that this man was strange to say the least. He had killed his entire army in the last battle. No one risked crossing his path. But at this time, the guy was examining the people present with his gaze. Is there anyone shining here? They needed to find someone worthy to replace the empty seat in their team. Mercenary Guild. It's a place where you can knock out new characters. And of course, their potential is directly related to their rank. The boy opened his eyes. In any case, is there anyone shining here? Suddenly his gaze locked onto some stranger sitting at a table somewhere in the distance. He was emanating some kind of strange purple color. That's it. Just what he needed. The guy was dumbfounded and began to glare at the stranger. The woman noticed him too, and taking a drag on a thick cigar and letting out a cloud of thick smoke turned her head. Her lips moved and a soft, calm voice sounded. She greeted the hero and said that it was good to see him in the Continental Crossroads Mercenary Guild. It was a woman, or rather an old woman with long gray hair, or maybe it was just white. She had a patch over her eye, and with her fingers she held the cigar which was barely smoldering. She was dressed in an officer's uniform with large epaulets, and on her breast she had many orders, which testified that she had seen more than one battle. Ash was stunned, a mercenary of that rank, really. Really. A smile appeared on his face. Did he really find what he was looking for so quickly? He walked over to her and without invitation sat down beside him. The boy asked if he could recognize the name. The woman rose from her seat and nodded courteously. Putting her hand to her breast, she introduced herself and said her name was Jupiter. She added that it was an honor to meet the Lord. 
The woman stood at attention in front of him as if she were still in the role of a soldier. The boy wondered. A mage of such a rank? Plus a mage of light? He just couldn't believe it was a granny in a mercenary guild. He squinted his eyes and began to stare at her studyingly. He had never seen such a uniform before. What country does it belong to? The woman offered her hand to her chest and said with some warmth that this uniform belonged to their ever-black empire. She added that the boy must not have recognized it because it was created decades back. It's an old pattern. The boy smiled. So she used to serve the empire? His voice sounded ringing. He was satisfied with his find. The woman stretched her mouth in a smile, and the city replied that she had given 30 years of service to the military, had even been captain of the second mage squad. After retiring, she made a living through mercenary work. Looking at her uniform, the boy said respectfully that she must be a model soldier even after retirement. The woman put a cigar in her mouth and waved her hand and said that it's not like that at all. It's just that it's hard to live on one pension. There's not much money. The woman took a glass with some hot drink and asked with interest, What brings your majesty here? The boy smiled and answered the question with a question. What did she herself think? To hire someone useful to her team, of course. What else would one come to such a specialized place for? The woman squinted and looked at him with her only eye. She asked in an ingratiating voice, Was he sure he wasn't here to find a decoy to die in his place? Of course, the question was a legitimate one, as this place was frequented by people who used the others as expendable. Hearing those words, Lucas was furious. How dare the old woman talk about his master like that? The man was already ready to join the fight. He was already grabbing his sword when suddenly the boy stopped him with his hand. No need to. It's all right. The knight reluctantly put his weapon back away. The woman took another drag on her cigarette and the bodies reply that rumors of a battle on the front lines had already spread everywhere, even outside the kingdom. Such rumors spread with phenomenal speed. The woman added that it looked like he had to pay dearly for being so incompetent. He lost a lot of people and almost lost his castle. The woman grinned and laughed softly. Let them be lowlifes who are paid to fight ordinary battles, but still they are not idiots to dig their own graves. They still want to live and they don't want to die in an alley somewhere following an idiotic order. None of them want to put their lives at the disposal of a naive rookie commander. All the other mercenaries jumped up from their seats as well, and stared at the newcomers. The woman frowned and clenched a cigarette in her mouth. The boy nodded understandingly and said that he understood. These concerns were legitimate, but still he had a suggestion. He stepped forward and began to speak. These people are here to do missions and to make money at it. He walked up to the crowd of people that had already begun to thicken around him and asked one already consuming question. Hadn't they already sold their lives? Isn't that why they came here? They offer their services, risking their lives for a small fee. Didn't they all end up in this place because there is no other way to make money? And now they're afraid to do what they're here to do. The people fell silent and stared intently at the prince. He slapped his hand on the table and shouted, and besides, they say they are not foolish enough to dig their own graves. He leaned over to the woman and said in an ingratiating voice that sounded at least strange to him. The woman was confused at these words and almost dropped her cigar from her mouth. The boy continued. Her career was definitely effective, except that she was eventually fired as well. Plus, for a reason, it was all done because she was secretly stealing military funds. Isn't that right? The woman almost choked on that statement and widened her eyes. She understood it perfectly, but no one knew about her past before. The boy hit exactly the right target. He grinned. Isn't that right? Isn't that the same as digging a grave? Apparently she had no idea he knew about her past. The boy laughed. He inwardly rejoiced. He had done the right thing. Besides, it wasn't all that easy out there. From corruption to smuggling goods. I got her caught and kicked out of her job in disgrace. Now she's forced to sit here in a stinking tavern trying to make a living on a mercenary's wages. And yet, she proudly continues to wear her military uniform. Isn't she ashamed? The boy leaned over to the woman and looked at her reproachfully. All she could do was clench the cigarette tighter in her lips. The epitome of corruption. Corrupt soldiers, rotten to the core. A dishonorably discharged veteran, isn't that a cliched story? However, it didn't really bother him. She was a heroine of simply staggering abilities. She now looked more like a pirate than a warrior. That's all about this woman. Jupiter the Light Mage. The woman sighed heavily, 
and took the cigar out of her mouth. She turned to the boy. Even if her career ended on such a bad note, she was still proud to be a soldier of the Empire. The woman said this without the grandeur of before, but still without losing her pride. She glanced at the guy and asked him to watch his expressions. However, he seemed to ignore her words. He sat down beside her and asked, How much? How much is she willing to ask for her pride? The woman looked at him as if she was ready to kill him. You could hear her teeth gritting with anger. But the boy stared at her unceasingly and even stopped blinking. He repeated his question. How much would it take to make her a hunting dog? The woman overcame her anger after all and smiled, said that despite her age and looks, she was quite expensive, at least 100,000 a year. But she didn't have time to finish. The guy said he was willing to pay 200. The woman was so surprised that she dropped her cigar. It fell straight to the floor, making a soft thumping sound. Double. 200.000, repeated the guy without a shadow of doubt in his voice. The woman looked at him in surprise and couldn't even find anything to say. This is a high price for a mercenary, however. He is a prince of the empire and the lord of this city. Moreover, he just sold all the 400 crystals he managed to obtain by killing spiders. Yeah, the bespectacled man had done well and he hadn't cheaped out. Now he had enough money. He looked at the woman with a proud look the way one would look at a thing. Waste? No, for the opportunity to buy a soldier of such rank, he was willing to pay any price. The woman continued to look up at him, now seriously considering his offer. It was evident that she was reluctant to refuse such a sum. She was even willing to disregard her own pride, though for the umpteenth time. The guy held out something like a business card. Her fear of death, he's buying it, and will immediately pay her double the original bid. A beaming smile shone on his face. The guy spoke in a loud and boisterous voice. Cowards that don't want to sell their lives can go home to their mommies. But if they are true mercenaries willing to work for big bucks, then let them stay. He stood in front of the crowd of mercenaries who looked at him in surprise and did not dare to say a word. The lad, however, went on talking. Let them come tonight to the empty field west of here as the crossroads. The next place he went to was a church. It was a large white building with two bell towers. This is where the monks usually sat and the service was always going on. In this place, the church was one of the top of the hierarchy, somewhere on par with the government. Important decisions were made here and powerful healers resided here. Inside the cathedral was the monumental structure of the angel. The statue stood somewhere in the middle of the great hall, and Ash was sitting underneath it. Next to him sat a nun who was healing him with her magic. The boy was in complete bliss. After a few minutes, the procedure was over. The woman looked at his neck and said it was almost done, but a small scar would remain. The boy thanked her for her help, and indeed his neck was left with a small red scar. Smiling, the woman said she was very happy to have helped. A beautiful face looked at him. It was an R-rank hidden heroine. She was the best healer, St. Margaret. She had long brown hair and big brown eyes. Later, he would be able to recruit her by fulfilling certain conditions. The guy stood up and looked around carefully. However, that wasn't why he was here today. There was some business to finish. He placed a weighty bag of money on a small table. The boy turned to the saint and asked, Is what he asked her earlier ready? The girl nodded her head and said it would be done now. In front of them stood several dozen people dressed in church uniforms. It was similar to the uniforms of the temple novices. The woman said quietly that she had brought everyone here who was available at the moment. Ash circled everyone with a studying look. Among the temple attendants was Demian. He looked at his comrade with big puny eyes and smiled. It could be seen that the boy was quite well here. He has found his vocation at last. Smiling, Ash said that he seemed to be adjusting well here. Inside himself, he was glad for the boy. Glad because after all the adversity, he was able to find his haven and was now safe. The sun was slowly coming into its own. The day was heating up. Ash said that now they would have a lot of things to do. Besides, it would not be easy. Ash and Lucas stood on a small platform. In front of them stood a few dozen townspeople, all of them with worried and teary faces. Behind them were many graves. That day, a national mourning was declared. Then many coffins arrived from the forward base. They were brought by the soldiers. The sight was really depressing. There was a smell of hopelessness and death from everywhere. 
People came here to honor the memory of the fallen soldiers. Tears came to their faces. Ash placed a small gold-rimmed photograph near his comrade Ken's grave. There he was, along with his family. The boy frowned. Everything was going according to plan. The soldiers lined up in a straight line and stood motionless, waiting for the command. Each grave was marked with the flag of the Empire, indicating that a brave warrior defending his land was buried here. Also here was a small choir that sang a funeral song in honor of the fallen warriors. The girls had mournful voices and were as well dressed in black funeral clothes as anyone else. From then on, death was so common in this place that ceremonial funerals like these were commonplace. Most importantly, monetary compensation was paid to the families of the deceased. It is highly doubtful, however, that this money could have made any difference to their loss. People were whispering among themselves and occasionally breaking down into crying. Pitiful sobs were heard from everywhere. People began to shuffle around, watching the new prince. Shocked by the sums, people began to whisper. The news passed from mouth to mouth and spread among the townspeople. Rumors always spread very quickly. The boy stood on the platform and drew a full chest of air. He was going to make a speech in front of all the townspeople. He wasn't going to sugarcoat anything. Yes, it was a performance, but it was extremely reasonable. Here on the front lines, their fight should be known as a noble mission for the sake of all mankind. The boy stepped onto the platform and looked around at the townspeople. His loud voice began to echo throughout the neighborhood. He is the third prince and newly appointed Lord Ash von Heider Everblake. People began to whisper. Chuckles crept everywhere. None of them took the new ruler seriously. Everyone thought he was a madman, a madman who had come to the throne and doomed his empire to collapse. He looks like a complete asshole. The boy heard everything perfectly well, of course, but he wasn't embarrassed by the words. He sighed and said he would not embellish these events. His gaze was cold and hard, as if he did not care at all about the fate of these citizens. It was as if they were just expendable to him. He began to speak in a measured voice. Certainly on the front lines everyone will die. Death will be their constant companion. Suddenly he interrupted his speech, his gaze fixed on a man in the crowd. It was the familiar from the tavern, Lady Jupiter. But what was she doing here? She was smoking her thick cigar as usual. His eyes rested on her. Had she come here? Had the past conversation affected her so much? But still the boy went on talking. His voice sounded firm and determined. He wasn't afraid that the crowd might burst out at any moment and tear him to pieces. The townspeople didn't accept him well enough, and he was making such a speech. The guy went on. He was saying that on the front lines everyone would be dying. Death will be continuous. It's a war for all mankind. Every week in the cemetery there will be more and more graves, and the church choir would sing, honoring the new dead. The people stood panting. They were shocked at such a straightforward you though they understood it themselves, but they did not want to admit this fact. The crowd stood without moving. All eyes were directed at the Lord. The boy spoke without embarrassment. He asked to be given a chance to clarify the situation. He said that the man's death would be worth more than his life. People began to look at the man with a look of disbelief. Funeral expenses and all the ceremonies had taken a toll on his wallet. Almost half of the money he had gotten from selling the crystals had gone into all of this. If this keeps up, there'll be almost no money left. Funerals are terribly expensive. However, logically, death shouldn't be a cheap pleasure. A monk stood near one of the graves and, folding his hands in a prayerful gesture, read the sermon in honor of the deceased. Ash continued his monologue. He said in a confident voice that, because of all of this, he would try to save all of their lives, no matter what it cost him. That was the priority for him right now. Trying to make sure they all stayed alive and keep working on the front lines. Lily sat on her wheelchair and looked at her comrade with a pitiful look. The girl was happy at being left alive, but now her situation was much worse. Ash continued to speak. He said in a thunderous voice that no one in the military should dare to die prematurely. The guards dressed in shiny armor stood silent and greedily absorbed every word. The guy was telling them to live and shake as much money from him as they could. Jupiter frowned and took a drag from her cigarette, thinking. Those words seemed incredibly strange to her, especially coming from such a man. Ash told them not to make him spend on their expensive funeral in any way. He waved his hand, 
and the barrels of the guns rose upward. On command, a volley rang out and the smell of gunpowder hung in the air. He had said all he wanted to say. Now he wondered how the garage would take it. Yes, it was undoubtedly a tough speech, but in these realities it was necessary. At least he remained honest. An incompetent commander making excuses. A nasty lord throwing money around left and right. I don't care what they think of him. The boy didn't bother to speculate. He's going to prove himself with results. He will prove to all these people that he is more worthy of being on that throne than anyone else. The boy's head cocked forward, his long red cloak developing in the wind. Guy smiled. He was pleased with himself. Well, time to clear the first location. He had worked exactly as planned. His speech had penetrated deep into the minds of the townspeople and had settled there. Now we just had to wait and see what happened. Location one. Three days and one hour to go. Night came unexpectedly quickly. The big bright moon crawled into the sky and peeked through the thick clouds. The first stars began to light up in the sky. After the funeral, the boy went to the backyard of his estate. There he was met by Lucas. This knight followed him rigorously, guarding his every step. They stood and for a few minutes there was a slight pause between them. A window popped up in front of him, asking him to activate the teleportation gate. He immediately jabbed his finger at the icon labeled Yes. Of course, that was what he was going to do. The pile of rocks in front of which they were standing suddenly stirred, and large waves, one after another, began to rise into the air, forming something like a circle. All the while they were glowing with a strange bluish glow. The portal slowly began to activate. After a few dozen seconds, a portal glowing with blue light had already formed in front of them. It was a large sphere with a swirl of energy swirling around in it. The guys stood right in front of it and prepared to enter M. Lucas gingerly looked at the portal. He had never seen anything like this before. In a stammering voice, he started to ask, what is it? And ahead of his question, the guy answered that it was a portal that would take them to a dungeon under the lake. Ash quickly stepped forward. He wasn't about to back down. Lucas asked, is that what he meant? The boy nodded his head, confirming his guess. With a wave of his hand, he smiled and said that this passage would take them directly to the enemy base, where they could attack the enemy completely unnoticed. And his face, on which a triumphant smile was spreading, testified that his plan was going to work. This game combines two genres with tower defense and dungeon crawling. It's even written on the cover of this game, so there should be no doubt. Locations with monsters attacking the intersection refer to tower defense. But in between passing the locations when monsters do not attack, the player can explore the dungeon under the lake it know about the origin of the monsters. Dungeon Sweep, this is the so-called open world where players can raise their level by killing monsters. An important mechanic to advance in the game. In these dungeons, it is better to go in groups of well-pumped players. Ash stood near the portal that was waiting for them to enter. Just as he thought, you can activate it before passing the location. Great. It's a heck of a game, but it's not that illogical. At least he's got a lot of experience now. He's had a lot of training. But now, has a good start to get through the game. He has a cheater character, Damien, and also AOE damager SR rank Jupiter. With the help of these two, he can easily pass any dungeon. It's funny how it started out so poorly. Plus, he has enough money to maintain it, so it's more than fine. The walkthrough proved to be a doable task for him. A satisfied smile stretched across his face. The guy was already anticipating that he would be able to easily pass this dungeon without any obstacles. He explained the rules to Lucas and said that they were going to scout the enemy base before the next location. The knight obediently listened to him and memorized the further plan of action. Finally, he clapped his hands together and said he understood. This was a great opportunity for him to prove himself in battle. Combat was an incredibly exciting pastime for him. After he finished listening to his maker, he cheerfully replied with a cheerful smile that he was fully ready. Ash was even a little embarrassed by this. He didn't expect the knight to agree to such a venture so easily. The guy stared at his ward incomprehensibly. That's it? No questions? That surprised him immensely. Lucas should be the one with the most questions, right? However, the knight smilingly looked at his master, fully prepared to follow him into any scorcher. The prince he had served his entire conscious life had suddenly changed beyond recognition. Didn't that embarrass him in the slightest? Also, he knew about the structure of the city and the location of the dungeon despite being in this city for the first time. 
Didn't that confuse him? Ash pondered. This should have been enough to raise suspicion, but Lucas continued to follow his orders without fail. The guy frowned. This was all kind of weird, but now was not the best time for that kind of thinking. He would think about it later. He turned to Lucas and the knight turned to him with the same radiant smile. The boy asked him, isn't there anything he wants to ask, 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 so Lucas like twitched. The man became serious and was silent for a second. He drew his eyebrows together and looked at his master intently, thinking about something. There was a look of doubt on his face, but for the moment the man said nothing. Suddenly he turned to the boy. Ash tensed his whole body, expecting that the knight would guess something and begin to pester him with questions. Then his plan would surely go awry. Goosebumps ran down his back. He was already preparing himself for the fact that he would have a lot of explaining to do. However, it was quite the opposite. Lucas put his hand to his chest and bowed slightly, saying that he was just following orders he had nothing to ask. Ash exhaled loudly. He calmed down. It was all over. He definitely didn't need any extra questions right now. The moon shone brightly illuminating the immediate surroundings. Crickets chirped and the voices of two men could be heard. Lucas said that he was only the sword and shield of his master. His job was to carry out orders. He tilted his head, continuing his slight bow. He said he only kills and protects on his master's orders. No questions should be asked of him. It was clear from his face that this man would do whatever his lord ordered him to do. Ash Stunned looked at his subordinate. He hadn't expected such directness and loyalty from him. He could not believe that this man had no questions. It all seemed very strange, and he must have suspected something. He was not that stupid, was he? Yet Lucas says he trusts him. It seems like I'm more loyal to him than he is to me, and it looked like this man had no doubts. Lucas kept glaring at him with a slight bow. Such thoughts sent a small shiver through the guy's body. He looked at his subordinate with a look full of respect. He didn't know what to say. This was definitely something he hadn't expected. Inside himself, the guy thought that a little later, he would definitely reward this man for such loyalty. Inside himself, he magnified. Also, it was time to move forward. The guy opened the portal and reached out his hand to his knight and asked if he was ready to go with him into the very scorcher. A triumphant smile shone on his face. The guy was already anticipating a good adventure that would bring him much success. Lucas looked at him with a serious look full of alertness. He said firmly that he was ready to follow him happily, straight to the underworld, whatever was waiting for him there. The player smiled and looked at his knight with incredible respect. He liked that this man did not ask unnecessary questions, but simply followed his orders. It saved him a lot of needed hassle. The guy poked at the sign that said Lake, and the teleporter lit up. They took a quick step inside the glowing circle and everything around them was flooded with bright light. He even had to squeeze his eyes shut a little to avoid being blinded. The teleporter was now fully operational. Then there was a bright flash of light, and the teleport vanished. The pile of rocks took on its usual appearance once more, crumbling into its usual place with a small rain of stone. During the teleportation in front of the guy every now and then popped up windows with hints that annoyed him. He already shouted angrily to the game to stop pretending to care. Soon, the teleportation was complete, and he stepped on solid ground. Soon they arrived at the place. Now the two men stood in front of a small lake, in which floated a dilapidated platform. It was damp all around, and the croaking of frogs could be heard. Ash looked around, studying the area. It was eerie, dark everywhere, the air was humid, and the boy had a feeling inside that they were in for quite a battle. Black Lake the lake that was the source of the monsters. It was a veritable hell that was creating nightmares on the southern edge of the world. The clouds slowly began to part, and the bright white light of the moon illuminated the bleak landscape. It felt like they were in a parallel reality. There were large mountains everywhere, but at the same time the terrain was completely empty. Suddenly the silence was broken by Lucas's alarmed scream, calling for his lord to look away, pointing his finger somewhere. There was a definite look of concern on his face. Ash turned his head and looked where his ward was pointing. The water in the lake began to bubble and soon it split in two. The picture reminded me of a biblical parable. The lake parted, 
and there appeared a small peculiar path on which one could walk. The ground beneath my feet began to move, and here and there glowing hands began to come out of it. The sight was eerie. It seems that the whole army of dead people who had been sleeping soundly until now was awakened by uninvited guests, and now will take revenge for the disturbed sleep. Soon an army of the walking dead appeared before the aliens. These were knights who had fallen in the battle. They had been transformed into ghosts that wandered aimlessly across this expanse. The walking armor from which the bluish light was streaming began to move on its own. A clattering sound could be heard around them. They were moving and their movements were broken. Ash apparated in horror, obviously he hadn't expected this. His eyes widened. Something had gone wrong after all. What the fuck? The guy didn't know what to do. His life hadn't prepared him for this. They were facing an army of living armor. He thought he could do it quietly, but he didn't. Before them stood an army of living armor. A whole army of them clashing their weapons trying to tear them apart. The armor was terrifying. Blue light streaming out of it. The armor was rusted from time, but that only gave it an eerie entourage. Each one held a long sword. The boy gritted his teeth and trembled with fear. Why had things turned out this way? Why these freaks? It was a dry nightmare for him. He didn't care who he would meet at the first location. Goblins, mermaids, wyverns. There are so many level monsters. But why was he left with only the ones he tried his best to avoid meeting? In front of him stood an entire army that crackled with their armor moving straight towards them through the parting waves of the lake. The light from that armor spread far beyond, and from afar it looked like an army of fireflies was moving towards them. The boy wrapped his arms around his head and seemed ready to skin himself with anger. Fucking luck. He was furious. Fighting these things was a nightmare. They were ghosts. How could they even be killed? However, despite the general deplorability of their condition, Lucas was on full alert. He looked around at his opponents. Here were the monsters they would have to kill. The man gripped his sword, ready to charge in. Ash continued to stare miserably in front of him. Suddenly a sign with information about the monsters appeared in front of him. The boy's bloodshot eyes widened, and he prepared himself for the worst. He saw something terrible. The level of these creatures was fifth. Living armor, class attacking. But what surprised him the most was the quantity. 1.052. Lucas looked at his leader and asked if everything was all right. The man noticed that his highness was visibly pale. Ash stood there without moving, as if he was burrowed into the ground. His face shrank like a rotten apple. The boy bit his lips bloody, and the hair on his head and everywhere else began to move. He turned to Lucas, saying that he'd already said that in training, but he'd say it again. We're fucked. That's how many times he started the game from the beginning. There are various reasons for this on Topol. But if there was a living armor waiting for him at the very beginning, he immediately started the game over as he realized that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to deal with this Hulk deal with. The living armor fully lives up to its description. Beneath their heavy armor hides only the phantom. Killing him is an almost impossible task. Because it is incorporeal, this type of monster is extremely resistant to physical attacks. It becomes easy to fight him only in the second half of the game. When the player has a lot of different equipment, including magic amulets, various spells, and all that stuff. But now everything is very, very bad. The guy stood in his place, not deciding to move forward. There was only one question on his mind, but why these freaks? Meanwhile, the army of armor with a loud clang was coming closer and closer to them. Ash clenched his teeth with rage. It felt like someone was just riffing on them. Like someone was deliberately interfering with the game. The guy had absolutely no idea how they were going to deal with all this crap. The number of knights was unbelievable, and on top of that, they didn't have the necessary equipment. Three days to the opening of the first location, the knights had already begun to crawl out of every crevice, approaching their victims. Their armor rattled, and the rumble drowned out everything around them. Everything was covered in a bright blue glow that emanated from their bodies. After a bit of thinking, the player came up with the only sure way out of the situation. He ordered his partner to leave. Lucas nodded, and they got ready to run away from here. They have no choice but to do everything they can to protect themselves. There's no way to deal with these creatures. The knights had already started to crawl ashore and rush straight towards their defenseless victims. Soon they still managed to get away with this monstrous location. And now the player was in his place. In his castle. As soon as he got inside, 
it immediately started calling for Eider. His voice echoed throughout the castle. The guy was definitely disturbed about something. The cry of the Lord began to echo throughout the palace. He called out to his subordinate, and the bespectacled man immediately appeared in front of him with the same stuttering voice. He congratulated his lord on his return and waited for further instructions. Ash asked in a gruff voice, What is the state of the city's military strength? The bespectacled man stammered as he began his report. They have a total of 526 men capable of standing on the front lines. The servant had a small tablet in his hands. This is where he wrote down all the available data. As soon as the player heard this, he angrily stomped his foot on the floor. What? The guy was furious. He had made 100 turns of roulette and had only won 500 people. What? That's just unthinkable. He was furious, and he was biting his lip. He was ready to tear his hair out. This character whose body he had unwittingly fallen into was just a real freak. Ader stammered and began to say that during the training, most of their soldiers simply died. And then the player realized he was totally fucked. But finally he calmed down and asked how many more they could hire. The servant replied that they'd already recruited all the mercenaries who'd come to town. So there was no way they could hire more. The servant shook his head. Unfortunately, it's not possible within this city. The boy turned to him, then have him send out all the other cities and bring more soldiers here. Have him say they'll double the normal rate. Ader wrote everything down in his small notebook. He nodded understandingly, a sign that he would do exactly as instructed. Ash said to send to the Imperial Palace as well. Have them relay that the monsters had begun to awaken, and have them request as many reinforcements as possible. The bespectacled man wrote down all the instructions to himself in his notebook, his pencil sliding quickly across the paper, tracing out neat symbols. Finished writing down, the bespectacled man raised his eyes to his master and asked, Is he sure he wants to do this? The guy looked at him. If they request reinforcements from the Empire now, there will be a devastating event later in the game. Ash scratched the back of his head. Yes, let him contact them. He had no choice anyway. He must survive by all means. The bespectacled man smiled full mouth and stretched out that he understood. Then he turned around and said that let him still gather all the stonemasons, carpenters, blacksmiths, and alchemists of the city. Let them work in their best interests. Right now their manpower could not be more useful. The servant cried out in surprise that then the production of magic stones would come to a halt. His voice trembled, however. The fact that he started to contradict his lord was a big mistake. Ash jumped up to him and grabbed the kid by the throat. Veins swelled in his face and his teeth gritted with anger. His eyes were bloodshot and through his teeth he began to hiss. The city is about to be wiped out. And he's worried about producing pebbles. Let him drag everyone here. Ader gasped, saying that he understood everything and would follow orders immediately. The frightened servant flashed out of the room, slamming the door behind him. The player was left all alone and sighed heavily. There was no one in the room but him and now it was necessary to come to his senses. The current difficulty level of the game is fucked up. Everything is so difficult. Resources are scarce, and the monsters are arriving with renewed vigor. He opened the information window and started looking hard for something there. He didn't think he had time to wait any further. He needed to act now and immediately. He was already operating under time constraints, and there weren't many resources left. The guy looked at the information window with a serious expression. The more complex the game became, the more variables he had to make. Commander Rookie, does he wish to choose this class? The game popped up a question box in front of him. That's why he decided to take a chance. Get your diidiotic system. The guy confidently clicked on the icon and the information window lit up with a bright blue light. On the information panel, a congratulatory message popped up in big white letters. The player has become a rookie commander. The guy stared directly at the congratulatory window for a few more seconds, as if expecting something to change. Some stupid music started playing and small confetti flew into Ash's face. Some kind of clown effect, the boy thought. He was not impressed at all, but rather annoyed. Suddenly he felt a heaviness in his chest, as if he was about to have a heart attack. He grabbed his chest and bent in half. It was such a pain that he didn't have the strength to deal with it. However, it was over quickly. All that came out of the guy's mouth was a stifled scream. He bulged his eyes and groaned. It was hard to breathe. It felt like what had just happened. 
an information window popped up in front of him, indicating that a minus 50% debuff would be applied to his growth characteristics. He looked at the pop-up window with horror and surprise. What had she just said? What a devil. A minus 50% debuff will be applied to the item skill. Seriously. Of course, he stood there with his eyes wide open. The kid couldn't believe how bad it could be. But it happened. For a couple more seconds, he stood there, staring silently at the information panel. He refused to accept the fact, however. The window reported the facts. A second later, a scream echoed throughout the royal palace. The guy was cursing at the top of his lungs. What the fuck? Are they fucking kidding me? He was just pissed off. This is crazy, isn't it? Why did they give him so many debuffs? He grabbed the dashboard and I squeezed it so hard it cracked the glass. He was furious. Like a rabid beast, he was ready to smash the damn glass. This is some kind of fucked up thing. He grabbed the poker and he wanted to start smashing everything around him. Eider, that little prick. He was about to rush out to find that lousy glasses guy and finish him off on the spot, but stopped when he heard the notifications. Many windows began to appear in front of him, and he stopped and scrutinized them, still breathing hard. It said that he had gotten a totem attack skill, another one of the same skill. He got another sub-buffer skill and another main order skill. On top of that, Team Synergy was now available. The guy stood there and didn't understand anything. He was breathing heavily like a raging bull while holding a large poker in his hands. What the hell was this? He calmed down a bit after all and began to scrutinize what was written. From everything that came out, he could now reinforce all of his soldiers. Quite a useful skill his anger quickly passed. And now he was fascinated, studying his new abilities. Which, by the way, there were many. Now it turns out that if he is just present on the battlefield... Each soldier will get a bonus to his attack and defense. Now he understood why he had been so weakened. He had calmed down a bit, but he was still a bit angry at such an injustice. The guy carefully studied the information cells and analyzed what he should do now with the new reinforcements. Honestly, it was impressive. Commander class enhancements. Depending on the combination of the team members' classes, they would receive different bonuses. It was suggested to try a lot of different options. Some sort of system of interconnecting classes in his patty. Ash smiled. He liked it a lot for a gamer like him. This class was just perfect. He looked at his poker, which now reminded him of a king's scepter. The guy hung it back in place, and the poker seemed to glow with some kind of magical light. One day had passed since the lad had received his new class. He had a lot of things to do, and now there was even less time left. The day was in full swing. Ash had found the bespectacled boy, and now stood in front of him waiting for an explanation. He made it clear that he wanted the most detailed explanation of what had happened. Otherwise, he would kill the bespectacled man here and now, whoever he was. Ader stood in front of him, shifting from foot to foot. He was clearly worried about something, and in a shaky voice he explained. The fact was that no one was obeying his orders, and he had to resort to slightly more urgent measures. In front of them stood several bound men. They were bound hand and foot and looked more like slaves. The bespectacled man said that in his haste he was only able to bring the Union leaders. Ash Reddy fell through the ground with shame. He hissed at him, in fact, he kidnapped them. But the bespectacled man didn't seem embarrassed at all. He fixed his glasses on his nose and smiled. The leader of the Union, Kuznetsov, a full man with a big bushy beard, shouted that it was just some lawlessness in broad daylight. He was furious. He had been kidnapped from his forge and was now being dragged not clear where. The leaders of the Bricklayers Union and Plotnikov. Is he going to take over production? They were just furious. What kind of behavior is this? This is some kind of barbarism. The leader of the Alchemists Union. An elderly man with long gray hair and an equally long beard. Gritted his teeth and shouted that even if the king was a big shot. There was a time and place for everything. You can't just show up at a man's door, kidnap him and force him to work. Ash trembled with fear. Now everyone's even madder at him. They've even got veins on their faces from scream. The guy realized at that moment that he was not going to get respect by this method. He was only making things worse. What a bespectacled bastard. He should have apologized that democracy would be a better option. But he said something else. It's like he looked at his victims and roared. Do they want to die? He gave off such an ominous aura that everyone got goosebumps. 
and only the bespectacled man stood by and smiled. Ash looked at them with a crazy look. Through clenched teeth, he hissed. Do they have any idea where they are? How dare they yell at him at the top of their lungs? Have they forgotten who he is? The guy's eyes widened, and he looked like a deranged lunatic who'd just escaped from an asylum. The player began to squeeze his hand with such force that even the table under his fingers began to crack and break. He is their prince and lord. If he calls them, then all must drop what they are doing and run here on all fours. He didn't look like himself. His eyes bulged even more. How dare they hurt his feelings? Is this really how he wants to part with his life? He seemed to have gotten too much into the role of a mad ruler. Seeing this, the Union leaders immediately cooled their fervor and looked at their intimidating lord with tear-filled eyes. Where, after all, this is the first time the prince is their lord, so they agree. That rare occasion when it feels good to be Ash. The player was satisfied, after all, intimidation is an effective method. After that, the negotiations went smoothly. After the leader made his demands, the masters were horrified. They couldn't believe their ears. Is it serious? After all, his demands were just exorbitant. Ash didn't hesitate to throw up his hands and smiled. Of course, he's offering them 20% of all the magic stones the army will collect at below market value. He was an amazing merchant and knew how to negotiate. Being able to buy the stones directly is too lucrative for them, right? Well, then let them establish a trading relationship. The guy leaned towards them and his voice became more ingratiating. Well, now in return, whenever he orders, military equipment must be manufactured first. Of course, he would pay fairly according to suitability. The boy was silent for a moment and waited to see what the masters would say. He folded his hands in front of him and looked at his subjects with a snide look. Good deal, isn't it? He knew very well that the masters would have no choice, so the deal was only a formality. Using his money and power, he was easily persuaded, although at first they were doubtful, of course. At this point, negotiation is the only thing he can do. Does that make him a materialist? Of course it does. Leader Smith, of course, agreed. Will it be difficult? What should they do and when should they start? What else is there to do? Ash was pleased that everything was going according to his plan. Money is a great thing, after all. You could buy anything with it. People to work with. Materials. He smiled at his new subjects, who would now obey his orders without question. One thousand living armor moved at them in an inexorable armada. The light from their flaming faces spread out to fill all available space. They let out something like the moans they usually let out in the face of death. They moved straight towards the walls of the city, ready to raise it to the ground. And now it's up to the inhabitants to make sure the fortress stays standing or collapses. They would be there in about two days. Ash thought about it. The situation was not good. The enemy was advancing. They had not much time left. They needed to concentrate all their forces and start working hard. His comrades stood in front of him. And on their faces, you could understand that they were in complete shock. This was a big surprise to them. Lucas was the only one with a completely calm expression. The knight looked at his lord and asked in a concerned voice what they should do. The forces to defend the city. He folded his hands in front of him and looked at his team carefully. The man urged them to listen carefully. Their future lives depended on what he was about to say. The state apartments were buzzing with activity. The team was figuring out how they would deal with the oncoming horde of monsters when they were about to be at the gates of their castle. It was necessary to gather all their strength to concentrate and fight back. Lucas was announced as the commander, as he was the most suitable for this role, had combat experience, and had excellent fighting skills. In addition, it was the only person he could fully trust. Ash said that the soldiers would make mistakes, so Lucas would have to lead them and guide them to the proper path. Lucas nodded his head in acknowledgement. He would do exactly as he was ordered. After all, it was his duty to the state. The bespectacled man stood with Ash and looked ahead carefully. Lily coughed and timidly began to speak. She realized that there was little she could do to help now. Looking at her leader, she smiled guiltily, and said that as he could see, she wasn't really able to help the army right now. However, the guy was not embarrassed. He was sorry but they needed her now more than ever. The guy reassured her by saying that she wouldn't be standing at the front, much less on the front lines. So nothing to worry about. Then she would have a slightly different assignment. The girl missed her eyes. She was in charge of the water artifact, 
It was an equally important position, for the outcome of the victory depended on this artifact. It was one of the most important parts of their army. Mentally, the guy apologized to the girl, however. He couldn't dismiss her since she was a civil servant, which meant that she would carry out her service for the rest of her life, no matter what condition she was in. Jupiter took a big puff and asked for permission to ask a question. There was something she wanted to clarify. The woman was only interested in money. She asked about the salary, if she performed well in battle. Could her pay increase? The guy sighed. What a money-crazed grandmother. She only thinks about one thing. By the way, their lives are in danger right now. The thing that makes her crazy is money, especially with gold. She had a passive talent called Gold Rush that couldn't be turned off. What a devil. Just like in the game. The guy slapped his forehead. It made it harder. However, he had no options. He nodded his head. Sure. Depending on the result, how well she performs in battle, the reward would naturally increase proportionately. He answered this without a shadow of doubt in his voice. Every servant had to be valued. The woman smiled and said that in that case he would have to find more money to fully fulfill his promise, since he would have to splurge to pay her salary next year. She was the captain of the special unit. The woman, smiling and holding a cigarette in her hand, continued to speak. Because there was no other mercenary that worked as hard for the money. That money was her only passion and she was willing to sacrifice her life for it. Goggles walked up to Damien and handed him a crossbow. He smiled and said that he had made it especially for him. The weapon was customized. The boy looked at the gift in surprise, and for a few seconds he hesitated to accept it. It was a normal crossbow. It had an average damage, somewhere between 10, 15 damage. It had a durability of, and it didn't have any additional bonuses. However, for a gunslinger, which the boy was, this weapon was perfect. He smiled and proudly said he would do anything. He was with the ceiling at long range. The boy smiled and said he would do anything if it was your highness's order. You could see from his face that the boy was fully prepared to fight, and even give his life if necessary. The player looked at his subordinate. His posture gave away uncertainty. But still he took up the task with unprecedented enthusiasm. Indeed, the boy was fiddling with his crossbow examining every inch of it. He was certainly pleased. Judging by the way he was handling the gun, he was going to be fine. Suddenly the player saw something strange. Where are the glasses? Doesn't he wear them anymore? The guy looked at his comrade in surprise. Damien stopped admiring the weapon and looked at the commander in embarrassment. Yes, he replied, his eyes already seeing perfectly well. The guy, apparently embarrassed by such a question, because he did not really want to reveal all the secrets. Scratching the back of his head, the boy replied that he wore them to make his eyesight worse. Ash was surprised to hear that, and his jaw dropped. How could that be? He doesn't seem to know anything about his team. The boy kept smiling. He said his eyes were needed now, and he wasn't going to wear those glasses anymore. It all looked like mockery. The boy was smiling a big smile and was apparently happy with his skills. The player looked at his team. A good-natured smile showed on his face. He had already gotten attached to them, yes, and besides, it would be a great tool to accomplish his goal. Ader fixed his glasses and cried out. What a relief. He was so worried there'd be someone else wearing glasses. It was like he was mocking everyone. A snide smile stretched across his face. Ash looked at him like he wanted to kill him now. He asked him in a calm but angry voice to be quiet. The bespectacled man immediately followed his order. After discussing the strategy, the south side of the crossroads began to build fortifications. It was necessary to be well prepared in order to meet the enemy with dignity. Everyone worked as hard as they could to reinforce the building as best they could. The head of the Union Plotnikov and Shakhtyorov ran up to the commander and began to shout something across the table. The man stopped and asked how the work was going. Is everything ready? The miner sighed heavily and said it was worse than it could be. There has been no restoration for a long time, and the building has almost collapsed from it. It's too old and dilapidated to withstand this onslaught. It needs more time, or more workers to finish it. Ash fell silent, his gaze becoming angry. Everything was literally falling apart. Here come the first challenges. It turned out that everything was not as rosy as it might seem at first glance. 
The guy looked angrily in the direction of the servant. He approached the bespectacled man and hissed through his teeth. That's how well he knows this building, right? The servant leaned back and continued to listen. Isn't repairing the walls the foundation of the basics? How did he let this happen? It's a collapse after all. However, the servant stammered and began to speak. He said pitifully that they had no money, they could hardly maintain the city, and that the strengthening of any structures was out of the question. The fewer monsters appeared, the fewer stones could be obtained, and hence the income dropped. The previous city lord had cut their budget, and as a result, everything fell into disrepair. Now it's what it is. The boy hit himself on the head. Wasn't this city? This structure was built to contain the monster hordes in the first place? The fort's function has been reduced due to decreased income. Naturally, how could he forget that? Now there's a new problem. How contradictory. On the other hand, it is what it is. He waved his hand and said he didn't care how much money or materials they spent. Let them reinforce and rebuild the wall so it looks like overkill. Is that clear? The guy was determined. He wasn't going to stop. The workers put their hand to their heads and said they would start immediately. The guy waved his hand and told them to start as soon as possible. The monsters wouldn't wait. Then they came to the workshop, where the carpenter was already waiting for them. There were a few dozen more workers fully ready to work. The materials were there, but still in limited quantities. There were boards and building tools. The player asked if they had understood everything. In the next two days, they have to make the walls. The guy said this with pressure, emphasizing the word must. He gave his workers a stern look with his arms crossed over his chest. It seemed that the guy was not going to back down. However, the workers weren't thrilled. They didn't understand how they were supposed to handle this. However, Lord wasn't going to back down. The walls. These are the tall ones, understand. The guy raised his hand up, showing how high the walls should be. The worker looked at him with a look of incomprehension. It was crazy. The man stammered and apologized and began to speak. If he understands everything correctly, these monsters won't be held back by some walls of wood. Does his highness really want to do this? The boy nodded his head. He doesn't need any super strong walls either. The man stood in front of him and blinked his eyes incomprehensively. The king continued. He said he didn't need walls too strong to contain the enemy. The man asked, but what does he need then? Smiling, the lad replied, so those just do what he says. Let them just make wooden walls, that's all he needs. Then he raised his hands up, showing how high they should be. Incredibly high, the guy was emphasizing that. He spread his arms out, showing how wide they should be. He was screaming for them to be incredibly wide. Now he looked like some kind of theater actor. He threw his hands up in the air and shouted that he needed walls. It looked like he was in some kind of play. He stood like that for a few more seconds, all right? The workers stood in front of him, blinking their eyes. One could only hope that they had gotten it right. However, you could tell from their faces that they were a little confused. Of course, anyone would start. If everything was clear, then no comment let them begin. The next two days were spent intensely preparing the army for the upcoming battle. Luca trained his men in formation, telling them the basic aspects of the battle. The gunner practiced marksmanship, though he had no need for it. At this time, Jupiter was just lying under a tree and resting. She was completely confident in her abilities, and that she didn't need the training at all. Lily was training with the alchemist. She needed to learn how to contain her magical power. Time literally flew by. The final day of preparation had arrived. Soon enough, they would have to fight to the death. They had to protect this place no matter what. The building had changed, albeit slightly. But with limited time and resources, they still managed to fortify their structures. Thirty minutes to the start of the battle. The atmosphere was slowly heating up. Everyone could feel the excitement. The moment was the most important. Through the telescope, you could see the forest which stretched for many kilometers in the distance. Somewhere there was a rumbling sound. Something was approaching. Something very big. A whole army that would wipe everything in its path off the face of the earth. Seconds later, an army of ghost knights emerged from the forest. They rode behind their ghostly horses, and a rumbling sound was heard, as if the earth itself began to move. The sight was truly terrifying. A soldier pulled back from his telescope and cried out in horror that he could see the enemy. He had to inform his own. He swung his huge mallet as hard as he could and struck the drum. 
a loud sound heralding the beginning of the battle. They're coming, the man shouted at the top of his voice. A huge army of ghosts was approaching their fort. They merged into one big sea of glowing metallic substance. A couple more minutes and they would be at the very gates of the building. And lo and behold, the countless horde showed up from the depths of the forest. They stood in front of the entrance of the building and awaited the order of their ghost commander. In a few seconds, they were to attack. Even the earth shook beneath their feet. The fort stood unbreakable, however. Everyone inside felt the tension rising with literally every second. Someone missed a small coal to light the torch. Ash's voice echoed throughout the fortress. He tried to cheer up his warriors and said there was nothing to fear. They are well prepared. Experienced fighters who can fight back against this and the wicked. The boy was completely confident in his abilities. He stood on the edge of the building and watched his castle being approached by the relentless monster. He was ready. He had an army, however. It was necessary to calculate his forces soberly, not to lose all of them. He turned to his subjects and said that these ghosts were just a bunch of suckers. The boy wanted to cheer himself up as well. For as sure as he was, there was still a slight uneasiness. Of course he was lying, but he had no other choice. It was necessary to cheer up his subjects. That ghost armor was the worst enemy one could face in the vastness of this game. It wasn't susceptible to physical damage, it was a disembodied shell. However, he continued to lie. He shouted that they were the strongest army of the Southern Empire. A lie again. They are actually just a scattered group of mercenaries made up of retired and novice amateurs. He ordered the preparation of water magic. Huge cannon barrels began to appear, aimed directly at the horde of unclean. The equipment was in perfect condition. It was almost brand new. Once again, it was a lie. No matter how much money was invested, it would never be completely ready. He stood before his subjects and tried to encourage them. The boy shouted that there was no reason to worry. They will stop them. He was lying, but he was still trying to encourage, to convince his army otherwise, and so he shouted at the top of his voice. The two knights prepared a huge cannon, pointing it directly at the approaching fiends. There were, of course, doubts about whether this thing could stop an entire army, but they simply had no choice. They had to group together and act coherently. He had a smile on his face, but naturally it was strained. He needed to cheer everyone up. And then tonight, they would raise their glasses to victory. The guy smiled and was fully prepared, but the question was whether his charges were ready. You could see they were very scared. All it takes on this field is one anxious man to make things go wrong. Huge storm clouds began to gather in the sky. They were gray and heavy. Lightning flashed everywhere, striking the ground. A huge ghostly army was approaching them. The earth trembled under their ghostly hooves. The player stood and watched. A tremendous wind rose up all around. He smiled and said he was leaving it to Lady Jupiter. Half their power depended on this woman alone. She had enough strength to defeat. The woman took a drag on her cigar. Well, let's go. She was looking forward to a good battle, and her eyes lit up with flashes of lightning. Behind her stood several other people. Max Light, for whom he'd paid a lot of money, was on the offensive. Right now, he was hoping this woman wouldn't let him down. The horses roared as fast as they could, the ground flying out from under their hooves. All the monsters had a common goal, to kill all the humans in their path. A woman rode ahead, holding tightly to her horse. She had a cigar in her mouth, unchanged. She once again felt the fervor of battle that she had long forgotten. Now she was once again in command of her troop. A long-forgotten feeling fascinated her. She looked around at the army of monsters and prepared to deliver her crushing blow. A long-forgotten feeling overwhelmed her. The woman was incredibly happy that she would not only be lucky enough to earn money, but also to participate in such an amazing battle. It gave her incredible pleasure. The new recruits, the monsters gradually surrounded them, closing the ring. If there were no obstacles in the way, these monsters would try to get as close to the humans as possible. Behind her galloped several. The monsters began to fall into the traps set in advance before the battle. In other words, it's obvious which way they will move so the traps work perfectly. The woman stopped a few meters away from the army and watched as the ghost knights fell into the abyss one by one. Ash began to command. In a thunderous voice, he ordered her to act now. They didn't have much time to come to their senses, but things were going pretty well as it was. 
The thundercloud began to emit electrical discharges. The woman clenched her hand into a fist, and an energy sphere appeared in her hand. Well, now she was going to make some money. A satisfied smile stretched across her face as she literally anticipated that she was about to make a fortune. The clouds opened and a huge bolt of lightning descended to the ground. The electrical discharge struck several hundred monsters at once, immediately incinerating them. The armor melted from such voltage, and the monsters died one by one. Jupiter stopped at the edge of the cliff and watched the monsters floundering at the bottom of the abyss. She was incredibly pleased with her work. The blow was incredibly powerful and hit exactly on target. The monsters began to rise to their feet. Leaning on their broken armor with eerie groans, the knights began to rise and prepare for another attack. A bright blue light shone through their armor. They were not going to give up. They had no soul. And the goal was only one to kill more people. Jupiter shouted furiously. What is this one not staring at? Let them respect their elders, you fucking freaks. The woman began to concentrate her energy again to deliver another crushing blow. The heavens opened up and a dazzling bolt of lightning burst out from there again. The knights began to fall one by one, struck by the powerful energy discharge. Their bluish glow began to fade, dissipating into the air. The armor fell to the ground with a clatter. Suddenly the guy saw something strange. That pattern. Meticulously, Jupiter. He opened his eyes in surprise. Never before had he seen such power. The woman moved the cigar away from her mouth, and it too lit up with a bright electric light, gradually changing to a bluish glow on the kind that the armor had. She concentrated a bundle of lightning in her hand. Fried armor for dinner tonight. The woman had entered courage and was now ready to destroy everything in her path. Her power could be envied by even the strongest of knights. With a wave of her hand, she launched a bundle of lightning straight at the group of knights. She was now like an electric demon that destroys everything in its path. This was her second skill, repeated blinding. A simply incredible storm of electricity descended upon the knights. They were vaporized one by one. Even their ghost armor couldn't save them from such power. The military stood at the top of the fortress and waved happily. They were in awe of this mercenary's might. It seemed that victory was in their pocket. The player smiled. He himself was pleased with what was happening. This mercenary's first skill was tagging, and the second skill was dealing damage, reaching the tag targets. A wonderful combination. The number of people defeated was growing by the second. He stood at the top and watched as somewhere in the distance Thunder Ricotta now and then flashed lightning. Great Jupiter. The guy mentally thanked the woman, for she had saved many lives. Smoke was flying everywhere. There was a distinct smell of burning in the air. The woman and a few recruits were standing on the edge of the abyss and watching constipated. However, still things were not so simple. Although the enemies were getting fewer, but still there were a thousand of them. The melted armor lay on the ground, but the enemies were approaching with inexorable speed. From afar, they looked like a whole swarm of fireflies. The woman and a few recruits stood in the distance and watched the monsters approach. They were not afraid, however. A decision had to be made quickly. As it was, just now was nothing but a small dent. The monsters were not getting smaller. The guy shouted at the top of his voice for Jupiter to not slowly retreat. There were too many of them. The woman definitely couldn't handle it alone, and even with a group of inexperienced rookies. She heard his order and turning to her own ordered an immediate retreat. There wasn't much time. It was necessary to act instantly. The woman's voice boomed like thunder drowning out the crackle and rumble of battle. They immediately grabbed hold of their horses and rushed with all their might to duck. The knights continued to pursue them for some time longer. They ran after them, at the speed of the horses galloping gallop. The knights ran as hard as they could. They did not tire, for they were long dead a second more, and it seemed they would catch up with the hapless warriors. Jupiter shouted to her subordinates to run faster. There was no looking back. They needed to get to the fortress as soon as possible. They were relatively safe there. From afar, five horses could be seen running away from simply countless knights. The sight was truly terrifying. A second more, and it seemed they would be caught in a ring. Then they'd never get out. Everything is going according to plan. The player was watching from above. He turned to the others and shouted for them to do as he said. Everybody get ready. His voice was so loud it drowned out everything around him. 
One of the new recruits looked back frightened. He saw several knights were almost beside him and were already pulling their iron hands towards him. The boy went cold with fear and almost let go of his weapon. Ash gritted his teeth and watched everything that was happening. He was very afraid, just a little more. Just a little bit more. The boy was counting the seconds for his army to return home safely. Jupiter shouted at the top of her voice for everyone to move faster. Faster to the gate. The woman was at the peak of her powers, heart pounding at breakneck speed. A small recruit who looked to be about 15 years old and was trying his best to run. He nodded his head and in a stammering voice agreed. The boy was very scared, but to the best of his ability, he fought the incoming fear. Everyone else also ran home as hard as they could. The horses were exhausted, but the riders whipped them harder and harder. The gate was quite close now, only a few hundred meters to go and they would be safe. The column approached the entrance and ran after them. The clinking of their heavy armor could be heard everywhere. Only a few meters remained. The player victoriously raised his fist upwards. It worked. Well done, Jupiter. Everything was going according to his plan. Only a few moments remained. Those very wooden walls stood around. They formed something like a semicircle with themselves, surrounding the knights. The monsters slowed down and began to look around in surprise at their empty armor. It was the first time they had ever been in such a position. The whole army had stopped and now stood in front of the wooden barriers. In principle, they could have easily destroyed them. But for some reason, they stood like a stumbling block. The guy stood victoriously on top and watched the bewildered knights stand there doing nothing. Now it's their turn. They will either destroy or do something else. However, the knights stood motionless. They were like statues frozen. It seemed like it was the first time they were in such a position. An entire army stood motionless, even though they were in front of wooden walls that they could easily destroy with a single blow. Jupiter looked back in surprise. The woman slowed down a bit and turned around. What is he asking, though? It's all so obvious. The riders moved quickly towards the entrance of the fortress. The knights rushed after them, along the corridor formed by the wooden walls. The huge army had narrowed its range of action and now moved in columns. Of course they did. Stupid bastards. These armor had no brains and could not think clearly but simply followed their monstrous instincts. If the guys had completely blocked their way, these knights would have easily destroyed the walls. And now they have to crowd into a small passageway to get through. The guy raised his hand and waved, ordering them to prepare for a volley. Now the most favorable position for them. The knights were piled up. All that was left was to destroy them with one aimed shot. The rows of monsters were getting tighter. They were losing their guard. They were turning their heads in different directions, trying to squeeze forward. But they were having a hard time doing so, making them a vulnerable target. The player stood in front and watched the battlefield. He shouted. They had waited so long for this. The guy was shaking with anticipation. The moment of truth was about to come. He waved his hand and ordered everyone to open fire. Do not save any shells. The guy smiled. Everything was going exactly according to his plan. As soon as he gave the order, there was a deafening roar. All the guns started firing. The fortress began its defense. The rumble was such that one had to cover one's ears to avoid going deaf. The knights lifted their heads up. They saw a whole rain of fireballs flying at them. These cannonballs would destroy them in one blow. The knights who had piled up were now unable to move out of the line of attack. They only had to humbly await their deaths. The cannonball hit exactly in the armor. They caught fire like a torch. The knight's soul was scorched to the ground. They scattered one by one. An entire rain of fire rained down on them, sizzling them one by one. Everything was incredibly convenient. This was the foundation of the fundamentals of defensive play. One had to lure the opponent into an awkward position and then strike. The knights were flying in different directions, and there was an incredible noise all around. The ghosts vaporized under the onslaught of the rain of fire. They were literally burned out. Their army was powerless in the face of the threat. No matter how many of them there were, the rain of fire sizzled their countless army by the hundreds, even thousands. This was a true death zone. Being in this position, the knights were practically useless. No matter how many there were, they wouldn't be able to break through any further as they would immediately meet the rain of fire. It was necessary to control this crowd to manipulate them into the most uncomfortable position. The player shouted for no one to stop and kept firing. 
It was now necessary to increase the tempo of fire to burn these bastards to the ground. This was the only way they would be able to gain victory. Demian stood beside him and watched the scene. Even their observation deck was reached by the sparks that were spreading all over the place. It was incredibly hot, as if someone had lit a huge bonfire. The boy looked down in surprise and noticed that the monsters were not even able to overcome this point. They were stuck in place and were now just dying under the hail. He asked in a stammering voice, If this continues and continues, won't it be enough? Everything around them continued to rumble, shells raining down from the sky like rain, sizzling the undead army. Ash looked down carefully. No, it's not over yet. The knights are getting closer. There are more of them. We can't slow down if they want to win. We have to destroy them completely. However, something has changed. The empty faces of the knights once again glowed with a bluish glow, and they began to put their shields forward to defend themselves from the impending threat. After a while, they had built a kind of shell that even burning shells could not penetrate. Now they increased their defenses and kept moving forward as well. Now this rain of fire was nothing to them. They moved forward like a living tank. Putting their shields forward, they ignored absolutely all the shots. The guy looked at them with a fierce look. No, they wouldn't end up like that. They're just tough bastards. He realized that this battle was in danger of dragging on, and they should build up the tempo. His face was smiling despite the fact that the situation was escalating by the second. Everything possible had to be done to finally end this. He shouted for Lily to activate it. This might be their last hope. The girl screamed that she would activate the gravity field artifact right now. She gathered all her power and began to transfer it into the stone. The alchemists sitting next to her began to apply the spell. Soon a dark purple sphere formed near them. The surroundings began to breathe heavily. Gravity changed slightly. The artifact is activating. Countless numbers of approaching monsters were reflected in this sphere. Something changed now. The knight spared a move and was already moving with difficulty. The gravity artifact was in full effect now, the knight's movement was hindered. As soon as this happened, the player ordered the bow to judge. Now it all just depended on how long they could hold out. They needed a lightning strike to finally finish them off. Lucas heard his master's orders and ordered his underlings to get ready immediately. It was their finest hour. They had to finish these things off. Several soldiers took a huge crossbow outside and began loading it with arrows. There were several of these crossbows out there. All the weapons were aimed specifically at the horde of these monsters. Now in a few seconds they would fire a volley, and this would be the decisive battle. Lucas raised up his shining sword which gleamed its blade in the sun. He ordered them to aim for their soul cores. A few more seconds and he would give the order. The man waved his sword ordering the military to open fire with all guns. The man's voice sounded like thunder, drowning out even the rumble of battle. The soldiers fired. An entire arrow flew straight into the horde of monsters. They aimed perfectly, and each arrow reached its target, piercing the core of each knight. Even though the armor was quite strong, the huge hard arrows easily pierced through it. The knights began to fall one by one once a knight's chest was pierced through. They became completely helpless. The arrow hit exactly the target, piercing through their core, thus taking away their lives. After that, the knight would become just a helpless puppet. The player was watching from the sidelines. We need to increase the damage done by crossfire. Let them finish them off with artifact and ballistae. That way they can win. All right, everything's going according to plan. However, a soldier appeared from somewhere and shouted in a worried and frightened voice that the monsters had started to go around the walls. It was a real shock. The monsters had gotten smarter. They realized that they could go around, and now countless of them rushed straight towards the castle gates. They were moving with incredible speed again. The guy clenched his teeth with rage. He had, of course, assumed that such a thing could happen. But there were more monsters than he had expected. There were too many of them. He needed to act instantly. He bent down and turned to Lady Jupiter, who was already standing with her troop at the castle gates. The woman decided to take a little break. The player shouted for her to get ready for battle. The monsters are advancing from the right side. Let her drive them away using the tactic of hit and run. The guy shouted this so that the woman could hear it through the rumble of battle. She only did it for the money. All she cared about was the reward for the work she did. She wasn't even afraid of death, for money was worth more to her than her own life. 
With a swing of the reins, she whipped her horse and it moved forward with a fierce determination. Now it was up to her to distract the horde. The knights ran straight at her, blue fire streaming through their armor. One of the knights thrust his sword forward ready to pierce his enemies. The sight of him was terrifying. Jupiter concentrated the unbelievable power of lightning. The woman swung her arm and prepared to knock out those freaks with a single blow. A smile stretched across her face as she anticipated her reward. Ash looked in the direction where thunderclaps could be heard and bursts of lightning could be seen. Great. She's doing well with the block that is the side. Now gotta deal with the armor on the other side. He turned around and addressed the gunner. He said it was his turn. The boy looked at him fearfully and even a little taken aback by this. He waved his hand to the side and ordered him to shoot off the monsters that were advancing on the left. Indeed, there were just as many. A huge armada was moving straight towards the fortress. The boy sighed and put a hand to his chest. Now it was his finest hour. He must give his best to avenge his comrade. The boy even held his breath. Everything seemed to slow down for him. He felt nothing but concentration. His eyes lit up and the energy overflowing his body seemed to transfer to his weapon. The arrow glowed with a bright light. The boy took aim using all his strength. After a second, he pulled the trigger. There was a click and the arrow flew out of the weapon with a phenomenal speed and sound waves flew in different directions. The boy was barely able to stay on his feet. The arrow flew precisely at the target. He didn't even need to aim, his skill was so powerful. Another second and there was a whistling sound. The arrow was coming right at one of the knights. It flew right into the target, striking the heart of that horrible creature. The knight roared and fell from his feet. A second later, his armor began to disintegrate and fell to the ground with a loud clang. The target was hit with a single shot. A smile told the boy that he had finally hit it. He was pleased with himself and behind him stood a few guards who opened their mouths in amazement to watch. It was the first time they had ever seen such marksmanship. Ash stretched out in a smile. There he was, a sight from a thousand miles away. To think that with them one could pierce the soul core with an ordinary arrow. How cheating this skill was. The guy didn't know where to put himself out of happiness. Victory was already in their pocket. The archer took aim once more to strike the heart of yet another spawn. Kill box in the center. All that was left was to hit the enemies. In the middle was a sphere that immobilized the army of enemies. All that was left was to deliver pinpoint strikes. Jupiter was on the right. The woman defending the flank, weeding out the monster hordes with her spells. She had no trouble dispatching the undead hordes with just one strike. The gunner on the left, he hits the enemies with a single shot. All flanks are protected. That's just great. At this rate, it won't be difficult for them to win this war. The player smiled. The number of defeated was approaching K just a little more. And they would wipe out this entire army. At this rate, there shouldn't be any difficulty until the boss reveals himself. It was good to see that their preparations had paid off. However, suddenly he saw something strange. One of the defeated knights began to glow. It was as if his ghost soul was leaving his armor and rushing upwards. The same thing happened to the rest of the knights. Hundreds, thousands of little souls were flying out of their armor and rushing forward somewhere up into the heavens. There they gathered into a huge sphere of bluish light. It was the concentration of all the power of the ghost armor. What the hell is this? There was nothing like this in the game. The guy lifted his head up and looked up there fearfully. Something incredible was going on there. The number of defeated knights had reached 500 after all. And as soon as the counter reached that number, the whirlpool of blue light above began to move in a circle. And a face began to appear there. After a second, the guy saw a demonic face appear in that circle of light. There were glowing eyes, and the mouth was stretching in a monstrous smile. He felt a vibration that spread more and more. The boy clenched his teeth. Goosebumps ran down his back. Is that the boss? He had never seen such a thing before. How was he even going to fight it? Indeed, it was the boss of the Living Armor Army. A ghost knight. He had a 25th level, far higher than he could defeat. The ghost knight began to form its body, gradually descending lower to its victims. It was this creature that gave the strength of the Legion. The Legion is basically strong on its own. But even after defeating it, the players still have another boss waiting for them. But they only finished off one half. Why did that asshole show up so soon? The knight hasn't put up any resistance so far. He just hovered in the air and looked at what was happening with his ghostly eyes. 
He was not resisting, not reinforcing his knights, not attacking. He just hung in the air and stared. This whole thing was getting weirder and weirder. However, this isn't just a game, it's freaking real. The guards were horrified. It was the first time they had ever seen something so horrible. Even people who had gone through the war were shaking with fear. What the hell is this? The mere appearance of a huge monster in the sky caused the soldiers to panic. They didn't know what to do. Their morale plummeted in every second. The player looked at them and cursed to himself. What a devil. At this rate, they would just lose any fighting spirit. That's the difference between the warfare people are used to and the and that goes against monsters. It is the latter that awakens the supernatural fear that sits deep in the bowels of the human soul. Fear of supernatural ugliness that is beyond human comprehension. The appearance of this monster terrifies the soldiers. The guy looked at the terrified guards who froze in horror. It was as if he was bringing the remnants of the army to their knees. Moreover, it wasn't only the people who came to be terrified. The horses, too, refused to go forward. They reared up and threw their riders to the ground. The beasts were no less afraid than the men. Jupiter could hardly stay in the saddle. She clung to her horse as if it had gone mad. She tried to throw the woman to the ground and run away. The situation was getting worse by the second. The woman struggled to stay in the saddle, but the horse seemed to go crazy. It was jumping from side to side and the rider was about to fly off the horse to the ground, and so it happened. After a few seconds, the woman still couldn't hold on to the saddle and promptly flopped on her back on the hard ground. She groaned and realized she was in great danger. The knights were coming closer and closer to her with each passing second. Only a few meters away, she could already see their glowing faces. She was bleeding. She had hit her head hard during the fall. A whistling sound came out of her mouth. She tried to get up, but her body didn't seem to listen. The woman was already mentally aware that she would soon be finished. The player saw it all. He clenched his teeth and realized that one of the fighters was going to die. No. The bastards rushed forward. The army of those bastards was coming faster and faster. The woman seemed to have lost consciousness and was now lying completely helpless. At this time, the hordes of those walking armor were approaching her. They were already fleeing with their weapons forward ready to deal with her. Suddenly she was surrounded by her subordinates. Holy shit! We have to protect the wizard. They stood in a semicircle and prepared to fight back. They needed to protect their commander, as Jupiter was one of the most valuable members of the team. Ash came to be horrified. Jupiter was, after all, the key figure in the first location. Now her team was in danger. He realized that just seconds more and they would lose their most valuable player. Lucas shouted that they should deploy cannons and artillery to help Jupiter's squad. It was already obvious, however, the situation was escalating with every second. Ash shouted that there was no way they could do that. If they withdrew their weapons and the kill box got smaller, more enemies would just hour through the walls. There would be more of them, and then they would definitely fail. Lucas wanted to object to something, but the leader stopped him with a gesture. The soldiers were panicked by the appearance of the huge boss. The huge face with a nightmarish grin looked down at them from the sky, obscuring almost all the space with its body. Even the sun had stopped shining. The cannons and ballistas stopped firing. The situation was getting worse by the second. The already poor defenses weakened instantly. The troops began to break forward. One more second and they would definitely be close to the castle. He looked at Lucas and ordered him to concentrate on rebuilding the kill box. All the soldiers have gone crazy. Lucas hesitantly replied that he understood and immediately took command. The soldiers were grabbing their heads. They were possessed by madness. They did not know what to do next, for now their lives were on the line. The player looked at the right flank and mentally apologized to Jupiter. She had to get through this somehow. They were in a bad situation right now. The woman opened her eyes quickly. Her eyes were bloodshot and her head hurt, literally splitting apart. Adrenaline raged in her blood, giving her strength. She grabbed her head, which appeared to be about to explode with pain. The woman tried her best to regain consciousness, a strangled groan escaping her throat. She was still alive. But how? She looked down at her bloody hand with a blurry look. What the hell is she doing at her age? It was as if the woman realized she was on the verge of death. She began to realize that now was not the best time to be a hero. She looked around with a blurry gaze and saw the vague silhouette of a man. His voice was heard as if from far away. 
He was screaming for her to finally wake up. Could she hear him? His face was concerned, terror glistening on it. It was clear from it that the situation was worse than ever. They have to go, oh for fuck's sake. The woman finally, finally came to her senses and looked around. She saw the new recruits bravely fighting the ghosts. They fought to the last man, even though the forces were not equal. In front of her stood the man with the head. She started to come to her senses and got to her feet. Losing her head, she said that they were in a really fucked up situation right now. Looks like she doesn't have time to lie on earth. She has to make a decision right away. The man yelled out that the rescue team would be here soon. They just need to hold out until a certain time. His face was furious. A battle was brewing. The ghost knight swung his long spear and pointed the full power straight at the man, who hesitated not to notice the attack. However, he still managed to react in time and swung his weighty mace, bringing the full force of his blow down on the armor. There was a clang of metal. The knight staggered. His armor was damaged, but he did not fall. Dust began to kick up from beneath his feet. The knight was still on his feet. His ghostly body took no damage. It hissed and began approaching directly towards the defenseless man again. The man stared and didn't notice the knight was still standing on his feet. Though he was struck, his ghostly body remained standing in the same pose. It didn't seem to have done him any harm. His ghostly face was still glowing with a bluish light. With his gaze, he looked forward. What the fuck? Why the fuck is he still standing? He had hit him as hard as he could. The man didn't understand. He couldn't even move this knight with his normal attacks. He was like a wall. Jupiter saw everything. She saw the mortal danger coming right towards the recruit. The woman wanted to warn him. She even opened her mouth to scream, but she didn't have time. The phantom knight was moving too fast to react. She wanted to warn her recruit, but immediately saw a sharp bayonet pierce the man's chest. A stream of blood spurted from his mouth. He was still alive. His eyes rolled back and a scream came from his mouth. His eyes bloodshot, he shifted his gaze to the direction he was being attacked from. His chest was tearing with pain, but he was still on his feet. Behind him? He was sure he had finished off everyone in the vicinity. The man turned his head back and saw the ghost knight's upper half body holding the spear that had pierced through him. That thing was still alive. The man stared and didn't notice the two men charging at him, swinging their sharp swords to finally finish him off. Naturally, he couldn't do anything. There was a wet crunch of tearing flesh. The knights hit their target precisely and began to pierce him with their spears. Jupiter stood a short distance away and naturally gritted her teeth watching her recruit flounder helplessly in his own blood. The woman went into a rage. She was going to deep fry those things. Her eye began to glow with the same blue energy. The bodies began to overflow with electrical power. She wanted to cast a spell, but something was wrong. Her hand wasn't obeying. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get the electric discharge to appear. Her arm was throbbing in a lot of pain, and she couldn't cast her spell. It looked like the blow had been quite strong, and now she had lost her power. The girl on the recruit was completely surrounded by the knights, who were already grabbing her arms, pulling her towards them. The woman shouted for everyone to retreat. She had already resigned herself to the fact that she was going to be finished. The knights were closing in, already pointing their spears at her. A final death rattle was heard. The woman found herself pierced by multiple spears. She died instantly, blood pouring from her mouth. In the middle of the battlefield stood a beaver who could not recover from such a shock. Goosebumps were running down his back, and he felt death approaching him inexorably. He squinted to get a better look, and from what he saw, his heart stopped for a second. As soon as he came to his senses, he immediately released the shield from his hands and ran in the opposite direction, shouting for help. The man went mad. One of the knights, however, was still alive. He swung his spear and the tip gleamed in the sun. He swung his spear straight at the fleeing victim. Though he was without his lower half, he was still alive. The spear flew a few dozen meters to its target and pierced the poor man as he ran. A pop was heard, and he immediately fell to the floor. The spear had penetrated through the vital organs. Jupiter looked on as the poor guy's lifeless body fell to the ground with a loud thud. The tiny line of defense consisting of only a few people was destroyed in an instant. Jupiter smelled the scent of the living armor in front of her for a second. She could feel that cold breath of death approaching her with inexorable speed. The woman knew that now her death hour was coming. 
The stench of rusted armor and blooming water. It literally sent chills down her spine. It was the smell of drowned men. The knights became enraged and immediately lunged at their prey. Their armor glowed with a blue glow and now they were ready to tear her in half. The woman gathered all her strength into a fist and electric shocks began to form in her hand. She was able to control herself. She gritted her teeth and said that those things would be better off staying at the bottom of the lake and continuing to rot there. The woman went into a rage. It was as if she had gained her last strength, her second breath. Why can't they just let the old granny earn some easy money begging sign? Her whole body was covered in electric shocks. The woman was like a beast. She released a powerful discharge of electricity, which reached its target in a split second. A crackling sound was heard. The electricity struck the armor, and the ghosts started squirming into fire, and in a second there was no trace of this hulk of knights left. Only on the floor lay the burnt armor, which still emanated the vile smell of rotting water. The woman breathed heavily and looked around. This blow was a weak point, even less than a quarter of what she could when she was in good condition. It was definitely not what she had expected. She saw through the fog, dozens of silhouettes of knights approaching her in the distance, glowing in the darkness. Parting with her life was something she really didn't want to do since she hadn't had time to get rich yet. Too bad. Suddenly she saw a little guy who was among her brigade. She shouted for him to get out quickly. The kid looked at her with a surprised look. The woman kept yelling. She said at least one of them must survive. Her face was overflowing with fury. She shouted that she would buy him some time, so let him run show. Drops of blood were streaming down her face, and her body was overflowing with burning fury. The guy screamed that he couldn't do it. Staying this is the best option. She's a mage. Although the guy was scared, however, he didn't plan to back down. The woman stared at him with an uncomprehending look. What does he mean? The guy put his spear forward and said that this is the first rule of mercenary survival. Stay close to the mage. He looked ahead at the approaching horde of evil. The boy said he had a much better chance of survival if he stayed with it, than running away without even having a horse. And Jupiter looked at the little guy in surprise. His strategy was effective, even though he was rather small. He thrust his spear forward to impale one of the approaching knights. The sound of metal was heard. The blade didn't stick in. The armor was too strong. He didn't kill the knights. He pushed them farther away, and it worked. The knights would fall to the ground and remain harmless for a short time. Looking at the woman with mad eyes, he said he would hold them off as long as possible, by any means necessary. While she prepares for the next spell, Damien held tightly to his crossbow and fired it over and over again, hitting the target. He was providing support from within the castle walls. He was working like artillery. Thanks to his skill, he hit the exact target every time. The kid bravely fought a horde of knights, swinging his spear and pushing them away every time. But it was enough to stop all the enemies. 262 Jupiter charged her spell, her hand once again glowing with a blue electric light. A crackling sound was heard. A couple more seconds and she would use her spell. By the time she was able to gather enough energy to create lightning, it worked. However, the boy who was protecting her was still pierced by the spears. He didn't have time to react, and now he died instantly. Blood spurted from his mouth. His eyes rolled back, and now his life was leaving his body. Jupiter screamed in rage, and gathering all her strength, charged a powerful e-discharge of electricity directly into the crowd of these bastards. There was a tremendous explosion. The lightning was so strong that as soon as it touched the armor, it immediately sizzled them. There was a rumble that could be compared to an earthquake. The woman stood in front of the body of the dead boy, who, at the cost of his life, had allowed her to gain a few seconds. There was only one question on her mind. Would she have been able to save him if she had gathered enough energy a couple seconds earlier? The kid who was protecting her was still barely alive. He was breathing heavily, blood gushing out of his mouth. Tears came to his eyes. He realized he was no longer alive, but he was desperately trying to grasp at the last threads of life. She was too old to take death personally. She looked at the dying boy and spoke to him in an emotionless voice. The woman asked, What is the first rule of mercenary survival? The dying boy looked at her through his tears. The life had almost left his body, but somehow he was still holding on. He said through tears and wheezing that the first rule was not to take a job that paid a suspiciously large amount of money. 
His voice was already starting to get weaker every second. The woman had to listen to hear what he was saying. The boy wheezed, the life almost leaving him. His eyes began to roll back. Consciousness was leaving his head. He hated to die terribly. The woman looked at the crowd of approaching knights. She sighed heavily and said that everything was wrong. All of his rules for survival are wrong. He can't succeed as a mercenary if he follows them. She clenched her fist, which began to fill with electricity, crackling everywhere. He can't be rich if he wants glory. The woman roared like a wounded beast. She immediately rushed into the thick of things, thrusting her electricity-charged fist forward. Now her entire body was literally bursting with sparks. She flew into the thick of things and said that to be rich, you have to take the most dangerous jobs that pay a hell of a lot. The thick of it. She charged her fist with such force that it lashed out with a deafening arrow that pierced several hundred knights at once. She shouted for the one to stay as far away from the mages as possible. The boy frightened asked, why? The woman looked up at him, breathing heavily. She was holding on to her wounded arm, which was still vibrating from the overflowing energy. She replied that it was only because the mages would take full responsibility. If he wanted to survive, he should never have become a mercenary. She pulled a long cigar out of her pocket as usual and stuffed it in her mouth. She breathed heavily and tried to come to her senses. The woman had expended too much energy. So much that she didn't even have the energy to light a cigarette. That's a shame. She stood motionless and watched another pile of those living armors bearing down on her. She thought life would be easier once she got her high paycheck. Funny thing is, everything she knew seemed wrong. She was wrong in her conclusions. Turns out this is how her life would end. Here on the battlefield, she's bayoneted by hundreds of knights. The woman grinned and boldly looked into the eyes of impending death. She still held the cigarette in her mouth, the tart taste of it spreading across her mouth. Suddenly, she heard Lucas's voice behind her, and also the clatter of his horse's hooves. He yelled for the woman not to move. The man was already flying straight towards her, thrusting his glowing sword straight ahead. He jumped incredibly high and rushed into the thick of the battle. The man threw the knights around like tin cans. Jupiter. Was surprised, she opened her eyes and watched the man massacre the undead one by one. She certainly didn't expect anyone to come to her aid now. Lucas looked at her with serious blue eyes. The man had arrived just in time and was now raring to fight. Into the haze, he wasn't going to stop. It was just beginning. The events were moved from a few hours back to the fortress. The player ordered everyone to focus on rebuilding the kill box. All the soldiers went crazy. That's right. Complete madness reigned here. The soldiers were grabbing their heads and screaming in terror. Mentally, the guy apologized to Jupiter, but she would have to wait a little longer. Right now, it was much more important to hold the defenses of the building. The guy ran up to one of the soldiers and gave him a hard kick in the back. Anu, come to your senses, he shouted. The soldier woke up and immediately forgot about his fear. The guy shouted, were they really scared by the sheer size of the monster? What an embarrassment. His indomitable commander skill activated. The guy was unlike himself. It worked. His fighting spirit was transmitted to the soldier and he shouted his battle cry. No fear. And his eyes lit up and he immediately rushed into battle. The guy was even a little taken aback by this. What's gotten into him? Did his speech have such an effect on the soldier's spirits? On the other hand, it was a good thing. He looked at his hand, which suddenly began to glow yellow for some reason. He had a hunch about it. Could it be his skill working like that? Yes, it was. Unshortened commander provides all soldiers within a ten-meter radius with immunity to mental defeat. The guy pulled himself together and started commanding. Lucas, he shouted, calling the soldier to him. The man turned to him and looked surprised. The player shouted that he would calm the soldier down and will restore the kickboxing so Lucas has something to do. With the knight at this time stood near one of the soldiers and tried unsuccessfully to bring him to his senses, the player said that Lucas should do a rescue mission at this time. He will lead the rescue team. Let him open the gate and rescue the Jupiter squad. Let him go into the valley of death and save a comrade. It was an incredibly stupid order. However, there was no choice. Lucas looked at him with serious, clear blue eyes. He, despite all his orders, he strictly obeyed his master. He said he would return as soon as possible. He didn't even hesitate, just silently agreed. 
The knight immediately disappeared, and after a few minutes, the player saw him galloping to the aid of the squad. At this point, he thought that he trusted Lucas the most, as this man always listens to all his orders. Then he quickly began to command the others and bring the rest of the soldiers to their senses. Come to your senses, you assholes. The soldiers began to wake up from their sleep and realize what was happening. Lucas flew forward with his sword straight into the mouth of the enemy. His eyes blazed with rage. He was ready to tear anyone who got in his way. He burst into the center of the battle and began to scatter the knights like toys. Metal rattled everywhere. The knights disintegrated like tin cans under Lucas's onslaught. Jupiter was in a bit of shock. She opened her eyes to watch him scatter everyone around her. The woman was stunned for a second. Her cigar even flew out of her mouth. Her only eye went wide. She couldn't believe someone had come to her rescue. Lucas looked at her with clear eyes, letting her know that there was nothing to worry about anymore. He wouldn't leave her in trouble. The man yelled for her to hold on tight. Before she could even realize it, the man's strong hand grabbed her by the scruff of the neck and lifted her up in one deft motion. The woman didn't even have time to realize anything. Only a shriek escaped her mouth. A few seconds later, she was already sitting on the horse. Lucas kicked his legs against the horse's sides and ordered it to move forward. The horse shrieked and dismounted. They began to move away from the huge horde of knights with great speed. The uncleanness continued to pursue them. The clinking of their armor could be heard everywhere. They were fleeing Iso all their legs to finally catch up with the fugitives. One of the knights let out something like a roar. He opened his armor and blue flames burst forth from it. They ran right behind them, throwing their long spears forward in an attempt to still hit their target. Several bayonets flew forward with a whoosh cutting through the air. Their sharp tips were pointed straight at the fugitives. By seconds more and they would simply be pierced through. Lucas reacted in time, and at the last moment with a deft kick of the ball reflected. Jupiter sitting next to me almost died of fear. She did not expect that someone could have such abilities. As soon as the man did so, he immediately turned away and began to lead the horse on. Jupiter turned to him. The man raised an eyebrow in surprise and asked what was wrong. The woman looked at him with a stern look and asked if he wanted her to introduce him to her granddaughter. She's a lovely girl. And what is this old woman up to? Lucas looked at her with a surprised yet annoyed look. That's the last thing we need to talk about during a fight. The man said that if she had time and energy for jokes, she'd better use it to restore her magic. There's still plenty of monsters out there. The woman laughed, smiled. She looked at the knight. With his master, he was nice and here something was different. But when the prince is not around, he becomes colder than ice. They carried on anyway, she thanked him for saving her. The man nodded, he shouldn't have thanked him. He was just following his leader's orders. Lucas led his horse forward confidently, but his clear face expressed only concentrated anger. He was rigorously following his king's orders. After waiting a bit, he apologized for not arriving sooner to her rescue. The knights at this point were almost recovered and rushed in pursuit of the race of faces. They could not miss such a chance. The woman turned around and looked back where the army was already rampaging. Regret it later after they had dealt with all the monsters. The woman even growled. It had been a long time since the old hag had been so angry. They galloped faster and faster while the huge monster was already towering over the fortress. Wrath came out, she was covered in blood, but it didn't seem to bother her at all. Her eyes glistened with electric shocks. The battle continued. Explosions could be heard everywhere. Thanks to the skill of unshortened Commander Killbox was restored in time. Now, everything was back to normal. Looked out of cover and saw Lucas already returning home. And Jupiter was sitting behind, seemingly unharmed and partially unharmed. However, not all was so rosy. In the heat of battle, he lost four irreplaceable heroes. He was too confident of his combat competence and overestimated himself. In the game, he had to manage a lot of soldiers. There were similar states such as fear and distractedness. But here, the feeling of the soldiers is more diverse and complex. Something had to be done about it. The horse was screaming. It was scared to death, but still kept running forward. There was no way he expected the horses to be so scared. Something had to be done about it. The guy squinted. He needed to consider more variables since this was reality. The flames that spread from behind the artillery cannons were a danger, too. This was one of the results of his lack of caution. Now he had a lot more problems. The flames were rapidly devouring the barrier. 
and God forbid it should spread any further. Killbox is falling apart. That's a problem. At this rate, they won't be able to hold their defenses much longer. The army was coming closer and closer. The fire was covering everything around them. At this rate, the road would be clear for them, and they would be able to reach their camp unhindered. This was already a big problem. The boy gritted his teeth in anger. His whole plan was falling apart in front of his eyes. He couldn't let this happen. It looked like they would have to fight along the fortress wall after all. He wanted to end it all with a single artillery barrage. However, not everything goes according to plan. Fortunately, there weren't many monsters left. All that was left was the final push. The Phantom Knight was only one left. And the number of living armor is only, it's not all that bad. Their goal is definitely doable. Still under his control, even though they have a boss. Just need to build up their strength to finally deal with all these points. Lucas's voice was heard. He was standing upstairs with Jupiter standing next to him. She looked shabby, but she put it down. Lucas reluctantly added the title of this woman's name. Apparently something had happened between them. The man looked troubled by something and even upset. He didn't approve of her because of the reason for his dismissal. But his action was the right thing to do. It was necessary to show respect after all. The player looked at the mercenary and said that he was actually glad she was alive. The woman took a drag on her cigarette and said she was ashamed. The old hag made a lot of mistakes. Died in vain. There was blood running down her arm and dripping on the ground. What a shame. She could not forgive herself for such a lapse. She was ashamed of herself now. The player looked at her and said that she didn't really know that a monster would suddenly appear in the sky. Such moments sometimes happen. Also, she didn't know that the horses would go crazy. It's not her fault. It's not worth killing yourself over. But she was still standing there, staring guiltily in front of her. She was ashamed of her transgression, and she had to make amends, for their lives depended on this battle. The woman clenched her fist. She was angry with herself. Therefore, she would repay the favor. She had a serious look in her eyes. It appeared that she would not back down from her seat now. However, the man told her to focus on her recovery at this point. Her strength would still come in handy. Jupiter didn't give up and said that she would be the one to take that monster's head off. At this moment, the army of walking armor was already approaching the castle gates. Their rumbling could be heard clearly. A battery of guns were firing and the rumbling sound spread throughout the entire county. Ash shouted that the killbox was no longer fulfilling its function and we should cease fire. Everyone agreed. The cannon stopped firing, but smoke was still coming from the red-hot guns. The soldiers looked at the battlefield with frightened looks. They couldn't believe it and couldn't understand what they should do next. Then the player turned to the gunner and ordered him to rest. The boy wanted to object and say that the army was approaching, but the man stopped him. He approached the boy and said that there would be a bigger fish for him. There is one job that only he can handle. The boy looked at him and told him to rest for a while. Let him regain his strength. Damien looked at him and stammered in agreement. The guy hit his crossbow. The enemies had reached the walls of the fortress. The situation was getting more complicated. A huge army began to break the door. They pounded, trying to break the walls, but everything was in vain. So far, the castle walls had withstood the onslaught. Realizing that the walls of the front could not be broken down, they chose another tactic. With their sharp fingers, they began to dig into the wall and try to climb up. One of the knights began to climb the wall, followed by several others. They were climbing up the wall like some kind of spiders. I don't know what they were holding on to. Ash yelled for everyone to get ready for a melee. Now they're going to have a direct confrontation. The guy didn't want to admit it, but still the irreversible was about to happen. The soldiers came to alert and grasped their weapons tightly. Aye, sir, ready for close combat, close combat team forward. The boy commanded, and the knights prepared to defend the fortress. They stood as human shields prepared their weapons each with a huge vam in his hand. The knights were dressed in shining armor battle without magic is based solely on physical strength and endurance. Ash realized that he simply had no other choice. A multitude of emotions were reflected on his face. Anger, rage, and rage. This will be a head-on attack. A multitude of knights lined up in a column and prepared their weapons and moved forward. The ground trembled beneath their feet. Now they had no chance to retreat they would face this foul thing head on. The walking armor climbed up the sheer wall as if they were some kind of spiders. 
It was about to come dangerously close. Now this was the beginning of the real war. The boy looked down and saw a lot of knights climbing up the steep cliff. Now they would have no other choice but to face them. The soldiers went into readiness mode. They watched with fear as the monsters approached them, however. Every one of them was ready to give their lives for the Empire. Rocks were falling from under the knight's fingers, but they stubbornly climbed forward as if there were no obstacles. Ash raised his hand up. There was still a little time left. Just a little more time and it would be time to attack. The guy was waiting for the right moment. He saw the glowing knights coming closer and closer. Their fire was already felt at an extremely close distance. The same foul odor of rot emanated from them. Waiting for the right moment, the boy shouted, ordering his military to begin. Throw those things down. Several soldiers were holding a large barrel of rocks, they shouted, and pushing began to lift the barrel, going to roll the rocks right over the monsters. A second later, a rain of stones poured down through the armor. It was working. The heavy stones threw them down. The monsters flew straight down to the hard ground, where they crumbled into spare parts with a rumble. These are pieces of rocks, steel and other debris left over from the army's fortification. It's working. For a few seconds, they had hope. The armor was fed down. One by one, it fell apart. But after that, somehow magically reassembled again. Many living armor thrown to the ground and it shattered, however. Those that managed to rise again after falling. The boy looked at all this with clenched teeth. What an annoying will to live. Why don't these things die yet? It's simply unbearable. Keeps on climbing despite all this garbage falling on them. Indeed, the armor continued to directly follow its invisible order. The guy ordered the others to knock the armor down with their spears to at least buy some time. It came to him that now it was time to reorganize his team. Guy opened a system window and started typing something. Jupiter would be the main link in this team. We needed to reorganize the team so that their power would increase. Territory defenders, commander, and the team doesn't lose morale. Double magician. Two mages. The attack power of the elements increases by 20%. The guy's eyes even widened at that, no way. 20%? That's just great. The rest of the soldiers continued to fight furiously. One of them had his spear broken. The knight broke the weapon in one powerful move. And now the poor man was left without defense. The enemies are already here. The hideous hand of one emanating in armor appeared on the edge of the roof. It dug its fingers right into the concrete, breaking through it. Several knights had already climbed over the fence and were now heading straight for the others. They clattered their armor and were ready to tear everyone in their path. However, there was an army standing in their way, fully prepared for hand-to-hand -hand combat. The men put their weapons forward, closing their bills. They were fully prepared to fight. The knight opened its maw. Tongues of blue flame began to burst out of it. The sight was truly terrifying. In addition, it started to rain. The boy looked at all this with clenched teeth. From now on, the fight would no longer be one-sided. They would have to fight face to face. Firing at the undead would no longer work. The only question is, will these soldiers be able to handle it? Several knights stood readying their weapons, fully prepared for battle. A bright beam of light pierced the space and shattered the armor of one of the monsters. The light literally came out of nowhere. The flash was so bright that it illuminated the entire space around it. It was as if the entire fortress began to glow. Undoubtedly, it was Lucas, who, like a furious beast, burst into the thick of things, and he swung his huge, weighty sword, cutting down the monsters one by one. The man stood firmly on his feet. Nothing in the world could move him. It was as if he was now in berserk mode, ready to destroy anyone who stood in his way. The man shouted that he would destroy the monsters. He had a look of rage on his face. The task of the others is to stand still and hold them back. The man addressed his subjects, handing out orders to them. The knights stammered as they accepted the order and rushed to carry it out, and not tightly clutching their weapons in their hands, though there was fear in their hearts. But they had no choice. Ash smiled. Yes, that's it. It wasn't about whether they could do it or not. They had to do it. The boy himself had no doubt that they would do his bidding. The soldiers stood in a line and readied their weapons. They let out a battle cry to boost their morale. To survive, everyone must be stronger. They have no choice but to fall, get up again, fight and win. 102 Ash turned to Lily and ordered her to prepare a haste artifact. Haste is an effect that increases a character's movement speed. The girl nodded and immediately prepared to carry out the order. With the help of magical energy, she activated the artifact, which immediately glowed with a bright green light. Activating the artifact at speed, 
Magical energy immediately flowed through the knights' bodies. They felt a sudden surge of strength, and the movement speed of all comrades was increased by 5%. Duration, 5 minutes. Also, they had skills equipped. Main order, attack totem, and defense. All of these will help them win. They will be able to fight in melee without any problems. They immediately rushed forward and started throwing the monsters down. Their strength allowed them to act without any respite. As they threw down the monsters, the knights immediately fell down. The commander looked at them from afar. It was going to take a good effort. If they wanted to win, they had to do their best. He hoped that at least now, he would succeed. The sky slowly began to be covered with leaden clouds. It became much darker. The atmosphere was oppressive, but it did not affect the quality of the battle. The knights fought. They pushed the foul and immediately began to become a human shield. Swinging their weighty clubs, they fought fiercely. Lucas was at the end of his rope, but he did not give up swinging his weighty sword. One more swing, and one walker's armor shattered into pieces. He fought clearly, as if he saw nothing but the target in front of him. Ash watched from the sidelines, and he was filled with excitement. Right now, everything depended solely on the efforts of his team. Lucas's first skill was the iron will kick. The man stood in front of the entire knights, but he didn't flinch. The more enemies he killed, the stronger he became. Lucas had single-handedly dealt with all the enemies. It wasn't any difficulty for him. However, however, it wasn't enough. The guy stood and watched his team fight fiercely, but it still wasn't enough. With renewed vigor, the monsters attacked them. Now they were losing, even though he had used almost everything he had, but it still wasn't enough. One of the sword max and the warrior went down. The poor guy sputtered his blood and immediately fell to his feet. The second soldier shouted that they had many wounded. We must get them on their feet at once. He held his comrade's hands, trying to lift him up. Unlike the living armor, whose numbers only multiplied, the number of wounded on the hero's side only grew. It seemed that hope was lost. Demian shouted that he would return to the front line. However, the guy stopped him with his hand and... That man should save his strength for the boss battle, just like Jupiter. What to do? The guy squinted his eyes and frantically searched for options. They were getting fewer and fewer. Every soldier counted, but the enemies were not getting fewer. There must be a way to reduce the number of casualties. One of the knights was stubbornly defending himself with his shield. However, he was very strong. We had to get rid of the remaining enemies. After a second, a powerful explosion sounded, and a bright column of flame rose into the sky, scattering everyone around in different directions. The guy opened his eyes wide in surprise. He hadn't expected this, but who was it? He had some guesses, but are they already what he was thinking? The flames consumed all living things in its path time after time. It was pure primal fire, destroying everyone. When he looked closer, he saw that Lily was standing there. She was in her wheelchair, flames bursting out of her hands, consuming the enemies one by one. At this moment, the girl was not like herself. There was no trace of the modest and shy girl. Now before the eyes of those present was a warrior, destroying her enemies. Ash, it's like coming to my senses. This is it. She can use magic. The boy shouted. There was hope. The girl turned a surprised and scared look on him. Is he seriously saying that now? She had always been a mage after all. What kind of nonsense is this? Yes, yes, this is awesome. Later on, he will definitely promote her. However, after a while, the girl was almost completely exhausted. She had used too much of her mana. And now there was almost no strength left. Breathing heavily, she begged to be dismissed. The guy grabbed her wheelchair and dragged her forward. He said he would also pay her a hefty bonus. Come on, he smiled. Finally, a way out had been found. However, the girl did not share his enthusiasm. She was saying that she wanted to retire. Her mana had run out. However, her commander was unabashedly, well, one more time. He ran forward and carried the girl who screamed frightenedly but still from his last strength let out a stream of fire forward. In addition, the power of magic has been increased by 25%. That's an amazing result. The primordial fire was scorching everything. The knights fell one by one. It was a true flamethrower. He ran through his fortress and wreathed himself forward. She in turn released pillars of flame. That's it. She can do it one more time. The girl said pitifully. Let him at least address her as a human being. The rest of the knights fought furiously repelling the attacks one by one. So the soldiers held back the enemies with their bodies. 
Lucas was tearing apart the undead with his sword, that's just beautiful. And Lily was burning them to hell with her fire. He opened the girl's mouth and began pouring mana into her, to restore her strength somehow. The girl resisted, but it was all to no avail. Suddenly the soul from the armor began to fly out, turning into a small blue cloud. After that the armor fell to the floor with a clatter, no longer posing any danger. The rest of the army also stopped. Was this really the end? They were breathing heavily, they couldn't believe that they had finally stopped those things. A second later they exploded with a furious scream. They had stopped them, they had done it. The people rejoiced, for the battle was over. However, the commander came up to them and said, No, this is not the end. The people were quiet, what? Is it not over yet? Lucas looked at him with a tired look. He had fought to his limits, and now the man needed rest. Ash looked at them with a serious look and ordered them not to let their guard down. There was still one more, the most important enemy left. The armor that had fallen to the ground began to slowly rise. Something was holding them and pulling them up towards the heavens. There was already that ghost, the knight there. He was pulling all the armor down to him as if he were putting on armor. Now he would enter the battle and who knows if our heroes could defeat him. After a few seconds, his ghostly body was fully clad in armor now. He took on a truly intimidating appearance. The monster had arms and legs. He took on a relatively human appearance. Then a sword materialized in his hand, which also consisted of armor fragments. Two lights flickered in the openings of his helmet, and they were eyes. They looked really terrible. There was no soul there. Just a dark, ghostly light. Now he looked like a real nightmare. He was glowing with fire. His body was completely covered with impenetrable armor, and he held a huge, sharp sword in his hands. The knight swung his sword, and in one fell swoop he landed a few meters away from the fortress. His blow was so strong that it seemed the earth was about to split. Everything shook. People could hardly stand on their feet. They began to run in different directions, trying to save their lives. Damn, this is real. The guy screamed at the top of his lungs. Does this make any sense at all? There's no way that's the boss of the first location. His strength is simply incommensurable. How are they going to defeat him? The knight stood before him in full battle readiness. From beneath his armor came something that sounded like a scream. The scream of a thousand souls. His armor rattled. Flames began to shoot out from underneath. The monster leaned over and looked at his main enemy. He was truly terrifying. Its size was simply enormous. It felt like there was an entire mountain in front of the fortress. Ash shuddered in fear. He was truly scared for his life. Such a monster he had never seen before. Besides, to fight them face to face is pure suicide. However, the guy quickly came to his senses and clenched his hand into a fist. He had no right to make a mistake. It was impossible to step in. The monster must be defeated. He shouted to himself not to dare to be afraid. He is the commander after all. What does it look like? A commander running away from the battlefield. No, he wasn't going to run away. It's only the boss of the first location. He's only level 25. The guy flicked his hand and ordered a strike. The cannons began to roar, expounding flames. The projectiles flew precisely at the target, but they did not do any damage to me. He ordered me to save shells too. Now it was necessary to concentrate all my power on this thing. The knight stood right in front of him. He was completely engulfed in flames. The cannons rumbled. The cannonballs flew straight at the target, but all to no avail. They hit the target, but immediately burst. The knight took no visible damage. He waited patiently. It was a kind of entertainment for him. All all those shots could do was only move the knight back a little. But that was all the guns they had available. He stood like some unbreakable mountain that could not be moved. The boy shouted for no one to stop firing. It was necessary to lead the onslaught. If they recovered, the knight would reach the wall of the fort, and then it would definitely be the end. The monster stood in front of them holding his colossal sword. It was preparing to strike. Just one strike of this huge ball would be able to destroy everything around it. Despite the flames that the knight was engulfed in, he took a step forward. That bastard has a lot of stubbornness. Ash turned to Lily. The girl looked at him in horror, expecting another crazy plan. The drops from the previous potion had not yet dried on her lips, and she could hardly recover. The guy, however, ordered her to activate the third artifact. With a stammering voice, she obeyed. When she touched the artifact, it lit up blue and began to emit magical energy that absorbed everything around it. Multiplier. This is a rank R artifact. 
capable of increasing the effect of a character's magic spells by 100%. This is for Jupiter. The woman felt an incredible burst of energy. Her whole body was overflowing with magic now. All her wounds had healed. She was as good as new. The effect of Jupiter's spells had been increased. The women sighed heavily. Well, wonderful. She felt everything in her body being infused with energy. It was all in her hands now. She was so full of energy that the woman forgot she was even a decade old. Just like in her golden years. A smile stretched across her face. She prepared herself to burn everything around her. The guy pointed straight at the huge knight and ordered her to punch like it was the last time, right into the breastplate. The huge face of the knight was already approaching the castle gate. He was much taller than the tallest tower, and even the explosions couldn't stop him. Jupiter quickly not steps began to approach the edge of the tower. In her hands suddenly glowed electric discharges. The woman was on full alert. I've never felt so good before. Even the sky parted, and a huge lightning bolt appeared there. One more second and a huge explosion would descend from the sky. The woman shouted that no one would compensate them if they were damaged by the lightning. A second later, the heavens opened up, and a tremendous electric discharge fell to the ground. She concentrated all of her power and aimed this strongest strike straight at the night. The woman was at her limit. However, it was only a joy for her. She felt more alive than ever. The night began to melt. Even his armor couldn't withstand such an onslaught. He could feel himself slowly falling apart. After a second, his armor cracked, and a blue orb that glowed brightly appeared outside. It was the soul core, and if hit exactly there, this thing would die. The core was glowing, and it was like there was an entire galaxy. Ash yelled for Damien to start firing immediately. This was the last opportunity. There might not be another one like this. The boy was already on full alert. He stood behind the huge crossbow that had already managed to load a long arrow. Shoot. The command rang out like a thunderbolt of lightning. The boy strained all his vision. This was the best shot of his life. He had to be well prepared. There could be no mistake. His hand yanked the trigger. There was a crunch and now the gun went into action. From such exertion it creaked, but still it released a huge arrow which with monstrous speed began to move towards its target. A split second later, after traveling a great distance, the arrow stabbed straight into the core. A crunch was heard. The air around it became heavy as if imbued with magical energy. Under such an onslaught, the core began to splinter. There were many cracks. The life force began to fade. The night swayed every now and then. The arrow stuck exactly on the target. The core slowly began to collapse. If this shot works, this thing should be dead now. The player was incredibly happy he praised Shooter for a great shot. This guy always had the best shot. He never doubted that the Shooter would hit. The huge knight started to stagger. He lost his balance and was already starting to fall on his back. Just seconds more, and he would die. That's it. One, still at great sacrifice, but they won. However, at the last moment, the guy noticed that something was wrong. Through the armor of the knight showed light on the place where his eyes should have been a torch lit up. The boy was horrified. He didn't want to believe it wasn't enough. They'd used everything they had. Goosebumps ran down the boy's back and he bulged his eyes. The knight began to move, his armor creaking, the sword in his hand rising for another crushing blow. Even that wasn't enough for him. The monster took on a truly terrifying appearance. Fire was spreading everywhere. He swung his huge arm to shatter this entire fortress in one blow. The sight was truly monstrous, the fellow screamed in this cry mingled horror and despair. By sheathing his sword, he would bring down the walls. He shouted, ordering Jupiter to attack immediately. One more strike. The woman was already fully prepared. She was building up her magical energy. Raising her weapon so high, it would be very imprudent. The knight raised the dream sword higher, thus doing the woman a favor. His blade began to become covered in electricity, attracting more and more lightning discharges to it. A grimace of rage reflected on her face. He's just asking her to strike him with lightning. What an idiot. Now she'll have a much easier time hitting that Hulk. The monster has swung around, and in a couple more seconds it will unleash all its monstrous power right on the fortress. However, before he could even make a single swing, lightning began to rain down from the sky. The flaming knight had already suffered tremendous damage. In a split second, the full power of the lightning strike fell on him, and there was an explosion that shook the walls of the fortress. 
This strike contained all of Jupiter's power. There was a deafening explosion, and a huge bolt of lightning immediately aimed at the knight, immediately hitting the target, and the knight's body began to crack at the seams. This kind of tension. The thick armor shell began to evaporate before his eyes. There was a loud roar that came straight from the depths of the armor. However, it was already an irreversible process. The knight was vaporizing before his eyes. He raised his hand with his weighty sword one last time to deliver the final blow. The blade began to slice through the air with a deafening whoosh. A couple more seconds, and the huge weighty sword would come right down on the fortress. Ash came in terror. He shouted for everyone to run away immediately. The guy realized that in a few seconds, if everyone didn't get out of the line of attack, a huge number of casualties just couldn't be avoided. He watched in horror as the huge sword descended at an incredible speed. The soldiers dropped their weapons and began to scatter in different directions. They too saw the huge weapon heading straight for them. The shadow of the sword began to obscure the sun. The guy shouted for them to run away immediately. The soldiers froze in place. Lucas, without wasting a second, immediately rushed towards his master and covered him with his body. The man shouted for the ruler to run away himself. The knight's main task was to protect his lord. After a few seconds, there was a deafening rumble. The sword had reached its target after all. It crashed into the concrete wall with great speed and began to crumble it like a toy. The ground shook under the feet of the soldiers. Cracks crept everywhere. People struggled to stay on their feet. The impact was so strong that it was impossible to stay on their feet. People began to fly in different directions like toy soldiers. The blast wave threw them a great distance away. Frightened screams were heard everywhere, but it was impossible to do anything. After a few minutes, the smoke from the impact began to dissipate, and a horrible picture of destruction appeared before my eyes. Everywhere was the odor of burning powder and iron. Lucas immediately ran up to his master and began to examine him for injuries. The boy sighed and said he'd been hit hard on the back. Otherwise, he's fine. The man was sitting up, trying to regain consciousness. He said, What happened to the wall? Damien and the others were surveying the destruction. There was a distinct look of worry on their faces. They hadn't expected this latest outburst. They were still wary because the night might strike again. The player rose to his feet and began to look around. He saw a huge wreck of a ball that was stuck right in the fortress. The destruction was colossal, yet the fortress had somehow miraculously survived. Stuck right in the wall, and now the boy stood looking at this horrifying sight. The air around him began to vibrate. Something changed. The knight bent over and lowered his head. His eye began to glow with a bluish light again, as if he was preparing for his next attack. But for now, he stood unmoving. A few seconds later, there was a pop. More like an explosion, and now, the knight's heavy armor began to crumble like a toy. His blue soul flew out of the wreckage and flew straight upwards. The knight was defeated. They had finally killed the boss of this location. There was no limit to their joy. The fortress was badly damaged. Its walls cracked from such a powerful blow. And somewhere up there was the huge sword that the knight was holding in his hands. There was a rumble and the armor began to fall to the ground. His ghost soul hissed out of its iron confinement and rushed straight up. Lucas, along with his master, stood above and watched the last remains of the night dissolve into thin air. Lucas ran up to the boy and shouted that it was dangerous here. However, the player waved him off and said it was fine. Nothing to worry about. He recognized the pattern. This is exactly what the outburst of anger that the boss emits in his death throws looks like. He had a premonition of his unnamed death and was trying his last strength to survive. The cloud of his energy began to transform, ghost face peering into it. Distorted fire, her. A demonstration of fear, confusion, and madness. The cloud of many ghostly faces approached the boy, but he stood unmoved. He realized that this attack was not damaging, but could drive an unprepared person insane. The boy stood there, unmoving. His gaze was cold and focused. It was as if none of this was affecting him. He just stood there and watched, like a knight of Korchaf's death throes, and this is where human territory begins. His voice sounded calm as if he was talking to his comrade. Putting his hand forward, the guy began to concentrate his energy in it. He ordered the monster to get out of here. 
His hand glowed with a bright yellow light emitting magical energy. This was the skill indomitable commander. A second later, the sky lit up with a bright flash, and the cloud of monstrous faces began to dissipate. The flash completely vaporized the knight's soul. The air was filled with vibrations. The knight was finally and irrevocably dying. In a second, his body was about to dissolve into thin air under the pressure of the magic sphere. And so it happened, the night did not last. Under such an onslaught, his ghost soul scattered into many shiny shards, which turned into dust and began to fall to the ground where the burned armor already lay. The night was defeated. The rest of the military began to move closer to see where the giant had gone. They couldn't believe their luck. Had they really defeated this thing? Their faces were filled with genuine delight. Where are the ghosts? They moved closer to the edge of the fortress and began to look around. Where are all the other ghosts? They still couldn't understand what had happened to them. Was this the end? Did they really make it? Yes, it was. The night was irrevocably destroyed. The sky began to part, the clouds moved away, and bright sunlight descended on the ground as if to mark victory. An imperial flag rose into the sky and began to develop on the lung. The player raised his fist upwards and shouted that they had finally won. They were able to survive. There was incredible joy in his voice. He was proud of his army, who did not give up, continued to fight and eventually won. Now, they were in no danger. Even though the fortress was very badly damaged, no one cared. Now they were victorious. The huge sword was stuck in the fortress like a ghastly reminder of the horror that was going on here. They must win. They are incredibly resilient, so they must make the most of it. The rest of the soldiers stood moving as well. They still couldn't believe that it was over and they had managed to hold on to victory. A small, still, dim sunlight began to fall on them. Lucas looked at them with a smile. The man was brimming with pride because of the bravery of his soldiers. He had confidence in them to the end, and these men lived up to his expectations. The player watched and saw Lucas's confidence change to the joy of victory. He put his hand up in the air. It was known exactly whether it was due to his skill as an indomitable commander or his ability to push a speech, but it still felt good. He shouted, We must destroy all the monsters. With a confident gaze, he looked over his troops. They must survive at all costs. He saw it all. All he did was shout from the bottom of his heart to cheer up his soldiers. There was a distinct smell of gunpowder, and the battlefield was strewn with corpses and armor fragments. However, the battle was over. Victory was hard, but it had come. The fortress stood an indestructible hulk, though shabby, but still they survived. The location was cleaned up. The guy was rewarded for cleaning up the first stage. He had to check his inventory. An icon popped up in front of him, indicating that he was credited with the reward. The best player in this party was Jupiter, due to the fact that she destroyed the most monsters and did the most damage. The woman received three stars of honor. Soon the day ended, and night descended upon the city. Everyone needed to rest, and after that they went straight to the local tavern to celebrate their victory. Everyone was in high spirits. They were going to have a good rest. Up went the beer glasses. A real festival had begun. A player raised up his glass and began to make a congratulatory speech. He congratulated them on defending the fort from those creeps in armor. The guy was incredibly proud of himself and his army. He looked at everyone with a serious look. Let's raise our mugs to the fact that victory has come. The glasses began to rise. There was noise and cheers everywhere. They had a well-deserved victory. By the incredible efforts of the whole team, they had managed to defeat the undead after all. Now, they had a well-deserved rest. The player stood in front of a group of people who were celebrating. He raised up his beer glass and told them to drink as much as they wanted, and now he was paying for everything. Shouting was heard everywhere. People were incredibly happy. Free booze. There was a clinking of beer glasses. Everyone started clinking and celebrating the victory. People were congratulating each other. They were all incredibly happy and there was a friendly atmosphere all around. The height of the celebration began. Musicians were sitting around playing nice music. Everyone was celebrating, dancing, and having fun. People were in high spirits. Songs, shouting, and drunken noise could be heard everywhere. Soldiers were drinking together with ordinary workers. It seemed to be a real family atmosphere. 
Everyone was laughing, smiling at each other. It seemed that nothing in the world could mar their joy. There was a smell of delicious food around. Somewhere something was frying, boiling. The table was literally bursting with delicious drinks and flavorful food. On the grill was grilled aromatic steak, the smell of which spread throughout the tavern. The aroma made everyone drool, and the place was full of food and drink. People held hands and began to dance. At this celebration of life, everyone was a brother to each other. They all realized that each person's efforts were incredibly valuable in this victory. There was a contest going on all around. One of the men won, and a soldier raised his hand in the air. His opponent rubbed his hand in annoyance and gritted his teeth and looked at his winner. He shouted that it didn't count. The man ran aside and the player looked at all this from the side, and as if glowing with happiness. There was complete peace in his soul. Another round of left hands. The man wanted a rematch after all. The guy was looking at all of this with a kind of warmth that a father usually looks at his children with. There was complete peace in his soul. He didn't feel like saying a word right now, just observing the idea. Joy overflowed his exhausted heart. Suddenly he heard heavy footsteps. Lucas walked up to him and asked him how he was feeling. There was mirth in the knight's voice, and it was obvious he had already gotten quite drunk. Lucas looked at him with a cheerful look and said in a laughing voice that the Lord had not even taken anything in his mouth today. Maybe he should eat. The boy seemed to come out of his daze and nodded his head. Yes, I think he should eat. Luca handed him a mug of beer and the boy looked at the yellow-flavored drink. He grinned and said that the look on his face did not befit a commander who had led his people to victory. The boy was silent for a moment, and indeed there was some uneasiness in his soul. The knight leaned over to him and said that he had succeeded without great loss. Should not that be rejoiced? He thinks the boy should be a little happier. Let him not blame himself for everything. Ash sighed and brought the mug to his face. He immediately smelled the aromatic scent of beer. There was no great loss, but something was still tormenting him. As soon as the guy touched the drink with his lips, he immediately grimaced and spit out the contents, which came out of his mouth in a big fountain. It seems the drink wasn't all that tasty. Lucas immediately asked worriedly, What's wrong? Is he all right? The guy kept spitting up and said he was fine. It was just that the drink was not what he expected. Ash looked at the cup in horror as the viscous substance continued to spit out of his mouth. The drink was incredibly vile and strong tasting. It was at least 40 degrees. It felt like he was drinking vodka. What the hell? This isn't beer. Well, I guess we should celebrate after all. The guy frowned again, true. There were no big losses, but that didn't mean there weren't any. He was still tormented by the fact that he hadn't been able to save more lives. People had died, and it still tormented him. If someone dies, I don't care how much the final casualties amount to. It's a death. The death of a person. It's still a great tragedy, no matter how many. He understood that on the battlefield there's no way without it. But still, it's hard to recover from it. Every life is important, and every person is valuable. Of course, he realized that he would definitely not be able to save everyone playing presumptuously. However, if he'd been a little more careful, the guy seemed to be thinking about something. If he had been a little more careful, even these casualties could have been avoided. He froze in place, and images of the recent battle began to flash before his eyes. The images of the dying soldiers still wouldn't come out of his head. This battle was definitely different from the training. He could change the outcome, but in battle he was not always able to make sound decisions. That was what had led to the loss of human life after all. He remembered himself. At that moment he was confused and tried to control himself. The guy was frozen in some kind of nightmare. He stared at the mug, hesitating to take another sip. He wanted to replay every action he could change. He knew that, and it hurt more. It also hurt that his comrades had died. Lucas sighed and looked at his leader with a glower. And yet he had led them to victory. Had done a fine job. Shouldn't have gotten so killed, that's what he thought. The man tried to cheer up his commander somehow. He was getting discouraged. The fire was crackling in the fire, slowly devouring the charcoal. The knight realized that whatever he said to me, his words will not make the commander disappear. However, his highness should consider what he said. This is a feast in honor of victory. There was noise everywhere. People were celebrating. 
The victory celebration continued. The knight and the commander were sitting on a bench discussing what was going on. And if his highness is unhappy, then the soldiers won't be happy either. They must see their commander as a support and support. That's when their morale will be high. Lucas looked at the player good-naturedly and asked him to smile. At least for now. Let him rejoice with them, after all, he deserved it more than anyone else. He took command in such a desperate situation and was able to lead them to victory. That's a commander's job, too. To be happy for his subordinates. The boy sighed heavily, but still managed to squeeze out a haggard smile. Smiling. That's a commander's job, too. Great. He was still able to relocate himself and smile at least for now. However, his calmness didn't last long. A bespectacled man appeared from somewhere and seemed to come at him screaming. He was in complete agreement. The boy held out the last letter as usual. The player looked fearfully in his direction. Where did this geezer here came from? The bespectacled man was also happy. His wide glasses literally glistened in the rays of the lanterns. He was holding a dish of vegetables and a small piece of meat. Mourning the sacrifice is certainly important, but they should find time to celebrate the victory, too. And what does he need? Ash sighed heavily. The last thing he wanted to see right now was that pesky ghoul. Ader was dressed in a chef's outfit. He was holding a bowl of vegetables. Since eating meat alone was bad for him, he brought vegetables. The boy looked at the bowl of vegetables in surprise. He hadn't even eaten meat yet. It's all vegetables. What the hell is this? The bespectacled man kept smiling. He happily congratulated the player on clearing the first location and immediately stretched out in a smile. It wasn't easy, but he managed it. He was just happy, probably more so than the protagonist himself. Almost laughing, the servant asked him to keep it up. The player frowned and looked with disbelief at this little asshole. He was starting to annoy him more and more, constantly appearing from somewhere, talking in riddles yes, and besides, after their conversations at the beginning of the trust in him decreased by times. Ash sighed and took a large tomato from his plate. It looked quite appetizing. It must have been grown on one of the royal farms. Ader suddenly raised his hand up and shouted that his highness was eating vegetables. The guy didn't even have time to take a bite and looked at this kid in surprise. What is he doing? But the servant kept shouting. His highness didn't eat anything, and now he's choking on vegetables. In his voice, one could hear a playfulness and even some mockery. He apologized to him and said they were so selfish. Everyone heard about it. It made the guy blush with shame. What the fuck is he doing? Naturally, the servant's shout had an effect. Immediately, a multitude of people ran over to the player. One of the men was holding a piece of meat, and each man had a piece of meat in his hands. Tears glistened in their eyes. They couldn't believe that they had forced their prince to eat the rumored one meat to eat vegetables. What kind of rumors were these? The boy couldn't believe it. How did this ash even live? What kind of weird place is this? One of the men would have shouted at the top of his lungs, You bastards! Bring his meat! His shout was so loud you could have been deafened. And don't forget the alcohol! What the hell is wrong with them? The already intoxicated men continued to drink. Now they took the prince under their arms and dragged him along with the rowdy crowd. He had a piece of meat in his mouth. Beer was pouring everywhere, and everyone was drunk. Ash was annoyed. A huge pig's foot had been shoved into his mouth, and now he was holding it with one of his teeth. What the hell was that? He couldn't believe how it had come to this. He was supposed to be reviewing the battle in a dark corner somewhere tonight. Obviously, his plans were not going to come to fruition. He was already being dragged along as he suddenly felt someone yanking him. A soft hand tugged at his sleeve. It was Lily. She was shaking. She was sitting in her chair about to cry. She smelled strongly of alcohol. When did she get so drunk? A decent-looking girl, but a real alcoholic at heart. He did not have time to say anything as the girl with tears threw herself at him. Tears glistened in her eyes and flowed in streams down her cheeks. She begged him to dismiss her at once. Let his highness dismiss her immediately. It was as if the girl wanted to jump into the boy's arms. She stood in front of him and shook him by his clothes. The boy tried to fight her off. Aha, uh -huh, now. Let her work hard. No layoffs at such a difficult time for the kingdom. The girl pleaded, but he was adamant. He'd better pay her more. The other men looked at the girl in horror. What had gotten into her? They hurriedly approached her so she wouldn't bother his highness. 
The cloaked man immediately took her to a secluded place, but the girl kept begging to be dismissed. The guy turned around, only to silently stare after her. No, no way, you can't lose such valuable fighters now. Let these guys go and steal her to bed. She's already drunk enough, she needs to sleep it off. He was watching her when he heard someone laughing next to you. The guy turned around startled, and Damien was standing next to him. He too was smelling of alcohol. He was holding a mug of beer in his hands. The guy chuckled and looked at the player with intoxicated eyes. The guy sat at the table and barely kept himself from falling to the ground. This water's a little hot. The guy hiccuped. How much had he drunk after all? The player looked at him with surprised eyes. It's not water and who gave the kid a drink? He's just a kid. He can't drink yet. Ash suddenly saw Jupiter standing next to him. The woman was pouring more alcohol for the kid. She was pretty drunk herself, but it all makes sense now. That's who's the big drunk. The player was horrified. How can you get a child drunk like that? What will she do to him? However, it turned out the woman was not at all embarrassed. She smiled and puffed on her cigarette. What kind of child is he? This guy is a full-fledged mercenary. He should know how to drink, smoke, and most importantly, how to spend money. The woman was smiling and enjoying the party. She's getting the kid drunk. She smiled and said that this kid is like a grandson to her now. She will teach him well and he will become a real man. At this time, the kid was completely drunk. His cheeks were burning and his eyes were going in different directions. Why teach your grandson these things? That's a horrible adult woman. The player was furious. Damien seemed to be enjoying everything, smiling and laughing. The guy already smelled like alcohol. One more minute and he'd pass out. The player looked at him with surprised eyes and remained silent. Young people, what do they do to them? He leaned against the player, not at all embarrassed. Ash smiled. He dared to put his hand on the prince's head. He was actually getting bolder. The alcohol must have gotten to him. The boy didn't seem to realize anything. Suddenly the boy was embarrassed and lowered his eyes. The boy was upset about something. In a quiet voice, he said that when he was alone, the face of his dead comrade kept appearing in front of his eyes. The boy was ready to cry. Apparently, these memories were not completely out of his head after all. He still could not stop thinking about that day. The feeling of guilt did not leave him completely and settled for a long time in his heart. The guilt of just living, it tormented his heart. However, when he is around his highness, he feels better. The guy smiled and his cheeks reddened. It seems that he really does feel better. That's why he's beside him. The boy didn't have time to finish his sentence as the alcohol finally took over his head and he collapsed on the table and fell asleep. The player looked at him in surprise. There you go, a drunken child. Where's that been seen? It's not because he's special, it's just the way he is. It's his passive skill that makes the military feel more invigorated when they're around him. But he couldn't tell the boy about that, for obvious reasons. Not everything he needs to know. Jupiter also perked up and broke away from devouring the alcoholic beverages. She held in her hands and said that her magic somehow became stronger when she was under his command. The woman eyed the player suspiciously, continuing to hold the cigarette in her mouth. The woman asked, Was it really due to his leadership vein? The man mused. It's all his skills and synergy with other team members. It's all a 25% buff. Yes, they are right. However, he can't tell them about it naturally. The guy smiled and tried to keep his composure. He couldn't give away his secret. However, he was not very good at it. Lucas turned to him. The man was already quite intoxicated and his cheeks were burning with alcohol. Yes, indeed, when he is with his majesty, he, his doubts disappear. His body becomes light and fast. In Ufa, too, I was surprised that next to the player he feels much stronger than usual. It's all thanks to his highness's noble character and the talent to lead people to their goal. Ash turned to him and smiled. Wow, so that's why he's always hanging around. The boy looked at his subordinate ironically. Well, it all made sense now. Lucas smiled and somehow hesitantly said, I guess that's the way it is. This answer confused the boy a little. Probably. And what did that mean? Is such an answer befitting a model knight? This somehow embarrassed the player. Something alcohol has a bad effect on him. He shouldn't drink anymore. Meanwhile, everyone else continued to celebrate and drink. They drank to the survivors, to the fallen knights, and to his highness the prince. The party was in full swing, 
people were incredibly happy. There was incredible shouting everywhere. Concentrating was quite a difficult task. The boy wanted to think about something else, but he was surrounded by the others. His mug was empty. What was wrong with him? Ash tried to joke around and said he wasn't feeling well. He really didn't want to be the center of attention. He needed to be alone with himself and think about his plan of action. The men were immediately horrified and began to apologize. Tears came to their eyes again and one of them clutched at his heart. They are bad at uplifting. They made the prince, who is famous for his ability to drink for weeks, not drink a single mug today. It seems this theatrics will go on for a long time. It's got to stop. The boy squinting again. Like this? Not only did he kill his entire army, but he's an alcoholic. What kind of life did this godforsaken principle lead? It's strange. Is it really that bad? The people wouldn't stop. They begged for forgiveness and asked me to kill them for their behavior. In the end, the player got fed up and said, Make them get up right now. Stop behaving like this. Then the people asked him to drink immediately. Well, what to do with them? I'll have to drink with them or they won't leave. The boy knocked over the glass and drank the whole mug in one gulp. Are you happy now? Since they forced their commander and lord to drink, he hoped they knew what would follow. Now let them all fill their mugs. Now everyone will drink. The guy was furious. He was starting to get annoyed. Naturally, everyone filled their mugs almost to the top. Everyone began to toast. Glasses clinked, and the rustle of pouring beer was heard. There was a spicy aroma of alcohol. From this smell alone, one could get intoxicated. One could only imagine how drunk these people were. There were many people gathered on the main street. The party was heating up, and now we had to get wasted. As the moon shone brightly in the night sky, they drank, ate, sang, and talked. The feast had grown large, with people from all over the neighborhood, even those who weren't from the city. But no one seemed to care. There was noise everywhere. The moon had already risen in the night sky and began to illuminate everything with its bright, pale light. The night of victory continued. Everyone was celebrating. The atmosphere was warm and friendly. The party went on all night. The doors creaked open and a bright light burst into the room. From there came the drunken voice of the player, who hiccuped every now and then from the alcohol he had drunk. He could barely sit in his seat and staggered in different directions. After all, the alcohol had affected his condition and now he was dizzy. He could not get his thoughts in order, and they were spinning in his head inexorably Roy. Ash was sitting on his bed. The smell of alcohol wafted from him. The odor filled the entire room, and it felt like it wasn't a bedroom but some kind of pub. The boy sat on the bed, looking at the chests of loot. There were a couple to open before going to bed. Chests received for clearing the location. They should be a lot of things of value. He got up from the bed and approached one of the chests, choosing it at random. Guy put up his hand. Well, what color is it? The chest was nice and slightly warm to the touch. The lid of the chest opened and a bright yellow light poured out. SSR rank, really? There was no limit to the player's joy. The first chest and such luck? Although, wait, there was something strange. Something was lying at the very bottom of the chest. It was something black that looked like a small rag. The player took out a small glove from there, which seems to be usually worn by ladies, but what is it? He thought there would be some legendary weapon, some ring, money at least. Not just SSER rank, but max level. His surprise was replaced by delight. A satisfied smile stretched across his face. His hands trembled in anticipation. Oh my God, come on. The boy just shone with happiness, his mind as if it had come out of a veil, and he realized what had fallen into his hands. His whole body shook with anticipation and pleasure. What he was witnessing was phenomenal. A thing of this rank, yes, and at the very beginning. Her pleasure was unparalleled. He stood looking at the spilling bright yellow light. However, his joy was also quickly replaced by anger. What the fuck? He irritatedly threw his glove right into the wall. It flopped and immediately slew the elephant to the floor. What the fuck? Out of all that variety of such items, some bullshit fell out for him. He looked at the characteristics of the glove and his rage became much stronger. He got a lucky punch. A consolation fucking item. It was a gauntlet, level 7. Combat glove type, 777 attack. Strength, 7 out of 7. Each stat percentage gets a 1% bonus. I'll be lucky today. Some player. Something like a slot machine with a jackpot written on it. 
Seema's damage with these gloves is determined by a tape measure. Sometimes he used them on his streams to cheer up the audience, but in practice they are completely useless. Guy walked over to the loot. At least he had something with his hands. He looked at the gloves that were on the floor. Yeah, the thing it was bullshit, but you can't get upset. After all, couldn't he just throw them away or give them to someone? The guy put on the gloves. They were incredibly pleasant to the touch, as if they were specially made for his hands. Was it because of their rarity? He raised his hands to his face and looked at the new items disappointedly. Might be able to hit the jackpot roulette when we'll need. One has to be optimistic. However, it worked out rather poorly for him. How the hell did he get that shit? Optimistic. That's the word he had in his head. Fucking hell. The guy couldn't contain his anger after all and wrinkled his nose in annoyance. There are so many cheater items that could make life easier if he had them. But no, out of all that variety, he fell out some low-grade crap. What the fuck is optimism? How can you be optimistic at a time like this? Despite receiving a rare golden item, he tossed and turned all night and barely fell asleep by morning. He mumbled something under his breath all night and tried to come to terms with the fact that the only item he had received was bullshit. He woke up the next day in the evening. His head was splitting from the hangover. He had to come to his senses as soon as possible. He didn't want to lie on the bed all the next day. He struggled to his feet and staggered out of his room, leaning on the door. His head just splintered like some kind of broken box. My eyes were spinning, my mouth smelled foul, and my body ached with an unexplainable pain. The first person he saw that day was Lucas. The night didn't look well either, though he tried to take on some godly appearance. There was a distinct hangover on the man's face. His eyes were tired and he had huge bags under them. The man greeted his supervisor and he smelled like alcohol. They stood there for a few seconds, staring at each other with uncomprehending stares, as if they had seen some kind of monster. Ash looked at him, and after a second of silence asked, Is he okay? He should have rested this morning, however. No. The knight stood in front of him, had hair on his head. He apparently hadn't had time to clean up. The man wanted to start saying something, but the gagging in his throat prevented him from doing so, and he hurriedly covered his mouth with his hand. It looked like he'd gotten drunk last night, too. The player was staring at him with that unblinking gaze. He was no better now. Suddenly from somewhere appeared a servant, on his face his always shining smile. He appeared literally out of nowhere. In his hands, he already had a shiny tray with two cups and a small teapot. The boy was startled and looked up at him. The last thing he wanted to see right now was this annoying brat. However, the servant greeted him in his usual manner. Why was this bespectacled man full of energy all the time? How do you even do that? However, anger quickly changed to admiration as soon as the two of them saw Shiny's teacups. The bespectacled man knew how to please after all. Here's some warm water with honey. Let them both drink it down. The bespectacled man's voice was cheerful after all. As soon as the boy drank this decoction, he seemed to revive. His head immediately cleared up and his body filled with strength. Is it time to start preparing for the next stage? Lucas at this time continued to drink tea. This drink was incredibly healing, although, in their situation, even ordinary water would seem something incredible. Soon they managed to clean themselves up, and they were standing near the fortress, inspecting the destruction caused by the giant skeleton. The huge sword was still sticking in the wall. No one had bothered to remove it, and in principle, it would be too difficult to remove such a huge thing. The player folded his arms across his chest and anxiously began to speak. Yes, in this condition, they wouldn't be able to stop wild animals, let alone monsters. How long will it take to repair? He looked at the servant and sighed worriedly. The chief builder stood at attention and began his report. More than two weeks first we need to get that huge sword up. The man tried to keep his composure, as he realized that it was important to speed up the tempo of the work now. The boy thought too much time. There were nine days and twenty hours until the second location was cleared. Uninjured soldiers will assist in rebuilding the walls starting tomorrow. Lucas nodded his head obediently, a sign of agreement. We should try to finish as soon as possible. The next one wouldn't be long in coming. Then he turned to the bespectacled man and asked, What about reinforcements? He wondered. The neighboring city would be sending soldiers soon. 
The soldiers sent to the central district will return tomorrow. The player thought, what a devil, we'll have to wait until tomorrow to see any progress, this is bad. Time is running out of steam. Speeding up tempo is not an option either. He can deal with everything else, but he's not in charge of the reinforcement squad. All we can do is pray they get there safely. Well, they don't have any other choice. He's ordered his courtier to let him know if anything happens. In the meantime, go with him and do what they can. The knight was a little dumbfounded. Is this what his leader meant? He hated to admit it, but there seemed to be no choice. A smile appeared on the player's face. Dungeon. Let's destroy the monster breeding ground. He seemed to be full of fighting spirit again, which was good, but it didn't seem to have any good consequences. They've only just recovered from the previous battle. They can't start so soon. Lucas looked at him surprised and a little scared. This time their target is also Black Lake? Yes, that's right, the player smilingly replied. Only this time it will be a little different. This time they'll go to the location with all the team members. It was time to change the genre of the game from tower defense to dungeon assault. Only by such means can any progress be made. If he wants to get out of there in one piece, it's time to change tactics. That's it for today. He announced the end of the meeting and wished everyone to take care of themselves. Now they would see each other tomorrow. The day passed surprisingly quickly. Night fell on the city again, and everywhere the lights began to come on. As the rest of the team left the meeting room, he told them that tomorrow they were leaving on an expedition. It would be easier if they could see it with their own eyes, rather than having to explain it one hundred times. It's better to see it once than to hear it one hundred times. Damien took the gurney where Lily was sitting. He smiled and said goodbye to his master, who waved politely. However, the girl was not so satisfied. Okay. The man mentally apologized to her. There was nothing to be done. This dungeon was designed for five. Ader walked up to him with a small notebook and prepared to write down the instruction. The boy told him to prepare provisions for tomorrow's expedition. The servant asked what exactly he needed to prepare. In a confident voice, the fellow replied that he would need canned food, camping supplies, wares, and a few other things. He frowned and looked at his servant with an incredibly serious look. The bespectacled man was still smiling the same way, his thick glasses shining in the candlelight. More lanterns, flashlights, anything that can illuminate in general. This will take place at night, so they'll need reliable sources of light. The next morning, all the members of the future expedition gathered in the backyard of the manor to discuss the future plan of action. Everyone was here. Lily was sitting on her wheelchair and sniffing her nose. She was terribly reluctant to take part in this adventure. She had had enough of the previous expeditions, on which she had almost died. So the girl had a premonition that she would have to face the horrors here. Jupiter stood nearby and continued to smoke her cigar. She had a backpack on her back. It looked like something serious, and where were they going? The woman wasn't over-enthusiastic as usual. Even she seemed hesitant. The guy winked at the others and started lifting up rocks, preparing the portal. He replied that they would see for themselves soon. He didn't want to break the intrigue. Though it was clear from his face that something big was about to happen. A second later, a glowing portal appeared in front of them. Jupiter's jaw dropped in surprise. Is that teleportation magic? Clearly the woman didn't see it often. Especially not now. She had disappeared several hundred years ago, hadn't she? She couldn't believe her eyes while the player was trying to keep his composure. Damn, he hadn't studied this point. Now there might be suspicion. Anyway, they would find out everything as the mission progressed. Now was not the time to discuss. He turned to the others and said that they were going to teleport to the nest of monsters. It was located under the Black Lake. The faces of the team members were on full alert, and only Lily was crying with grief. She realized that the next trip might be her last. Her mind was still burning with the memories of the last trip, where she had been used as a flamethrower. What the devil would she have to face that now? The boy, meanwhile, continued to explain. He said that they should investigate this place to find out why the monsters are coming from there. Maybe there's a portal where they come from or something. Either way, they need to get in there. It's the only way to stop the invasion. After taking a few seconds, he added that this time it would be for good. Destroy the source of the monsters. That is the goal of the entire game. He realized that they would have to give their best on this outing. 
He opened the teleportation tablet and chose the only unlocked location, the lake. He said he'd brief them on the way, so let them follow him now. There was a worried shriek from Lucas. Your Highness, let me go first. However, the player didn't even think of listening to him. He quickly slipped right into the portal before the knight could even say anything. I told him not to worry so much. No, this guy's always rushing forward. It's logical, but sometimes it gets annoying. Soon, the teleportation was complete. During this time, signs with trivial teleportation tips were constantly blinking in front of my face. You could write something normal, couldn't you? After the teleportation was completed, they quickly stepped onto solid ground. There was an oppressive atmosphere around. Jupiter felt it immediately, where she fought many monsters. Indeed, it was that very black lake. They were standing on the shore of a huge lake that looked like some kind of oil. There was not a single living soul in the usual sense. The lake stretched for many meters ahead. Somewhere there in the distance could be seen the dawn that never fully came. They stood on the shore and looked around. The player asked the woman, had she been here before? The mercenary frowned and said that it was twenty years ago. It appeared it was obvious that these memories were not particularly pleasant for her. It was back when the royal soldiers were still at the crossroads. They had received orders to fill the lake with earth to block the place off forever. The boy looked at her in surprise. Not what was trying to fill this huge lake with earth, really. Seems like a real idiot was at the helm twenty years ago for giving such a stupid order. Not surprising, considering what he turned out to be. The woman kept talking. She said that the whole magic squad was involved. They tried to use their magic to raise the earth and fill the lake, but the woman stopped. The boy asked what happened next. You could tell the woman was worried. The memories were too much for her. She sighed heavily and said that of course it was impossible. No matter how hard they tried, it was all in vain. They had thrown everything they could at a simply foolish venture. No matter how many stones fell to the bottom, the lake endlessly swallowed them up like a black abyss. The woman frowned, and one could hear her teeth gritting with anger. Apparently something else had happened there. Rumors had spread everywhere among the royal army that the lake was connected to the underworld itself. The woman became wary. After the first week of attempts, monsters began to appear. They came out in droves, the army retreated. The plan failed miserably. The soldiers had to retreat in a hurry to save their lives. Since then, it was the first time she had been this close to the lake. They continued to stand on the shore, studying the surroundings. The commander told them to be on guard. This place is incredibly dangerous. They need to keep a constant watch in case something goes wrong. Have them be careful because they are going to go deeper. As soon as Lily heard this, it us immediately shaken with fear. Tears sprang from her eyes. But wouldn't she be able to live to a normal old age? It seems like the girl had no choice. A tablet appeared in front of the player's face, asking if he wished to enter the lake realm. He immediately poked at the sign that said, Yes. After a second, the next sign now appeared in place of this one. It warned that they would not be able to return until they opened the next transfer point. Are they really willing to do that? The guy frowned. Is this lousy game trying to scare him or something? Do they think he's played this game once or twice? This is kind of ridiculous, even. He stood in front of the monitor and held out his hand. Of course he wants to get in there. As soon as the guy pressed the confirmation button, then the water in the lake began to bubble, and immediately a powerful hydrogen formed, sucking everything into the abysses of the lake. That's where it was going to go down. Ash stood on the bridge for a while and watched as the vortex began to gain power. This is the entrance to the dungeon if they get through this vortex, so it seems in the underwater realm. Okay, gotta move forward. Immediately, not a second, the guy jumped into the thick of it. The water was incredibly cold. The cold was getting to his bones, but he began to sink down deeper and deeper. A hint icon appeared on the screen. Tip. The number one reason for failure is inattention. You have to be alert in any situation. It was dark and cold here. But the guy opened his eyes and through the thickness of the water began to look around the immediate surroundings, as there could also be monsters here. That was his first impression. Darkness. He saw nothing. It was approaching him. Suddenly he heard a voice. It was deafening, no wonder, since he was in the thickest water. Your Highness. Your Highness. The guy opened his mouth and quietly said that he was here, no need to worry. 
let them all keep calm and turn on the light. A match flickered somewhere, and the space was illuminated by the bright warm light from a torch. It was held by Lucas, and the knight's face was clearly troubled as he stared ahead of him, studying the small space that the torches were shining out of the darkness. The whole team was here. No one had gotten lost in the transition, and that was a big plus. They began to look around, exploring the surrounding area. Everyone lit their torches and began to look around. The bright light picked out small corners of the darkness. It seemed to absorb them, thickening on the sides, turning into a large veil. Lily lit her torches, otherwise breaking them in different directions. The girl was apparently afraid of something. And indeed, it was a bit gloomy here, that's putting it mildly. The girl didn't seem to like spaces like this. Everyone turned around and looked where she had been looking before. Lucas was also wary. Jupiter opened her eye in surprise and exclaimed in surprise. The man pointed forward and asked in a frightened, trembling voice, What is this place? He looked forward but said nothing. He pondered how best to tell them where they had gotten to after all. He hadn't brought them the instructions after all. Now he would have to explain himself. In front of them stood a huge gothic castle, like the one kings built in the Middle Ages. It was a castle of the Lake Kingdom, dungeons and located under the water. It was really colossal in size. Compared to him, our heroes seemed ordinary bugs. The gates were incredibly high. It turned out that in this palace lives a real evil. However, it seems that all this arrangement did not embarrass our hero. He smiled and said that this is partly a nest of monsters, which they should gradually very quickly subtract. Guy stopped for a second and examined his body. Everything was fine. He could breathe and move around without any problems. It seems that it was all about the ancient magic that hides this place, and thanks to which you can move around like in the real world, despite the fact that it is all under the water column. This entire palace was hidden by a large dome that kept the water from seeping in. Lily still couldn't come to her senses and fearfully looked straight at that huge castle. In a trembling voice, the girl clutched the bag of stuff to her chest and asked how such a huge hulk could be under the lake, and how can they move around like this quietly. However, the girl did not have time to finish her question, as she was interrupted by Lucas. He ordered everyone to be alert and silent. Someone is coming. The man turned a worried look somewhere to the side and prepared his weapon. From far away, there were some slow and silent footsteps. If you wanted to hear them, you could not hear them but the sensitive hearing of the night still picked them out from the silence of the night. Someone was indeed approaching them. The man grasped his sword and prepared to guard his team. He turned to where the sound had come from and the others followed. In the distance, some figure in a black robe could be seen. It was like some sort of monk. However, something about it was off. Something sinister. It was a person who was completely hiding his body. From the looks of it, it was a woman. She had a huge long sword behind her back. The woman's face was hidden by a hood, from under which two incredibly long braids of gray, almost ash-colored hair came out, hair falling straight to the ground and dragging behind her. The woman was approaching them at a leisurely pace. Lily. With all her might, she tried to run away, but the boy grabbed her by the chair and pulled her back up. Let them not be so nervous. This is not the enemy they first entered the dungeon, so it must be an NPC. She had a silent gait. It was as if she was floating without touching the ground. Her soft voice was heard. Treasure hunters looking for something to eat in the Lake Kingdom. Her voice sounded as if from far away, from the depths of the water. As soon as the boy heard her voice, he was immediately alert. His eyes widened with surprise, as if he had heard the speech of some unfamiliar person. And what can I say? Everyone is wary. Who knows what this person is and what he wants from them? The girl raised her head and the hood pulled back a little, revealing her face. She had deep, dark blue eyes and white, pale skin. The girl's voice came out as if from far away. She said that what they were looking for was not here. Let them return to the surface while they can. She said the last phrase as if with sadness and regret. The boy stood like that for a moment, staring right at her. That sentence honestly sent chills down his spine. I've never seen her before. Does this NPC exist in the game? That was an open question. Where did this girl come from in this place? Yes, it is clear that there are about a hundred of them living here. And one random NPC was supposed to act as a guide. But there was one question. He had never seen her here before. Although the guy had scoured the game. He had started the game 742 times. 
but not once. This girl had never appeared here. Where'd she come from? Is this some kind of upgrade? Well, there's no way out. We'll have to enter into a dialogue with her to at least find out what happened here. The boy took one hesitant step back and said that they had come from the surface. He tried to keep the tremors out of his voice, but he was not doing a very good job of it, and it was obvious that he was worried. They've come from the surface to get to the bottom of this and stir up a hornet's nest. The woman looked at him silently with her sad, sad eyes. The guy kept talking. He tried to look manly so as not to arouse any suspicion they must seem like ordinary adventurers. Who knows what this girl's intentions are? The guy kept talking. He said that because of the monsters that come out of this place on the surface, the world is suffering. They're going to end it. He tried to make his words confident and even made his voice a little rougher. The girl sighed and said that the Lake Kingdom has long since fallen into a nightmare. No one can ever wake it up. This place is consumed by darkness, and every person who sets foot here dooms himself to imminent doom. Countless warriors who came here to liberate this place have died a horrible death here. More than one person has been here, but so far no one has been able to make it to the end. Every adventurer who came here immediately died, or went a little farther, but still their fate was unenviable. They all died on the spot, and only their corpses remained here dotting the dead earth. The woman looked at them again with her sad eyes and told them to leave while they still had the chance. They certainly didn't need to go into this darkness. Let them go. Before the abyss consumed them, and before they went mad with regret for their actions. However, the boy had clearly made it clear that he wasn't going to back down. If he was really going to turn back because of words like that, he would have left the game long ago and returned to his world. But it's not that simple, right? He is the Lord of the Crossroads, a fortress city that exists for the purpose of stopping monsters. And he's also responsible for the defense of the fort, no, the defense of humanity. This mission was placed on his shoulders the moment he stepped on the ground of this game, and to retreat now would be a disgrace. The guy straightened up and proudly said that the abyss does not scare him. This game is full of various monsters and challenges. They must enter and destroy this bloody breeding ground of darkness. In order to continue to exist peacefully, they need to be ready for any challenge. That's why they've come all the way to this horrible place. Does she think they'll retreat now? But the doors are locked and if they want to enter, they can't. Indeed, these great gates were sealed. It would take a very great effort to open them. If there was any other way to get in, they would have to do something. The boy looked at the girl with some hope and asked if they could ask her to help them get in here. He could hear the hope in his voice that the girl would still agree to be their ally, but there weren't many options in them as it was. The girl squinted her eyes slightly and continued to look sadly at the travelers. After a bit of silence, she sighed heavily and replied that, all right, so be it. She would help them. Her voice was incredibly sad at the fact that she would have no choice. She stood in front of them and said it was interesting to see what they were doing, whether their words were really full of courage or whether it was just her brother's recklessness. She seemed to have seen many such people trying to get here, and not one of them seemed to have reached their destination after all. She rushed back and told them to follow her. She would guide them to their destination. The player asked how should he address her. Would she tell him her name? Still need to know who they will spend this journey with. The girl stopped for a second and turned back to them. The last big minute pause, she said that she didn't remember her name anymore. But if it was so important to them, let them call her nameless after all. The girl turned to them and still sighed heavily. Her eyes were downcast. At first it might have seemed like she was blind. Her pupils were dilated to the point of covering almost all of her eyes. They followed her along the walls for some time. The landscape did not change. It was still the same impenetrable darkness, and only their torches shone out of the darkness to light the way. The atmosphere was unfriendly to say the least, and even Lucas with his overcoming will began to worry. How could they just follow who knows who? It would definitely turn out to be a trap. However, the player was completely calm. He reassured his comrade. Everything will be fine, did he hear? Just have to keep moving forward. Is he a Kamakuku clock? Every five minutes he starts his tantrum. It's getting annoying. They continued walking, the silence of the night cut only by the thudding sound of their footsteps. They moved forward deeper and deeper into this horrible dungeon. The atmosphere was oppressive, to say the least. There was a sea odor everywhere, as if they were on the shore of some sea. 
Everywhere smelled of rot, and the sounds of dripping water could be heard. Soon the nameless one stopped. She stood on the spot and said that they had come. This is the place the travelers were looking for. They stood in front of it a large passageway. The girl turned to them and said that by entering here they would be able to get in. The boy looked in the direction the girl was pointing and was stunned. Is this really the place? They stood in front of a small passageway that led deep into a dark tunnel. Was it a sewer system? It seemed to be. It smelled foul. They clearly didn't want to go inside. Nameless stood nearby and told them to be careful. It was slippery. Still, they had no choice but to plunge into the stinking darkness. They walked forward with their heads down, lighting the way with the dim lights of their torches. The smell was unpleasant, to say the least, but they had to keep moving. Lucas led the way and was fully prepared for any danger, followed by the player and then the others. Soon they reached the exit of this tunnel. The guy stepped forward, illuminating the space with his torch. This seemed to be the place they were going to come to. This was the first area. The sewers. They stood in a small room more like some sort of intermediate hall. Nameless stood next to it. There were incomprehensible lights burning all around. It was unclear what had been powering them all these years, however, there was still some source of light here. All the sewers were connected here. It was a big branch. You could get lost in no time if you entered one of the tunnels. The pipes were dry. You couldn't even hear water dripping despite the specialization of this place. The odor was still quite distinct. The player started to activate the teleportation portal. He raised his hand up and several stones rose up, forming an archway. This was a checkpoint. It's a safe zone. No monsters could get in here. From this place, one could safely teleport to any convenient place just by using teleportation magic. So next time, they could start from right here without going near the lake. The teleport sign listed another location, the sewers. It was the second of three locations. The last one was inaccessible. The boy continued to study the locations, but suddenly he was distracted by Lily. The girl started begging. She wanted to go home. She definitely didn't like this place. The guy brushed it off. Yeah, now, what does she think they were carrying so many provisions with them just to go back and the begging sign funny? No wonder, though, the girl always started to panic in situations like this. Nameless said she wasn't going any further. They were on their own from now on. She wouldn't be able to wait for them. The guy thanked her for her help while pushing Lily away from himself, who persistently tried to grab his hand. The guide looked at them with a stern look and warned them once again that the Lake Kingdom had already been completely consumed by the nightmare. A great ordeal awaited them. It was worth being on their guard. The farther they went, the darkness would become thicker and the monsters would become stronger and stronger. If her words still weighed nothing, then let her give them one small piece of advice. The girl looked at them sadly. After a little silence, she said, almost in a whisper, that they should never turn out the lights. That would be their only salvation. If they did not want to be swallowed up by the nightmare, then let them follow this advice rigorously. After these words, all were silent. The warning must have had an effect, and an unknown fear settled among the crew. Everyone began to look at each other, but only their leader remained calm. After a silence, she said, May their path be blessed by the gods, if they had already decided to put their lives in danger. The player held a small lantern that would be their guide to this nightmare world for a further time. Then, the girl turned around and with quick steps headed somewhere in the darkness of the tunnel. Her dark figure quickly disappeared in the approaching darkness, and in a second there were only the slight sounds of footsteps moving away into the night darkness. Now they were left to their own devices. Lucas stood with the player and asked, Who is she anyway? And how could she live in the underwater realm? The guy shook his head and said he had no idea. The whole thing was strange. Even he didn't know about such a thing. Demian. Suddenly a voice came up, the boy said fearfully that the darkness here was somehow strange. Even his eyes could see farther than a few meters. The boy made it clear that he didn't like it here. His whole body trembled and he looked around fearfully. However, even so, how does this girl move around here without the slightest light source? She apparently navigates well in the darkness. The player did not say anything, but only continued to stare into one of the passageways. He had no answer to this question. Now for the first time he was faced with something he could not explain. 
Even though he had spent more than 1,000 hours in this game, this dungeon is full of secrets, and even he, the one who could pass the game, does not know them all. For the first time in his life, in the whole experience of the game, he had to face something that he himself cannot explain. The only thing he is sure of is that they will meet her under the lake again. The boy looked at his team and tried to cheer them up somehow. He said confidently that they would be able to see the girl again, and then they would ask about everything that interested them. As enemies or as friends. Who knows? It all looked as strange as possible, but there was no time or desire to turn back. They had enough gear at the checkpoint, and now it was time to move on. The guy asked the crew, Are they all ready? I think he already had an answer to that question, of course. You can't be ready for that. A sign popped up in front of him with information. Sewer Area 1. Passage progress, normal room 0 out of 3, boss room, they only had to pass this test. The guy smiled and looked at the plaque. Considering the entire level of their team, and the number of players that are there then, there should be no problem with the sweep. Despite the oppressive atmosphere, he seemed confident in his abilities. Well, let's go. They looked into the depths of one of the tunnels. The darkness was frighteningly unknown, but they had to push on inside. Only the light of their flashlights illuminated the way ahead. The darkness dissipated a few meters ahead. There showed walls made of ancient bricks. Without hesitation, they moved inside. The thudding sound of footsteps ripped the space. Each sound in this deafening silence was heard like the sound of thunder. Lucas asked, How much farther down this corridor are they going to go? The player walked ahead, surveying the area. He shook his head. No, there wasn't much left. Lucas's questions were starting to annoy him a little. And why was he so concerned? He had rigorously obeyed all his orders before, but now doubt seemed to have settled in his soul. From his experience in this game, he knew how this dungeon was organized. The basic structure of the dungeon, this room, and the connecting passages. In the rooms, you can find some items and fight enemies, or talk to NPCs. He already guessed who was waiting for them in the first room. The guy not sure stepped forward room one. There was already a monster waiting for them. It was a big rat. Although this beast was small in normal life, here it was the size of a small cat. It was a huge rat. Sewer room one. Rat level three. Quantity, 14 pieces. It was necessary to destroy these creatures. The rat was quite nasty. It had large paws with powerful claws on the ends. It opened its mouth and hissed. I, its mouth was full of razor-sharp teeth and in the middle was a split tongue. The boys stopped and watched as a large pack of rats approached them. There was an unimaginable squeaking sound all around. Lucas stepped forward and put his sword out to defend himself from the creatures. The rats were getting bigger and bigger, not crawling on the walls like spiders, coming closer and closer to their victims with each step. What a nuisance. By themselves, they are not difficult enemies, but because of their numbers here will not be able to relax. Guy already mentally prepared for battle, well, it will have to try. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted by Lily's scream from somewhere behind him. Screaming. Rats? Why is she such a coward? The player was starting to get angry. There was too much noise coming from that girl lately. He even thought for a moment that they shouldn't have brought her here. He waved his hand and ordered Lucas to step forward. To kill only those who came too close, and to keep his distance. The boy nodded his head and moved forward with his long sword. Ash ordered Damien to aim for the eyes or neck as the heads of these creatures are very strong. The boy activated his vision and nodded his head understandingly. He would immediately carry out his order. He ordered the others not to waste their mana and let them attack only those who had broken through Lucas's defenses. As for him, he would just watch from the sidelines. Jupiter and Lily prepared their spells. Magical sparks began to burn in their hands. The player at this time just stood somewhere to the side and watched his team fight the monsters. Two rats jumped dangerously close to Lucas, and he activated his sword, which glowed with a bright yellow flame. The rats let out a deafening squeal and immediately lunged at the man. The knight immediately swung his sword, and with one precise blow, shattered several of the vile creatures into small pieces. The sound of tearing flesh was heard, and the lifeless bodies of the rats began to fall to the ground. The gunner was aiming precisely at the target. He did exactly as his leader had told him, aiming only at the dangerous places. 
Even though the boy was scared, the player's skill had worked and the fear went away somewhere. Thanks to his eyes, the arrows hit exactly on target, hitting the rat in the neck and eye. The animal immediately fell to the ground, making a nasty squeaking sound. Soon the rat became smaller and smaller, and their ugly bodies were already lying dozens of nearby. It's so hard for me, right? The guy looked around. There were only animal corpses, which gave off a nasty, nasty odor. He turned to the boy and asked, It wasn't that hard, was it? The gunner smirked and sighed. Yes, he was more nervous than he realized. The boy held up his crossbow. The knight turned to him and said, That brought the total to should he collect magic stones or not. They're low level, not even. He hesitated half a word and asked again, What? Thirteen? But the system showed fourteen. Where'd the other thing go? The guy hesitated and didn't notice that one of these creatures had already flown at him from behind, which had somehow survived and was now attacking the defenseless player. The guy noticed it too late. He had no way to dodge anyway. The monster slid its vile maw open and squeaked. Its teeth glistened in its mouth and its tongue fluttered like some kind of rag. A couple more seconds and it could sink its teeth right into the skin of the protagonist. The guy reacted quickly and with a shriek put his fist out, he was more angry than scared. How did this thing manage to survive? The guy was ready for it, and it seemed it was time to use his new gloves. His fist made contact with the animal's elastic furry body, and the rat immediately flew aside, thrown away by the powerful blow. Immediately the inscription jackpot appeared. Don't expect it yourself. And the guy hit with such force that the animal was literally vaporized under his pressure. A jet of energy burst from somewhere in his fist, which threw the beast far back. The rat squealed and flew into the wall. A second later, it crashed into the concrete wall, its body crunching under the pressure. A small trickle of blood appeared behind her back. The blow was really powerful. The guy himself didn't expect such a thing. The rat list slid down the wall. It died instantly. The guy looked in surprise at his hand which was wearing the glove he had so recently gotten from the chest. The hand was literally smoking from the energy overflowing from it. A strike above a hundred? That's rare. Behind him was the gunner, whose jaw dropped in surprise. Lucas immediately ran up to him and began to ask if he was all right. The man was scared for his king's health. He had to protect him after all. The boy turned around and said he was fine, but his body shook with surprise. The knight looked at his lord in surprise and asked, What was that just now? How did he kill the monster with one blow? It was unimaginable. The man had a look of genuine surprise on his face. He didn't expect his master to be so strong. The guy rolled his eyes. I mean, after every sweep, do I have to explain to him what he's doing? He'd already accepted the fact that he had to code to avoid suspicion. He stammered, trying to come up with some sort of coherent explanation. Coming up with nothing better, he said it was the prince's punch. The boy put his fist forward. Lucas questioned in surprise. The prince's punch? Ash said that's what it was. What, you've never heard of such a thing? The guy raised his fist up and proudly said, When members of the royal family are in danger, they can activate a superpower. Sometimes it manifests like this. Please, just please let them swallow this lie and move on. The guys really didn't want to get into any explanations to waste time. Lucas looked at his master in surprise and clenched his fists in admiration. Yes, this is awesome. Awesome. Everyone else just stared at the player in amazement. They of course doubted. Only Lucas was without a doubt loyal to his master. Still, they moved on. Good thing they were savvy. They found themselves in another room, the second to last. It was unfortunately empty. There must be something hidden here. He ordered everyone and downloaded carefully and all the team members scattered to the corners to find anything of value. Damien shined his flashlight somewhere in the distance and said there was something here. The guy was definitely interested. The player clenched his hands into fists and ordered him to move forward. He expects to finish the job. It seems there must be some treasure here, at least by the law of the genre there should be. Indeed, there did seem to be some kind of chest. It was quite large, great job. Guy told the others to be careful. It might be a trap disguised as a chest, however. He didn't have time to finish his goal. Suddenly, Jupiter rushed past him. The woman suddenly changed in her face. She had a wide smile and her eyes were burning with happiness. It was as if the woman was maddened. 
she rushed forward. This was her passive gold rush talent. What a greedy old woman. Shouldn't we stop? What if it's a trap? The boy was terrified. After all, he was facing some problems. This woman had a passive skill as soon as she saw some treasure as if she would lose her mind and immediately rush over there. Jupiter sprang to the chest and with trembling hands opened it. From there, a bright light immediately began to face her. Oh God, thank God it's their chest. The boy mentally thanked all the gods that they hadn't stumbled into another trap. Soon Jupiter came to her senses, a little embarrassed. She apologized in a shaky voice. Whenever she feels money, it stops controlling you. The woman shook her head and looked around. She held the chest up to the player and said that she was rightfully giving it to his highness. The guy stared at the chest in silence. Hey, Granny, does she think he can't see what's in her pocket? In the next room, he was again confronted by a multitude of rats, seemingly even more numerous than the last. Through the darkness, they could see dozens of eyes staring straight at them, burning red with indomitable fire, easily cleared the third room. Soon after a few minutes, they approached the last room. This is where the boss should be. The boy stepped forward with a confident step. Indeed, everything indicated that they were now in front of the boss's room. There was a massive oak door that would be difficult to open. The boy stopped right in front of it and began to examine it with surprised looks. The player smiled and said that after they finished with the boss, they could go home and have a good rest. So it would have to be more of an effort. He himself wanted to get out of this creepy place as soon as possible as he was already sick of the sewer stench and a lot of rats. They managed to open the room with quite a lot of effort. The doors creaked open and a bright red light began to shine in. The guys moved inside with confident steps. They were ready for the fact that there would be another private boss, which he would be able to cope with without much effort. It was time to go home. Each of them was already anticipating how they would sit at home with their pockets full of treasures and walk around, preparing for the next outing. Outside the door, however, appeared something that confused them for a moment. There lay a whole bunch of rats that were covered in their own blood. Apparently, the monsters were dead, as evidenced by the red eyes that had gone out and the open mouths in death agony. The smell of the place was also appropriate. The already unpleasant smell of sewage mixed with the stench of rotting meat, and the player had to cover his nose with his hand to avoid emptying his stomach right there. What the hell is that? The smell of blood. There's definitely something fishy going on here. The traveler's gaze fell on some strange creature that was sitting somewhere in the back of the room. It looked like a huge rat, but something was wrong. The rat was huge, much larger than any they had encountered. The creature downed something under its breath. To the rats. No to rats, no end, and no edge. The creature took the hand of one of the rats, which immediately began squeaking pitifully. It clutched the rat in its huge paws which were crowned with sharp claws. The rat wriggled and tried to break free, but the creature's grip was powerful. I must kill the rats. I must kill the rats. The creature repeated this phrase over and over. It squeezed its paw and a wet crunch of bones was heard. The little rat that didn't seem so big anymore in the hands of this monster forbade, and immediately its little body went limp. I must get rid of them. I must return the Lake Kingdom to its original form. The creature repeated this phrase like some kind of mantra. The monster opened its mouth and a deafening squeak of voices erupted from it. It was a huge rat. Only it was strange, there was something human about it, something remotely like a mind. Demian saw this creature and his whole body shook with fear. This monster speaks human. The boy certainly didn't expect to encounter something like that in these dungeons. The boy stood there dumbfounded. He couldn't move. Fear had completely taken over his body. The creature moved its short ears and listened. Apparently it had heard the boy, and now it turned its full attention directly to him. What? Is some rat still alive? The monster turned its head toward him and grinned. Its mouth was completely covered with teeth and a long, ugly tongue covered in viscous saliva protruded from it. The creature's eyes burned bright red fire, like those of the rats they had met before. But the monster was different. It looked at the newcomers as if they were its new food. It was the boss of this dungeon, a giant rat man, the managers of the sewers. He was level 15. As soon as the monster saw the newcomers, it turned towards them and let out such a deafening squeak that they had to cover their ears. 
No matter how many rats I kill, they still keep coming. Damn rats. The monster seemed even bigger than it was originally. When the creature rose to its feet, it appeared to be a few meters tall. Lucas and the player stood there, looking on in horror. The man put his sword forward and already prepared to repel the attack. It was clear that they would not get out of here so easily. The monster was truly terrifying, and the protagonist even had goosebumps on his back. Sewer controllers? Why does that rat have a human name? What the hell was that? The guy squinted his eyes and took a closer look at the monster. It was clear that this was some kind of experiment. You couldn't just have this thing existing here. I'll kill you all. The monster roared and lunged straight at the newcomers. It put its clawed paw forward and opened its huge mouth. It was obvious that this monster was not going to let them go so easily. Its eyes were burning with a kind of inhuman fire. It was going to fight him now. And his life depended on the outcome of the battle. The boy opened his eyes in horror. No, must do something. He realized that something irreversible was about to happen. Suddenly, against all expectations, Lily stepped up. She thrust her arms forward and let out a jet of fire that rushed straight at the monster. A rat. The girl almost cried out in fear but still attacked the monster. The fire began to spread rapidly. As soon as it reached the rats, they began to squeak shrilly. Hot. However, the flames were inexorable. It devoured the rats' bodies one by one. The girl, as if she had lost her mind, she screamed for that thing to stay away. It was as if she was possessed. She was spewing flames from her hands like some kind of volcano. The girl seemed to be very frightened, and that was what acted as leverage for her. Everyone else just stared at her in surprise. No one expected the girl to be so persistent. It seemed that the boss had been defeated. The big rat flopped to the ground with a loud sound, and steam began to emanate from it. After all, its eyes were still glowing, indicating that the rat was still alive. However, it must have taken a lot of damage. The monster raised its head and looked at the girl with its red eyes. You damned rat hissed at the monster. It clenched its teeth and prepared to attack its future victim with them. However, Jupiter was fully prepared. The woman raised her hand up and lightning immediately began to form on her fingers. This is where his stop was. Sweet dreams. The woman smirked and prepared to unleash the full power of her spells on the monster. There was a crackling sound and a small but very powerful lightning bolt flew towards the monster. It pierced the monster's head like a needle, which had already managed to rise to its feet. A second later, an explosion was heard. The air smelled of burnt meat, and the rat was covered with electric shocks from head to toe. The monster began to scream, Razinu in its huge maw. A flash of light washed over the entire room, and the monster's entire body was covered in bright light. The monster wanted to say one last thing, but he didn't have time. His body was completely covered in lightning and his heart immediately stopped. From such a discharge, even such a monster. It died in an instant. Before he could say the last sentence, the monster slumped to the ground. Smoke emanated from its body. Its face was frozen in a death grimace. It was quick. The guy was standing right in front of him and the whole thing was trembling with fear. He hadn't expected such a rapidity of events. Thanks to the joint work of the two mages, it was not difficult to deal with the boss. This monster's resistance to magic is practically zero, which makes it vulnerable to various kinds of spells. If they had only relied on physical damage, there would have been some difficulties, however. It ended up just fine. The monster was dead, and its red eyes were extinguished by the film. Lily immediately grabbed onto the guy's arm and started to ask, Are they going home yet? He turned to her and nodded his head in the affirmative. Yes, they were almost over. Was she scared? The girl almost cried. Of course there is scary. The room is filled with dead rats. How can she not be scared? She seemed really scared, but in principle she was understandable. Indeed, the Vidoc here was so-so. The room was completely filled with rats that gave off a horrible stench. In the middle of all this splendor lay the boss, whose body was still smoking, emitting an even more horrible odor. All the friends were standing in front of a large chest. Apparently there was a reward. A sign flashed above the chest. It was the reward for clearing the boss room. The chest was small in size, but it looked like it would be a good bounty. The guy looked at Lucas and ordered him to hold Jupiter so she wouldn't lunge at the treasure chest again. All for they had already perfectly realized that this granny was very fond of money, even more than herself. 
The guy bent over the chest and began to study it. At the same time, the knight held the granny who tried to escape from his clinging hands. The woman was like mad, respect your elders. She shouted it like some kind of chicken. However, the man held on tight. Ash, after digging around in the chest for a while, he found something valuable. He pulled out a sword from there. It wasn't a simple sword. It looked like some kind of saw or the nose of a swordfish. Wow. The guy looked at that sword like some kind of deity. There was an incredible amount of magical energy emanating from it, and the sword itself looked awesome. Next to it, a sign popped up with information. It was a rat cutter, type, long sword, attack 20, strength 20. When attacking a type monster, the rat does 25% more damage. Kill the rats, both of them. Yes, this item comes in handy. The guy didn't hesitate to throw the ball to Lucas. The knight gratefully accepted the gift and grabbed it with both hands. The man was incredibly pleased. His cheeks immediately lit up with happiness. Yes, this weapon was not good enough to replace his normal sword, however. Let the man keep it with him. He would still need it. Lucas nodded his head and hid the sword behind his belt. The boy bent over the chest, looking for anything else useful. Maybe there's something else in there, and there was. There was something else at the bottom. There was a small scroll. It consisted of white, soft parchment. It was a summoning scroll. Automatic defense turret. It's a guaranteed first area drop item. He'll lie if he says he didn't come here for it. That was just great, wasn't it? All the rewards have been collected. There's no point in staying in this hole any longer. Well, it's time to head back. Guys, it's time to head back to town. Looks like Lily was the most excited. She was depressed about this place. And now they're finally getting the hell out of here. Yes, location complete. The first area of the sewers. All three rooms have been cleared. The raid was a success. After going down the hallway to the boss room, the sewers ended, though. They didn't have to walk very long, and soon they should have made it to the surface. As soon as they climbed out, the guy opened his eyes in surprise. A very interesting picture appeared before him, which he had never seen before. Here begins the inner part of the Lake Kingdom. Part 2. The Hidden Alley. They found themselves in a strange place. A lot of shabby wooden houses, apparently uninhabited. They stared at them with their black eyes. The guys stopped somewhere in the middle and started lighting the way forward with torches. Everything is so advanced. On the face of it, these were the streets of a real prosperous city. However, it seemed as if no one had lived here for a long time. Since even a blind alleyway looked like this, what should the rest of the city look like? The guy stopped and started looking around. This was a city that had become the epitome of magical society, a true reflection of the frozen deep realm. But in that, there was no light at all in this city, nor was there a single living soul. The city was a veritable ghost. The empty streets were gloomy and frightening. There was a haze of mist everywhere, more like a fog. The atmosphere here was even more oppressive than in the sewers. The city was forever in darkness. It was silent and dead. This place didn't bode well. Only one lone lantern in the middle of the street stood illuminating a small stretch of road. There was darkness everywhere, oppressive and unseen, which had been consuming this city for years. Here was another checkpoint, the second area. Hidden alley unlocked. Another teleport opened up in front of the boy. This seemed to be the last area. But suddenly, a sign popped up in front of them, indicating that they couldn't go beyond this area for now. The player stood in front of the teleporter for some more time and didn't understand anything. What the hell was this? How come they couldn't get out? In any case, he wasn't going to go any further today. Otherwise, we'd be left with nothing but horns and legs. They've done a good job. I think that's it for today. The boys stood in the middle of the dark alley. The atmosphere was heightened by the fact that they could hear some strange sounds. Even though the city was silent and dead. Well, time to go home. The guy approached the teleport information sign and clicked instead of teleporting to the backyard of his kingdom. The research was complete. Their reward was sent back. Character level increase. Ash level 9. Lucas level Demian level 2. But something did catch their attention. Under a lonely street lamp, there was a strange figure standing there. She was dressed in some kind of rags. From afar, she looked like some kind of medieval jester. On her head, she wore a cap. Strange. The stranger in his hands held something that from afar looked like a windpipe. His quiet voice was heard, as if he spoke through a mask, so it was him, the last player. 
came all the way here. The stranger lifted up his pipe and some kind of sound came pouring out of it. Squeaks began to be heard everywhere, as if hordes of rats were approaching them. The tune was merry and resembled some old song from a fairy tale. The stomping of a thousand little feet was heard from somewhere, and soon a whole horde of these sewer rats appeared before the eyes of our heroes. They were coming inexorably fast. They ran like an invisible army, and only their luminous black eyes gleamed in the darkness. May we be forgiven for our sins, said the stranger. The light illuminated his face. He was indeed wearing a mask. Now he looked like some kind of medieval harlequin. The mask was similar to those usually worn in medieval theaters. It had a smiling face on it, but in this setting it looked more creepy than funny. Apparently it was the Pied Piper, or Rat Lord, as you like. Soon an army of huge rats formed around him. They were much bigger than the ones our heroes had seen in the sewers. Each of them was the size of a large dog, and this strange stranger stood in the middle of the horde talking to himself. It was all for the Lake Kingdom. The team was still standing in front of the teleporter, and had already started to go inside. The bright light flooded their bodies just a moment more, and they would be at home in cozy taverns, where they would drink alcohol until the wee hours of the morning and eat delicious food. The player looked at his team and once again praised them for a job well done. A satisfied smile shone on his face. Well, let them rest tonight. Jupiter put his huge cigar in his mouth again and said irritably, She doesn't know if she can rest well tonight. It is hard to believe that this city is hiding thicker than water. The woman apparently wanted to explore this place some more. Maybe there are still some treasures here. Lily was sighing heavily at this time. The girl was very happy that they would finally get away from this horrible place. However, the mercenary. Everything did not calm down. She could not even imagine what happened to this place. Moreover, it was the darkness. It was definitely unusual. It is an unusual night that descends on cities with the passing of the sun. It is something more oppressive and horrible. She turned to the player and asked, Did he have anything to say about it? The guy was silent. They were still standing in front of the teleporter. There was a slight pause between them. He began to reminisce. He didn't have anything to say at the moment. Even though he had completely gone through the game, how and why the Lake Kingdom had become like this had not been revealed to him yet. However, there was one suggestion for that reason. He should go to the center of the city and search for all its secrets. Well, but that's for later. He smiled and said they'd deal with it all in order. For now, they would have to go back to regain their strength. They had already traveled a very long and hard way. All of this would be left to her later. Jupiter sighed and said that she doubted she could fall asleep sober. She would have to get drunk again to get rid of the intrusive thoughts. The woman had a feeling that everything was not as simple as it seemed at first glance. Well, next time she would surely come back here and follow the place up and down. Unexpectedly to herself, Lily began to share her fondness for alcohol. One raised her hand and said that they'd better have a drink together tonight. Something really strong. That seemed to be the only thing that would help her sleep tonight. Jupiter smiled and took the stroller with the girl and rolled it somewhere far away towards the exit of this town. The player looked after them and thought to himself that it turns out that these two get along well, although at first glance you cannot say so. Demian smiled. He said that he would return to the temple after all this. He still had goosebumps from the experience, and it seemed that only a strong prayer could restore his spiritual strength. The boy was definitely not ready for such a journey, and he would need a good moral and spiritual recovery. He approached the player and said that if he prayed, he could regain some strength. The guy was trembling, and it was obvious that he was really scared. The player nodded his head. Okay, so be it. He turned to Lukos and said that they should rest too. The knight nodded readily. He wanted to fall into sweet sleep himself, to restore his energy. The moon had already risen, and was illuminating the surroundings with its bright pale light. Lucas asked, Is he going to go down into the dungeon again? The player replied that yes, but not until the next defensive battle, but why? Lucas asked, Don't they have to go scouting and find out which monster will attack next? The guy seemed to understand why the guy was clowning around. He turned to him and said that they seemed to know everything already. Lucas looked at him in surprise. What was he talking about? But they had only just met rats, hadn't they? Yes, they did. 
The player said that next time they would be fighting against a large squad of sewer rats. Time to get ready for those critters. The lake realm. It is teeming with rats. They are perhaps the only monsters to be feared here. They are the only inhabitants of this place. And over the years, they have breed and here just countless. At first, these things will fill every available space, every research area. Their population reaches a limit. They become too numerous. And then they crawl out of the dungeon and head upstairs. Plus, they'll exterminate every living thing. They were already standing in the backyard of the manor and talking. It was just the player and Lucas. Yes, the monsters they have seen. And there are some that have yet to be encountered. The knight raised his head in surprise and nodded his head in agreement. The doors opened and the bright light from the candles hit them in the eyes. The player summoned his servant and asked, Is everything ready? Are hot baths and good food ready? The bespectacled man, however, seemed troubled about something. He literally fell down the stairs and kept shouting at the top of his voice. We have an emergency. It's a total disaster. What happened? The player stared at him in surprise. Was it something again? Ader started gibbering. He said there would be no reinforcements. His eyes were frantic. He was literally shaking with fear. The player did not immediately understand what he heard, but little by little he began to understand the meaning of what was said. Goggles repeated that central city, and all the surrounding neighborhoods said that they couldn't send troops. At this moment, a chill ran down the guy's back. What the hell? Everything was normal after all. What could have happened during his absence? Answer the real bullshit. Their dialogue was interrupted by a stomach rumbling. It seemed Lucas had gotten very hungry during the last outing, and he could use a good meal. There was an awkward pause between them, and the knight looked away in embarrassment and sighed. As soon as he realized what had happened, he started to apologize. He was incredibly ashamed of what he had done. Well, there was no point in talking about it now in this environment. He wouldn't be able to solve the problem right now anyway. Whatever. He'll deal with it tomorrow. Let him get the food right now. I'm hungry. The moon came out from behind the clouds, and a bright, pale light illuminated the manor. They had eaten well during the night and slept well. Now it was time to deal with the immediate problems. The first thing As woke up, the player came to his servant and asked what he said about yesterday's reinforcements. Why wouldn't there be any? Ader already awake since the morning, and scratching his head and adjusting his huge glasses, stammering began his report. A war had recently broken out on the Western Front. The Empire was currently fighting its enemy. The player didn't understand. What was the big deal? The servant continued. And that very thing. They are gathering all their soldiers to be transferred to the Western Front to reinforce their position there. Because the reinforcements they could send here won't be coming. They're in desperate need of troops themselves. The boy frowned. There's definitely something wrong here. What the hell kind of war is this? What enemy? He needed to think hard about all this. The Empire wages wars all the time, that's true, regardless of the time of day and so on. They are always at war with neighboring countries. But now they suddenly need all the soldiers of the South. It's kind of strange, moreover, he wasn't aware of what kind of enemy they are waging war with this time. And most interestingly, all of this happens exactly when he asks for reinforcements. The guy's thinking with his hands folded in front of him. It's all weird. More and more unanswered questions. What about the mercenaries? Did they get anyone? The servant said they're hiring all comers, but not many. And besides, these people aren't really interested in taking part in such ventures. It's a load of crap. Their last battle ended only a few days ago. It'd be foolish to expect the mercenary guild to be replenished at once. So what do we do? The boy rubbed his head, trying to get his thoughts in order. Things were getting worse and worse. Luga stood nearby and shifted from foot to foot, continuing to smile. Eventually, it's up to the channel player, and he grabbed the bespectacled man by the face. And why is he smiling? He cannot understand. How do they find the troops? The bespectacled man tried to say something. Actually, he has an idea, but there is one nuance. A man who can help them, he's a pain in the ass. Ash shouted that he could make a deal with the devil himself. Next battle, let him spill where to get soldiers. Ader smiled broadly and invited his lord to follow him. This git was definitely up to something, that's for sure. Soon they went outside and got the horses ready. The gambler was already seated and the servant stood beside him. 
Lucas politely inquired where was he going. There was confusion. This bespectacled man very rarely went out. Yes, and what was he even up to? The servant did not hesitate to answer that he was going to the past lord. I need to settle a couple of issues regarding the army. Smiling, he replied that they were going to McGaffer Cross. He immediately smiled his egregious smile, and his wide spectacles gleamed in the sun. Yea, and who are they at all? The servant replied that in brief, they are the people who protect the borders. They are in border fortresses like the one they are in now. These people have great authority in their power. They can even compare to the prince himself, as they have great responsibility on their shoulders. Compared to ordinary earls, they stand much higher. After all, they are tasked with protecting the front line from enemies, monsters, and natural disasters. In other words, they are not just nobles. They are military commanders. What are also responsible for the defense of their region. The servant yanked on the water and the horse leisurely moved forward. In a nutshell, how at the crossroads people began to arrive, this very cross was running everything here. They moved forward. The town was designated in his honor. Their horses moved forward. They had not the shortest road ahead of them, so there was time to discuss a few things. Family. It was this cross that paved the road and built the fort. A crossroads, it turns out. He came from a noble family and had defended this place for a long time since its creation. The player looked at the servant with disbelief and asked in surprise, so if this person had such powers of authority, power, and so on, then why did he step down? The southern front is far from the center. Speaking of frequency, this person has much more influence here. It's simply illogical. He has more influence than the emperor himself. What's the point of him leaving such a high position? It was just stupid to lose such an opportunity. However, Cross has resigned as lord and turned the city over to the center. That's why the ash took his place. It makes sense, then, because of the plot and the lore of the game. However, there was still one unanswered question. Why did this man give up the power and the earth that had been passed down through the generations? This thought did not give the player any rest. He had been pondering it all along. So why? The servant turned around and said that in a nutshell it would be quite difficult to tell it. It would be better if he heard about it firsthand himself. In any case, it would be better to talk once for himself. The way was indeed not very short but still they soon arrived at a large and beautifully decorated palace. To it lay a little narrow path, along which they went forward. Up close the mansion looked a little shabby, but it was still presentable. This slight dilapidation gave it a certain elegance. They stopped at the gate. Originally it was just a rest home. But after leaving his post, the Count moved here permanently. Almost the entire space of the house was covered with some kind of ivy. From afar it looked like a haunted house, but up close the feeling was only intensified. It seemed as if no one had lived in this house for a long time. Everything was covered with cracks. The windows were completely shuttered and nothing could be seen behind them. The guys stopped right in front of the gates. They were big, even a little bit bigger than in the player's mansion. They were also covered with thickets of that nasty ivy. The boy stopped in front of the doors and asked, Is there someone living here? It looks like it's been abandoned for a long time. The servant announced cheerfully that of course he regularly sends all sorts of important things here. The gate creaked open, letting them into the spacious courtyard. They were seen from afar by an old man who immediately asked loudly who was here. He looked at them from afar and did not seem particularly pleased with the unexpected visit. He had a bottle of alcohol in his hands, and the old man himself, or rather his appearance, showed that he was a regular drinker. How dare they come in here? Ah, go away. He told the guys to leave immediately. The old man had a red nose and a furious expression. Ader immediately waved his hands and started to greet the old man. He said it was him, didn't the old man recognize him? As soon as the owner of the house saw the servant, he immediately softened. His then he made more and more quiet. Ah, we're her secretary's friend. Long time no see. The player stood there and didn't understand anything. What's he talking about? What's he talking about? Is this the Count? It was hard to believe that this decrepit drunkard is the man who leads most of the army. The old man's whole appearance indicated that he was just a drunkard. But couldn't this man with a red nose and swollen face be the leader of a great army? The former lord of the city? That's nonsense. 
The Count looked at the boy, who continued to gibber on and on. The old man looked at him with swollen eyes. The servant said the Lord had guests. He had brought guests. It was as if the old man had woken up from a week-long binge. What? Guests? Hadn't he asked him not to bring anyone looking for him? But the servant wouldn't stop. He literally begged the old man to talk to the guest for a while. He assured him they had good information. Then, he pointed his finger at the player and said he was introducing him to the new lord, His Highness Ash von Hader Everblack. And the player stood there in the middle of it and didn't understand. Looked at him with a surprised look, as if he had not expected to see such an honored guest at his place. The guy coughed and tried to find words to somehow start a conversation with this dirty old man. He did not understand what to talk about with a man who except the bottle has not seen anything in his life. But still, the guy gave out a friendly smile, or at least something like it. Coughing, he said he was very pleased to meet this count. He, the youngest of the emperor's sons and the newly appointed Lord of Crossroads Ash. Some sort of cunning gleamed in his eyes. Even though this ruler prince is a tyrant, he can't have a bad relationship with the count. It's a bit awkward to speak formally, but it's the right thing to do. It's like the new private is talking to his superior. It's a funny situation. He walked up to the old man and began to speak voluptuously with a playfully benevolent tone. They came here to talk about some business. Before the guy could say anything, however, the old man cut him off with, Get the fuck out of here. The guy was even a little taken aback by this warm welcome. Naturally, he comes to some old man and he sends him away. The guy was dumbfounded for a second. That's the reception. He never liked to talk to high-ranking people. But this old man was also very nasty. This was out of line. He was ready to burst with rage, but the old man continued to shout, spitting saliva out of his mouth. Can't you hear me? Get out. Are you deaf? Yeah, it looks like this old man's dialogue is going to be short. The dominance of the protagonist. It's a hierarchy with a firm class system. Even if the count is in these lands. How dare he disregard formalities when talking to princes? That's not to mention bringing him back Vaughn. Good Lord, what an uneducated people. Ash immediately changed in his face. There was no trace of his feigned friendliness. His eyes flashed bright red fire. The boy shouted, Isn't that a little impertinent on his part? The boy was simply furious. How dare this decrepit old man treat him like this? This is crossing all boundaries. He rested his hands on his side and said that now he would remind him of the hierarchy. But he stopped halfway through. Fuck it. The Count didn't seem to be listening to him at all. He pulled out a huge, weighty sword, more like a lance used by medieval knights and an equally large shield. He took a few steps forward. In such a strict law-abiding empire, what does it mean, he thought, to raise a weapon on a member of the ruling family? Surely it is an encroachment on the throne. No self-respecting hierarch could tolerate such treatment of his person. However, the old man didn't seem to be embarrassed at all. He pointed his huge bayonet at the prince and prepared to attack. His face was glistening with rage. Saliva was flying from his mouth. Definitely this old man has them all at home, and crazy people should be avoided. It's a fucking truism. The old man didn't relent. He tried his best to kick the no-call guests out of his place. Get out while she only uses the words away. The guy had no choice but to leave the old man alone. He said goodbye that he would come back and hopefully next time we'll have a conversation. Okay. But the Count wouldn't stop. He shouted at them not to come any closer. Let them leave him alone at last. Well, they had no choice but to leave this strange place, and no less strange crazy old man. Meanwhile, the player was trying his best to hold Lucas, who was already raring to fight. Patience, patience. Yes, this old man still has a way to go. Earl Cross, full name Charles Cross. Never appeared in the game defense of the Empire, but the reason he knows him is that he is the father of the best tank in the game, Evangeline Cross. This girl has incredible skills. She is one of the most popular characters of SSR rank every self-respecting gamer knows about it. But still, she has a very nasty father, with whom it is impossible to dialogue at all. However, the guy did not give up hope that this drunkard definitely has a good side. Maybe he will still manage to get along with him, ask. I don't know. The guy sighed heavily and squinted his eyes. Okay, the first pancake is understandable, but how to talk to him? They soon left the manor and headed for their home. On the way, the player asked, so how this drunkard would be able to solve his problem? 
The servant replied that this count has his own personal army, and she is quite numerous. That's why he brought them to this place. His army is a squad of elite soldiers who are only loyal to their superior, and if they could convince the count, it would greatly help them with their problem. These men are incredibly strong, well-trained and practiced, therefore, is a great asset in the military industry. The guy thought for a second and put his finger to his lips. Yes, it all sounded more than good, but there was one but. He absolutely must persuade this count, but how? There is no conversation involved. After all, he can't even meet him face to face. How can there even be dialogue in such a state? But suddenly the bespectacled man gave hope. He said that there is one way. The player immediately turned to him. What is it? His eyes lit up with interest. The boy scratched his nose and said that sometimes only a drunkard can understand another drunkard. He showed his hands a gesture signifying a shot. The boy fell silent. He no longer liked the idea. Damn it. He wanted to lead a righteous and godly life. But this damn world won't let him. He's always getting into trouble. Now he's got to become a drunk to get another drunk to give him an army. But so much for diplomacy. Soon they approached the Count's estate again. Ash began to call out to the old man to get through to him. A light evening was already beginning to descend on the land, and the sky was dyed in bright, warm colors. The Count naturally heard the uninvited guests, and again and fiercely rushed to defend his possessions. He again had his shield and sword in his hands. What is the matter? He's had enough of life. But he had been warned. Never to come here again. The Count, however, faltered at the half-word. He stood outside his domain and looked at the prince who was standing beside a small wagon, in which there was evidently something covered with white sheets. The Count stopped and looked at the boy closely. What is that? The boy smirked and threw aside the covers. Under it was a lot of gold, gold bars, different jewelry in front of this could not stand any man. Money is a great power after all. The guy sighed. This? It's money, he stretched out in a smile. This is what he loves the most. He hoped that this was what would help him find common ground with this old man after all. You can never have too much money. Ash. There's still a wild degenerate. He was a womanizer who loved a wild lifestyle of bacchanalia and embarrassment to all and sundry. He did not shrink from any method, the most inhuman way to win attention. And universal love was a cool thing for him. A degenerate like him would never have come to the negotiations empty-handed, as he had always prepared a generous gift in advance. The gold glittered in the sun, casting sun bunnies. Of course, he brought with him a heap of expensive liquor gold, and other valuables that were certainly in the esteem of the higher ranks of society. He pulled out one of the bottles filled with expensive liquor. The boy waved it in front of the old man's face. Let's have a drink, Count. He smiled and squinted at the old man. The boy was in the bull's eye, naturally. The old man wouldn't be able to resist it. Or is it that he doesn't want to? A natural and bargain was heard in this question. The boy stood in front of the old man, who no longer looked so belligerent. Seeing the drink, the Count seemed to lose all his ardor and began to refuse. Who said he didn't want to ask? The plan worked like clockwork, naturally. This greedy old man could not refuse such gifts. He immediately changed his rhetoric from a squabbling old man to the most friendly and hospitable man on earth. A wide smile stretched across his face. Surely enter your highnesses. This is all the goodness let him not forget. How nice that he's so predictable. At this time, poor Lily was having nightmares in her bedroom. In her dreams, the dastardly prince was constantly putting her to work, doing hellish dirty work, constantly using her as a human shield. The girl still couldn't sleep and was tossing and turning in her bed. And in the meantime, the prince was engaged in a kind of diplomacy, trying to establish trade relations with other members of the royal nobility, and a bright light flickered inside the cloister. Over here. Soon he found himself right inside. The furnishings were shabby, but still indicative of a rather noble person living here. There was a spacious hallway, a lot of expensive furniture with expensive satin upholstery. The boy went inside and a musty odor hit his nose. Apparently the room had not been ventilated for a long time. He stepped onto the creaky floor, which immediately bounced under his weight. It looked like it hadn't been renovated since the day this place was founded. Beer bottles sprang up from somewhere under his feet and were lying here and there. What a mess. 
he thought as he stepped into this place for the first time. He had to put his hand over his face to keep the aroma down. It was as if he'd come to a distillery, and all day long he hadn't smelled so bad that the odor alone could make him intoxicated. He's not just a drinker, he's a real alcoholic. Meanwhile, the old man fussed somewhere and looked for glasses in which to pour expensive drinks. Soon he found what he was looking for and placed before the prince two exquisite glasses, on which was carved the family crest. It had been a long time since he'd had a drink with someone. Already he had changed completely and he smelled of hospitality. Ash looked at the glasses in disbelief. Was this glass clean? The old man smirked and replied in a laughing voice that even if the house was a mess, the glasses should be clean. Isn't that showing respect for alcohol? It was clear from everything that the old man was very reverent about drinks. He immediately took out one of the bottles that the guest had brought, so what is it? The old man took out one of the bottles with interest and began to twirl it in his hands. As soon as he noticed what was written on the bottle, his face lit up with happiness. First year peacemaker's whiskey. My mother, he's priceless. Apparently it was the first grade of alcohol, and the old man, who was naturally the kind of person who would place a special value on such things, was incredibly happy to see such a gift in his collection. Peacemaker. Middle name of the current emperor. This means that this drink was made in the year of his coronation. An incredibly exquisite drink that every fan would like to have in his collection. It also means it's incredibly expensive. The guy had made a good choice, now he had the old man all to himself. How simple he is. He brought this drink to the old man, so please let him treat it well. The old man is already pouring the alcohol into glasses. That was the meaning of his action. To gain trust and then get what he wants. The guy smiled. Now it's just a matter of waiting for the old man to get drunk and then convince him to give him his army. Ash wanted to observe at least some rules of etiquette and held out a glass to the count, wishing to take a drink with him. But the old man did not take any trouble to knock over the glass and almost drained the whiskey in a gulp. Having finished drinking, the old man sighed heavily and smiled even more. The alcohol made his face even redder. This is what good alcohol means. What was expected from a quality drink. It even feels different. The prince didn't seem to share his enthusiasm. How can one appreciate the taste of a drink if he drinks it in one gulp like this? They sat at a long table opposite each other. It was a little dark. Only the light from the window illuminated the room. The count looked at him carefully. But if he wants to compare it with the cheap drinks he usually drinks, shouldn't he follow the same pattern? That way the evaluation would be fair. Ash is a bit freaked out by that, isn't he? He doesn't drink, so he can't say for sure. It's like he's an alcoholic. He's not going to get drunk in the company of someone like that. Even in real life, he was a whisperer. And here, he's not even a whisperer. Besides, it looks like this old man won't let him go. Still, he wanted to talk more about the matter for which he had come here. The Count had already drained another glass, but he wouldn't even listen to anything. He shouted for the lad not to change the subject. The old man poured another glass and said the prince, can just get the hell out of here if he wants to talk about anything other than alcohol. The boy stammered, let him give at least an appetizer of some sort. Drinking without an appetizer is somehow not comical anymore. The Count looked at him with a serious look, as a teacher usually looks at a negligent student. This drunkard drinks only on an empty stomach. You can get gastritis that way, can't you? Someone drinks. The boy who got intoxicated from ordinary beer now had to drink whiskey like water. The old man took out a small bag of seeds from somewhere in his pocket. He placed it on the table and invited the boy to taste it. What are these? The boy looked at the offered treats in disbelief. He didn't want to taste them at all. If this old man seemed to eat only alcohol, one could only guess what he was eating. However, the old man said without a fraction of confusion that they were dried fruits. He made them from fruit picked from his orchard. They have an orchard? The boy was surprised. Is there really anything here other than alcohol? He took a small seed in his hand and prepared to put it in his mouth. He pointed to the window. Right outside the window, see? Right outside the manor. And indeed, a little distance from the house itself, there was a small garden where apparently a family of grapes. It's small. It's kind of a hobby to look after it. The trees there looked kind of stunted. They were rather astonishing to be in such a place. Well, the guy thanked him for the treat, but he didn't have time to finish the sentence. As soon as he put the small dried fruit in his mouth, it felt like he was chewing on some kind of burnt rubber. 
He immediately spit the contents out of his mouth. There was still an unpleasant taste in it. This stuff was really gross. The guy looked at the treat and asked with disgust what was it. This stuff looked like some kind of rock. So bitter and sour. How did he think he was supposed to eat it? The old man looked at him with a reproachful look and asked resentfully. How dare he spit out something he had nurtured with so much labor? The old man took a small bite, too. How rude. However, after a second, he too spat out the contents outside. Ash looked at him in surprise. What the hell is he doing? What the fuck? The old man wiped his mouth with his hand and continued spitting. That's disgusting. He tried so hard, but it tastes like garbage. The old man almost cried at such a loss he couldn't bear. He slid the boy a bag of this disgusting fruit. I told him it was a gift. So why is he giving it to him if he can't even eat it? It's an abomination. The old man smirked and said that if he could, he would eat it himself. So why would he give it to him? At this time, he filled his glass again. The old man looked and drank the drink like water and did not get drunk at all. It is evidently so. The guy did take the gift after all. After all, it would be rude if he refused on the first day of meeting him, but obviously the old man is talking some nonsense. But he sounds very convincing. What a pinchuga. Strig, meanwhile, picked up one of those strange things and started twirling it around in his hands. The intersection is in the southernmost part, right? For some reason, he decided to let himself be reasoned with. The sun was already nearing sunset. Their sowings had dragged on, but it's all in the name of democracy, remember? The days are long. The land is fertile. They say there's no better place to grow fruit. It's great, isn't it? But the guy couldn't understand why the fruit tasted so bad. You can grow so many things here. Then why does it taste so bad? The old man smirked and replied that they say that whatever you sow on this land will grow in abundance even without proper care. The man lowered his eyes and looked somewhere in front of him. Except if we're attacked by monsters every day. He gloomed. Oh, is this conversation starting to move in the right direction? Monsters are destroying fields. Farmers are dying. Soon there will be nothing left here at all. But even if these things die, their bodies start leaking filth that soaks into the soil. Is that what happens then? Does he know? He looked at the boy who was flapping his eyes big and understanding nothing. The old man continued. The whole area becomes contaminated. The earth becomes cursed. All plants wither and die. And nothing else grows on this soil. All that is left here is a lifeless desert. That is why, around the crossroads and there are no fields on which to grow anything. The old man said the last words with a kind of bitterness, as if he were about to cry. The Count looked at his glass with a concerned look, looked at the golden-colored alcohol made from fruit from varnishes, from fruit from the varnishes that would never grow on these lands. There would only be lifeless expanses left here, where everything would die. They looked out of the window and the prince asked, Then in that case, why is he gardening? But if it is not profitable, it would be logical to give it up. The Count fell silent and sighed heavily. He drank a few sips from his glass and after a little silence said, Everyone must do at least one stupid thing in life, isn't that so? And there was an incredible bitterness in that expression, as if he had lost something very dear to his heart, something he could never get back. My folly is a garden. The man sighed heavily and seemed ready to cry now. He took another look at his garden, which was slowly fading before his eyes. There was no longer the growth of grapes as before. Now there were only the dilapidated shadows of the past. The bottle of other liquor was already completely empty. The Earl continued to drink too much of it. Now he couldn't get drunk even if he wanted to. That seemed to be all he cared about. This is crazy. I think it's time to get to the point. The boy thought about it too and poured another shot of alcohol. He leaned over to the old man and asked in a husky voice, Does he know why he's here today? The old man darkened again and asked, didn't he tell him to get out of here if he wanted to bring up any other subject besides drinking? Eventually the boys got sick of it, or maybe the alcohol had gone to his head, but he slammed the bottle down on the table and shouted. Then he just got a little bit sharper. So let the old man throw him out if he wants to, but before he does, let him say what he came for. The guy started talking. He said the monsters are coming here again. Their numbers are overwhelming. The old man continued to sit silent. He looked at the boy with a look as if he doubted what he wanted to do. 
Naturally, there was disbelief in his eyes. But the boy, it did not embarrass him at all, and he continued to talk. The last time they fought 1,000 living armors, it was a mortal battle. They were able to stop that foul thing, but the walls were badly damaged. In addition, their army has been greatly thinned. Since then, there are very few able-bodied soldiers left, and it is unlikely that they will be able to fight back the next time these creatures decide to break free. Then, everyone is in mortal danger. The boy had already lost all shame and spoke frankly. He said that he desperately needed the Count's support. He needed soldiers under the Count's command. The guy looked at him with such a look as if he was begging for help. It was not peculiar, as the guy was used to getting everything just by the snap of a finger, but here, he said. The old man was silent, sighed heavily and closed his eyes. There are no soldiers under his command. This phrase sounded like thunder at the base of the sky. The boy didn't stop. He said he knew everything about his personal army. The old man interrupted him and said that he had friends whom he had trained with whom he had shared the battlefield all his life. But when he gave up the title, when he stopped fighting shoulder to shoulder with them, when he lowered his sword and shield, those men too faded into oblivion, becoming only legends. They no longer fight as hard and sharp as they used to. It is now generally unknown where they are and what is wrong with them. They are all retired, doing their usual bodies and unlikely to return to military life. However, the lad did not relent. The alcohol he had drunk had worked after all, and it betrayed his strength. He leaned over to the old man and said, Let him call on them. The old man took a sip of alcohol and said it was just useless. This land is not worth defending. The old man looked at the small grape seed in his hand. The guy didn't want to accept it. What's he talking about? This is just some nonsense. But the old man stood his ground. He didn't want to make any concessions to this little upstart. Let them waste people's lives trying to protect this worthless front line. Best evacuate everyone from the place. Ask for it and forget it like a bad dream. Ash stared at him with a furious look and didn't want to believe it. The old man, as if he wasn't embarrassed, he continued to chug alcohol. This coming from a family that made it their duty to defend this land. Something after all this, it was hard to believe that this man even held a weapon. However, the old man got ahead of his question and continuing to saw him with his gaze asked, why did he come south? This question put the boy in a stupor. He did not know what to answer, what to tell him. He himself did not know why he was here. To tell him the truth. He wouldn't believe him, he didn't have the strength to lie. However, he had to get out of this situation somehow. The old man sighed heavily and said that everything here was dying. The soil no longer yields fruit. There is no hope for the future. The sun was already beginning to sink illuminating the sky with its warm rays. The old man looked at his sudden guest with a stern look of fury. He gave him advice, from one who had spent his life defending this place. He should leave here as soon as possible. There's nothing left to catch. All this land is long dead. There's no hope, no future here. We should just leave and forget it like a bad dream. There's no hope anywhere. Let him get out of here before the curse of this land eats him whole. It's just no use. No matter how hard he tries, he won't succeed. He left the palace with mixed feelings. Lucas was waiting for him there, preparing the horses for departure. As soon as the knight saw his lord, he jumped up to him and asked him how it had gone. Had he succeeded in persuading the old man? The guy shook his head. No, he failed. But he has a gift. The guy held out to the knight the very pouch the old man had given him. The man looked at it with an attentive gaze. The pouch was the only thing he had gotten out of this conversation. Anyway, nothing is solved in one day, right? The boy looked at the gift and sighed heavily. So he's planning on coming back? Lucas asked it with some hope. But it's worth the time and effort. The old man will give in to me so easily. This man is already exhausted from his life and is unlikely to be inclined to make a final decision rather quickly. By the way, what happened to that count? Lucas looked at him in surprise, waiting for an answer. Still, the player had been gone for a long time. The boy jumped up on his horse and turned to the knight. He said that this old man seemed to have had it pretty easy on his journey through life. He asked, did Lucas know anything about it? The knight thought for a moment and shook his head. No, he still couldn't remember anything. The boy looked somewhere in the distance where the road went. 
The bespectacled man said he needed to hear everything from the Count himself. The boy sighed and as if to growl. Still, nothing is done in a day. But this waiting and the stubbornness of the old man was just getting to him. He remembered the servant's words to him before he left. Damn fucking principal. He remembered the smirk of the bespectacled man. That weirdo is definitely hiding something. He was starting to annoy the player more and more with every second. He knows something, but he stubbornly won't say anything. In any case, a belief is a belief you can't just take and break the will of a person, especially one who was involved in the fighting. Everyone knows that these people don't bend their character. Now they have to do what they can, whatever they can. The riders mounted their horses and prepared for their home. Fix the wall and prepare for battle. That was the first priority. No matter what cards they hold now, sooner or later the monsters will come, and no one could guarantee that there wouldn't be more of them. The player approached his fort and looked around. He must give his best and kill all these things with all his might, no matter what happens. It was time to go back to the crossroads. They still had a lot of things they needed to finish as soon as possible. They had plenty of work to do. The boy looked ahead with a serious look. The next morning, work boiled over. The sword that was stuck right in the fortress had already been removed, but it left a big hole. The fortress was badly damaged and needed to be restored to its integrity as soon as possible. This would require a lot of materials and manpower, but they had no choice as they were operating under time constraints. The player had climbed up and was now standing near the huge breach that had been formed by the sword strike. They had just pulled out that huge sword. Today they would clean up the debris and get to work on rebuilding the wall. The commander of the builders reported back for further action. The boy left the surroundings with a glance and told them not to throw away the sword shards but to spread them along the entire line of the fort under the wall. It would make a great barrier, a kind of barrier of sharp shards. It might help them in the battle. A perfect trap for the rat they did so and now there was a huge field of barbed shards in front of the fortress itself. It was doubtful that this barrier could prevent the rats from getting through, but still better than nothing. They needed to take every opportunity to increase their power. The boy looked around at the huge opening that had been created by the battle. How long will it take to repair it? The builder hesitated, as if calculating something in his mind. The breach is much larger than they expected, so... The man faltered and tried to find the right words. Eventually, that tired the guy out, and he asked, What's the closer to the point? How long does it take to repair? The builder stood at attention, and replied that it would take at least ten days. There was a pause between them for a second. The guy sighed heavily. Ten days. The next attack is about a week away. They have very little time, resources too. Reinforcements don't look like they're coming. We have to convince the old man somehow. It's worse than he thought. There's not enough time. It's very, very fucked up. You can't subdue the junction wall, which is the epitome of empire architecture with a couple of stones. But it's worth a try. If you can't do it right, you'll have to improvise, because that's what military strategy is all about. The guy frowned and said he'd take care of the materials and the workers, have them do their best to finish the repairs within a week. The builder would have liked to object to something, but he was interrupted. Ash looked at him with a fierce look. His eyes glittered with red fire. Well, let him speak. He's listening intently. He approached the man almost closely, and the sight of him almost made the builder cry. Yes, he was well aware that this was an impossible task, but they had no other choice. There was only one thought in his head. Three thousand monsters. Three huge rats the size of dogs that they met during the free exploration would be fucking three thousand. Images of his recent dungeon exploration flashed through his mind. A chill immediately ran down his spine. Yes, this just seemed like an impossible task. They need that wall. By all means. If they can't fix it by the deadline, this whole estate and indeed the whole city will be overrun by rats. And then nothing will save them at all. The builder realized it himself. He tilted his head. And Ogryumov said that they would try their best. The boy put his hand on his shoulder as if trying. He thanked the Builder. He would never forget his hard work and universal sacrifice. He tried to boost morale in some way, realizing that all of this was simply necessary right now. Then he turned to the other workers. Hey, they're actually here to protect the world. 
Let them build the wall as fast as they can. The workers nodded in agreement, but they didn't have much choice. For the past few days, he's been repairing the wall. In addition, he visited the Count every day and drank with him at night in his manor. Still, diplomacy must be properly developed. He tried his best to convince the old man that he just needed this army, but the old man was stubbornly unwilling to make concessions for a long time. There was no conversation between him and the Count. It was more like a mutual drowning in alcohol. Only alcohol. They drank heavily, and the boy was beginning to enjoy it. However, the matter still didn't want to move from the dead point. At this time, when their leader was drunk, all the workers were working hard in several shifts. The defense line was steadily being repaired. Yes, it was difficult. But it was a small piece at a time, not a whole picture. And in the end, the protagonist's liver was steadily collapsing. He suffered from hangovers every day. It was just unbearable torture to drink with this old man. It was as if he was made of alcohol. The guy could not afford to drink such an amount of alcohol. Countless amounts of alcohol went into his stomach. Now he was like this old man himself, as if not to become an alcoholic at this rate. After several days of numerous drinking, the Count finally opened his mouth for something other than alcohol. And there was finally a dialogue between the two of them. <sighs> During one of the evening's drinking phases, Graf asked him an unexpected question. Does the boy have someone he loves? The Count held a drinking glass in his hand, and this question hung in the silence of the night. A neat candlestick was burning on the table, the candles on it already beginning to melt, pooling wax that had already begun to drip down. Silence hung between them for a second. This question put both of them in a stupor. The player didn't know what to answer. In the end, he looked at the Count with already decently tipsy eyes and asked again, What did he mean? This question sounded very strange indeed. The Count coughed and irritably repeated his question. He asked if he had someone he loved. The man asked this question and sipped his drink from his glass again. The boy was still silent. I don't know what to say to him. This question really put him in a stupor. The Count grinned and exhaled heavily. Of course, he believes that there are no such people. The old man was troubled and even upset about something. The boy nodded his head. The old man was right, even despite all this. However, the old man didn't want to get behind him in any way. Let him think hard. Does he really have no one? The boy really thought about it. He started going over all the people he knew in his head. Someone. Someone he loves. The guy thought about it and tried to put his thoughts in order, but alcohol was getting in the way. He started going through his family acquaintances, close friends. He was alone in his world. Even before he became a streamer. He remembered his childhood when he constantly had to fight his loneliness. He remembered himself as a little boy, standing in a dark world without any support. He had no one. Indeed, all this time he belonged to himself. No one especially loved him, and he kept up with it, too. He had no special people. Everyone was just some kind of puppet. Every night he was left to his own devices. A lonely loner. Sounds romantic to me. Then he started streaming gained an audience and these people seemed to become something meaningful to him. A subject who gave him love, love and attention that he had not received all his conscious life. And that's how he became who he is today. All these people who watched him days and nights expressed their love to him. He could literally feel it through the screen. It seems these people who wrote in the chat room, watched his broadcasts were the only ones who didn't feel bad for wasting their time on him. Of course, these people asked him stupid questions, made him perform stupid and even sometimes disgusting actions, but it was a kind of distraction from real life for him. In principle, he did not complain. It was just a gathering of people who watched it willy-nilly. They were just watching interested then as he played games, talked to them, well, and everything like that. The guy started to push his thoughts out of his head. No, this love wasn't mutual. He hated to even think about it. Anyway, no matter how much he thought about it, nothing came into his head anyway. After all, he didn't have that person whom he could call beloved, dear, or otherwise. When he finished thinking, he rubbed his head and said that there was probably no such person. The old man, as if noticing his confusion, sighed and said that he seemed to have had a hard life. For a second, there was a flicker of sympathy in his words. Strange, of course. The boy looked at him with a stern look. Why would this old man sympathize with him? Why was he taking such an interest in him? 
It was impossible to get a word out of him before, and now he was ready for such revelations. The boy grinned and answered, And this is coming from a man who prefers to spend all his time drinking alone? This mockery struck him as disgusting. The old man laughed as if to ignore the joke. And this count, does he love anyone? Fine, beat the enemy with his own weapon. After that question, the count did a little love. He began to stir the alcohol in his glass and as if to become sad. The old man apparently did not want to remember these moments from his life, but the boy made him dive into his past again. Now, the old man didn't look the way he had just a few hours ago. Yes, he loved his wife. She was the only one he'd ever loved in his entire life. She was the only ray of light in his life. And it was very hard for him to part with this most precious person. He closed his mouth for a second and felt that his words seemed to hurt this man. But then again, who conducts diplomacy like that? The old man continued. However, his wife died three years ago. The guy after these words became silent completely. He felt ashamed of his boorish behavior for a second. The old man continued to talk and poured more alcohol into his glass. He said that his wife had been torn apart by monsters in the garden, and so had to be buried in an empty coffin. The old man didn't seem the least bit embarrassed to talk about it, but there was an inhuman sadness in his words. The old man finished pouring alcohol into his glass and as if frozen in place. He looked at his glass and did not dare to continue his conversation, as if gathering his thoughts. It was evident that the subject was very painful to him. He looked before him with a kind of devastated look and continued speaking in a colorless voice. There is a curse that is passed on to everyone, every lord of these lands. A curse? The boy raised an eyebrow in surprise. The old man seemed to understand his question and began to tell him, This city, or precious you yourself. Perhaps one day he will have to choose between the two, and on this choice depends the future fate. The boy was silent and stubbornly looked into the old man's eyes, waiting for him to continue. He was interested in it, but it sounded more than strange. There was no exception to this. Not the earliest lords, not his father, not his grandfather. No one could escape this curse. All suffered the same fate, and it was a terrible fate. The old man reached for his glass with a trembling hand, his hand trembling as if he were severely cold. Was there any doubt that it was the alcohol that made it shiver? It seemed the old man was afraid. He had been forced to plunge into the memories again, and it was all hurting him. After a moment's thought, the old man added that now, the moment had come for himself. His voice trembled and he seemed ready to cry now. With tired and sad eyes, he stared like a statue in front of him. Then there was no activity behind the monsters for several decades. For a short period of time, peace and prosperity reigned. People lived their normal lives and had no idea of the approaching danger. People lived a quiet and peaceful life, however, there was no income. Because of this, he had to open his own business to somehow replenish the treasury. There was no choice. He had to make every effort. His wife told him that they should go into farming, as it was quite profitable. The boy looked at the old man in surprise. Was that something that could be done outside the fort? It sounded surprising, to say the least. The old man nodded his head. A war had broken out in the lands of the northern front. So the empty and peaceful lands of the south were ideal. Fertile soil and all. In short, you could plant anything you wanted. Monsters were also relatively rare, so the earth was clean. They thought it would be good for farming, so they expanded their holdings. It was a good idea for a while. People prospered and didn't know the need for anything. Rumors of the fertile soil spread far beyond their domain, and people came from even the farthest lands to sow their plot. Monsters were few and far between. They could easily defend themselves, and for a time everything went well. People were happy, and agriculture flourished and multiplied. This orchard they saw from the window was located at the very end of the border. It was thriving. Its wealth was multiplying. Things were going relatively well. The treasury was replenished, and the city soon became a thriving metropolis. The old man looked out the window and said that his wife had taken the responsibility, the initiative to plant trees and sow the land in the most dangerous places. It was a very noble move, but also selfless. The old man was silent for a moment, as if sinking even deeper into his memories. He said he still remembered how she had fed him grapes from her dirty hands. He was ready to cry. 
The fruit they grew that first year was worthless. However, it was the first thing they could do. In spite of all this, the fruit was the sweetest thing the man had ever tasted in his life. It was a complete idea. For a moment, he even had hope that it could all last forever. The old man rejoiced, and there was no limit to his joy. He was glad that he could finally stop killing countless monsters and finally do something peaceful, and instead would work in the fields, picking fruit thereby earning a living. What's life got to do with asking for a sign? It's fine. It just takes time. I wondered how long he could go on living like that. The old man even blushed for a second. There was no trace of his alcoholic intoxication. Despite how much he drank, his speech became more and more distinct. But of course, it was all impossible. It all remained only in his fantasies. The old man lowered his head and looked down frustrated. That was the second year they had been farming. It was this year that had been the decisive year. Then, everything had changed for the worse. They received information that about a hundred huge monsters were approaching towards the city. There were too many of these creatures to defend themselves. In a flash, he returned to the intersection to keep the defenses there. He remembered his wife saying goodbye to him and telling the man to be careful. That was the last time he had seen her so beautiful. The man went to the defense of the city, leaving his wife alone, with no idea what might happen. The old man sighed heavily and was silent for a second. Apparently, he was approaching a moment he clearly didn't want to remember his whole life. Just back in town, he had learned that the monsters had split into two groups. Now, there were two places in danger. Monsters separated from the group and rushed into the farmland. She began to wreak havoc there, killing everyone in its path. A lot of civilians died. They tore people apart, leaving no one alive. It was a real nightmare, this whole peaceful agricultural town just drowned in blood. The main group of monsters had already attacked the city, and the Count had to choose where he would go. He saw his city being attacked by countless monsters. A fateful decision had to be made. Then he was faced with the choice of whether he would save his wife on the farm or protect the tens of thousands of people in the city. The man stood as if in a daze. He did not know what to do. His fate depended on his choice. The man was silent again. The candles began to rattle. It was obvious that he was overcome by incredible tension. To remember all this was certainly very painful. He raised his eyes to the boy and asked in a tired voice, What did he think the old man had chosen? There was a small pause in the air after that question. Of course, everyone already understood. The boy nodded his head. The city. Of course it was the city. There was no doubt left. Like any other warlord, he would prefer to save the civilians. The old man nodded his head, of course the city like all his ancestors. He had chosen the city because of the principles and rules he had learned in the army. He left his wife to her fate in order to save the people. He rushed to the rescue and they fought the monsters. They finally won after a few hours without a humiliating fight. By then he had hurriedly returned home. When he arrived at his home township, a heartbreaking sight awaited him there. Many of the inhabitants were simply torn to pieces, pieces of human bodies lying on the road. All the soil was soaked with blood, and there was a distinct odor of iron in the air. The fields were destroyed, all the people killed. The sight was simply monstrous. Some dozen monsters had torn nearly a hundred people to shreds, including his wife. The old man said this almost crying. Everything was destroyed, everything he loved, everything he'd worked so hard to build up over the years. He wanted to forget it, but still the shards of the past cut into his heart. This count had been sure of his calling as a military man, and had paid the price of losing everything he held dear. The old man trembled, overwhelmed by anger. What was the problem? Perhaps the problem was the secure border that protected them from the monsters. Perhaps there was a planning error there. Perhaps it was because his domain had overextended and thus disturbed the monsters who came to avenge the invasion of their territory. The old man shook his head. No, it was all his fault. His fault was that he had abandoned his wife at a time when she needed his support the most. He had abandoned the man he loved and chosen the city. He obeyed nothing but his own principle. Before the man's eyes stood the girl who had once been a beautiful woman, his wife. Now he had lost her forever, leaving behind only memories. The Count lowered his eyes and brought the mug of alcohol to his mouth again. I can see why that old man drowns his sorrows. 
Accurately calling him crazy, she never understood how he could prefer her mother's town. She was understandable, too, and now the old man realized it, too. After a few days, she left the place, and the old man was left alone. All he had left was a shattered memory that would remain forever in his heart. And besides that, what's worst of all is the incredible guilt he feels towards his wife and daughter for not being able to protect them. And in the end, this is what resulted from defending the city. The old man began to shake. He was ready to cry right there. It was obvious that these memories were causing him just inhuman pain. It was all a heavy memory for him, however. It would never leave his head. This is what has become of his life. His wife died. He lost his daughter. Now he is all alone and all he can do is drink alone. He's rotting here and he'll probably die in this cursed place that has become a grave for his family. The old man looked up and said that this was just one example out of dozens, if not hundreds. The boy looked at him with serious eyes. He seemed to understand everything now. He did not have the strength to say anything in reply, for he himself had a lump in his throat. The old man said that he probably knew why the town was called that. The boy asked again, City of Graves. The old man nodded his head and looked at him good-naturedly. Yes, that's exactly what he thought. A city built on bones, it too would soon force the boy to make his choice. The old man folded his hands in front of him and said that in order to protect this cursed place, he would have to make a choice sooner or later to sacrifice something very dear to him. Now, it was his fate too. The old man had been through this before and it pained him greatly to see history repeat itself. The boy fell silent and stared at the old man. Of course, it didn't sound like a curse, but more like a prediction. He didn't want to believe it, but the old man spoke quite convincingly. But it didn't inspire him with hope for a bright future, like a prediction of the inevitable causes and effects of the future. Funny story. Their family has resisted at this sacrifice for years. It has been a difficult confrontation, but they can't take it anymore. Their spirit is broken. The will is undermined. Enough sacrifices. They are sick of enduring. The old man squinted his eyes. His whole body seemed to group together. He said bitterly. He couldn't pass this work on to his daughter. This is the only memory of what his life was like before this tragedy. Now he can't let it all happen again. It is too painful for the old heart. The boy looked at him with a squint in his eyes and nodded understandingly. Yes, it was all clear to him now. This old man just doesn't want to repeat the tragedy. It was understandable. He, on the other hand, did a very honorable thing. So he resigned because he wants to keep his daughter from being haunted by the curse, so that she can't inherit his position. The old man nodded his head. That's right, that's right. The old man looked at his trembling hand and nodded again. It was like this. He wants his daughter out of these cursed lands far away. For her to live free and happy, he couldn't let that cursed fate catch up with her. It would be a terrible thing. Then he wouldn't be able to forgive himself for living on this earth at all. Yes, this is the tank Evangeline Cross. The best tank the player needed so badly. And whom Graf wants to keep out of the line in the front. So that she will never face that nightmare again. As a father, he did a very honorable thing. But still there was no choice. Suddenly the old man changed and poured alcohol into his mug again. Now he wants the old man to help him with the defense of the city. The loyal one. Something changed in his voice for a second. Suddenly he loudly placed the drink bottle on the table. The prince even twitched from such a sudden movement. What on earth is this? It seems the old man was definitely in a bad mood today. The man looked at the boy with a serious look and said that he had already defended himself enough. At the cost of his family and friends, he can no longer afford such a monstrous expenditure. The guy silently looked at the old man and realized that he could hardly change this man's mind. And in principle, it was quite understandable. No one would want to make such sacrifices again. It would be monstrous of him. The old man said he'd never want to get into this mess again. No more sacrifices, no more wasted suffering. In the eyes of the Count, that reflected in the glass with alcohol was not an expression of pride that he devoted his whole life to the military trade, the defense of the front line. There was only unbearable grief, which he dragged through his life like a cross. The old man said that he wants to die within the walls of this city, not at the front. He just wants to end his life in peace. In his eyes was only regret that he was not there for his wife when she was dying. 
The old man couldn't take it anymore. Naturally, he would never agree to make such a sacrifice again. The old man coughed and said he thought that was reason enough for him to refuse. In principle, he could be understood, but it was not so simple. Night had already dominated the sky, and the fat moon had crept up there. The lamp was almost burned out. He told him the truth as a sign of gratitude for staying with him all this time, and tried to relieve him of his loneliness. The old man had already mellowed, and spoke as kindly as possible. He was not like himself at this moment. He looked at the boy. There was only unbearable sorrow in his eyes, and his voice became quite quiet. Now, let him go. And lastly, the old man said he would give him one important piece of advice that would probably help him in the future. The boy frowned and prepared to listen. The old man said that if he had to make a choice, he should first think carefully and not make a mistake in his choice, as the old man had done in his time. Don't you dare regret your decision like he did. At this time, Demian was enjoying his stay within the palace walls. He was restoring his spiritual aura, and a beautiful nun was standing beside him. There were two days left before the next phase began. The wall had already been repaired by common efforts. Now they had to prepare even better, as they might have to defend even harder than last time. There were sword shards scattered around the wall, which served as a kind of barrier unit. The guy was approaching the others in a loud voice. He said that they are well done, doing great. Everything was going just fine. It was necessary to cheer up the workers so that they would not lose his spirit. As soon as the workers saw their ruler, they cheered up. Let them take a break and have a snack. Many treats were brought to them so that they could finally regain their strength after working for days. Yay, food. Their happiness was unbounded. Now they could afford a long-awaited respite. They began to rejoice as expected of his prince. Generous when needed, why is there no alcohol? The people began to resent it. They were very thirsty. The guy gave them all a look of annoyance. Do they have the conscience to be disgruntled? Let them eat what they're given. The workers laughed and encircled the prince who held a bottle of drink in his hands. He poured one of the workers into a glass and asked how the repair of the building was going. The worker clucked and accepted the gift. A smile appeared on the face of the chief builder, and he said in a cheerful voice that since they had provided them with more workers than they needed, it looked like they would make it on time. It won't be a problem. The fortress will be repaired. Everything will be fine. They will be fully prepared to repel the attack. The repair of the wall will be finished within two days. Basically, it was just fine. The hardest part was over. The wall is almost ready. We just have to wait to repel the attack, and we can consider the stage passed. One of the main alchemists stood in front of him and was literally shaking with anticipation. The guy cast a sarcastic glance at him. Now this? He asked it with some sort of anticipation as if he realized what awaited him. The alchemists seemed to be glowing with joy. They're finally going to use this. That's just great. The old man didn't know where to put his joy. He was holding the very scroll they had so recently found in the cave. It was the same scroll of magic summoning they had found in the sewers. It could only be given a worthy use, to be used after studying the alchemical workshop. And just today, the study of the scroll had been completed. One more stage had been passed. A sign popped up in front of the player whether or not they wanted to use the summoning scroll. Automatic defense turret. Of course he did. He grasped the scroll with his hand, which immediately began to glow with a bright blue light. Everyone literally trembled with anticipation. This was going to be great. The turret would help them a lot in the big battle that was coming so soon. The guy's hand lit up and he received the skill automatic defense turret. Now it can be used in battle to fight rats. In front of them lay a small pile of building materials that apparently were left over from a previous construction site. It would probably be enough. This stuff could be used to build a turret. It would make a great material. Finally, he would be able to use the item obtained from the chest. He was over the moon. The guy couldn't wait for the upcoming battle. His chest was filled with excitement. Soon, very soon, everything will happen. All the necessary ingredients had been gathered. In addition to all of this, he would be able to use a magical mana core of rank P. It would be just fine. A small sphere glowed in the guy's hands. It was the core. An automatic defense turret. A sign for setting up the turret appeared in front of them. Guy knew's finger somewhere near the entrance of the fortress. He thought that this would be the best place for the defense turret. The place immediately lit up, and a small mark appeared there. 
The very same building materials immediately flew up into the air, like rocks that would rise as soon as he was about to use the teleport. The boy watched it all with great enthusiasm. Soon, very soon, he would see everything. The stones began to pound into the ground as if gathering themselves. It was like the big builder, only it was assembling of its own accord. The player watched as a large defensive turret formed from a pile of ordinary building materials. The outline of a turret, concrete, and various metals formed a cannon-like structure. Eventually, a huge turret appeared exactly where the guy had poked it. It had a huge barrel. It looked like the turret of some kind of tank. It looked kind of out of place. This is the Middle Ages, and here it is, this huge. The turret immediately began to turn its turret, as if it had consciousness. The metal creaked and the muzzle began to twitch in different directions. It was just a beautiful sight. The guy realized that at this rate the victory was not far off. He clapped his hands. Well, what a beauty. The alchemist who was standing next to him literally cried with happiness. This was a lost technology. It had disappeared over 100 years ago. Magical architecture, just beautiful. The old man couldn't find himself from happiness. The player turned to the others and with a wave of his hand patted the turret. He thanked everyone present for their hard work. Thanks to them, all these defenses are getting stronger and stronger every day. At this rate, they would be able to easily defeat the impending threat. Everything was going according to plan, even though they were working under time constraints. He cheerfully told the other workers to keep it up. People immediately started jumping in their place and waving their hands in a burst of joy. They themselves felt the result of their work, and it made them feel happy. Good spirit. At this rate, they can do well. The guy smiled and looked at the people. He hoped that it would be like this. Only at this rate, they would be able to do well. Well, their next stop is the forge. This is one of the most important elements for defense, and in principle for the entire industry of the city. It's where all the manufacturing power is concentrated. This is where weapons ammunition, and other things are made. The smithy was a large building, from the chimney of which there was a thick smoke. Inside was a large blast furnace in which the flames were blazing. There was a huge fever and a huge pump that pumped air near it. On the walls hung various weapons, swords, axes, shields, that sort of thing. They stepped inside, and the distinct smell of hot iron immediately hit their noses. The boy asked Lucas how he felt about all this. The night was overjoyed, the glitz and glitter and beauty. The night, by all appearances, was incredibly pleased. No wonder so many weapons in one place. They had ordered the armor, and now he was clad in his new armor. It literally shone in the sun. This sturdy armor was made from the mana cores he had managed to find in the dungeon. Ghost armor. Level 30. Armor type. Protection. 50. 55 units. Resistance to physical attacks is increased by 33%. The wearer gains the ghost skill. The player certainly did not like that the durability of this armor is like glass, but nevertheless it is more useful than he thought. Ghost. Level 1. The user gets invulnerability for 5 seconds. During this period of time, the user is not only immune to all types, but also cannot attack himself. Lucas almost cried from such a gift he sobbed and said that he would use this gift wisely. The player looked at him and smiled. Of course, let him use it. He had ordered it especially for Lucas. Such a confession made the man completely teary-eyed. Lucas almost cried when the measurements were taken. The boy looked at the knight with a smile. It was worth it to give gifts more often. This man was very loyal, incredibly loyal, never asked questions and was always on the front lines. He deserved this gift more than anyone. Then the boy turned to the blacksmith and thanked him for the excellent armor. The old man grinned and thanked the boy for the opportunity to work with good material for the first time in a long time. The whole thing was an incredible honor for him. Up to this point, he had only had the opportunity to work with some kind of broadsword. A smile of happiness literally shone on the man's face. He was completely ready to work. He incredibly liked the fact that for the first time in a long time, he would be able to do something meaningful. If they trusted him again, he would do it to the best of his ability. Let him order any time. The old man said this with a kind of unnatural excitement. The forge was already level three. The level of the structure is increasing, which means everything will soon come to a pretty high combat readiness. 
Creating gear plays a big role in this game. He would definitely look into the forge often. The guy folded his arms across his chest and addressed the knight. Lucas readily responded. Ash Yee said that they should go to the eastern part of the city. Something important is going on there. The guy frowned. Apparently there really was something serious there. Bright flashes of explosions were going up. In the west field of the fortress city, the sounds of cannon shots echoed in the air in remembrance of the fallen soldiers. It was the funeral of soldiers who had fallen in battle during the last defense. They stood in front of a large number of people. All had a mournful look. Flags hung everywhere. And in the background was a cemetery. The corpses became more and more. The earth was falling on a beautiful wooden coffin. New coffins were covered with earth, underneath the neatly placed headstones. There weren't so many deaths this time, however. Still, each person's death was a great tragedy. However, the guy couldn't say for sure whether it was good or bad. Still, still needed to preserve as much life as possible, or else it would just be an unacceptable omission. His face was gloomy, exactly like the weather in the background. And here again were the chanters, singing for the soldiers who had fallen in battle. These wistful songs spread throughout the neighborhood. They sowed longing and sadness. The smell of death was everywhere. It was impossible to get away from this odor. It haunted the inhabitants of the city even in their sleep. The player stood in the cemetery and silently contemplated on the tombstones that towered above the expanse of land. It was an incredibly sad sight after all. These people did not die in vain. He could not allow their resistance to end. All these people had to remain in the memory of the living. Today had flown by in an instant. Soon he and Lucas were already in the backyard, which was a huge cemetery. The moon had crept into the sky and illuminated everything with its pale glow. They stood for a few more seconds in silence, as if honoring the memory of the dead. The first to speak was the Count. He said that they had spent most of the city's budget on the funeral. There was an unbelievable sadness in that voice, and they even organized compensation payments to the families of the deceased. This is very, very commendable. That's a really good way to spend money. He would even say royal. The Count appeared literally out of nowhere. The boy turned to him and stared at the old man in surprise. He was approaching them with a shaky gait. The old man was still sullen. He was staring straight ahead at the ground, contemplating the countless numbers of graves. But this is the passing line, the place where life is washed away like a dam during the rainy season. There was some truth in those words. There would come a time when he would no longer be able to cover up what was happening with good deeds. The player sighed heavily. All he needed at this time was a lecture. He turned to the old man and asked, did he come here to say that begging sign then it is not the best for this kind of talk? If there's something of substance, let him speak now. The boy asked Riley, had he run out of alcohol at home that he had to come here? The old man grinned. You can never have too much alcohol. Sometimes he comes here alone to buy a couple of bottles, but that's not why he's here today. Talking in riddles, there was something strange about his tone. He asked his former comrades for their opinion. The old man came closer and closer to the boy, asked if they would like to defend the city. The boy even hesitated for a second and stopped breathing. What a thing. Did he really get something clear? It was completely unexpected. The guy honestly thought he'd have to talk to the old man for a long time. He looked at the old man with a fierce look and what was their answer? The fate of the city depended on that answer. The old man sighed heavily, and after a second's hesitation, he said that they all agreed. They want to return to service again. After these words, the player literally jumped out of his pants. Yes. And his shout went out all over the estate. He was incredibly happy about this turn of events, something he could not have expected even in his wildest fantasies. A wide smile stretched across his face. This was the best news he could hear today. Even in the last week, the guy was simply delighted, his face literally shining with joy. Could it be that everything was going to work out the way it should? The Count continued to speak in his calm and sad voice. He didn't know how these grandfathers could help the boy, but they were making preparations right now. They were now under his jurisdiction and responsibility. Smiling, the old man continued to speak. Let the boy treat them well like a true military superior. They are, after all, willing to give their lives for protection. They are as old as the Count himself. 
so let him not be too cruel after all. But the boy didn't even seem to hear this. He ran up to the old man and grasped his hand. The lad began to thank him from the bottom of his heart. Thank him. Really. The Count was even a little taken aback by this. It wasn't him who needed to be thanked, but these people who had agreed to come to the rescue. This man was too strict, and the boy didn't even know how to approach him better. But who would have thought that he would help to ask or not to sign honestly? It was completely unexpected. But the boy was grateful, purely from the bottom of his heart. He was grateful to this man that despite everything, he agreed to come to the rescue. They were standing on a small hillock where they had a spectacular view of the city. The city lights were already on, illuminating the entire neighborhood with a warm, bright light that spread even into the sky. The boy didn't stop. He wanted to thank the Count as best as he could. But he had talked to him himself. The old man sighed and said what he thought it was all he could do to help them now. He fell silent, as if searching for the right words, and then told the boy to take good care of the town, since he was the new lord. And besides, good luck to him. The old man was calm, but his voice looked sad. The boy was determined. He once again thanked the old man for his help and said he would do his best. The old man could have confidence in him. Ash said he would visit the old man as soon as he needed some more of his wisdom. His voice was so cheerful that he now sounded like a child who had been bought a long-awaited toy. What the hell wisdom? Let him just bring the booze. The old man snorted irritably. The old man began to shuffle off to his house. The boy shouted after him that he would send him more herbs. You have to worry about your health after all. The old man shouted that he'd rather have him bring him nothing than that kind of crap. He stood still for a while and looked at the player. There was some sadness in his eyes. The old man sighed heavily and cast a last sad look at him. Then he waved his hand in farewell and continued to walk away with his hot, slow gait. His silhouette began to slowly drift away, gradually dissolving into the distance, and eventually had to disappear around the nearest corner. The boy thought that the old man was probably going to his garden. He wanted to stop him to say something else, but he didn't want to disturb the old man. He had already done enough for the common good. Still, it's the Count, even though he's old, but he's still been defending the front all his life. He would be a great help to him in the game, after all. He had experience, unmeasured combat experience that was unrivaled. But you can't be so cynical. This man has lost too much in this town. His family, his loved ones. Let the old man be alone. He deserves a rest after so many years of hardship and unbearable suffering. So the boy didn't dare to stop him. He just wouldn't have had the conscience. The boy just stood there and watched the old man go away. He watched and believed that next time they would talk more. And this time their conversation wouldn't center on some war and hard things. That he would again give him some advice. Some life lesson that would help him overcome this obstacle. However, at that moment, the guy could never even think that there would never be another time like this. It was the last time he would see the old man in such a state. After two days of even more hard work, the repair of the wall was completed. Now the fortress had a more or less presentable appearance. Workers and materials were enough to completely restore the integrity of the structure. On top of one of the towers stood a turret, which was ready to destroy any enemy. The player was already met by the chief engineer who held a hammer in shaky hands. Some things they certainly rushed, but the wall will hold its duty. There were bags under the man's eyes. It was obvious that this man had not slept for a long time and had been working hard for a long time. The boys nodded. Good job, really, they did a great job. And at this moment, he was incredibly proud of his workers. All the preparations were completed. The materials were plentiful. There were arrows, cannonballs, and other war material. The army had increased many times over. The people the Count had talked to had come to their aid after all. And now the number of knights was almost double. By about 300 soldiers, their total troops had increased. The men were dressed in green clothing as well as armor they carried with them the flags of their empire. And stood on the roof of the castle prepared to do their service. On the wall stood a man, about the same age as the Count himself. He put his hand to his heart, with full combat readiness to do his duty to this place. They said that their numbers had originally been around a thousand, but what was left was what was left. Some had died, some just couldn't make it. The guy looked at the soldiers with a smile. However, even so, the final number was still more than he had asked for. 
There were now completely enough soldiers to finish off these things. The turret stood at full alert. It swung its huge cannon in different directions, looking for a reliable target. A single shot from this cannon could wipe out an entire horde of monsters. The player ran up to the cannon and began to hug it as if it were someone he cared about. He even started kissing the gun and kept saying, My baby, I trust you. Killbox was ready too. They had built an equally small room out of large wooden barriers that formed a tunnel so that the monster population would be smaller than it was originally. Everything was going just perfectly. Everything was ready for the battle. All that was left was to wait. The guy grinned contentedly. He was incredibly pleased with himself. Everything was going perfectly. If they succeeded, the fortress would stand. They could defeat these hordes of rats. However, he still had that image of the rat catcher in front of him. He really didn't want to meet that type face to face. That ugly mask on his face, the openings of his eyes, and the black smile. It reeked of some kind of hopelessness and coldness. It appeared literally out of nowhere, to the Pied Piper standing firmly on his feet and casting a barely perceptible shadow on the ground. He was standing a few hundred meters away from the fortress, and he could see it perfectly well. The man was all in the same clothes in which he had been met there, deep in the dungeon beneath the water. Behind his back was still a horde of rats. He was preparing himself to storm this great fortress. One of the soldiers galloped on a horse approaching the fortress. He galloped at full speed. Apparently something terrible happened there. The horse was literally exhausted. The soldier clung to the body of the beast and drove him as hard as he could. Dust was bursting out from under the horse's hooves. It was rushing forward. The horse was literally on its last breath. But the soldier was whipping it on the water. As soon as he approached the fortress, he immediately shouted with all his might that he had information from the scout. With his whole appearance, the soldier made it clear that something terrible had happened. His face literally radiated fright. His eyes were wide open and drops of sweat were building down his face. In a trembling voice, the man said that the monsters were coming. Running straight at him soon, they will be here. A little more time would pass and the monsters would come dangerously close. The rats were already running. There were just some countless numbers of them. My voices were burning with red fire. The player himself saw it all clearly. He was standing on a hill, and from there he had a wide view of the field cloud forming in the distance. Apparently a large army of monsters was already approaching them. A chill ran down his back. Stage two had begun. Ten minutes to go. As soon as the guy saw the pillars of dust in the distance, he shouted for everyone to get ready immediately. Don't let your guard down. He himself was fully prepared for battle, but a slight chill of fear still ran down his spine. All answered in unison that they were ready. The fortress was fully prepared for defense. The men got into a fighting stance and prepared to repel the attack. The preparations were perfect. Everything was going smoothly. And it's all because he's been playing this game for so long. He'd learned everything about it. There's never been a situation like this. When everything was good from the start, everything was perfect. There were so many soldiers. The fortress was ready. Come on, let the monsters come here if they aren't afraid. A smile shone on the guy's face. He was completely confident in his abilities. It didn't cost him anything to destroy this army. He thought he could handle it no matter what. The dust cloud slowly began to dissipate and a familiar shape appeared there. It was the same man they had seen in the dungeon. The Pied Piper was already here. He had gathered all his troops to attack the fortress at once. He wore the same mask on his face. It inspired a kind of fear and invisible awe. A smile stretched from ear to ear. The black apertures of his eyes frightened with their obscurity. As soon as the guy saw it, goosebumps ran down his back. His eyes literally popped out of his orbits. A man stood in the dust cloud and with a smiling face looked straight in front of him. His gaze was deadpan. His appearance did not bode well. His figure was clearly visible from afar. He was approaching closer and closer with each passing second. Lucas immediately noticed the confusion on his leader's face and ran up to the boy. He started asking him what was wrong. The boy pointed his finger to where he saw the stranger. Does he see him over there? However. He did not have time to finish his sentence. 615. Suddenly the guy noticed that there was no one else in that place. There was only dust. The silhouette was gone. 
as if it had vaporized, dissolved into thin air. It was simply inconceivable, wasn't it? Ash immediately turned to his gunner. He asked the boy if he saw a person there. Lucas also began to look ahead, trying to see something in the distance. But everything was clear and empty. There wasn't a single soul there. 617. Demi inactivated his eye, but he couldn't see anything, no matter how hard he tried. Even the player himself was a little confused. If this man can't see anything, is this stranger like that? Ash swung his head in different directions. Is this really a hallucination? He firmly hoped it was, because if he wasn't wrong, they were in very big trouble. For a second, a doubt settled in his mind. What if it wasn't a hallucination? What if there really was someone there? If he wasn't imagining it, and this army of rats was being led by someone? That would be a terrible oversight. If it was, who the hell was it? The ground beneath his feet began to tremble, indicating that the army of rats was gradually approaching the distance. The torch began to shake. Everything was covered in vibrations, even seemingly in the air. They're here. A huge cloud was coming closer and closer. Through it were already visible silhouettes of huge rats, which were endlessly approaching the walls of the fortress. The boy stood at the top and watched everything that was happening from on high. For some reason, doubt, even a little fear, settled in his heart. He clenched his fist and ordered himself to calm down no matter what. He must remain calm, as he's a military leader. He must set an example for everyone else. If he is not calm, panic will start to spread in the midst of the army. He must be calm regardless of whether it was a hallucination or not. No matter how many damn rats there are out there, the only thing he can do is stop them. The boy put his thoughts in order and stared piercingly off into the distance. He tried to see the approaching threat as best he could. He evened out his breathing and tried to regain his senses. Guy ordered the artillerymen to get ready, and several soldiers began diligently pulling their cannons up to the defenses. They were preparing cannonballs so that they could hit the hordes of rats with the cannonballs at all costs. After a second, the guy ordered open fire. Many deafening shots rang out. Flames began to burst out of the cannons. Cannonballs flew at an unimaginable speed, and there was such a rumble that you had to cover your ears. The rats stopped for a second. Otherwise, they raised their heads. The monsters saw the burning kernels coming towards them. They flew with great speed and in a second were ready to strike the monster. Explosions, the cannonballs flew precisely to the target, but despite the fact that they still killed the rats by the dozens, they did not become less. They still ran unstoppable stream. Explosions were heard here and there. The monsters began to scream. The fire began to burn them by the dozens, but they did not stop advancing. There was a distinct smell of burnt leather and meat in the air. There was a rumble everywhere and the squeaking of the monsters. The monsters were approaching exactly as planned. They advanced, and the cannonballs immediately caught up with them. Guy watched from above as he watched the explosions tear apart the bodies of these creatures. The kill count had already passed almost a hundred rats killed in the first salvo. Not bad. Ash stretched into a grin. They only know how to take numbers. They're ugly weaklings, aren't they? Those rats are worthless, after all. Kill them all. The guy ordered to destroy all the monsters. He was completely sure that these rats were no danger. The numbers of these rats are ridiculously large, so large that they are forced to huddle in clusters, which definitely plays into his hands. Now these monsters could be easily defeated by simply shooting at large clusters. In other words, by directing all their attacks at just one target, they can destroy entire piles of these scum in one volley. The rats would run exactly to the kill box, and the shells would hit them immediately, killing them by the dozens. A whole thirty minutes passed at first defense. The guy opened the plate to see just how many total they killed these creatures in such a time. A sign popped up that indicated that there were two, 924 rats left to kill. On top of that, there were still three bosses whose level was unknown. At this rate, there shouldn't be any problems at all. However, the guy hesitated half a word. Somewhere in the distance, he saw something strange. The rats started doing something strange. They started climbing up these small walls. Using their sharp claws, they deftly bounded upwards. He grabbed his telescope and pointed it to where the main battle was taking place. What he saw there made the guy grit his teeth in rage. There were mountains of corpses. 
The rats were climbing up them and beginning to climb over the barrier. This was bad. At this rate, they would not realize it and would soon get close to the castle. The artillery would not be able to reach them. Shit. The rats stopped more and more. They were climbing over the fence. Their little bodies were too fast to hit. At this rate, they can climb the wall with their corpses. There are too many of them. The devil. The rats were starting to get smarter, even though they were mostly dumb creatures. It wasn't hard for them to get ahead. Soon, a few of the barriers fell, and the rats were now moving forward unhindered. They had spread out and were now very difficult to hit. The collapse of the kill box was definitely not in his plans. What a devil. The guy yelled for the gunners to change their aim immediately. There was a need to focus. The guy yelled for the blistrarians to get ready. Of course, the situation was getting worse by the second. The place where the rats congregated was located quite far away from the walls of the fort. Besides, there were sharp shards lying on the approach to the fort. So they were relatively safe for now. So far, so good. The cannons continued to fire from all guns. There was an unimaginable rumble and the smell of gunpowder all around. The artillerymen were firing. They were not sparing the shells, which were still in abundance. In addition, crossbows began to fire. A round began to form with unimaginable whistling. Arrows flew out and headed straight to the center of the cluster of rats. Although the artillerymen were hitting their target, there was still something the boy had overlooked. Even though the shells were reaching their target, the rats were not getting any smaller. They continued to burst forward. The gunners looked at their commander with horror and said that the rats are too fast and hard to hit. Also, they are at a decent distance, so it is too difficult to aim. The military were horrified. The situation was getting worse. The guy gritted his teeth and slammed his fist on the wall. What a fucking rat. Too nimble. Normal arrows wouldn't be able to hit them. The situation was getting worse by the second, and the rat's body consisted mostly of muscle, which allowed them to move very nimbly. The speed of rats. Why the fuck didn't he think of that beforehand? This could be a decisive turning point. At this rate, the rats that reached the castle walls would be far more than he expected. At this time, the furry monsters were approaching the castle at an unimaginable speed. They were running, and there seemed to be no barriers for them at all. Immediately, a turret burst into the battle. It began to spin its guns, choosing a suitable target. All this cannon began to glow with green light, gaining magical energy. Immediately, there was a loud sound of gunfire. Several beams of green energy burst out of its muzzle, and like tentacles, they began to spread further and further away. The beams of energy flew straight forward, and after a few seconds they reached their target. The guy seemed to have forgotten that he even had such a weapon. He looked to the side and opened his eyes in surprise. For a second, goosebumps ran down his back. He hadn't expected such power. The rat that was hit by the projectile began to squeak. Its body was covered with blue-green light. Its skin began to melt. The rat opened its mouth and let out a death squeak. A second later, the earth shook underfoot, and there was a colossal explosion. Green smoke rose behind the fortress, and shreds of bodies from the rats began to fly up to incredible heights. Fuck me up. The player didn't even know what to say. He was simply taken away from what he saw in front of him. His eyes reflected the incredible shot. The explosion was so powerful that his ears even stopped up. The guy looked in front of him and realized that the defensive turret is the best gun for this kind. The number of rats. Still, the turret was coping. But there was one small nuance. No matter how good it was in combat, it would not be able to hold the entire front. Sure, this cannon had destroyed a decent amount of rats. But there were still plenty of them left. Some of them were already approaching the castle walls almost closely. On top of that, there was another one. The turret had used up all of its shells and was now simply useless. It went into recoil. Smoke began to ooze from its large muzzle. The turret was overloaded. The guy's eyes widened in horror as he saw a simply unimaginably huge number of rats approaching him faster and faster. A lot of them. Even too many to handle. A chill ran down the boy's spine. The rats were making their nasty squeaks. They were already almost at the castle walls. The front was advancing faster than he had anticipated. Sure, the shrapnel they left behind they are doing poorly. However, it is not a panacea. It's only a matter of time before the rats reach the wall. The guy at this point realized that it seems a close fight was inevitable after all. 
He knew that he would have to fight these rats face to face after all. But then there would be casualties among the soldiers. He was interrupted by an explosion. The ground shook under his feet and the guy stammered half a word. The explosion was repeated. The air rose a cloud of black smoke. Several dozen rats scattered in different directions, torn by the blast wave. The guy didn't know what to say. What else was it? He definitely didn't expect that someone could hit directly into a cluster of rats with such precision. It was simply unbelievable. Then a few dozen more explosions rang out, all of which hit the target with general amazement. The projectiles flew past with a muffled whoosh and landed in the hordes of rats. What the hell is this? Who's firing those things? The guy shifted his gaze to the side to find who could do it after all. To his surprise, he saw the Count holding one of his soldiers by the head. The soldier in turn was just glistening with fear. He got in. The soldier rejoiced that he was suddenly shooting so clearly at the target. This is the Count's army after all. The guy at this moment realized that the result of him recruiting these old men was beyond his expectations. These people are incredibly experienced. In addition, they can train his own military, which will naturally have a positive effect on the outcome of the battle. The Count's army commander started shouting for everyone to finally wake up. What amateurs let them unclench their buns already? Cheer up. They have work to do. This speech had an effect, and the soldiers were as if off the chain. The soldiers cheered each other up. It's no big deal. Let them keep firing. Even just firing the cannon will help a lot. Rather than sticking close to the soldiers and acting as mentors, it was just wonderful. Such a tandem was paying off. Now their army would be much stronger. The soldier said that there was nothing to worry about. They would take care of it. Everything will be fine. He had a wide smile on his face. Apparently the man was completely confident in his strength now. It was just a matter of continuing to fight at the same pace. The guy smirked, good. He will trust them you. In any case, this is just an unimaginable leap. The defense to the cross defense is still going smoothly. Everything is just fine. The shells are hitting the target precisely. The guy stood on the high ground and watched the army of rats thinning every second. Thanks to the help of the Count's army, thanks to their guidance, the number of rats was inexorably decreasing. Yes, these creatures were undoubtedly dangerous, but from the looks of it, dealing with them wasn't such a difficult task. Thanks to their mentorship, the player's soldiers had become much more experienced and were now able to take down hordes of sewer rats with ease. Maybe they are wondering what his teammate is doing at the same time. The guy stood and watched the battle. His face was calm. He realized that so far everything was going according to plan. Everything was under control. There was nothing to be afraid of. Lucas commanded the rest of the soldiers with all his might. Left defense line. Your firing range is too short. Get your asses up out of your seats and shoot properly. He assisted the front line leaders. The soldiers followed his order strictly. When he suggested some general plan of action, Lucas gave commands according to my instructions. He followed his plan and step by step brought them closer to victory. This synergy played an incredibly large part in their victory. Even if his ignorance of the battle techniques of this world lead to vague instructions, Lucas miraculously grasped the essence and gave precise instructions to the soldier. But still it was given to him with great difficulty. He sometimes almost could not understand what was required of him. The guy stood behind him and smiled at the way his subordinates skillfully commanded the army. What a capable protagonist, it's unbelievable. He has great talent. The guy once again thought that he should have well rewarded this man for his combat services. Demian firmly held his crossbow in his hands, loading the arrows one by one. He fired, hitting the target accurately. Of course, the speed of his shooting was rather slow, but it was still compensated by the fact that he was hitting the target accurately. Thanks to his eyes, he could hit rats in the very eye, despite the fact that they moved at an incredible speed. He was incredibly skilled at maintaining his fire and putting holes in the heads of rats that could still make it to the wall's defense line. The arrows hit the eye, killing the vile monsters. Since the boy's strength lies in long-range shooting, it would seem that his ability is less important in large-scale events. But it is not, for in this case, the number of kills does not matter. The player looked at his shooter and thought in his head that he was doing a great job. The boy was shooting with all his might. It was as if there were no obstacles for him. 
At this time, somewhere in the depths of the fortress, something strange was happening. A magical sphere had formed here, glowing with a purple light that filled the entire space. Lily is responsible for controlling the magic artifact. She was directly present at the place where the huge magic sphere was. The girl performed her duty faithfully, even though she whined a lot. But still, she was an indispensable employee in battle. The girl waved her arms in different directions. Lower gravity artifact number one in three minutes. Prepare gravity artifact number two. Seeing her raising her voice and going back and forth in a businesslike manner was mind-boggling. The girl turned around to the player and smiled her smile. This time, it was kind of frantic. It was as if she had gotten into the excitement and was skillfully leading everyone else. She stuck her thumb up. It seemed as if she was saying so, look how hard I'm working. She seemed to have entered the courage of battle. There was no trace left of the former girl, and it was as if she was enjoying it. However, despite all the girl's bragging, the player turned away, then made her embarrassed. In his mind, he apologized to her. No matter how hard she tried, he still needed her on the front lines. Well, next. Next, and one of the most important members of his team, is Jupiter. The most experienced of them all, and the woman who can take out this entire horde with one blow. The guy smiled, turned his head, and looked at the woman. At this time, she was just lying there. Yes, indeed, it was an old woman resting. She had a glass with some kind of drink in her hands. She didn't seem to be particularly tense. I smiled. The woman said, No way, everyone is somehow working, constantly shouting somewhere in a hurry. It's brutal. Seeing all of this at my convenience, the man became furious and looked at her with a look that made even her, an experienced bounty hunter, feel a chill inside. After all, he had told her to sit there and take a break, but still be ready, and she had just gotten comfortable. As soon as she saw that look, it immediately snapped her out of her seat, and she began to fake sigh. Oh my goodness, why does her back hurt so much when she tries to collect mana? And the guy started gritting his teeth in rage. Can't even yell at her because she's their precious mage. She better not slack off after her break. The guy smiled and looked after her. The woman raised her glass with some kind of drink upwards and nodded her head with a smile. Of course she would, after all. It seemed to be pure entertainment for her. He doesn't like that, Babusia. She's too haughty. All in all, thanks to the help of all but Jupiter, of course, the defense was going well. The rat hordes were being decimated, and at this rate they could win a landslide victory. Things are going well, even though the front line is closing in. By this time, the automatic turret had already reloaded, and was again firing directly at the hordes of rats. Nasty creatures flew in different directions like toys. They immediately vaporized in the air, and surrendering death squeal. The power of the automatic one was overwhelming. It was hardly the most valuable unit of their army. The guy started hugging that turret again and acting like it was his lover. From afar, it looked a little strange, if not frightening. The guy was really out of it. He had gotten this artifact, and now he was going to make the most of it. At this rate, clearing the stage would go smoothly. At the foot of his castle, there were already several hundred corpses of these rats lying at the foot of his castle, their numbers immediately increasing. There was a smell of burnt meat everywhere. Soon, very soon, they would be able to gain victory. In his heart, the guy was rejoicing if this continued. Would this really be the first stage that they would cross without any damage or casualties? He smiled and anticipated a speedy victory. Soon, however, a silhouette appeared in the distance, which made him look away from his size and stare straight ahead. Someone was approaching. The boy looked into the distance, and it was as if his heart froze. There appeared a familiar silhouette that was getting closer with every second. The fog began to clear and in the distance appeared the silhouette of the very man who stood dressed just like that jester from the Middle Ages. He was approaching faster and faster. It turned out that he was moving with some incredible speed indicators. The very same man. So it's not a hallucination. The player finally realized that everything he was seeing was real. He grasped his interface and ordered the map to be shown immediately. He needed to know the exact location of all the enemies on the map so he could destroy them as quickly as possible. What he saw made him go into a stupor. His eyes went wide and a chill ran down his back. Something twitched in his chest. He realized that the situation was now worse than ever. Was what he was seeing now true? He really didn't want to believe it. The map opened, 
and in addition to the hordes of rats that were approaching him at an incredible speed, another icon appeared on the map. The same red mark, only a little bigger. It looked like it was a hostile NPC. But how? Who was this NPC? It was completely incomprehensible. He literally appeared out of nowhere on the second stage. How on top of that it was simply impossible. Of course, a lot of different events can start during the defense. Variables make the game interesting. The invasion of a hostile NPC is just one of those. It was certainly strange, but understandable. Only one question remained. That NPC from the Lake Kingdom that from the Empire all these freaks can ruin the fight. How did he end up here? But they're only at the second stage now. That's just not possible. Do the game rules not take that into account? Or is this game not subject to any rules at all? With more questions than answers, he clenched his teeth and prepared himself for the possibility that he would have to fight someone else. The image of a bespectacled man popped into his head. It wasn't time for an event yet. Could it be that this was the workings of that developer again? He doesn't even have that bastard principle around him. He can't even explain to him why the hell did he even make the game like this. In his head was the distinct image of that bespectacled man who had been ruining his mood all this time. Yes, what the fuck is this? Why is everything going wrong? Ash turned to the shooter and asked if he could see the guy, right? The boy was even startled by such a rush of emotion. It was the first time he had seen the commander so agitated the boy pulled back a bit. The boy activated his gaze, and it was the degenerate who stood at a great distance but still could be seen. He was still smiling the same way, his mask now more annoying than intimidating. He had appeared literally out of nowhere. Demian looked over and saw that there was a guy standing in the distance. That's a bard, right? A bard is a singer or poet, usually a solo performer of songs of his own composition. He is also one of the classes of this game. The player nodded his head and immediately ordered the boy to shoot. They only had one chance to hit this brat. Apparently, he is the one leading this horde of rats. If they don't deal with him now, who knows what consequences might await them later on. Demian is horrified by this order, but he's just an ordinary man. He doesn't look like a monster at all. The guy couldn't believe his ears. Would his commander order him to shoot this man? It doesn't matter. He has to shoot. The player ordered him to shoot immediately. He was absolutely certain that this was the character from the Lake Kingdom. He's the one they saw there, and he controls the rats. And his costume, it's the bard's signature outfit. He's the one who controls the rats. The guy pointed his finger to where this man was standing and yelled that he really should shoot him before he started playing his flute. That's why, that's why rats move. The lad looked fearfully at his commander and could not say a word. The crossbow in the boy's hands rattled from squeezing it too tightly. His hands were shaking. The boy could not gather his thoughts. He could not believe what was happening because he realized that he would have to kill a man. It was unthinkable for him. His whole body was shaking with fear. Ash leaned over to him and shouted he was telling him to be his trigger man after all. If he didn't want to see him lie to more people, this let him shoot at once. The boy looked at him fearfully and couldn't control his emotions. He was very scared at this moment as he realized that the situation was escalating with every second. The boy didn't have time to do anything before everyone heard the shrill sound of a flute, which began to merge into a song. Too late. It was all too late. They hadn't had time to shoot, and now this musician was beginning to lead his horde of rats. Ash dazed with fear, he realized that they had made a mistake. Now the rats would obey this creep. If they didn't do something, these things would sooner or later climb over the fence. He turned his head as far as he could. He slowly looked in the direction of the musician who continued to play his tune. Goosebumps ran down his back at the realization that something unimaginably terrible was about to happen. The musicians brought up his musical instrument and began to play. The music spread further and further. If the rats heard it, it would surely be a disaster. The rats heard the music and all at once turned their heads towards their master. Their red eyes began to glow even brighter. It was clear that something terrible was about to happen. The rats stopped. At the top of the fortress stood the guards who were ready to use their weapons at any cost. But to their surprise, the rats stopped. They froze as if frozen and waited for instructions. The men stood at the top of the stairs. I didn't know what to do. They just watched as a huge number of rats stopped just a few steps away from the fortress. No one realized what was happening. 
the rats suddenly stopped, and there was a look of bewilderment and fear on people's faces. They realized that all this was not for nothing. It could not be that the rats would start retreating. Suddenly, the monsters began to go crazy instead of screaming. The air was filled with their squeaks, which mixed with the melody. And now there was a real cacophony. In a few seconds, the beasts, as if obeying an invisible conductor, began to approach the fortress, now using an organized formation. They clustered together and moved forward toward the gate. Now they were moving in a group that was gradually moving into a line. What's going on? They're all moving toward the same point. Ash watched in horror as the rats moved straight towards him. Where are they going? The guy didn't understand anything. Why did these animals suddenly change their direction? What changed? Their behavior is definitely obeying someone. Lucas noticed it too, he said. The rats are moving towards the center of the wall and... A distinct fright appeared on the knight's face. He realized that something terrible was about to happen, however. It was impossible to prevent it. Absolutely all the rats had piled up and formed a single formation, moving straight towards the center, where the gate was. Obviously, this was the weakest point of their fortress, and the rats under the musician's control had realized all this and were now moving straight there. Ash shouted for them to change the aim of all cannons and all guns. Use all firepower to destroy the rats coming at them. The guy was furious, and fear appeared in his soul now. For the first time in a long time, he didn't know what to do. The cannons started firing all their guns. The smell of gunpowder again spread throughout the neighborhood. There was such a rumble that one could not even hear one's own thoughts. It was horrible, but despite all efforts, it was almost in vain. Although the shots hit the target, the army of rats didn't stop. They were growing in number. They were moving in an organized formation, moving straight towards the center of the fortress. No, they can't keep up. The rats started moving much faster than usual. They ran in an organized hulk, their eyes glowing with rage, teeth glistening in their mouths and split tongues. The changes in their movement were too sudden. It's too difficult to readjust to their movement. It's just unbelievable, isn't it? The rats were running at an unimaginable speed. As if this melody was giving them more and more strength, they had become fierce now. These monsters posed more danger than one could guess. One of the rats that moved first rushed to the castle wall with a monstrous squeak. It rushed there as if there was a living creature there, not even thinking that they might die when they hit it. Now they were out of range of the cannons. They had gotten too close. The fire had died down, and now there was the smell of smoke in the air. The boy looked down in wonder. What were they even up to? It's just unthinkable, isn't it? Why are they acting like this? A look of bewilderment mixed with fear appeared on his face. He saw a very funny picture. The same rat that had been running from the first one crashed into the wall and immediately died by breaking its neck. In its place was a bloody stain. What? They're trying to break through the wall. What are they going to do? A few more rats rushed after her. With a monstrous squeak, they moved straight towards the wall. It was a strange sight. The rats were running straight to their death without sparing themselves. They hit their heads right into the wall and immediately died. However, despite all this, their numbers were still frightening. Rats ramming their heads into the wall. It's ridiculous. However, since there were too many of them, they were still a danger. The rest of the soldiers looked on in wonder and fear. What are they doing? They've gone crazy. Bewilderment and fear appeared on their faces. They had never encountered something like this before. The rats came more and more. They hit their heads against the wall and rammed into it even though they died immediately. They struck their heads right into the wall, and though it had no effect, it looked terrible. The player looked at all of this with horror. What crazy freaks. It's a wall its repairs had only finished a few hours ago. Are they going to destroy it again? This was unacceptable because if they did, they'd be left with no defense at all. The boy realized that even though everyone had worked hard, it was impossible to do anything normal in such a short period of time. And now, they were in great danger. The walls were not too strong to withstand such an onslaught. They only focused on the side towers and completely forgot about the rest, so the occurrence of a crack was inevitable. Indeed, the wall began to crack, and light began to shine through it. Sewer rats trying to squeeze through the resulting gaps. 
Although they were small, their numbers were enormous. They banged their heads against the wall, thus destroying it at the base. They tore the metal with their huge claws. Surprisingly, their paws were incredibly strong for such a small size, suggesting that the wall wouldn't hold up for long. Other than that, they gnaw through concrete with their teeth. These animals were incredibly survivable. Other than that, their numbers were simply astounding. They're splitting the wall of the fronto. A horrible realization visited the boy's head. It hit him like a thunderclap. Now it would be a nightmare. The crack in the wall stopped more and more. Now the defense was about to break through. If that happened, they would definitely be finished exclamation mark. It just couldn't be allowed. The guys knew that if this happened, it was going to go down in flames. There was no way this could be allowed to happen. If the rats could still break through, this town would definitely be the end of them. Although the arrows were reaching their target, but still the rats were not getting smaller. No other monster did a better job than the rats. They live in the sewers all the time, feed on waste, eat concrete all the time. And to top it off, I'll say it again, their numbers are overwhelming. The guy gritted his teeth in anger. Only a suppressed wheeze escaped from his mouth. He realized that the situation was getting worse and worse. He couldn't let the number of casualties increase. It was simply impossible. The guy was furious. He stared into the distance from where more and more hordes of rats were arriving. Guy clenched his teeth. His rage was unbounded. Perhaps he had imagined something at that moment. Something that made his heart beat even faster. Or perhaps when that degenerate began to play his flute. The moment his rats began to approach the walls of the fortress, he laughed. He was mocking them. Yes, that was it. Well, this NPC from the hostile underworld is a bard who controls monsters with his flute. An incredibly stubborn psycho who won't back down from anything. A living degenerate. And his name is the Pied Piper. We must kill him. That was the thought that popped into the boy's head at the last moment. It was like thunder at the bottom of the sky. This Pied Piper was laughing. Definitely laughing at him, feeling his superiority. There was no way this degenerate could win. Ash turned to the archer boy. He ordered him to shoot this guy, now. The boy grasped his crossbow with trembling hands and tried to control his emotions. He took aim as far as he could. The boy could see the man standing in the distance playing his flute. The crossbow in his hands trembled. His heart beat with incredible force and fear settled in his soul. The outcast stood somewhere far away, but still one could see him laughing. Perhaps there was a smile under his mask, too, though his face could probably never be seen. Grinning once more, the Pied Piper adjusted his hat and snapped his fingers. It was like a game to him now. He would disappear, once again putting his opponents with his nose. Ash yelled at the gunslinger to shoot here immediately. His face was burning with rage. This was the only chance. When could one kill this bastard? Otherwise, those rats would get in. However, it was too late. Once again, the mysterious figure was swallowed up by a cloud of dust, and a moment later there was nothing else in that spot. Only the wind was developing dust that swirled in a small cloud. The player fell silent. The gunner stood beside him, lowering his head in fear. He felt guilty. Ash was ready to just tear him on the spot. He tried to control his emotions that filled his soul. The poor boy started crying with fear. He started apologizing and saying that he couldn't shoot the man even considering the fact that he was the enemy. The boy was crying, his voice breaking into a scream. You could see that the boy was very much affected by this. The player looked at him with a stern look. After all, it was expected. After all, this boy is just a support. But there were quite a few among their enemies. This boy couldn't be allowed to be so afraid. Otherwise, he would eventually die. Someone would kill him and it would be on the player's conscience. He quickly cooled down as he realized that he couldn't indulge in emotions right now. However, in any case, he would have to face human enemies in the future. The gunner stood and guiltily squinted at him. If he couldn't overcome himself, his ability would be reduced by half. Ash put a hand on his shoulder and said softly that they would probably talk about this later. There was a far more important task now. This problem needs to be dealt with. He looked down where the rats were already trying to break through the defenses, and they were succeeding despite the fact that they were dying literally by the dozens to tear the wall apart. The boy ordered the artillerymen and archers to focus on the center. The cannons immediately lowered down and began firing all their guns directly at the cluster of rats. Arrows whistled through the air, which immediately reached their target. 
The battle was heating up with renewed vigor. The rats were no less. It was necessary to concentrate all their power to finally end it all. Finally, the boy turned to Jupiter and told her to get to work. At this time, the woman was already in full battle readiness. She was done fooling around and now she was ready to deal with these bastards. Her whole body was literally ablaze with lightning. The woman was overflowing with power now. She was ready to experience the courage of battle. She crunched her fingers and said that she was now more ready than ever, as she knew that sooner or later he would say it. A smile spread across her face and the cigar immediately burned with energy. The guy put his hand out in front of his face and ordered everyone to concentrate. Fry them all. Now the lightning would do its job, he remembered how they had fought the rats, and Jupiter had knocked out a huge rat with literally one hit. There was a clap of thunder, and lightning bolts began to rain down from the sky, which descended directly into the hordes of rats. There was a squeak. The air smelled of fried meat again. The monsters screamed in pain, but the lightning bolts immediately killed them on the spot. Then the guy turned to Lily and ordered her to prepare the flamethrowers and magic artifacts at full power. This was the last decisive battle that would determine the outcome of their lives. The girl nodded her head and immediately ordered everyone to activate the flamethrower artifacts, and her voice sounded incredibly strict. It was hard to imagine that just a while ago, this girl was shy and timid. Now she was like a real leader. The rest of the soldiers rolled large spheres filled with fire onto the castle walls. They were going to roast all those rats with it. They were incredibly hot now. Everything would be much easier. The artifacts went into full power. There was a big explosion and jets of fire immediately rushed down straight into the hordes of those rats. Combined with the lightning, it was just monstrously powerful. It literally incinerated those rats no matter how many there were. The artifacts were working at full power. Their strength was enough to destroy dozens, even hundreds of rats in a single volley. The guy was smiling again. Everything was going exactly according to his plan, just like that. All right, he rejoiced, for now victory was just around the corner. They still hadn't used their trump up their sleeve. Are the rats gathering in one place? Then they'll just fry them. Just BTW to have them all together. Fire and lightning will just destroy them in one second. Then they'll just make a new kill box. The guy stood at the top and watched as the lightning and the powerful fire jet just incinerated the many rats that were approaching his fortress. His face was overflowing with joy, his eyes burning with rage. Did they think he wouldn't outplay them? He would destroy them all, you miserable creatures. The guy was already celebrating victory in his heart, realizing that the rats would not be able to withstand such an onslaught. That was just great. Suddenly, he was distracted by a notification on the map. The guy stopped freaking out and shifted his gaze to the side. What he saw made a chill run down his back. His eyes widened. The information about the bosses that were previously under a question mark was displayed. They were rat warriors. They were just incredibly powerful level 30 elite warriors. A quantity of three pieces. If their name was revealed, then those things are around somewhere. Indeed, suddenly there was a terrifying and terrifying scream. As if woven from many different voices, a huge warrior appeared from somewhere and opened its huge, toothy mouth. This rat was just a huge, colossal size and probably had just monstrous power. These were the same creatures they had seen in the dungeon when they had gone on the raid. The rats were several meters tall, with sharp spikes on their backs and tails that looked like some kind of sting. Its eyes burned with the same red fire. Now they were simply a colossal danger. In addition to them, there was a second wave of sewer rats behind them. Naturally, they would try to continue what they had started. If these rats died, more would come to replace them. They would break through this door after all. And then it would really suck, Guy ordered in a trembling voice to stop them. For the first time in a long time, he was scared. Really scared that he might die now. Sure, there had been many such instances, but dealing with such hordes of rats would be a nightmare for him. He trembled with fear. The guy for the first time in his life didn't know what to do. They'd already used up everything they had. The warriors were approaching. They were so powerful and heavy that their post cracked the earth. It shattered and shards of rock showed outward. Their feet were just incredibly powerful. They had huge claws on them. One of the warriors rushed towards the entrance and put his powerful clawed paws forward. Is he going to break down this door now? The guy looked at his soldiers and shouted at them not to stand there. 
The soldiers seemed to come to their senses and rushed down. They realized that something unimaginably terrible was about to happen. Don't let them do it! The cannons started firing again. They were trying to hit the soldiers to distract them from the main entrance. If these things could get through, it would be the end of them all. The projectiles were hitting the target accurately, but there was some doubt that they could do any damage to these things. Even though they were taking damage, the rats continued to move forward with even more fury. They were simply indomitable beasts. The creatures that constantly lived in danger had now broken free. The guy took a closer look and realized that these warriors looked at least twice the size of the one they met in the dungeon. So if they had handled it with great difficulty then, what to expect from them now? This was simply unthinkable. If such a monster crashed into the wall, it would even be hard to imagine the damage it would do. It was unimaginable. One had to stop this thing by all means. They would use it as a battering ram if it broke through. It would definitely be the end of everyone. Besides, he had a few thousand more of these rats behind him. They would also break through inside. Then they definitely wouldn't be able to fight back. The turret continued firing. The shots sounded like thunder. Flames burst out of its barrels. Shooting straight at the enemy, several energy projectiles flew straight at the warrior, who was already preparing to break through the wall with his powerful body. The rat didn't even seem to notice that its death was approaching it. A few seconds later, the projectiles reached their target and immediately exploded on contact with its huge armored body. The monster let out a scream, smoke spreading everywhere, which was a bright green hue. The monster fell to the ground with a clatter its bright red eyes slowly fading at first. It had taken a tremendous amount of damage. The monster stuck out its tongue and lay on the ground, seemingly dead. The boy looked down at all of this and realized that this was all just the beginning. Although the monster had been defeated, but not everything was so simple. Smoke was spreading everywhere. There was just a disgusting smell in the air. He clenched his teeth and ordered no one to relax. This isn't over yet. Be ready. He realized that these things wouldn't give up so easily. He had to concentrate all his strength to finally deal with them. That was the key to success. The other two monsters rushed to break through the castle walls. A cloud of the remaining rats rushed after them. They were approaching faster and faster. It was simply monstrous. Killing these warriors was a priority. The small army could be forgotten about for a while. He shouted for everyone to fire, don't save shells. This is a battle on which their lives depend. The cannons were firing, they were already at their limit, and the shells flew with astonishing speed. They reached their target, hitting the rats with a bright, righteous fire. There was an unimaginable rumble around. You had to cover your ears not to go deaf. They activated the mana multiplier so Jupiter could fully utilize her powers. The woman prepared herself. She thrust forward her hand that was already fully engulfed in lightning. She prepared for something fun to start now. Her body was overflowing with energy a smile spreading on her face. She smelled something fiery coming. The woman smirked and prepared to deliver her crushing blow. It was kind of fun for her. Her body was just overflowing with energy. The power was simply colossal. The woman unleashed all of her energy on the rats, transformed into an electric discharge. It was as if the gods themselves began to descend from the heavens. There was a rumble everywhere. Lightning bolts were striking the ground where the rats were accumulating. These monsters literally dissolved in the air. The power was so strong that nothing in this world could not withstand such an onslaught. Everywhere there was an unimaginable squeak, scream, and the smell of fried meat. However, that was not all. Despite all this power, a few giant rats still managed to break through. They were moving at an incredible speed. The endurance of these creatures was simply unimaginable. It had already approached the borders, and in a second it was ready to hit them. Jupiter looked forward. What a bunch of freaks. And not enough. The woman didn't believe in autos that anyone could have survived after such an impact. This was the first time she had ever faced something like this in her life. She didn't believe that these monsters could withstand even half of her power. Considering the damage distribution... Even that wasn't enough to knock these monsters dead. The rats were approaching. The warriors stood in vanguard. They were ready to break through the castle's defenses in a single blow. Just to defend themselves. Guy yelled to get the flamethrower ready immediately. The rats were getting closer. If they did get close enough to the castle walls, they would be finished. The girl looked at him that the artifact hadn't recharged yet. 
The player nodded his head and said that he knew everything. Suddenly it came to the woman's attention what he meant. She realized that the flamethrower would be herself. Immediately the girl shook with horror. Is this what she thought it was? It's a mockery. And I'm just going to have to do it again. But still, there was no choice. Either she would do it or they would all die here. The girl concentrated all her power. A pillar of flame burst out of her hands, which even began to burn her body. The girl screamed in fear, but released a jet of fire forward. She almost cried. She knew it. She knew it. She knew it. The pillars of flame ripped out of her hands and flew straight into the hordes of rats. Still, she had to act as a living weapon again. The girl really didn't want to do that, but she didn't have much choice. The fire reached its target and began to burn the rats. There was a deafening squeak. The monster screamed in fear and pain, but was unable to resist such power. His entire body was consumed by fire. His skin began to melt. The monster screamed with unbearable suffering, but could not stay on his feet, no matter how hard he tried. The fire was consuming all living things in its path, as if God himself had come down to earth and was now sizzling all living things right. The monster did not stand on its feet and immediately died. Its red eyes ceased to blaze with fire. Its huge body began to lurch to the ground, and in a second, it was ready to fall. Another warrior rushed after him, the two of them substituting for each other like a human shield. These creatures had phenomenal stamina, despite all the damage they didn't receive. The monsters weren't going to retreat back. It was just a nightmarish sight. There's one more left. The last one. The player shouted for them to kill him immediately. His eyes were blazing with rage. Horror overwhelmed his whole body. He realized that if they couldn't deal with them now, they wouldn't get another chance as they would all be dead. As if hearing this order, he drew his sword and prepared for battle. This would be the fateful battle that would decide the outcome. He gripped the hilt of his sword tighter and prepared to strike. Swinging his sword straight at the warrior, it flew with the blade straight forward, slicing through the air with an unimaginable whoosh. The man had charged it with his energy before, and now the sword flew, leaving a bright light behind it. The sword hit the monster in the neck. The monster screamed in pain but did not fall. Sticky, nasty saliva spewed from its mouth. Then the knight ordered the gunner to immediately shoot and finish off the monster. One more shot. His heart was jumping out of his chest as the knight realized that the outcome of the battle depended on it. It was an unimaginably nightmarish sight. Everyone was worried. Now there was only hope for the arrows. Ash turned to the boy and shouted for him to shoot quickly. He didn't have much time left, so the boy grabbed his crossbow and prepared to aim. This time he felt no fear. All he had to do was take the last shot. The guy activated his eye and took aim as best as he could. He used all his power to put it into that shot. The boy realized that if it didn't happen, they would all die here. He couldn't allow any more casualties. Soon he pulled the trigger. The arrow flew out of the crossbow, and with a whoosh began to cut the air inexorably approaching the monster. The boy was ready for anything. The arrow flew a few meters and crashed right into the creature's eye. The monster screamed. The shot was accurate. Was this really victory? The rat began to thrash in agony. Blood flew out of its mouth. The wounds were incompatible with life. The player shouted, eat, had they defeated him. A grimace of rage was reflected on his face. He realized that just a little more and the final denouement would come. However, his words were not destined to come true. He hesitated half a word and looked forward. Surprisingly, despite all the injuries he had received, the rat warrior was moving forward with him at an imaginable speed. How is that possible? He still had the strength to move? The monster was approaching them in huge strides, even though it had an arrow sticking out of its eye. The monster spewed blood from its mouth forward. The guy was terrified he still had the strength to move? That's just impossible. Now he really didn't know what to do. They had already spent everything possible. Why won't this guy die? It was as if they were all numb with fear. They couldn't move from their seats and just silently watched as the armored monster approached the fortress closer and closer. The monster began to roar. His eyes were bloodshot again. He was coming closer and closer. No, that's just impossible. They had no time to do anything. They had. There was a deafening rumble and crack. The monster had reached its goal, after all. 
It had broken through the wall, and now, the way for the rest of the army was free. The castle failed, the wall collapsed, and now it was all over. There was a hole in the middle of the building, just a huge hole through which the rats began to crawl. There was no defense left. Something was wrong. At this time, when the fortress was fighting against the hordes of rats, the Count was standing somewhere nearby on his horse and watched as his fortress was on fire. Something was wrong. He was a commander that had fought monsters all his life and had never once been able to understand. What he couldn't realize was that there was something different about this battle, something forbidding that he had never encountered before. It was strikingly different from the times when he held the position of commander-in-chief. It wasn't the number of monsters at all. It was the combination of monsters. These things that were coming closer and closer were incredibly powerful points. Instead of a group of different kinds of monsters came a unified army. He stood on a small elevation and watched. Only one thing was swirling in his mind. Had the prince already participated in three such battles? From what he saw, fear settled in his soul. The old man couldn't believe it. Now the old man understood everything. He understood why the young lord was so desperate for his help. He had not realized it at the time but now he was beginning to realize the enormity of the situation. Of course, it was hard for him to believe that a man like this lord, the way he was, and the way he had proven himself in the city, could do badly. It was simply unbelievable. But from now on, he could see for himself how dangerous things were. The old man put his hand on the saddle of his horse where his sword was already. He was making up his mind. Should he help him? Should he get involved in this battle? He hesitated recent events still on his mind. He came to his home farm and saw his wife, his men just killed, torn to shreds. He remembered it with pain, so much pain that he couldn't fight it. The old man looked away and sighed heavily for the last time. He still couldn't make up his mind. Two people were fighting in his mind, a soldier who must fulfill his duty and a simple man who just wanted to live normally. No, he made up his mind a long time ago. It's over. He's not in the military anymore and... Just let him have a normal life. He's been through enough in his life. He's lost everything he loves. Now he just wants to end his life in his hometown. He just wants to die in his garden. How hard can it be? The old man turned around and led his horse deep into the woods to get away from this place as fast as possible. He didn't want to be a part of this. It's not his business. It's not his war. He had served his time. No, no, no. But something stopped you, too. Something that had been sitting in his soul for too long imprisoned in his memory. The old man opened his eyes and as if frozen in place. He couldn't yet come to terms with what he was seeing. Would he just give it all up like that? Why can't I move? The old man felt something. He felt something in his back, something very sharp like a knife going through his memory, cutting into the most private corners. His eyes widened, his breathing hitched. No, I'm not fighting him anymore. He didn't want to go back to his past, which with such effort he wanted to forget to erase from his memory. Too much pain he had endured in his life to go back to that viper's den again. The old man stopped and frowned. Something had stopped him. He couldn't understand why he couldn't just give it all up. His life should just end. He wanted to die in his garden surrounded by grapes. Why couldn't he? My memory still sparkled with memories of days gone by. He must go back to his garden. Wait for me, my dear. It was as if he mentally addressed his dead wife, who never waited for him, left unprotected. This time he would protect her. He swore it. He would now spend the rest of his life, the rest of his life, beside his wife, whom he had failed to protect in life, so after death he would stay with her and... At this time, there was a nightmare going on in the fortress. The player was commanding his army with his last strength. Give the order to evacuate. Immediately. He had no choice but to get as many people out of the city as possible before the rats ate them. The walls had been breached. There was a gaping hole through which these creatures were free to enter. Now there was no way out. If he didn't, all those people would die. He couldn't let that happen. He couldn't let that happen. He had to save what he had. The boy turned back and saw the second wave of these vile monsters already approaching the castle walls, which was now left unprotected. This army was simply huge, seemingly even bigger than before. So close. He realized that he would not be able to resist now. Save yourselves. He ordered all but the minimum number of artillerymen to go down and fight to the end. 
Even in such a situation, he remained true to his conviction. The soldiers prepared to take the last battle, many of them realizing that they might not be able to go back anymore. The boy turned to Lucas and said that the command of the soldiers A now rested with him. The soldier put his hand to his chest as a sign of understanding. He accepted the command and was now ready to fight to the last. The remaining men must go on. The cannons continued to spew flames and now most of the soldiers went down to defend the fortress in some way. They had to set up a palisade in front of the ruined wall. There had to be any way to stop those things and... The cannons kept firing. Not many shells left. But there was no choice. It was a nightmare. A nightmare that was happening on his. He turned to Jupiter, who was at her limit. The woman was concentrating an incredible amount of magic in her hands. She was already preparing the next room. The guy shouted that he was giving her complete freedom of action. The main thing was to kill as many at a time as possible. Let him, as soon as he accumulates the necessary energy charge, shoot it immediately. The woman, breathing heavily, said that his wish was laws for her. Now she'll give it her best shot. He turned back to Lily and asked, What artifacts are ready? The woman replied that they were only for speed. What about the flamethrower artifact? The girl bit her tongue and said there were still ten minutes left. She already realized what was waiting for her. However, she didn't want to believe it. The guy shook his head and told her to use haste on the soldiers right now and let her activate the flamethrower artifact as soon as it recharges. The girl replied in a stammering voice that she understood and... Then the guy approached the gunner. He wanted to give him an instruction. Even took a few steps towards the boy, but immediately stopped. The boy saw something. Something he really didn't like. He looked at the boy with eyes full of despair. Something had to be done. Demian stood there dead or alive, a look of sheer terror in the boy's eyes. He couldn't even take a proper breath. His heart was racing. The boy stuttered. He seemed to be out of his mind. The player realized that the boy probably thinks that this whole situation is his fault for not finishing off that rat catcher in time. No wonder the boy can't function properly now. He was about to cry when suddenly the player gave him a powerful slap right in the forehead. The guy could hardly stand on his feet and yelped in pain. Smiling, the guy said that he had done pretty well so far. It was necessary to at least cheer this boy up somehow. Otherwise, things would be completely bad. No need to think about bad. No need to think about bad. No need to think about bad. It's bad. Damien looked at him with frightened eyes. Your Highness. He couldn't believe that this was happening to him on his. The boy was very much afraid. Obviously, guilt was tormenting him now. He couldn't work properly, shoot, yes, even breathe. The player put his hand on his shoulder and told him he wouldn't blame him for a couple of small mistakes. It's all nothing. So don't let him lose confidence. The case is still full. The boy bit his tongue and tried to pull himself together. This is the shooter who never missed his target. A real cheater. He must be taken care of. The question here is whether they can survive. The boy approached the shooter and said that for him, his mere presence is already a huge advantage over the enemy needed to let the boy realize that he is really important. The gunner looked at him with a frightened look and could not believe his ears. Therefore, he must trust the player just as the player trusts him. Damien looked at him with eyes full of tears and nodded his head. Yes, your highness. The boy realized that he didn't have much choice. Guy walked up to him and put his hand on his shoulder. There's the glorious one. Now there's the most important frontier left on him. He led the boy to the edge and told him to shoot the rats that were breaking through the soldier's defense line. The boy looked down the city and saw the soldiers fighting countless rats. The boy trembled with fear. Now, after the player's words, the boy seemed to change. He nodded his head. Yes, he will do his best. It was as if there was an added confidence in him. Well, that's better than nothing. Ash looked at him with a serious look. Well, now we just have to hope that everyone does their job well. This was the final frontier. If they made a mistake here, the next time they might just die. That could not be allowed to happen. The guy looked down and saw a huge horde of rats moving straight towards the breach. There were too many of them. One could only hope that everyone would make it through. Otherwise, this city would just drown in blood. The guy shouted that the rats are coming. The whole army must be ready. Among I am the base of the sky that struck all the military points. Absolutely all the soldiers were shaking with fear. They realized that perhaps not everyone would return home. However, they didn't have much choice. The monster was only getting bigger. They couldn't let these things destroy the city. 
The huge body of the dead monster was lying in the opening, and the soldiers immediately stood behind it. They put up their shields, preparing to meet the enemy face to face. Each of them had fear in their hearts, yet they were eager to fight. The first paw of the rat had already entered the ground of the city, and now they were already inside. There were simply countless numbers of them. The monster were tearing, and they could smell the scent of blood. They wanted to destroy everything in their path. As soon as the first rat crossed the threshold of the city, its head was immediately cut off by a sharp swing of the ball. It was Lucas who was the first to rush into battle. With a single powerful blow of his jagged sword, he cut off the rat's head, which immediately flew in the opposite direction, choking on its own blood. The man had fought like a true knight. Now it was up to them to win. The blade of the sword was covered in rat blood. Thanks to the enhancement, this sword was dealing 20% more damage to rats. It was literally smoking now. The real fun would begin. The man stood in front of the rest of the military and said that the passage is narrow. Don't let them panic. Destroy the rats one by one as soon as they appear in the passage. The man seemed to glow with rage, and this color gave the rest of the men strength. The soldiers prepared to repel the attack. They grabbed for their swords and shields and now, raring to fight with fury in their souls. At this time, the commander-in-chief stood above and watched from above. He watched in silence as his soldiers heroically defended the city at the cost of their own lives. He knew that it was an unthinkable labor. If they could not hold the defense, they would all be finished. Suddenly he saw something strange. The number of rats that pass through the hole at the same time grows. There's more and more of them. Something very bad seems to be coming. Looks like the rats had gotten the idea to widen the passageways. They've been gnawing through the concrete and moving on. At this rate, it'll be impossible to deal with them at all. Ash clenched his teeth. What kind of rats are these exactly? They're not rats, they're badasses. A chill ran down his spine. What the hell is this? It's impossible. How do they do that? Why are these rats so smart? Bastards. Lily shouted that the flamethrower artifact was ready. The sphere began to fill with energy emitting a bright light. Just a second more and it would rain down righteous fire on the rest of the rats. All that was left was to activate it. So what was she waiting for? The guy started to recall indeed because some strange status was placed on this man he was the first to die. He nodded, okay, so be it. Sitting in the main seat, he began to speak in a serious voice. He will start by telling everyone their roles for tomorrow. He turned to Lily. The girl looked at him with a smiling face. Her class was mage, element fire. She is the main damager on this team, able to hit with one powerful spell after another. The guy said she would be their shield. Let her block the spider's attacks as a tank. The girl looked at her commander in surprise and fear. Then the boy turned to Ken. The man stood as always dissatisfied with something. Here he was, as it were, a tank capable of withstanding a large number of blows. Ash said he would have to infiltrate the mid and stealthily make a mess there. The man looked at his superior in surprise. Now that left Demi and he was a hitman. The kid still sat shrunken. He is a very important class in the game. Ash said that from now on, Demian is the shooter. The boy raised his crying eyes. Then the boy turned to Lucas. He said that the soldier would command the others and maintain the front line. There was silence between them for a second. Well, maybe they'll say something. Ken finally couldn't stand it, gritting his teeth, he growled. A man slammed his fist into the wall. He calls, that's the plan. That's some bullshit. The man was furious. Their emperor is saying this in all seriousness. Ash stood there in a bit of a daze. He didn't expect this from his subordinate, although it was actually, and it was actually bullshit. However, this location really wasn't one of those that could be passed by the standard method. The boy's eyes lit up and he suddenly changed his face. His voice became rougher. Something predatory flashed in his eyes. He looked at his subordinate and asked in such a state he dared not respect the subordination. The man came to be horrified. He physically felt the aura emanating from his commander. The man immediately closed his mouth. Soon, Ash stood up from his seat. Okay, the plan was clear. Since what he came up with sounds like complete recklessness, something needs to be done. Lily stood beside him and was also trembling with fear. He took hold of his sword and drew it outward. Without waiting for an answer, the boy swung his sword. The others were horrified by what they saw. They could not say a word. Damien trembled with fear. A lump stuck in his throat. The sword stabbed right into the girl's chest. 
She didn't even have time to realize anything and just stared frightened. Ash smiled and continued to hold the hilt of the sword. Each of them is able to accomplish the tasks at hand, right? A pause hung between them for a second. If he found himself in the body of a crazy person, why not behave the same way? Ken was trembling with fear. The prince had really lost his mind. What is he doing? How could they go into battle if they were commanded by such a madman? The boy was completely adamant. Suddenly flames began to ooze from the girl's wound. It grew stronger and stronger. But the boy seemed to be expecting just that. He smiled exactly what he had planned. All the roles had hidden skills, special abilities completely contrary to their tasks. 212. The boy looked at the girl and asked, She was wounded by a dagger as a child, right? When the goblin army invaded her village, the poor girl looked at the dagger stabbed into her and almost cried. After that incident, she got the fire skin skill, right? This skill allows you to resist any injury with fire. She didn't say anything and looked at him with big eyes. The boy continued to look at her, however, Lily didn't say anything. It was a tank skill that somehow ended up in the mage's possession. It couldn't be used in the game. But reality was different after all. Now he's going to squeeze anything out of this skill. A devilish smile appeared on his face. Then he has no choice but to use cheats. The flames grew stronger and stronger. Now let the developer see how he gets through this game. He pulled the dagger out of the girl's chest, but she didn't suffer any injury. The boy apologized Zato that his method of demonstration was too rough. The poor girl came to her senses and said she was fine, however. How did he know? The boy didn't answer anything. Then he turned his gaze to another member of the team. He approached Ken. The man trembled with fear. Ash said, This guy was a petty thief when he was a kid. The man trembled. Coming from a slum and the family had a lot of mouths to feed. The guy woke up and immediately began to look around frightened. A scream came out of his mouth. There was a look of incomprehension and fear in his eyes. What was that sound? He stood like a statue in front of an incomprehensible structure from which one stone had broken off and was flying straight at him. The boy finally realized that he was about to die and screamed in terror. What the hell is that thing? He was scared and prepared to be crushed, but the stone flew past him. The boy was breathing heavily and there was a distinct smell of smoke around him. The boy covered his face with his hands to protect himself from the acrid odor. Several people stood near a large cannon. They were dressed in knight's armor. After a second, the cannon fired with a loud sound. The boy bounced aside, not understanding anything, and just looked at them frightened. He was trying to understand where he had gotten to, and what the hell was going on here. He didn't have time to finish his thought as the cannon started rumbling again. Now it was starting to get annoying. He screamed for it to finally stop. What he saw shocked him even more. His eyes opened even more. In front of him stood a veritable army of knights. Each of them was dressed in shining armor and in their hands was a huge bayonet. He was in the very center of the battle. There were shouts everywhere. People were bustling about. He looked around and flapped his eyes uncomprehendingly. Meanwhile, there was a real bacchanalia going on around him. Explosions were heard. Fragments of stones were flying everywhere. Knights dressed in armor were rushing into battle. They were firing crossbows to prevent something terrible from coming up to them. Suddenly a thought crossed his mind. Were they really in the middle of a war? He still stood like a statue. When he turned his head back, he saw a knight rushing towards him. The man was frightened by something and called him emperor. It was obvious that the knight was terrified. He shouted and tried to find out, is his lord all right? The boy was at a loss for words. Is that an enemy soldier? He recoiled in horror from the man and covered himself with his hands in an attempt to defend himself. The knight stopped and looked at the boy. He continued to scream in fear. When the boy saw that the knight had stopped, he calmed down a little and looked at him in surprise. After a second, the warrior knelt down and began to tearfully apologize to his lord. The boy was even more shocked. The man was apparently terrified himself and begged for mercy. Tears were streaming down his eyes. A player with this old man? Why is he apologizing to him? The boy tried to get up, still not taking his eyes off the strange man. The knight in the meantime, with his head on the floor, did not even think of getting up. The guy walked up to him and asked if he was all right. He wanted to help the man, but didn't notice the terrible fire flash coming at him. At the last moment, he managed to bounce away, and the flash hit the ground, scattering rocks. The boy fell nearby, hitting his arm painfully. He clenched his eyes in surprise. He was in pain, but immediately tried to get to his feet. He could not recover from the shock. His heart was beating very fast and his eyes bulged. He stared in rage in front of him. What the hell was that? Was that a bomb? He raised his head and looked at where the shell had hit. 
There was green flames blazing all over the place. What the hell is going on here? There were people screaming in pain and in agony. Suddenly he heard someone's loud voice, someone calling out to them. The knight stretched his arm forward and ordered everyone and go to attack. The enemy was attacking them. The boy looked in their direction in surprise. A look of bewilderment on his face. Several knights ran straight to the edge of the fortress in an attempt to defend themselves. Something incomprehensible burst out from around the corner and stabbed a knight through and through in one second. The man died instantly. His lifeless body hung on a huge bayonet. A second later, his arms broke off and one of them fell right in front of the boy. Suddenly, one by one, the soldiers began to drop dead. There was utter horror on their faces. What the hell is behind this wall? Goosebumps ran down the boy's back. The answer didn't take long. In a split second, something formed in front of him. It looked like a huge spider. It had six burning eyes on its ugly face. The monster opened its stinking maw and made a sound like crackling. The boy had to cover his ears to keep from going deaf. Is that a spider? The rest of the soldiers rushed to attack the monster. They swung their balls. The monster shifted its gaze to them. Literally seconds passed and the beast sliced them in half with one swift blow. The boy trembled with terror. The bodies of the knights fell to the ground, showering it with blood. The boy's eyes filled with horror as he saw the huge monster moving towards him. For a second, he thought it was just a dream. The monster was standing only a few meters away from him, its huge fangs dripping a vile liquid. The monster squeaked and raised its huge paw more like a scythe. The monster lunged at him, venom dripping from its fangs. The boy stood right in front of it. His whole short life began to flash before his eyes. To die like this is just unbearable. Another man appeared from somewhere. He had long hair and a nice calm voice. A knight appeared literally out of nowhere and rushed straight at the monster, swinging his sword. The monster barred. The sword hit right on target, and the monster's body began to disintegrate. In front of the protagonist stood a knight dressed in shining armor. He was just like the knight in the book. The man had clear blue eyes and light white hair. He smiled and asked, Do I think it's a cliché for a boy to deny reality? The boy looked at him with a surprised look. This world was starting to seem crazier and crazier. Suddenly, knights hesitated and looked at the boy in surprise. Immediately, he jumped up to him and began to worryingly ask why he looked like that. Seeing that the knight was very worried about his lord, he examined the boy for injuries. For some reason, the man's face appeared familiar to him. Finally getting to his feet, the boy jabbed his finger at him. Lucas? The knight's face became concerned. He was silent for a moment. The man theatrically wiped a tear from his face and said he knew his lord had hurt his head. He grasped the misunderstanding boy by the shoulders and said cheerfully that he was happy to finally be called by his name. The boy was in complete shock. He shook his whole body and looked at the knight with bulging eyes. Is that the real Lucas? The knight looked at him with his blue eyes and remained silent. Another guess came into the boy's head, but it was simply impossible to believe. They were standing at the side of the battle, and next to them lay the carcass of a huge spider. A battle was raging all around. The battle didn't stop for a second. The fortress began to catch fire and hordes of black huge spiders were approaching. Burning arrows were flying everywhere. And the inhabitants of the fortress were defending themselves strenuously. His hunch made the boy feel sick to his stomach. Could he really be inside the game? At that moment, the guy realized he was in a real mess. It was a nightmare and he wasn't prepared for it. A bomb fell next to him and began to pulsate like a living organism. A second later, it exploded. And the boy covered himself with his hand to avoid being hit. There was only one question on his mind. How the hell did he get inside the game? Lucas addressed him again, calling him his highness. The boy looked at him in surprise. The knight grabbed him by the shoulders and told him that the enemy was attacking them right now. It's the army of the Black Spider. These things were getting bigger and bigger and they were approaching the entrance to the castle. And they were starting to break through the gates. The sun was nearing sunset and gradually hid behind the mountains, scattering its last rays. Lucas stood in front and shielded his master, protecting him from the enemy. He turned to his master and said that while time was still, let him do his best to hold out. All the while, the boy wondered, why is this knight protecting him? What do they call him? Your Imperial Highness? Soon the sun disappeared over the horizon and the battle ceased. The corpses of defeated soldiers lay all around. Heavily sighed, finally the sun had hidden, which meant everything was fine. He was covered in spider blood, looked fearfully at his lord. The boy looked at the foot of the castle where there were many monster corpses. There were obvious traces left after the battle. Many spider corpses were lying at the bottom. Everything was drenched in green blood. The boy looked at the knight and worriedly asked what was the date today. 
And where was he even? In a trembling voice, the knight replied that today was the last day of February 649 according to the imperial calendar. The boy clenched his teeth. It turns out tomorrow is March 1st. Lucas nodded his head. The boy squinted his eyes. A very familiar situation. Monster attack on a forward operating base. He bit something on his lip to the point of pain. Something in his head told him this was very bad. In the end, he remembered. Having sat through the game defense of the Empire for half a year, he had been to this location hundreds of times in the exact same story date, going through training. That's it, he's got it. Ash. Lucas looked at him in surprise. The guy beat his hand on his chest and yelled that his name was Ash. Ash von Hader Everblake. He grabbed his head, why? Lucas nodded his head, that's right. He found himself in the body of a game character. She's their worst commander ever. Also, worst of all, this is the character who died the most horrible death. The boy was holding his head and was terrified. The situation was the worst ever. After the battle, he went to his private home. The boy stood in front of the mirror and shouted furiously at his reflection. Bastard, couldn't you just sit still? Why did he stick his head out? The guy was breathing heavily. You're going crazy. He was the only one in the room. The reason this game is considered unplayable was the difficulty level hell. Also the Iron Man mode that forcibly saves progress. Well, he's the only one who got past that mode. Doesn't seem to care which of the game's moments he gets in. He's confident in his abilities and that he can find a way out. The boy opened the system window. He could pass everything except this location. The training was done in such a way that the player will fail sooner or later anyway. Because the story begins after Lucas single-handedly escapes the monster invasion. In this game, the story that lasts three years, you can only start hunting the army of black spiders after a year and a half. He massaged his head, trying to find a way out. Already, he needs to get his act together. He's been through this game before. He knows every pebble. If he can pull together all his knowledge and experience, he can definitely find a way out. After an hour of searching, he was desperate. There is no way out, there is no way out. The boy has already started laughing hysterical laughter. He's totally fucked, isn't he? Opening the system window, he began to study the opponent's parameters. Level 55? There's over 1,000 of them here. What the fuck was this? This was too much to learn. Besides, the weapons that were in this fortress were total bullshit. He tried to come to his senses and regained his breath again. You just have to make the save at the right moment. The moment one messes up, the whole game will be broken. He had played this game long enough to realize something in any situation. One must do something about it and try to find a way out to survive. He reached his hand toward the system window. The guy pressed his finger on the touch screen. There it was, found it. The guy opened the door with his foot and started calling for Lucas. The knight was standing nearby and looked back at him fearfully. The boy looked at him with mad eyes and ordered him to quickly assemble a squad under his direct control. Lucas looked at his commander in surprise and fear. Does he mean his guardsmen? The man looked at him in surprise. The king never summoned them. Why so suddenly? The boy growled. Just have Lucas call them in. The guy jabbed his finger at him. The knight looked at him with a completely uncomprehending look. A smile appeared on the boy's face. He said he had figured out a way to defeat them. Soon he was sitting at a table with his retinue in front of him. Lucas was standing nearby. It was obvious that all the knights were worried about something. However, the commander was calm and serious. He folded his arms across his chest and looked at his charges. Familiar faces, the girl with the staff was called Lily. The guy who was always dissatisfied with something was called Ken. The kid with the big glasses on his nose hugging his knees was Damien. Of course, they were familiar to him. After all, he played that game all the time. He had seen events in which these characters had died countless times. Ash looked at Damien and asked why he was shrinking like that. Lily shrieked. Indeed, Damien looked quite bad. He was scared of something, with tears glistening in his eyes. Lily smiled and said he was like that because he lost his comrade today. She asked her commander to understand that. Damien. For a second, he understood everything. Those words acted like a slap on the wrist. And he nodded. Now the boy was ready. He would follow his commander's orders. His face became stern. The artillerymen said the last shot was loaded, but they couldn't cool the cannon at this rate. Ash didn't listen to this. He ordered him to move. He would cool it himself. The guy looked at the cannon that was smoking from overexertion. The soldiers listened in horror and said it was incredibly hot. If the boy touched it, the consequences would be far more dire than a moderate burn. Ash replied that he would rather be burned alive here than go to hell and burn in the fire there. 
Damien walked over to him and looked at his commander. The boy frightened said he couldn't see anything. The commander replied that everything was fine. Clutching the wooden trigger handle in his hands, he said he couldn't feel his hands. The commander said it was all right. Smiling, he said it was okay. The boy furrowed his eyebrows. As soon as the boy's hands touched the gun, smoke came out. The boy felt just unbearable pain. He clenched his teeth and tried with all his might not to scream. He grasped the barrel of the gun and still could not contain himself in his hands from his mouth, burst out a deafening scream of pain. The guards were terrified their commander held the gun without sparing himself. This gave them strength, and they sparing no safety grasped the burning guns and they now raised the cannon together. The huge spider was already approaching them. It snapped its fangs, spreading a stench. Ash's eyes, he endured the pain, but now it didn't matter. Demian gathered his remaining strength into a fist and opened his eyes. Blood continued to pour from them. Shoot. The cry was like thunder. The boy pulled the trigger and the cannon fired its last charge. Its muzzle was immediately torn open. From such tension, all the military men immediately blacked out. Ash was grasping at scraps of consciousness. The last thing he managed to think was only one phrase. Get in. It was initially an impossible task to shoot at an enemy that was impossible to see. However, as if by magic, the projectile flew straight into the target, ignoring hundreds of thousands of other spiders. It was like an arrow cutting through space, and inexorably approached its target. The queen had a premonition of her death and gave one last death cry. She realized her days were numbered. The shell had burst her head without a doubt. Then the boy felt as if he'd swallowed his tongue. He couldn't believe his own happiness. Didn't know how best to respond to the first message from a viewer he'd gotten since he started streaming. The boy's eyes snapped open, his entire body pierced with pain. But he was alive. Against all odds, he had survived. Explosions continued to rumble around, burning arrows flying everywhere. The battle continued. Ken looked away fearfully. He had to distract the spider horde. He looked back and looked at his stamina potions, taking out the last of them. He sat under a tree, laying down his weapons. The guy was very afraid. Maybe just run away. The wind picked up around him and began to tear the leaves off the trees. Things were heating up. The man looked around fearfully, grabbing his sword. Someone was nearby, it was obvious. He began to walk around the tree to see who was following him. He looked around, confused. His heart was beating hard. The man fell to his knees and began to breathe heavily. Damien carefully looked ahead with his eagle eyesight. He had already seen the target. All that was left was to aim. A second later, there was a monstrous explosion. The target has been hit. Right in the bullseye. A large mushroom of fire rose high into the sky. Ash stood by the cannon and looked in front of him. It wasn't over yet. The spiders kept moving. Their horde seemed to only grow. They were already at the castle walls and were trying to climb up. Even though the cannon had hit its target, the queen was still alive. She was still able to give orders to her army. The boy clenched his teeth. Did they lack damage? If so, it's not good. The original Spider Queen could die from two strikes. But there was definitely something wrong here. A terrifying thought crossed his mind. What if her characteristics were different? What if she had a special skill? The soldier said that because of the overload, the cannon would soon reach its limit and explode. Because of this overload and the damage to the cannon, they can't fire at the length they intended. Ash says the man is talking out of his ass. The man grimaced and said they could fire five rounds in total. Two they had already used, three to go. A chill ran down the boy's spine. Three shots. That's not enough considering the queen is still alive. They have no choice but to finish this thing off in three shots. In addition, Demian's eyes also take damage. This skill has a side effect. The boy was already almost exhausted. Only one thing was swirling around in his head. Three shots is the maximum. The cannon was loaded again. Only one question remained, can Damien last that long? Fortunately, the walls of the central castle do a good job of keeping the spiders out. The boy heard a terrifying shout. The destroyer is coming. He moved his eyes to the side. A huge spider, completely covered in armor, was approaching the castle gate. He was much larger than the others and was well protected. The destroyer is trying to break through. He was surrounded by a crowd of other spiders as defense. There was nothing like this in the game. The guy yelled to the others to direct all fire at the destroyers. The cannons started rumbling, releasing tons of explosives forward. We had to hold them back. The shells were hitting their target, but didn't seem to do any visible damage. The spider kept moving. It was already at a dangerous distance. A couple more seconds and it would be over. There was a rumbling sound. 
The destroyer easily destroyed the main wall and the knights began to fly away like toys. The defenses had been breached. The way was clear for the spiders. Through the resulting hole in the castle, they began to come inside in a continuous stream. Ash watched the scene with horror. All he could do was watch the spiders approach inexorably fast. Lucas ordered everyone to raise their weapons. They are going down to the first floor to hold off the monsters. Ash ordered the gunners to get a grip. Those down there are protecting them. They must continue to shoot the queen. Before those things get to the artillery unit, they just have to destroy the queen. The boy became serious. Preparations were complete. The cannon ready for the next shot. They didn't have many attempts. Ash turned to Damien. The boy was almost ready. Ash looked along. The boy pointed the gun at the target. A second later, there was an explosion somewhere in the distance. A hit on the queen, but she's still alive. That thing is incredibly resilient. Ash yelled for everyone to slowly load the cannon for the next shot. Now, Lucas fearlessly fought somewhere below. He scattered the spider horde, buying his commander time. The knight was incredibly strong. He had no trouble dealing with the spiders, but there were more and more of them. He raised his head and shouted to the others to protect the artillery unit. They have a duty to protect the Imperial Prince. Ash realized that the situation was critical. He looked down and gritted his teeth. The defenses had been breached. The knights were piled up there and were defending the passage with all their might. The spiders were incredibly numerous. One of them pierced a knight through with its sharp paw. The man screamed, but his scream was immediately cut short. Blood spurted in different directions. The guy was desperate. The number of victims was inexorably growing. He was not prepared for this. He didn't know when he played the game that these were real people. The number of victims is inexorably growing. 142 people have already died. The soldier yelled for the others to put their hands on the cannon. We need to cool it down immediately. Lucas already very tired. And the spiders were already not getting smaller. The man looked around furiously. Ash came to be terrified. What should he do? How to find a way out of the situation? The defense is about to collapse and the artillery plant will be destroyed. Then they will definitely all die. Suddenly the general shouting was broken by someone's loud voice. It sounded like thunder. A man stood in the doorway holding a shield and a sword. The spiders stopped for a second. Ash looked somewhere in the distance and seemed to recognize the man. His eyes widened in surprise. The man drank the potion from the vial. In quick gulps he absorbed the tincture. It was Ken. The man wiped his face and looked fiercely at the army of monsters. The man stood all alone and shouted, I am Ken, Knight of the Empire. The spiders turned on him. In a second, their entire army was already running straight at the man, leaving the rest of the knights alone. Such a monstrous sight sent shivers down his spine, but it was too late to retreat. He ran in the opposite direction, trying to divert the spiders away from the main entrance. Suddenly a rock appeared in front of his face and the man immediately thought of a good idea that might work. A smile stretched across his face. The man hid behind the rock while the spiders got to him. He made the only right choice in this situation. He applied his secret, the pickpocket's survival techniques. His body began to merge with the surface of the rock. Ash shouted for him to wait. His health was at an extremely low level. The man noticed it too late. Due to his low health, his skill was not activated. And now he found himself surrounded by spiders. At the last second, he only had time to think that he shouldn't have trusted this man. The spider's fangs closed around his neck, another man dead. The guy looked at the statistician's window in horror. He could clearly hear the sound of flesh tearing right here. A legion of goosebumps ran down his back. His commands were wrong. The spiders were killing the warriors one by one. Because of his futile commands, a life, another man's precious life, was lost. The rest of the knights saw that Ken had moved forward along the line of defense. Now they rushed after him. They had no chance to retreat. Ash watched in horror as the other men left their lives on this battlefield. It wasn't just his fault, he himself, with his own hands, was killing these people. The boy opened his eyes in horror. Playing this game, he used the knights as bait when necessary. He didn't even think about what he was doing. This game was designed to use people as expendable, but now he realized it. The boy slapped his hand on a rock and ordered everyone to stop. Finally, he realized that every death is accompanied. The boy had already shouted for those damned monsters to stop. A huge spider tank appeared in front of him. It was already snapping its fangs. Just yelling would never stop them. We had to think of another way. A second later, a light descended on the huge monster's head, in which the outline of a sword could be seen. This was Lucas's special skill. He looked at the defeated monster in rage. The man raised his eyes and looked at his prince, asking if he was all right. 
One of the spiders was already flying at him, opening its vile womb. The only way to make them stop was to fight. The boy struck it with his blade, severing its head. The only way in this situation is to kill these spiders before they kill the others. The soldier shouted that the cannon was loaded for the fourth shot, however, Demian can't fire. Ash turned to the boy and shouted, can he fire? It was as if he didn't hear anything. The kid was already on his last run. Bloody tears were streaming from his eyes from overexertion. But he still agreed. Seconds later, there was a deafening rumble. The cannon fired for the fourth time. A huge buildup of energy flew straight at the queen. One more second and the projectile would hit the target. The queen looked in horror at her impending death. Her subjects began to rush to her defense. A huge energy charge incinerated the spiders one by one. The spider queen's eyes reflected horror. She realized that she could die in a second. A second later, a tremendous blow rang out. It hit her in the head. Target has been hit. However, it wasn't that simple. The queen somehow managed to survive. The fire from the impact had dissipated. Everyone looked towards the spider kingdom. A look of excitement ran across their faces. The cannon was already at its limit. It had heated up so much that it was ready to explode now. Damien couldn't fire anymore either. The attacks just didn't work. The military's hands blistered from the heat. The knight said the cannon was about to explode. There was no way to fire anymore. If they tried to fire again, all would die. The knight knelt down and said doomfully that it was over. It was time to surrender. The player looked at him with regret. Sweat was building on his face. Is it really over? The cannon was already damaged. It was smoking from reloading. If they fired any more shots, they would definitely die. The defense line was also broken through. The spiders were advancing with even more enthusiasm. People were dying by the hundreds. The gunner can't open his eyes. Is this really the end? Ash stood there like a statue, trying to think. Was there really no hope left? However, one of the knights looked through his telescope and said that they had no doubt struck the queen. Her skin began to peel off in large shreds. The monster had suffered significant injuries after all. The guy looked at the scout with rounded eyes and wanted to say something. Even left in this situation, he was faithful in his role to the end. The man didn't notice the huge projectile of energy moving towards him. Ash stared at it in horror, unable to say a word. His eyes rounded. A moment later, there was a deafening rumble. The shell had reached its target after all. It had hit the artillery unit. Saw this, but could not help in any way. He just screamed with horror. The tower cracked, and the guy went somewhere deep into the castle, along with the rest of the stones. There was almost no hope left. Ash. After a while, he was able to open his eyes after all. Luckily, he survived. The first thing he saw in front of him was Lucas's face. The knight was able to protect him. He arrived just in time and blocked the rock that could have crushed the boy. Ash immediately rose to his feet and looked at his savior. Lucas was worried about his lord even in this situation. Even though he was already at death's door, he still protected him. Ash jumped up to him and said he should be the one to ask. Is he all right or not? But the knight started coughing. His mouth was bleeding. The knight asked the boy in a quiet voice if he remembered the event of twenty years ago. However, the boy could not remember anything. As a player who occupied someone else's body, he had no memories. Lucas continued to speak. He said that when the Lord appointed him as his personal guard, such a thing he said. The knight said in a weakened voice that the Lord had once told him that even if he couldn't become emperor, he would remain the coolest man in the world. And as someone who would become his knight, Lucas should strive for that too. Lucas looked at his Lord with round eyes. He was, of course, a teenager at the time. But the boy's words had touched him to the point where he hadn't forgotten them until today. The man smiled through his strength. He could no longer rise. The stone had pinned him down. The man said that he trusted his king. Ash surprised asked the man even now. The boy didn't understand anything. He was shocked at such loyalty. Lucas frowned and said that he trusted his commander now more than ever. The stone was too heavy and the man could no longer handle the pressure and began to fall. In the end, he never made it and the stone pinned him to death. The man was no longer breathing. The dust slowly cleared. Only the ruins of the ruined castle were around. The boy was left alone. His most loyal subject had died protecting him from death. However, the boy could not believe that this man was dead. He looked hopefully at the knight and ordered him to hold on. He is the main hero, the savior of this world. The man lay with his eyes closed. Blood was streaming down his face. Ash lifted his head and looked around. He has to end this whole thing. Were they under an artillery unit somewhere? And how long had he been unconscious? 
He turned his head and saw that the cannon was destroyed. There were dead soldiers lying nearby. Fortunately, Shooter and the rest of the artillerymen were able to avoid fatal injuries. They were simply unconscious. The cannon, on the contrary, was destroyed. The boy hesitated and began to ponder. On second thought, why are they still alive? Where are all the spiders? A woman's voice was heard. The boy looked to the side in surprise and saw Lily. She was all engulfed in flames. The shelves were coming towards her and immediately burned. It's not over yet. A little hope appeared. The girl fought from the last strength. She burned like a torch burning in her enemies. Embraced by the flames, the girl looked at her commander and smiled. She did not want to give up until the end. The guy looked at her with horror. The girl's appearance was truly dismal. It was necessary to help her. Ash screamed. The girl reached out to him. Her face was haggard. In a weak voice, she said she wouldn't last long. For now, she could block the exit, but soon her strength would run out. And then the monsters would be able to get in and take over the fortress. And really, there was nothing but devastation all around. The girl blocked the passage with her last strength. She shouted for the guy to hurry up. They didn't have much time. And us hopefully looked at her commander and told him not to let them die needlessly. These words were like an order to the boy. He clenched his teeth and prepared to fight one last battle. The guy looked around and saw a few artillerymen who had recovered and were now cowering near the cannon. The man ordered the last shell to be loaded. The soldier was surprised, but the emperor had said that the cannon was at its limit. Fear was in his voice, and he had been told that she was already over the limit. If we fire any more shots, it will just explode. Ash replied that if they continue to do nothing, the spiders will eat them too sooner or later. What do they choose to do? They must not give up at any cost. The boy looked at his subjects. Even if they are burned alive, we must keep fighting. The soldier nodded his head. However, how do they aim? You can't see anything from here. They won't be able to detect the queen. The gun rack is lost. I'll have to hold it in my hands. It was on the ground. Besides, the gunner couldn't see anymore. But he doesn't need to aim. Just take the shot. The boy ordered the last shell to be loaded. That's an order. The gunner frowned and nodded his head in agreement. Ash started to approach the gun. He didn't know exactly how the skill of the eye from a thousand miles away worked. But as long as the gunner would shoot, he would always hit the target. He approached Demian. The boy sat with his back turned to him. He turned around and the boy saw that his eyes were bleeding. But he said he had to take one last shot. The boy's vision began to blur. He could barely make out the silhouette of his commander. Demian didn't believe in victory himself. What's the point of all this? No matter what he does, nothing changes. Ash gave him a serious look. He realized that hope was almost lost. He had to give the boy some encouragement. He told him that if the boy fired one more shot, the queen would die. The boy shook his head. That's not the point. Even if he fires the shot and the monster dies, what changes? Half of his friends are already dead. Even if he destroys the queen, it won't bring them back. The boy was about to cry. No matter how hard he tries, then this cruel world is always taking something away from you. The player stopped. These words put him in a stupor. Demian said that all he wants is to end it all. Doesn't want to live in a world like this anymore. He wanted to say something else, but the player interrupted him. He screamed his name as hard as he could. It was as if the boy had come to his senses. Ash started talking. Does the boy think this world isn't justified in being cruel? Thinks that even if he overcomes a huge obstacle in his path, life will be hell. The boy looked at him with a frightened look. The commander came up to him and grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. What a jerk, right thinking. There's a reason why if there's a difficulty level in this world, it's definitely hellish. And with an Iron Man mode for crying out loud where you can't save, Ash continued to shout furiously. This place is unfair to the point of absurdity. And nothing will ever be your way in it. That's life. Who doesn't know that? Damien didn't say anything. He just listened. Ash continued to scream. Is he willing to give up and lie there waiting to die? He looked at the commander with wide open eyes. He was at a loss for words after this. Ash shouted that he would fight to the last man, would come up with new and new strategies until the very end. He drew his sword from its sheath. His voice suddenly became cold and hard. He held it out to the boy and said that if he wanted to surrender, let him open his throat with that sword right now. The boy was silent. If he has the courage, let him do it. But if he's a coward, let him be his trigger. He approached the boy face to face and the odor of blood literally emanated from him. Let him stop looking back at his dead friends. He threw the sword to the ground and said that the only one he needed to continue was himself as commander. Let him not look for trivial reasons to live. Ash told him he was a chess piece, his key, his trigger, that's all he needs. 
The boy fell silent and frowned. Ash looked at him with a stern look. In addition, he had a new skill unlocked. Passive skill, indomitable commander. He looked at his gunner one last time with a look that could have incinerated him. That's an order. He got down on one knee in front of the boy. Putting a hand on his shoulder told him to finally smash the ugly face of that fucking monster. The monsters had gotten smarter. They realized that they could go around, and now countless of them rushed straight towards the castle gates. They were moving with incredible speed again. The guy clenched his teeth with rage. He had, of course, assumed that such a thing could happen, but there were more monsters than he had expected. There were too many of them. He needed to act instantly. He bent down and turned to Lady Jupiter, who was already standing with her troop at the castle gates. The woman decided to take a little break. The player shouted for her to get ready for battle. The monsters are advancing from the right side. Let her drive them away using the tactic of hit and run. The guy shouted this so that the woman could hear it through the rumble of battle. She only did it for the money. All she cared about was the reward for the work she did. She wasn't even afraid of death, for money was worth more to her than her own life. With a swing of the reins, she whipped her horse and it moved forward with a fierce determination. Now it was up to her to distract the horde. The knights ran straight at her, blue fire streaming through their armor. One of the knights thrust his sword forward, ready to pierce his enemies. The sight of him was terrifying. Jupiter concentrated the unbelievable power of lightning. The woman swung her arm and prepared to knock out those freaks with a single blow. A smile stretched across her face as she anticipated her reward. Ash looked in the direction where thunderclaps could be heard and bursts of lightning could be seen. Great. She's doing well with the block that is the side. Now got to deal with the armor on the other side. He turned around and addressed the gunner. He said it was his turn. The boy looked at him fearfully and even a little taken aback by this. He waved his hand to the side and ordered him to shoot off the monsters that were advancing on the left. Indeed, there were just as many. A huge armada was moving straight towards the fortress. The boy sighed and put a hand to his chest. Now it was his finest hour. He must give his best to avenge his comrade. The boy even held his breath. Everything seemed to slow down for him. He felt nothing but concentration. His eyes lit up and the energy overflowing his body seemed to transfer to his weapon. The arrow glowed with a bright light. The boy took aim using all his strength. After a second, he pulled the trigger. There was a click and the arrow flew out of the weapon with a phenomenal speed and sound waves flew in different directions. The boy was barely able to stay on his feet. The arrow flew precisely at the target. He didn't even need to aim, his skill was so powerful. Another second and there was a whistling sound. The arrow was coming right at one of the knights. It flew right into the target, striking the heart of that horrible creature. The knight roared and fell from his feet. A second later, his armor began to disintegrate and fell to the ground with a loud clang. The target was hit with a single shot. A smile told the boy that he had finally hit it. He was pleased with himself and behind him stood a few guards who opened their mouths in amazement to watch. It was the first time they had ever seen such marksmanship. Ash stretched out in a smile. There he was, a sight from a thousand miles away. To think that with them one could pierce the soul core with an ordinary arrow. How cheating this skill was. The guy didn't know where to put himself out of happiness. Victory was already in their pocket. The archer took aim once more to strike the heart of yet another spawn. Kill box in the center. All that was left was to hit the enemies. In the middle was a sphere that immobilized the army of enemies. All that was left was to deliver pinpoint strikes. Jupiter was on the right. The woman defending the flank, weeding out the monster hordes with her spells. She had no trouble dispatching the undead hordes with just one strike. The gunner on the left, he hits the enemies with a single shot. All flanks are protected. That's just great. At this rate, it won't be difficult for them to win this war. The player smiled. The number of defeated was approaching K just a little more, and they would wipe out this entire army. At this rate, there shouldn't be any difficulty until the boss reveals himself. It was good to see that their preparations had paid off. However, suddenly he saw something strange. One of the defeated knights began to glow. It was as if his ghost soul was leaving his armor and rushing upwards. The same thing happened to the rest of the knights. Hundreds, thousands of little souls were flying out of their armor and rushing forward somewhere up into the heavens. There they gathered into a huge sphere of bluish light. It was the concentration of all the power of the ghost armor. What the hell is this? 
There was nothing like this in the game. The guy lifted his head up and looked up there fearfully. Something incredible was going on there. The number of defeated knights had reached 500 after all. And as soon as the counter reached that number, the whirlpool of blue light above began to move in a circle, and a face began to appear there. After a second, the guy saw a demonic face appear in that circle of light. There were glowing eyes, and the mouth was stretching in a monstrous smile. He felt a vibration that spread more and more. The boy clenched his teeth. Goosebumps ran down his back. Is that the boss? He had never seen such a thing before. How was he even going to fight it? Indeed, it was the boss of the Living Armor Army. A ghost knight. He had a 25th level, far higher than he could defeat. The ghost knight began to form its body, gradually descending lower to its victims. It was this creature that gave the strength of the Legion. The Legion is basically strong on its own. But even after defeating it, the players still have another boss waiting for them. But they only finished off one half. Why did that asshole show up so soon? The knight hasn't put up any resistance so far. He just hovered in the air and looked at what was happening with his ghostly eyes. He was not resisting, not reinforcing his knights, not attacking. He just hung in the air and stared. This whole thing was getting weirder and weirder. However, this isn't just a game. It's freaking real. The guards were horrified. It was the first time they had ever seen something so horrible. Even people who had gone through the war were shaking with fear. What the hell is this? The mere appearance of a huge monster in the sky caused the soldiers to panic. They didn't know what to do. Their morale plummeted in every second. The player looked at them and cursed to himself. What a devil. At this rate, they would just lose any fighting spirit. That's the difference between the warfare people are used to and the end that goes against monsters. It is the latter that awakens the supernatural fear that sits deep in the bowels of the human soul. Fear of supernatural ugliness that is beyond human comprehension. The appearance of this monster terrifies the soldiers. The guy looked at the terrified guards who froze in horror. It was as if he was bringing the remnants of the army to their knees. Moreover, it wasn't only the people who came to be terrified. The horses, too, refused to go forward. They reared up and threw their riders to the ground. The beasts were no less afraid than the men. Jupiter could hardly stay in the saddle. She clung to her horse as if it had gone mad. She tried to throw the woman to the ground and run away. The situation was getting worse by the second. The woman struggled to stay in the saddle, but the horse seemed to go crazy. It was jumping from side to side and the rider was about to fly off the horse to the ground, and so it happened. After a few seconds, the woman still couldn't hold on to the saddle and promptly flopped on her back on the hard ground. She groaned and realized she was in great danger. The knights were coming closer and closer to her with each passing second. Only a few meters away, she could already see their glowing faces. She was bleeding. She had hit her head hard during the fall. A whistling sound came out of her mouth. She tried to get up, but her body didn't seem to listen. The woman was already mentally aware that she would soon be finished. The player saw it all. He clenched his teeth and realized that one of the fighters was going to die. No. The bastards rushed forward. The army of those bastards was coming faster and faster. The woman seemed to have lost consciousness and was now lying completely helpless. At this time, the hordes of those walking armor were approaching her. They were already fleeing with their weapons forward ready to deal with her. Suddenly she was surrounded by her subordinates. Holy shit, we have to protect the wizard. They stood in a semicircle and prepared to fight back. They needed to protect their commander, as Jupiter was one of the most valuable members of the team. Ash came to be horrified. Jupiter was, after all, the key figure in the first location. Now her team was in danger. He realized that just seconds more and they would lose their most valuable player. Lucas shouted that they should deploy cannons and artillery to help Jupiter's squad. It was already obvious, however, the situation was escalating with every second. Ash shouted that there was no way they could do that. If they withdrew their weapons and the kill box got smaller, more enemies would just hour through the walls. There would be more of them, and then they would definitely fail. Lucas wanted to object to something, but the leader stopped him with a gesture. The soldiers were panicked by the appearance of the huge boss. The huge face with a nightmarish grin looked down at them from the sky, obscuring almost all the space with its body. Even the sun had stopped shining. The cannons and ballistas stopped firing. The situation was getting worse by the second. The already poor defenses weakened instantly. 
The troops began to break forward. One more second and they would definitely be close to the castle. He looked at Lucas and ordered him to concentrate on rebuilding the kill box. All the soldiers have gone crazy. Lucas hesitantly replied that he understood and immediately took command. The soldiers were grabbing their heads. They were possessed by madness. They did not know what to do next, for now their lives were on the line. The player looked at the right flank and mentally apologized to Jupiter. She had to get through this somehow. They were in a bad situation right now. The woman opened her eyes quickly. Her eyes were bloodshot and her head hurt, literally splitting apart. Adrenaline raged in her blood, giving her strength. She grabbed her head, which appeared to be about to explode with pain. The woman tried her best to regain consciousness, a strangled groan escaping her throat. She was still alive. But how? She looked down at her bloody hand with a blurry look. What the hell is she doing at her age? It was as if the woman realized she was on the verge of death. She began to realize that now was not the best time to be a hero. She looked around with a blurry gaze and saw the vague silhouette of a man. His voice was heard as if from far away. He was screaming for her to finally wake up. Could she hear him? His face was concerned, terror glistening on it. It was clear from it that the situation was worse than ever. They have to go. Oh, for fuck's sake. The woman finally, finally came to her senses and looked around. She saw the new recruits bravely fighting the ghosts. They fought to the last man, even though the forces were not equal. In front of her stood the man with the head. She started to come to her senses and got to her feet. Losing her head, she said that they were in a really fucked up situation right now. Looks like she doesn't have time to lie on earth. She has to make a decision right away. The man yelled out that the rescue team would be here soon. They just need to hold out until a certain time. His face was furious. A battle was brewing. The ghost knight swung his long spear and pointed the full power straight at the man, who hesitated not to notice the attack. However, he still managed to react in time and swung his weighty mace, bringing the full force of his blow down on the armor. There was a clang of metal. The knight staggered. His armor was damaged, but he did not fall. Dust began to kick up from beneath his feet. The knight was still on his feet. His ghostly body took no damage. It hissed and began approaching directly towards the defenseless man again. The man stared and didn't notice the knight was still standing on his feet. Though he was struck, his ghostly body remained standing in the same pose. It didn't seem to have done him any harm. His ghostly face was still glowing with a bluish light. With his gaze, he looked forward. What the fuck? Why the fuck is he still standing? He had hit him as hard as he could. The man didn't understand. He couldn't even move this knight with his normal attacks. He was like a wall. Jupiter saw everything. She saw the mortal danger coming right towards the recruit. The woman wanted to warn him. She even opened her mouth to scream, but she didn't have time. The Phantom Knight was moving too fast to react. She wanted to warn her recruit but immediately saw a sharp bayonet pierce the man's chest. A stream of blood spurted from his mouth. He was still alive. His eyes rolled back and a scream came from his mouth. His eyes bloodshot, he shifted his gaze to the direction he was being attacked from. His chest was tearing with pain, but he was still on his feet. Behind him? He was sure he had finished off everyone in the vicinity. The man turned his head back and saw the ghost knight's upper half-body holding the spear that had pierced through him. That thing was still alive. The man stared and didn't notice the two men charging at him, swinging their sharp swords to finally finish him off. Naturally, he couldn't do anything. There was a wet crunch of tearing flesh. The knights hit their target precisely and began to pierce him with their spears. Jupiter stood a short distance away and naturally gritted her teeth watching her recruit flounder helplessly in his own blood. The woman went into a rage. She was going to deep fry those things. Her eye began to glow with the same blue energy. The bodies began to overflow with electrical power. She wanted to cast a spell, but something was wrong. Her hand wasn't obeying. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get the electric discharge to appear. Her arm was throbbing in a lot of pain, and she couldn't cast her spell. It looked like the blow had been quite strong, and now she had lost her power. The girl on the recruit was completely surrounded by the knights, who were already grabbing her arms, pulling her towards them. The woman shouted for everyone to retreat. She had already resigned herself to the fact that she was going to be finished. The knights were closing in, already pointing their spears at her. A final death rattle was heard. 
The woman found herself pierced by multiple spears. She died instantly, blood pouring from her mouth. In the middle of the battlefield stood a beaver who could not recover from such a shock. Goosebumps were running down his back, and he felt death approaching him inexorably. He squinted to get a better look, and from what he saw, his heart stopped for a second. As soon as he came to his senses, he immediately released the shield from his hands and ran in the opposite direction, shouting for help. The man went mad. One of the knights, however, was still alive. He swung his spear and the tip gleamed in the sun. He swung his spear straight at the fleeing victim. Though he was without his lower half, he was still alive. The spear flew a few dozen meters to its target and pierced the poor man as he ran. A pop was heard, and he immediately fell to the floor. The spear had penetrated through the vital organs. Jupiter looked on as the poor guy's lifeless body fell to the ground with a loud thud. The tiny line of defense consisting of only a few people was destroyed in an instant. Jupiter smelled the scent of the living armor in front of her for a second. She could feel that cold breath of death approaching her with inexorable speed. The woman knew that now her death hour was coming. The stench of rusted armor and blooming water. It literally sent chills down her spine. It was the smell of drowned men. The knights became enraged and immediately lunged at their prey. Their armor glowed with a blue glow and now they were ready to tear her in half. The woman gathered all her strength into a fist and electric shocks began to form in her hand. She was able to control herself. She gritted her teeth and said that those things would be better off staying at the bottom of the lake and continuing to rot there. The woman went into a rage. It was as if she had gained her last strength, her second breath. Why can't they just let the old granny earn some easy money begging sign? Her whole body was covered in electric shocks. The woman was like a beast. She released a powerful discharge of electricity, which reached its target in a split second. A crackling sound was heard. The electricity struck the armor, and the ghosts started squirming into fire, and... In a second, there was no trace of this hulk of knights left. Only on the floor lay the burnt armor, which still emanated the vile smell of rotting water. The woman breathed heavily and looked around. This blow was a weak point, even less than a quarter of what she could when she was in good condition. It was definitely not what she had expected. She saw through the fog, dozens of silhouettes of knights approaching her in the distance, glowing in the darkness. Parting with her life was something she really didn't want to do since she hadn't had time to get rich yet. Too bad. Suddenly she saw a little guy who was among her brigade. She shouted for him to get out quickly. The kid looked at her with a surprised look. The woman kept yelling. She said at least one of them must survive. Her face was overflowing with fury. She shouted that she would buy him some time, so let him run show. Drops of blood were streaming down her face and her body was overflowing with burning fury. The guy screamed that he couldn't do it. Staying this is the best option, she's a mage. Although the guy was scared, however, he didn't plan to back down. The woman stared at him with an uncomprehending look. What does he mean? The guy put his spear forward and said that this is the first rule of mercenary survival. Stay close to the mage. He looked ahead at the approaching horde of evil. The boy said he had a much better chance of survival if he stayed with it then running away without even having a horse. And Jupiter looked at the little guy in surprise. His strategy was effective, even though he was rather small. He thrust his spear forward to impale one of the approaching knights. The sound of metal was heard. The blade didn't stick in. The armor was too strong. He didn't kill the knights. He pushed them farther away, and it worked. The knights would fall to the ground and remain harmless for a short time. Looking at the woman with mad eyes, he said he would hold them off as long as possible by any means necessary. While she prepares for the next spell, Damien held tightly to his crossbow and fired it over and over again, hitting the target. He was providing support from within the castle walls. He was working like artillery. Thanks to his skill, he hit the exact target every time. The kid bravely fought a horde of knights, swinging his spear and pushing them away every time. But it was enough to stop all the enemies. 262 Jupiter charged her spell her hand once again glowing with a blue electric light. A crackling sound was heard. A couple more seconds and she would use her spell. By the time she was able to gather enough energy to create lightning, it worked. However, the boy who was protecting her was still pierced by the spears. He didn't have time to react and now he died instantly. Blood spurted from his mouth. His eyes rolled back and now his life was leaving his body. 
Jupiter screamed in rage, and gathering all her strength charged a powerful e-discharge of electricity directly into the crowd of these bastards. There was a tremendous explosion. The lightning was so strong that as soon as it touched the armor, it immediately sizzled them. There was a rumble that could be compared to an earthquake. The woman stood in front of the body of the dead boy, who, at the cost of his life, had allowed her to gain a few seconds. There was only one question on her mind. Would she have been able to save him if she had gathered enough energy a couple seconds earlier? The kid who was protecting her was still barely alive. He was breathing heavily, blood gushing out of his mouth. Tears came to his eyes. He realized he was no longer alive, but he was desperately trying to grasp at the last threads of life. She was too old to take death personally. She looked at the dying boy and spoke to him in an emotionless voice. The woman asked, What is the first rule of mercenary survival? The dying boy looked at her through his tears. The life had almost left his body, but somehow he was still holding on. He said through tears and wheezing that the first rule was not to take a job that paid a suspiciously large amount of money. His voice was already starting to get weaker every second. The woman had to listen to hear what he was saying. The boy wheezed, the life almost leaving him. His eyes began to roll back. Consciousness was leaving his head. He hated to die terribly. The woman looked at the crowd of approaching knights. She sighed heavily and said that everything was wrong. All of his rules for survival are wrong. He can't succeed as a mercenary if he follows them. She clenched her fist, which began to fill with electricity, crackling everywhere. He can't be rich if he wants glory. The woman roared like a wounded beast. She immediately rushed into the thick of things, thrusting her electricity-charged fist forward. Now her entire body was literally bursting with sparks. She flew into the thick of things and said that to be rich, you have to take the most dangerous jobs that pay a hell of a lot. The thick of it. She charged her fist with such force that it lashed out with a deafening arrow that pierced several hundred knights at once. She shouted for the one to stay as far away from the mages as possible. The boy frightened asked, why? The woman looked up at him, breathing heavily. She was holding on to her wounded arm, which was still vibrating from the overflowing energy. She replied that it was only because the mages would take full responsibility. If he wanted to survive, he should never have become a mercenary. She pulled a long cigar out of her pocket as usual and stuffed it in her mouth. She breathed heavily and tried to come to her senses. The woman had expended too much energy. So much that she didn't even have the energy to light a cigarette. That's a shame. She stood motionless and watched another pile of those living armors bearing down on her. She thought life would be easier once she got her high paycheck. Funny thing is, everything she knew seemed wrong. She was wrong in her conclusions. Turns out this is how her life would end. Here on the battlefield, she's bayoneted by hundreds of knights. The woman grinned and boldly looked into the eyes of impending death. She still held the cigarette in her mouth, the tart taste of it spreading across her mouth. Suddenly, she heard Lucas's voice behind her, and also the clatter of his horse's hooves. He yelled for the woman not to move. The man was already flying straight towards her, thrusting his glowing sword straight ahead. He jumped incredibly high and rushed into the thick of the battle. The man threw the knights around like tin cans. Jupiter. Was surprised, she opened her eyes and watched the man massacre the undead one by one. She certainly didn't expect anyone to come to her aid now. Lucas looked at her with serious blue eyes. The man had arrived just in time and was now raring to fight. Into the haze, he wasn't going to stop. It was just beginning. The knights lifted their heads up. They saw a whole rain of fireballs flying at them. These cannonballs would destroy them in one blow. The knights who had piled up were now unable to move out of the line of attack. They only had to humbly await their deaths. The cannonball hit exactly in the armor. They caught fire like a torch. The knight's soul was scorched to the ground. They scattered one by one. An entire rain of fire rained down on them, sizzling them one by one. Everything was incredibly convenient. This was the foundation of the fundamentals of defensive play. One had to lure the opponent into an awkward position, and then strike. The knights were flying in different directions, and there was an incredible noise all around. The ghosts vaporized under the onslaught of the rain of fire. They were literally burned out. Their army was powerless in the face of the threat, no matter how many of them there were. The rain of fire sizzled their countless army by the hundreds, even thousands. This was a true death zone. 
Being in this position, the knights were practically useless. No matter how many there were, they wouldn't be able to break through any further as they would immediately meet the reign of fire. It was necessary to control this crowd to manipulate them into the most uncomfortable position. The player shouted for no one to stop and kept firing. It was now necessary to increase the tempo of fire to burn these bastards to the ground. This was the only way they would be able to gain victory. Demian stood beside him and watched the scene. Even their observation deck was reached by the sparks that were spreading all over the place. It was incredibly hot, as if someone had lit a huge bonfire. The boy looked down in surprise and noticed that the monsters were not even able to overcome this point. They were stuck in place and were now just dying under the hail. He asked in a stammering voice, If this continues and continues, won't it be enough? Everything around them continued to rumble, shells raining down from the sky like rain, sizzling the undead army. Ash looked down carefully. No, it's not over yet. The knights are getting closer. There are more of them. We can't slow down if they want to win. We have to destroy them completely. However, something has changed. The empty faces of the knights once again glowed with a bluish glow, and they began to put their shields forward to defend themselves from the impending threat. After a while, they had built a kind of shell that even burning shells could not penetrate. Now they increased their defenses and kept moving forward as well. Now this rain of fire was nothing to them. They moved forward like a living tank. Putting their shields forward, they ignored absolutely all the shots. The guy looked at them with a fierce look. No, they wouldn't end up like that. They're just tough bastards. He realized that this battle was in danger of dragging on, and they should build up the tempo. His face was smiling despite the fact that the situation was escalating by the second. Everything possible had to be done to finally end this. He shouted for Lily to activate it. This might be their last hope. The girl screamed that she would activate the gravity field artifact right now. She gathered all her power and began to transfer it into the stone. The alchemists sitting next to her began to apply the spell. Soon a dark purple sphere formed near them. The surroundings began to breathe heavily. Gravity changed slightly. The artifact is activating. Countless numbers of approaching monsters were reflected in this sphere. Something changed now. The knight spared a move and was already moving with difficulty. The gravity artifact was in full effect now, the knight's movement was hindered. As soon as this happened, the player ordered the bow to judge. Now it all just depended on how long they could hold out. They needed a lightning strike to finally finish them off. Lucas heard his master's orders and ordered his underlings to get ready immediately. It was their finest hour. They had to finish these things off. Several soldiers took a huge crossbow outside and began loading it with arrows. There were several of these crossbows out there. All the weapons were aimed specifically at the horde of these monsters. Now in a few seconds they would fire a volley, and this would be the decisive battle. Lucas raised up his shining sword which gleamed its blade in the sun. He ordered them to aim for their soul cores. A few more seconds and he would give the order. The man waved his sword ordering the military to open fire with all guns. The man's voice sounded like thunder, drowning out even the rumble of battle. The soldiers fired. An entire arrow flew straight into the horde of monsters. They aimed perfectly, and each arrow reached its target, piercing the core of each knight. Even though the armor was quite strong, the huge hard arrows easily pierced through it. The knights began to fall one by one once a knight's chest was pierced through. They became completely helpless. The arrow hit exactly the target, piercing through their core, thus taking away their lives. After that, the knight would become just a helpless puppet. The player was watching from the sidelines. We need to increase the damage done by crossfire. Let them finish them off with artifact and ballistae. That way they can win. All right, everything's going according to plan. However, a soldier appeared from somewhere and shouted in a worried and frightened voice that the monsters had started to go around the walls. It was a real shock. But after that, somehow magically reassembled again, Many living armor thrown to the ground and it shattered, however. Those that managed to rise again after falling. The boy looked at all this with clenched teeth. What an annoying will to live. Why don't these things die yet? It's simply unbearable. Keeps on climbing despite all this garbage falling on them. Indeed, the armor continued to directly follow its invisible order. The guy ordered the others to knock the armor down with their spears to at least buy some time. It came to him that now it was time to reorganize his team. Guy opened a system window and started typing something. 
Jupiter would be the main link in this team. We needed to reorganize the team so that their power would increase. Territory defenders, commander, and the team doesn't lose morale. Double magician. Two mages. The attack power of the elements increases by 20%. The guy's eyes even widened at that, no way. 20%? That's just great. The rest of the soldiers continued to fight furiously. One of them had his spear broken. The knight broke the weapon in one powerful move. And now the poor man was left without defense. The enemies are already here. The hideous hand of one emanating in armor appeared on the edge of the roof. It dug its fingers right into the concrete breaking through it. Several knights had already climbed over the fence and were now heading straight for the others. They clattered their armor and were ready to tear everyone in their path. However, there was an army standing in their way, fully prepared for hand-to-hand -hand combat. The men put their weapons forward, closing their bills. They were fully prepared to fight. The knight opened its maw. Tongues of blue flame began to burst out of it. The sight was truly terrifying. In addition, it started to rain. The boy looked at all this with clenched teeth. From now on, the fight would no longer be one-sided. They would have to fight face to face. Firing at the undead would no longer work. The only question is, will these soldiers be able to handle it? Several knights stood readying their weapons, fully prepared for battle. A bright beam of light pierced the space and shattered the armor of one of the monsters. The light literally came out of nowhere. The flash was so bright that it illuminated the entire space around it. It was as if the entire fortress began to glow. Undoubtedly, it was Lucas, who, like a furious beast, burst into the thick of things, and he swung his huge, weighty sword, cutting down the monsters one by one. The man stood firmly on his feet. Nothing in the world could move him. It was as if he was now in berserk mode, ready to destroy anyone who stood in his way. The man shouted that he would destroy the monsters. He had a look of rage on his face. The task of the others is to stand still and hold them back. The man addressed his subjects, handing out orders to them. The knights stammered as they accepted the order and rushed to carry it out, and not tightly clutching their weapons in their hands, though there was fear in their hearts. But they had no choice. Ash smiled. Yes, that's it. It wasn't about whether they could do it or not. They had to do it. The boy himself had no doubt that they would do his bidding. The soldiers stood in a line and readied their weapons. They let out a battle cry to boost their morale. To survive, everyone must be stronger. They have no choice but to fall, get up again, fight and win. 102 Ash turned to Lily and ordered her to prepare a haste artifact. Haste is an effect that increases a character's movement speed. The girl nodded and immediately prepared to carry out the order. With the help of magical energy, she activated the artifact, which immediately glowed with a bright green light. Activating the artifact at speed, Magical energy immediately flowed through the knights' bodies. They felt a sudden surge of strength, and the movement speed of all comrades was increased by 5%. Duration, 5 minutes. Also, they had skills equipped. Main order, attack totem, and defense. All of these will help them win. They will be able to fight in melee without any problems. They immediately rushed forward and started throwing the monsters down. Their strength allowed them to act without any respite. As they threw down the monsters, the knights immediately fell down. The commander looked at them from afar. It was going to take a good effort. If they wanted to win, they had to do their best. He hoped that at least now, he would succeed. The sky slowly began to be covered with leaden clouds. It became much darker. The atmosphere was oppressive, but it did not affect the quality of the battle. The knights fought. They pushed the foul and immediately began to become a human shield. Swinging their weighty clubs, they fought fiercely. Lucas was at the end of his rope, but he did not give up swinging his weighty sword. One more swing, and one walker's armor shattered into pieces. He fought clearly, as if he saw nothing but the target in front of him. Ash watched from the sidelines, and he was filled with excitement. Right now, everything depended solely on the efforts of his team. Lucas's first skill was the iron will kick. The man stood in front of the entire knights, but he didn't flinch. The more enemies he killed, the stronger he became. Lucas had single-handedly dealt with all the enemies. It wasn't any difficulty for him. However, however, it wasn't enough. The guy stood and watched his team fight fiercely, but it still wasn't enough. With renewed vigor, the monsters attacked them. Now they were losing. Even though he had used almost everything he had, but it still wasn't enough. One of the sword max and the warrior went down. The poor guy sputtered his blood and immediately fell to his feet. 
The second soldier shouted that they had many wounded. We must get them on their feet at once. He held his comrade's hands, trying to lift him up. Unlike the living armor, whose numbers only multiplied, the number of wounded on the hero's side only grew. It seemed that hope was lost. Demian shouted that he would return to the front line. However, the guy stopped him with his hand and... That man should save his strength for the boss battle, just like Jupiter. What to do? The guy squinted his eyes and frantically searched for options. They were getting fewer and fewer. Every soldier counted, but the enemies were not getting fewer. There must be a way to reduce the number of casualties. One of the knights was stubbornly defending himself with his shield. However, he was very strong. We had to get rid of the remaining enemies. After a second, a powerful explosion sounded and a bright column of flame rose into the sky, scattering everyone around in different directions. The guy opened his eyes wide in surprise. He hadn't expected this, but who was it? He had some guesses, but are they already what he was thinking? The flames consumed all living things in its path time after time. It was pure primal fire, destroying everyone. When he looked closer, he saw that Lily was standing there. She was in her wheelchair, flames bursting out of her hands, consuming the enemies one by one. At this moment, the girl was not like herself. There was no trace of the modest and shy girl. Now before the eyes of those present was a warrior, destroying her enemies. Ash, it's like coming to my senses. This is it. She can use magic. The boy shouted. There was hope. The girl turned a surprised and scared look on him. Is he seriously saying that now? She had always been a mage after all. What kind of nonsense is this? Yes, yes, this is awesome. Later on, he will definitely promote her. However, after a while, the girl was almost completely exhausted. She had used too much of her mana, and now there was almost no strength left. Breathing heavily, she begged to be dismissed. The guy grabbed her wheelchair and dragged her forward. He said he would also pay her a hefty bonus. Come on, he smiled. Finally, a way out had been found. However, the girl did not share his enthusiasm. She was saying that she wanted to retire. Her mana had run out. However, her commander was unabashedly, well, one more time. He ran forward and carried the girl who screamed frightenedly, but still from his last strength let out a stream of fire forward. In addition, the power of magic has been increased by 25%. That's an amazing result. The primordial fire was scorching everything. The knights fell one by one. It was a true flamethrower. He ran through his fortress and wreathed himself forward. She in turn released pillars of flame. That's it. She can do it one more time, the girl said pitifully. Let him at least address her as a human being. The rest of the knights fought furiously, repelling the attacks one by one. So the soldiers held back the enemies with their bodies. Lucas was tearing apart the undead with his sword. That's just beautiful. And Lily was burning them to hell with her fire. He opened the girl's mouth and began pouring mana into her to restore her strength somehow. The girl resisted, but it was all to no avail. Suddenly, the soul from the armor began to fly out, turning into a small blue cloud. After that, the armor fell to the floor with a clatter, no longer posing any danger. The rest of the army also stopped. Was this really the end? They were breathing heavily. They couldn't believe that they had finally stopped those things. A second later, they exploded with a furious scream. They had stopped them. They had done it. The people rejoiced, for the battle was over. However, the commander came up to them and said, No, this is not the end. The people were quiet. What? Is it not over yet? Lucas looked at him with a tired look. He had fought to his limits, and now the man needed rest. Ash looked at them with a serious look and ordered them not to let their guard down. There was still one more, the most important enemy left. The armor that had fallen to the ground began to slowly rise. Something was holding them and pulling them up towards the heavens. There was already that ghost, the knight there. He was pulling all the armor down to him as if he were putting on armor. Now he would enter the battle, and who knows if our heroes could defeat him. After a few seconds, his ghostly body was fully clad in armor now. He took on a truly intimidating appearance. The monster had arms and legs. He took on a relatively human appearance. Then a sword materialized in his hand, which also consisted of armor fragments. Two lights flickered in the openings of his helmet, and they were eyes. They looked really terrible. There was no soul there. Just a dark, ghostly light. Now he looked like a real nightmare. He was glowing with fire. His body was completely covered with impenetrable armor, and he held a huge sharp sword in his hands. The knight swung his sword, and in one fell swoop he landed a few meters away from the fortress. His blow was so strong that it seemed the earth was about to split. 
Everything shook. People could hardly stand on their feet. They began to run in different directions, trying to save their lives. Damn, this is real. The guy screamed at the top of his lungs. Does this make any sense at all? There's no way that's the boss of the first location. His strength is simply incommensurable. How are they going to defeat him? The knight stood before him in full battle readiness. From beneath his armor came something that sounded like a scream. The scream of a thousand souls. His armor rattled. Flames began to shoot out from underneath. The monster leaned over and looked at his main enemy. He was truly terrifying. Its size was simply enormous. It felt like there was an entire mountain in front of the fortress. Ash shuddered in fear. He was truly scared for his life. Such a monster he had never seen before. Besides, to fight them face to face is pure suicide. However, the guy quickly came to his senses and clenched his hand into a fist. He had no right to make a mistake. It was impossible to step in. The monster must be defeated. He shouted to himself not to dare to be afraid. He is the commander after all. What does it look like? A commander running away from the battlefield? No, he wasn't going to run away. It's only the boss of the first location. He's only level 25. The guy flicked his hand and ordered a strike. The cannons began to roar, expounding flames. The projectiles flew precisely at the target, but they did not do any damage to me. He ordered me to save shells, too. Now it was necessary to concentrate all my power on this thing. The knight stood right in front of him. He was completely engulfed in flames. The cannons rumbled. The cannonballs flew straight at the target, but all to no avail. They hit the target, but immediately burst. The knight took no visible damage. He waited patiently. It was a kind of entertainment for him. All all those shots could do was only move the knight back a little. But that was all the guns they had available. He stood like some unbreakable mountain that could not be moved. The boy shouted for no one to stop firing. It was necessary to lead the onslaught. If they recovered, the knight would reach the wall of the fort, and then it would definitely be the end. The monster stood in front of them holding his colossal sword. It was preparing to strike. Just one strike of this huge ball would be able to destroy everything around it. Despite the flames that the knight was engulfed in, he took a step forward. That bastard has a lot of stubbornness. Ash turned to Lily. The girl looked at him in horror, expecting another crazy plan. The drops from the previous potion had not yet dried on her lips, and she could hardly recover. The guy, however, ordered her to activate the third artifact. With a stammering voice, she obeyed. When she touched the artifact, it lit up blue and began to emit magical energy that absorbed everything around it. Multiplier. This is a rank R artifact capable of increasing the effect of a character's magic spells by 100%. This is for Jupiter. The woman felt an incredible burst of energy. Her whole body was overflowing with magic now. All her wounds had healed. She was as good as new. The effect of Jupiter's spells had been increased. The women sighed heavily. Well, wonderful. She felt everything in her body being infused with energy. It was all in her hands now. She was so full of energy that the woman forgot she was even a decade old. Just like in her golden years. A smile stretched across her face. She prepared herself to burn everything around her. The guy pointed straight at the huge knight and ordered her to punch like it was the last time, right into the breastplate. The huge face of the knight was already approaching the castle gate. He was much taller than the tallest tower, and even the explosions couldn't stop him. Jupiter quickly not steps began to approach the edge of the tower. In her hands suddenly glowed electric discharges. The woman was on full alert. I've never felt so good before. Even the sky parted, and a huge lightning bolt appeared there. One more second and a huge explosion would descend from the sky. The woman shouted that no one would compensate them if they were damaged by the lightning. A second later, the heavens opened up, and a tremendous electric discharge fell to the ground. She concentrated all of her power and aimed this strongest strike straight at the night. The woman was at her limit. However, it was only a joy for her. She felt more alive than ever. The night began to melt. Even his armor couldn't withstand such an onslaught. He could feel himself slowly falling apart. After a second, his armor cracked, and a blue orb that glowed brightly appeared outside. It was the soul core, and if hit exactly there, this thing would die. The core was glowing, and it was like there was an entire galaxy. Ash yelled for Damien to start firing immediately. This was the last opportunity. 
There might not be another one like this. The boy was already on full alert. He stood behind the huge crossbow that had already managed to load a long arrow. Shoot. The command rang out like a thunderbolt of lightning. The boy strained all his vision. This was the best shot of his life. He had to be well prepared. There could be no mistake. His hand yanked the trigger. There was a crunch and now the gun went into action. From such exertion it creaked, but still it released a huge arrow, which with monstrous speed began to move towards its target. A split second later, after traveling a great distance, the arrow stabbed straight into the core. A crunch was heard. The air around it became heavy as if imbued with magical energy. Under such an onslaught, the core began to splinter. There were many cracks. The life force began to fade. The night swayed every now and then. The arrow stuck exactly on the target. The core slowly began to collapse. If this shot works, this thing should be dead now. The player was incredibly happy he praised Shooter for a great shot. This guy always had the best shot. He never doubted that the shooter would hit. The huge knight started to stagger. He lost his balance and was already starting to fall on his back. Just seconds more, and he would die. That's it. One, still at great sacrifice, but they won. However, at the last moment, the guy noticed that something was wrong. Through the armor of the knight showed light on the place where his eyes should have been a torch lit up. The boy was horrified. He didn't want to believe it wasn't enough. They'd used everything they had. Goosebumps ran down the boy's back and he bulged his eyes. The knight began to move, his armor creaking, the sword in his hand rising for another crushing blow. Even that wasn't enough for him. The monster took on a truly terrifying appearance. Fire was spreading everywhere. He swung his huge arm to shatter this entire fortress in one blow. The sight was truly monstrous, the fellow screamed in this cry mingled horror and despair. By sheathing his sword, he would bring down the walls. He shouted, ordering Jupiter to attack immediately. One more strike. The woman was already fully prepared. She was building up her magical energy. Raising her weapon so high, it would be very imprudent. The knight raised the dream sword higher, thus doing the woman a favor. His blade began to become covered in electricity, attracting more and more lightning discharges to it. A grimace of rage reflected on her face. He's just asking her to strike him with lightning. What an idiot. Now she'll have a much easier time hitting that hulk. The monster has swung around, and in a couple more seconds it will unleash all its monstrous power right on the fortress. However, before he could even make a single swing, lightning began to rain down from the sky. The flaming knight had already suffered tremendous damage. In a split second, the full power of the lightning strike fell on him, and there was an explosion that shook the walls of the fortress. This strike contained all of Jupiter's power. The woman even growled. It had been a long time since the old hag had been so angry. They galloped faster and faster while the huge monster was already towering over the fortress. Wrath came out, she was covered in blood, but it didn't seem to bother her at all. Her eyes glistened with electric shocks. The battle continued. Explosions could be heard everywhere. Thanks to the skill of unshortened Commander Killbox was restored in time. Now, everything was back to normal. Looked out of cover and saw Lucas already returning home and Jupiter was sitting behind, seemingly unharmed and partially unharmed. However, not all was so rosy. In the heat of battle, he lost four irreplaceable heroes. He was too confident of his combat competence and overestimated himself. In the game, he had to manage a lot of soldiers. There were similar states such as fear and distractedness. But here, the feeling of the soldiers is more diverse and complex. Something had to be done about it. The horse was screaming. It was scared to death, but still kept running forward. There was no way he expected the horses to be so scared. Something had to be done about it. The guy squinted. He needed to consider more variables since this was reality. The flames that spread from behind the artillery cannons were a danger, too. This was one of the results of his lack of caution. Now he had a lot more problems. The flames were rapidly devouring the barrier, and God forbid it should spread any further. Killbox is falling apart. That's a problem. At this rate, they won't be able to hold their defenses much longer. The army was coming closer and closer. The fire was covering everything around them. At this rate, the road would be clear for them, and they would be able to reach their camp unhindered. This was already a big problem. The boy gritted his teeth in anger. His whole plan was falling apart in front of his eyes. He couldn't let this happen. It looked like they would have to fight along the fortress wall after all. He wanted to end it all with a single artillery barrage. 
However, not everything goes according to plan. Fortunately, there weren't many monsters left. All that was left was the final push. The Phantom Knight was only one left. And the number of living armor is only, it's not all that bad. Their goal is definitely doable. Still under his control, even though they have a boss. Just need to build up their strength to finally deal with all these points. Lucas's voice was heard. He was standing upstairs with Jupiter standing next to him. She looked shabby, but she put it down. Lucas reluctantly added the title of this woman's name. Apparently something had happened between them. The man looked troubled by something and even upset. He didn't approve of her because of the reason for his dismissal. But his action was the right thing to do. It was necessary to show respect after all. The player looked at the mercenary and said that he was actually glad she was alive. The woman took a drag on her cigarette and said she was ashamed. The old hag made a lot of mistakes. Died in vain. There was blood running down her arm and dripping on the ground. What a shame. She could not forgive herself for such a lapse. She was ashamed of herself now. The player looked at her and said that she didn't really know that a monster would suddenly appear in the sky. Such moments sometimes happen. Also, she didn't know that the horses would go crazy. It's not her fault. It's not worth killing yourself over. But she was still standing there, staring guiltily in front of her. She was ashamed of her transgression, and she had to make amends, for their lives depended on this battle. The woman clenched her fist. She was angry with herself. Therefore, she would repay the favor. She had a serious look in her eyes. It appeared that she would not back down from her seat now. However, the man told her to focus on her recovery at this point. Her strength would still come in handy. Jupiter didn't give up and said that she would be the one to take that monster's head off. At this moment, the army of walking armor was already approaching the castle gates. Their rumbling could be heard clearly. A battery of guns were firing and the rumbling sound spread throughout the entire county. Ash shouted that the kill box was no longer fulfilling its function and we should cease fire. Everyone agreed. The cannon stopped firing, but smoke was still coming from the red-hot guns. The soldiers looked at the battlefield with frightened looks. They couldn't believe it and couldn't understand what they should do next. Then the player turned to the gunner and ordered him to rest. The boy wanted to object and say that the army was approaching, but the man stopped him. He approached the boy and said that there would be a bigger fish for him. There is one job that only he can handle. The boy looked at him and told him to rest for a while. Let him regain his strength. Damien looked at him and stammered in agreement. The guy hit his crossbow. The enemies had reached the walls of the fortress. The situation was getting more complicated. A huge army began to break the door. They pounded, trying to break the walls, but everything was in vain. So far, the castle walls had withstood the onslaught. Realizing that the walls of the front could not be broken down, they chose another tactic. With their sharp fingers, they began to dig into the wall and try to climb up. One of the knights began to climb the wall, followed by several others. They were climbing up the wall like some kind of spiders. I don't know what they were holding on to. Ash yelled for everyone to get ready for a melee. Now they're going to have a direct confrontation. The guy didn't want to admit it, but still the irreversible was about to happen. The soldiers came to alert and grasped their weapons tightly. Aye, sir, ready for close combat, close combat team forward. The boy commanded, and the knights prepared to defend the fortress. They stood as human shields prepared their weapons, each with a huge vam in his hand. The knights were dressed in shining armor battle without magic is based solely on physical strength and endurance. Ash realized that he simply had no other choice. A multitude of emotions were reflected on his face. Anger, rage, and rage. This will be a head-on attack. A multitude of knights lined up in a column and prepared their weapons and moved forward. The ground trembled beneath their feet. Now they had no chance to retreat. They would face this foul thing head on. The walking armor climbed up the sheer wall as if they were some kind of spiders. It was about to come dangerously close. Now this was the beginning of the real war. The boy looked down and saw a lot of knights climbing up the steep cliff. Now they would have no other choice but to face them. The soldiers went into readiness mode. They watched with fear as the monsters approached them, however. Every one of them was ready to give their lives for the Empire. Rocks were falling from under the knight's fingers, but they stubbornly climbed forward as if there were no obstacles. Ash raised his hand up. There was still a little time left. Just a little more time and it would be time to attack. The guy was waiting for the right moment. 
He saw the glowing knights coming closer and closer. Their fire was already felt at an extremely close distance. The same foul odor of rot emanated from them. Waiting for the right moment, the boy shouted, ordering his military to begin. Throw those things down. Several soldiers were holding a large barrel of rocks, they shouted, and pushing began to lift the barrel, going to roll the rocks right over the monsters. A second later, a rain of stones poured down through the armor. It was working. The heavy stones threw them down. The monsters flew straight down to the hard ground, where they crumbled into spare parts with a rumble. These are pieces of rocks, steel and other debris left over from the army's fortification. It's working. For a few seconds, they had hope. The armor was fed down. One by one, it fell apart. There was a deafening explosion, and a huge bolt of lightning immediately aimed at the knight, immediately hitting the target, and the knight's body began to crack at the seams. This kind of tension. The thick armor shell began to evaporate before his eyes. There was a loud roar that came straight from the depths of the armor. However, it was already an irreversible process. The knight was vaporizing before his eyes. He raised his hand with his weighty sword one last time to deliver the final blow. The blade began to slice through the air with a deafening whoosh. A couple more seconds, and the huge weighty sword would come right down on the fortress. Ash came in terror. He shouted for everyone to run away immediately. The guy realized that in a few seconds, if everyone didn't get out of the line of attack, a huge number of casualties just couldn't be avoided. He watched in horror as the huge sword descended at an incredible speed. The soldiers dropped their weapons and began to scatter in different directions. They too saw the huge weapon heading straight for them. The shadow of the sword began to obscure the sun. The guy shouted for them to run away immediately. The soldiers froze in place. Lucas, without wasting a second, immediately rushed towards his master and covered him with his body. The man shouted for the ruler to run away himself. The knight's main task was to protect his lord. After a few seconds, there was a deafening rumble. The sword had reached its target after all. It crashed into the concrete wall with great speed and began to crumble it like a toy. The ground shook under the feet of the soldiers. Cracks crept everywhere. People struggled to stay on their feet. The impact was so strong that it was impossible to stay on their feet. People began to fly in different directions like toy soldiers. The blast wave threw them a great distance away. Frightened screams were heard everywhere, but it was impossible to do anything. After a few minutes, the smoke from the impact began to dissipate, and a horrible picture of destruction appeared before my eyes. Everywhere was the odor of burning powder and iron. Lucas immediately ran up to his master and began to examine him for injuries. The boy sighed and said he'd been hit hard on the back. Otherwise, he's fine. The man was sitting up, trying to regain consciousness. He said, What happened to the wall? Damien and the others were surveying the destruction. There was a distinct look of worry on their faces. They hadn't expected this latest outburst. They were still wary because the night might strike again. The player rose to his feet and began to look around. He saw a huge wreck of a ball that was stuck right in the fortress. The destruction was colossal, yet the fortress had somehow miraculously survived. Stuck right in the wall, and now the boy stood looking at this horrifying sight. The air around him began to vibrate. Something changed. The knight bent over and lowered his head. His eye began to glow with a bluish light again, as if he was preparing for his next attack. But for now, he stood unmoving. A few seconds later, there was a pop. More like an explosion, and now, the knight's heavy armor began to crumble like a toy. His blue soul flew out of the wreckage and flew straight upwards. The knight was defeated. They had finally killed the boss of this location. There was no limit to their joy. The fortress was badly damaged. Its walls cracked from such a powerful blow. And somewhere up there was the huge sword that the knight was holding in his hands. There was a rumble and the armor began to fall to the ground. His ghost soul hissed out of its iron confinement and rushed straight up. Lucas, along with his master, stood above and watched the last remains of the knight dissolve into thin air. Lucas ran up to the boy and shouted that it was dangerous here. However, the player waved him off and said it was fine. Nothing to worry about. He recognized the pattern. This is exactly what the outburst of anger that the boss emits in his death throws looks like. He had a premonition of his unnamed death and was trying his last strength to survive. 
The cloud of his energy began to transform, ghost face peering into it. Distorted fire, her. A demonstration of fear, confusion, and madness. The cloud of many ghostly faces approached the boy, but he stood unmoved. He realized that this attack was not damaging, but could drive an unprepared person insane. The boy stood there, unmoving. His gaze was cold and focused. It was as if none of this was affecting him. He just stood there and watched, like a knight of Korchev's death throes, and... This is where human territory begins. His voice sounded calm, as if he was talking to his comrade. Putting his hand forward, the guy began to concentrate his energy in it. He ordered the monster to get out of here. His hand glowed with a bright yellow light emitting magical energy. This was the skill indomitable commander. A second later, the sky lit up with a bright flash, and the cloud of monstrous faces began to dissipate. The flash completely vaporized the knight's soul. The air was filled with vibrations. The knight was finally and irrevocably dying. In a second, his body was about to dissolve into thin air under the pressure of the magic sphere. Lucas and the player stood there, looking on in horror. The man put his sword forward and already prepared to repel the attack. It was clear that they would not get out of here so easily. The monster was truly terrifying, and the protagonist even had goosebumps on his back. Sewer controllers? Why does that rat have a human name? What the hell was that? The guy squinted his eyes and took a closer look at the monster. It was clear that this was some kind of experiment. You couldn't just have this thing existing here. I'll kill you all. The monster roared and lunged straight at the newcomers. It put its clawed paw forward and opened its huge mouth. It was obvious that this monster was not going to let them go so easily. Its eyes were burning with a kind of inhuman fire. It was going to fight him now. And his life depended on the outcome of the battle. The boy opened his eyes in horror. No, must do something. He realized that something irreversible was about to happen. Suddenly, against all expectations, Lily stepped up. She thrust her arms forward and let out a jet of fire that rushed straight at the monster. A rat. The girl almost cried out in fear but still attacked the monster. The fire began to spread rapidly. As soon as it reached the rats, they began to squeak shrilly. Hot. However, the flames were inexorable. It devoured the rats' bodies one by one. The girl, as if she had lost her mind, she screamed for that thing to stay away. It was as if she was possessed. She was spewing flames from her hands like some kind of volcano. The girl seemed to be very frightened, and that was what acted as leverage for her. Everyone else just stared at her in surprise. No one expected the girl to be so persistent. It seemed that the boss had been defeated. The big rat flopped to the ground with a loud sound, and steam began to emanate from it. After all, its eyes were still glowing indicating that the rat was still alive. However, it must have taken a lot of damage. The monster raised its head and looked at the girl with its red eyes. You damned rat hissed at the monster. It clenched its teeth and prepared to attack its future victim with them. However, Jupiter was fully prepared. The woman raised her hand up and lightning immediately began to form on her fingers. This is where his stop was. Sweet dreams. The woman smirked and prepared to unleash the full power of her spells on the monster. There was a crackling sound, and a small but very powerful lightning bolt flew towards the monster. It pierced the monster's head like a needle, which had already managed to rise to its feet. A second later, an explosion was heard. The air smelled of burnt meat, and the rat was covered with electric shocks from head to toe. The monster began to scream, Razinu in its huge maw. A flash of light washed over the entire room, and the monster's entire body was covered in bright light. The monster wanted to say one last thing, but he didn't have time. His body was completely covered in lightning, and his heart immediately stopped. From such a discharge, even such a monster. It died in an instant. Before he could say the last sentence, the monster slumped to the ground. Smoke emanated from its body. Its face was frozen in a death grimace. It was quick. The guy was standing right in front of him, and the whole thing was trembling with fear. He hadn't expected such a rapidity of events. Thanks to the joint work of the two mages, it was not difficult to deal with the boss. This monster's resistance to magic is practically zero, which makes it vulnerable to various kinds of spells. If they had only relied on physical damage, there would have been some difficulties, however. It ended up just fine. The monster was dead, 
and its red eyes were extinguished by the film. Lily immediately grabbed onto the guy's arm and started to ask, Are they going home yet? He turned to her and nodded his head in the affirmative. Yes, they were almost over. Was she scared? The girl almost cried. Of course there is scary. The room is filled with dead rats. How can she not be scared? She seemed really scared, but in principle she was understandable. Indeed, the Vidoc here was so-so. The room was completely filled with rats that gave off a horrible stench. In the middle of all this splendor lay the boss, whose body was still smoking, emitting an even more horrible odor. All the friends were standing in front of a large chest. Apparently there was a reward. A sign flashed above the chest. It was the reward for clearing the boss room. The chest was small in size, but it looked like it would be a good bounty. The guy looked at Lucas and ordered him to hold Jupiter so she wouldn't lunge at the treasure chest again. All for they had already perfectly realized that this granny was very fond of money, even more than herself. The guy bent over the chest and began to study it. At the same time, the knight held the granny who tried to escape from his clinging hands. The woman was like mad, respect your elders. She shouted it like some kind of chicken. However, the man held on tight. Ash, after digging around in the chest for a while, he found something valuable. He pulled out a sword from there. It wasn't a simple sword. It looked like some kind of saw or the nose of a swordfish. Wow. The guy looked at that sword like some kind of deity. There was an incredible amount of magical energy emanating from it, and the sword itself looked awesome. Next to it, a sign popped up with information. It was a rat cutter, type, long sword, attack 20, strength 20. When attacking a type monster, the rat does 25% more damage. Kill the rats, both of them. Yes, this item comes in handy. The guy didn't hesitate to throw the ball to Lucas. The knight gratefully accepted the gift and grabbed it with both hands. The man was incredibly pleased. His cheeks immediately lit up with happiness. Yes, this weapon was not good enough to replace his normal sword, however. Let the man keep it with him. He would still need it. Lucas nodded his head and hid the sword behind his belt. The boy bent over the chest, looking for anything else useful. Maybe there's something else in there, and there was. There was something else at the bottom. There was a small scroll. It consisted of white soft parchment. It was a summoning scroll. Automatic defense turret. It's a guaranteed first area drop item. He'll lie if he says he didn't come here for it. That was just great, wasn't it? All the rewards have been collected. There's no point in staying in this hole any longer. Well, it's time to head back. Guys, it's time to head back to town. Looks like Lily was the most excited. She was depressed about this place. And now they're finally getting the hell out of here. Yes, location complete. The first area of the sewers. All three rooms have been cleared. The raid was a success. After going down the hallway to the boss room, the sewers ended, though. They didn't have to walk very long. And soon they should have made it to the surface. As soon as they climbed out, the guy opened his eyes in surprise. A very interesting picture appeared before him, which he had never seen before. Here begins the inner part of the Lake Kingdom. Part 2. The Hidden Alley. They found themselves in a strange place. A lot of shabby wooden houses, apparently uninhabited. They stared at them with their black eyes. The guys stopped somewhere in the middle and started lighting the way forward with torches. Everything is so advanced. On the face of it. These were the streets of a real prosperous city. However, it seemed as if no one had lived here for a long time. Since even a blind alleyway looked like this, what should the rest of the city look like? The guy stopped and started looking around. This was a city that had become the epitome of magical society, a true reflection of the frozen deep realm. But in that there was no light at all in this city, nor was there a single living soul. The city was a veritable ghost, the empty streets were gloomy and frightening. There was a haze of mist everywhere, more like a fog. The atmosphere here was even more oppressive than in the sewers. The city was forever in darkness. It was silent and dead. This place didn't bode well. Only one lone lantern in the middle of the street stood illuminating a small stretch of road. There was darkness everywhere, oppressive and unseen, which had been consuming this city for years. Here was another checkpoint, the second area. Hidden alley unlocked. Another teleport opened up in front of the boy. This seemed to be the last area. But suddenly, a sign popped up in front of them, indicating that they couldn't go beyond this area for now. The player stood in front of the teleporter for some more time and didn't understand anything. 
What the hell was this? How come they couldn't get out? In any case, he wasn't going to go any further today. Otherwise, we'd be left with nothing but horns and legs. They've done a good job. I think that's it for today. The boys stood in the middle of the dark alley. The atmosphere was heightened by the fact that they could hear some strange sounds. Even though the city was silent and dead. Well, time to go home. The guy approached the teleport information sign and clicked instead of teleporting to the backyard of his kingdom. The research was complete. Their reward was sent back. Character level increase. Ash level 9. Lucas level Demian level 2. But something did catch their attention. Under a lonely street lamp, there was a strange figure standing there. She was dressed in some kind of rags. From afar, she looked like some kind of medieval jester. On her head, she wore a cap. Strange. The stranger in his hands held something that from afar looked like a windpipe. His quiet voice was heard, as if he spoke through a mask, so it was him, the last player. Came all the way here. The stranger lifted up his pipe and some kind of sound came pouring out of it. Squeaks began to be heard everywhere, as if hordes of rats were approaching them. The tune was merry and resembled some old song from a fairy tale. The stomping of a thousand little feet was heard from somewhere, and soon a whole horde of these sewer rats appeared before the eyes of our heroes. They were coming inexorably fast. They ran like an invisible army, and only their luminous black eyes gleamed in the darkness. May we be forgiven for our sins, said the stranger. The light illuminated his face. He was indeed wearing a mask. Now he looked like some kind of medieval harlequin. The mask was similar to those usually worn in medieval theaters. It had a smiling face on it, but in this setting it looked more creepy than funny. In the next room, he was again confronted by a multitude of rats, seemingly even more numerous than the last. Through the darkness, they could see dozens of eyes staring straight at them, burning red with indomitable fire, easily cleared the third room. Soon after a few minutes, they approached the last room. This is where the boss should be. The boy stepped forward with a confident step. Indeed, everything indicated that they were now in front of the boss's room. There was a massive oak door that would be difficult to open. The boys stopped right in front of it and began to examine it with surprised looks. The player smiled and said that after they finished with the boss, they could go home and have a good rest. So it would have to be more of an effort. He himself wanted to get out of this creepy place as soon as possible, as he was already sick of the sewer stench and a lot of rats. They managed to open the room with quite a lot of effort. The doors creaked open and a bright red light began to shine in. The guys moved inside with confident steps. They were ready for the fact that there would be another private boss, which he would be able to cope with without much effort. It was time to go home. Each of them was already anticipating how they would sit at home with their pockets full of treasures and walk around, preparing for the next outing. Outside the door, however, appeared something that confused them for a moment. There lay a whole bunch of rats that were covered in their own blood. Apparently the monsters were dead, as evidenced by the red eyes that had gone out and the open mouths in death agony. The smell of the place was also appropriate. The already unpleasant smell of sewage mixed with the stench of rotting meat, and the player had to cover his nose with his hand to avoid emptying his stomach right there. What the hell is that? The smell of blood. There's definitely something fishy going on here. The traveler's gaze fell on some strange creature that was sitting somewhere in the back of the room. It looked like a huge rat, but something was wrong. The rat was huge, much larger than any they had encountered. The creature downed something under its breath. To the rats. No to rats, no end and no edge. The creature took the hand of one of the rats, which immediately began squeaking pitifully. It clutched the rat in its huge paws, which were crowned with sharp claws. The rat wriggled and tried to break free, but the creature's grip was powerful. I must kill the rats. I must kill the rats. The creature repeated this phrase over and over. It squeezed its paw and a wet crunch of bones was heard. The little rat that didn't seem so big anymore in the hands of this monster forbade, and immediately its little body went limp. I must get rid of them. I must return the Lake Kingdom to its original form. The creature repeated this phrase like some kind of mantra. The monster opened its mouth and a deafening squeak of voices erupted from it. It was a huge rat. Only it was strange, there was something human about it, something remotely like a mind. Demian saw this creature and his whole body shook with fear. 
This monster. Speaks human? The boy certainly didn't expect to encounter something like that in these dungeons. The boy stood there dumbfounded. He couldn't move. Fear had completely taken over his body. The creature moved its short ears and listened. Apparently it had heard the boy, and now it turned its full attention directly to him. What? Is some rat still alive? The monster turned its head toward him and grinned. Its mouth was completely covered with teeth and a long, ugly tongue covered in viscous saliva protruded from it. The creature's eyes burned bright red fire, like those of the rats they had met before. But the monster was different. It looked at the newcomers as if they were its new food. It was the boss of this dungeon. A giant rat man. The managers of the sewers. He was level 15. As soon as the monster saw the newcomers, it turned towards them and let out such a deafening squeak that they had to cover their ears. No matter how many rats I kill, they still keep coming. Damn rats. The monster seemed even bigger than it was originally. When the creature rose to its feet, it appeared to be a few meters tall. The defense to the cross defense is still going smoothly. Everything is just fine. The shells are hitting the target precisely. The guy stood on the high ground and watched the army of rats thinning every second. Thanks to the help of the Count's army. Thanks to their guidance. The number of rats was inexorably decreasing. Yes, these creatures were undoubtedly dangerous. But from the looks of it, dealing with them wasn't such a difficult task. Thanks to their mentorship, the player's soldiers had become much more experienced and were now able to take down hordes of sewer rats with ease. Maybe they are wondering what his teammate is doing at the same time. The guy stood and watched the battle. His face was calm. He realized that so far everything was going according to plan. Everything was under control. There was nothing to be afraid of. Lucas commanded the rest of the soldiers with all his might. Left defense line. Your firing range is too short. Get your asses up out of your seats and shoot properly. He assisted the front line leaders. The soldiers followed his order strictly. When he suggested some general plan of action, Lucas gave commands according to my instructions. He followed his plan and step by step brought them closer to victory. This synergy played an incredibly large part in their victory. Even if his ignorance of the battle techniques of this world lead to vague instructions, Lucas miraculously grasped the essence and gave precise instructions to the soldier. But still it was given to him with great difficulty. He sometimes almost could not understand what was required of him. The guy stood behind him and smiled at the way his subordinates skillfully commanded the army. What a capable protagonist, it's unbelievable. He has great talent. The guy once again thought that he should have well rewarded this man for his combat services. Demian firmly held his crossbow in his hands, loading the arrows one by one. He fired, hitting the target accurately. Of course, the speed of his shooting was rather slow, but it was still compensated by the fact that he was hitting the target accurately. Thanks to his eyes, he could hit rats in the very eye, despite the fact that they moved at an incredible speed. He was incredibly skilled at maintaining his fire and putting holes in the heads of rats that could still make it to the wall's defense line. The arrows hit the eye, killing the vile monsters. Since the boy's strength lies in long-range shooting, it would seem that his ability is less important in large-scale events. But it is not, for in this case, the number of kills does not matter. The player looked at his shooter and thought in his head that he was doing a great job. The boy was shooting with all his might. It was as if there were no obstacles for him. At this time, somewhere in the depths of the fortress, something strange was happening. A magical sphere had formed here, glowing with a purple light that filled the entire space. Lily is responsible for controlling the magic artifact. She was directly present at the place where the huge magic sphere was. The girl performed her duty faithfully, even though she whined a lot. But still, she was an indispensable employee in battle. The girl waved her arms in different directions. Lower gravity artifact number one in three minutes. Prepare gravity artifact number two. Seeing her raising her voice and going back and forth in a business-like manner was mind-boggling. The girl turned around to the player and smiled her smile. This time, it was kind of frantic. It was as if she had gotten into the excitement and was skillfully leading everyone else. She stuck her thumb up. It seemed as if she was saying so, look how hard I'm working. She seemed to have entered the courage of battle. There was no trace left of the former girl, and it was as if she was enjoying it. 
However, despite all the girls bragging, the player turned away, then made her embarrassed. In his mind, he apologized to her, no matter how hard she tried. He still needed her on the front lines. Well, next. Next, and one of the most important members of his team, is Jupiter. The most experienced of them all. And the woman who can take out this entire horde with one blow. The guy smiled, turned his head, and looked at the woman. At this time, she was just lying there. Yes, indeed, it was an old woman resting. She had a glass with some kind of drink in her hands. She didn't seem to be particularly tense. I smiled. The woman said, No way, everyone is somehow working, constantly shouting somewhere in a hurry. It's brutal. Seeing all of this at my convenience, the man became furious and looked at her with a look that made even her, an experienced bounty hunter, feel a chill inside. After all, he had told her to sit there and take a break, but still be ready, and she had just gotten comfortable. As soon as she saw that look, it immediately snapped her out of her seat, and she began to fake sigh. Oh my goodness, why does her back hurt so much when she tries to collect mana? And the guy started gritting his teeth in rage. Can't even yell at her because she's their precious mage. She better not slack off after her break. The guy smiled and looked after her. The woman raised her glass with some kind of drink upwards and nodded her head with a smile. Of course she would, after all. It seemed to be pure entertainment for her. He doesn't like that babusia, she's too haughty. All in all, thanks to the help of all but Jupiter, of course, the defense was going well. The rat hordes were being decimated, and at this rate they could win a landslide victory. Things are going well, even though the front line is closing in. By this time, the automatic turret had already reloaded, and was again firing directly at the hordes of rats. Nasty creatures flew in different directions like toys. They immediately vaporized in the air, and surrendering death squeal. The power of the automatic one was overwhelming. It was hardly the most valuable unit of their army. The guy started hugging that turret again and acting like it was his lover. From afar, it looked a little strange, if not frightening. The guy was really out of it. He had gotten this artifact, and now he was going to make the most of it. At this rate, clearing the stage would go smoothly. At the foot of his castle, there were already several hundred corpses of these rats lying at the foot of his castle, their numbers immediately increasing. There was a smell of burnt meat everywhere. Soon, very soon, they would be able to gain victory. In his heart, the guy was rejoicing if this continued. Would this really be the first stage that they would cross without any damage or casualties? He smiled and anticipated a speedy victory. Soon, however, a silhouette appeared in the distance, which made him look away from his size and stare straight ahead. Someone was approaching. The boy looked into the distance, and it was as if his heart froze. There appeared a familiar silhouette that was getting closer with every second. The fog began to clear and in the distance appeared the silhouette of the very man who stood dressed just like that jester from the Middle Ages. He was approaching faster and faster. It turned out that he was moving with some incredible speed indicators, the very same man. So it's not a hallucination. The player finally realized that everything he was seeing was real. Guy ordered the artillerymen to get ready, and several soldiers began diligently pulling their cannons up to the defenses. They were preparing cannonballs so that they could hit the hordes of rats with the cannonballs at all costs. After a second, the guy ordered open fire. Many deafening shots rang out. Flames began to burst out of the cannons. Cannonballs flew at an unimaginable speed, and there was such a rumble that you had to cover your ears. The rats stopped for a second. Otherwise, they raised their heads. The monsters saw the burning kernels coming towards them. They flew with great speed and in a second were ready to strike the monster. Explosions, the cannonballs flew precisely to the target, but despite the fact that they still killed the rats by the dozens, they did not become less. They still ran unstoppable stream. Explosions were heard here and there. The monsters began to scream. The fire began to burn them by the dozens, but they did not stop advancing. There was a distinct smell of burnt leather and meat in the air. There was a rumble everywhere and the squeaking of the monsters. The monsters were approaching exactly as planned. They advanced, and the cannonballs immediately caught up with them. Guy watched from above as he watched the explosions tear apart the bodies of these creatures. The kill count had already passed almost a hundred rats killed in the first salvo. Not bad. Ash stretched into a grin. They only know how to take numbers. They're ugly weaklings, aren't they? Those rats are worthless, after all. Kill them all. 
The guy ordered to destroy all the monsters. He was completely sure that these rats were no danger. The numbers of these rats are ridiculously large, so large that they are forced to huddle in clusters, which definitely plays into his hands. Now these monsters could be easily defeated by simply shooting at large clusters. In other words, by directing all their attacks at just one target, they can destroy entire piles of these scum in one volley. The rats would run exactly to the kill box, and the shells would hit them immediately, killing them by the dozens. A whole thirty minutes passed at first defense. The guy opened the plate to see just how many total they killed these creatures in such a time. A sign popped up that indicated that there were two, 924 rats left to kill. On top of that, there were still three bosses whose level was unknown. At this rate, there shouldn't be any problems at all. However, the guy hesitated half a word. Somewhere in the distance, he saw something strange. The rats started doing something strange. They started climbing up these small walls. Using their sharp claws, they deftly bounded upwards. He grabbed his telescope and pointed it to where the main battle was taking place. What he saw there made the guy grit his teeth in rage. There were mountains of corpses. The rats were climbing up them and beginning to climb over the barrier. This was bad. At this rate, they would not realize it and would soon get close to the castle. The artillery would not be able to reach them. Shit. The rats stopped more and more. They were climbing over the fence. Their little bodies were too fast to hit. At this rate, they can climb the wall with their corpses. There are too many of them. The devil. The rats were starting to get smarter, even though they were mostly dumb creatures. It wasn't hard for them to get ahead. Soon, a few of the barriers fell, and the rats were now moving forward unhindered. They had spread out and were now very difficult to hit. The collapse of the kill box was definitely not in his plans. What a devil. The guy yelled for the gunners to change their aim immediately. There was a need to focus. The guy yelled for the Blistrarians to get ready. Of course, the situation was getting worse by the second. The place where the rats congregated was located quite far away from the walls of the fort. Besides, there were sharp shards lying on the approach to the fort. So they were relatively safe for now. So far, so good. The cannons continued to fire from all guns. There was an unimaginable rumble and the smell of gunpowder all around. The artillerymen were firing. They were not sparing the shells, which were still in abundance. In addition, crossbows began to fire. A round began to form with unimaginable whistling. Arrows flew out and headed straight to the center of the cluster of rats. Although the artillerymen were hitting their target, there was still something the boy had overlooked. Even though the shells were reaching their target, the rats were not getting any smaller. They continued to burst forward. The gunners looked at their commander with horror and said that the rats are too fast and hard to hit. Also, they are at a decent distance, so it is too difficult to aim. The military were horrified. The situation was getting worse. The guy gritted his teeth and slammed his fist on the wall. What a fucking rat. Too nimble. Normal arrows wouldn't be able to hit them. The situation was getting worse by the second, and the rat's body consisted mostly of muscle, which allowed them to move very nimbly. The speed of rats. Why the fuck didn't he think of that beforehand? This could be a decisive turning point. At this rate, the rats that reached the castle walls would be far more than he expected. At this time, the furry monsters were approaching the castle at an unimaginable speed. They were running, and there seemed to be no barriers for them at all. Immediately a turret burst into the battle. It began to spin its guns, choosing a suitable target. All this cannon began to glow with green light, gaining magical energy. Immediately there was a loud sound of gunfire. Several beams of green energy burst out of its muzzle, and like tentacles, they began to spread further and further away. The beams of energy flew straight forward, and after a few seconds they reached their target. The guy seemed to have forgotten that he even had such a weapon. He looked to the side and opened his eyes in surprise. For a second, goosebumps ran down his back. He hadn't expected such power. The rat that was hit by the projectile began to squeak. Its body was covered with blue-green light. Its skin began to melt. The rat opened its mouth and let out a death squeak. A second later, the earth shook underfoot, and there was a colossal explosion. Green smoke rose behind the fortress, and shreds of bodies from the rats began to fly up to incredible heights. Fuck me up. The player didn't even know what to say. 
He was simply taken away from what he saw in front of him. His eyes reflected the incredible shot. The explosion was so powerful that his ears even stopped up. The guy looked in front of him and realized that the defensive turret is the best gun for this kind. The number of rats. Still, the turret was coping. But there was one small nuance. No matter how good it was in combat, it would not be able to hold the entire front. Sure, this cannon had destroyed a decent amount of rats, but there were still plenty of them left. Some of them were already approaching the castle walls almost closely. On top of that, there was another one. The turret had used up all of its shells and was now simply useless. It went into recoil. Smoke began to ooze from its large muzzle. The turret was overloaded. The guy's eyes widened in horror as he saw a simply unimaginably huge number of rats approaching him faster and faster. A lot of them. Even too many to handle. A chill ran down the boy's spine. The rats were making their nasty squeaks. They were already almost at the castle walls. The front was advancing faster than he had anticipated. Sure, the shrapnel they left behind they are doing poorly. However, it is not a panacea. It's only a matter of time before the rats reach the wall. The guy at this point realized that it seems a close fight was inevitable after all. He knew that he would have to fight these rats face to face after all. But then there would be casualties among the soldiers. He was interrupted by an explosion. The ground shook under his feet and the guy stammered half a word. The explosion was repeated. The air rose a cloud of black smoke. Several dozen rats scattered in different directions, torn by the blast wave. The guy didn't know what to say. What else was it? He definitely didn't expect that someone could hit directly into a cluster of rats with such precision. It was simply unbelievable. Then a few dozen more explosions rang out, all of which hit the target with general amazement. The projectiles flew past with a muffled whoosh and landed in the hordes of rats. What the hell is this? Who's firing those things? The guy shifted his gaze to the side to find who could do it after all. To his surprise, he saw the Count holding one of his soldiers by the head. The soldier in turn was just glistening with fear. He got in. The soldier rejoiced that he was suddenly shooting so clearly at the target. This is the Count's army after all. The guy at this moment realized that the result of him recruiting these old men was beyond his expectations. These people are incredibly experienced. In addition, they can train his own military, which will naturally have a positive effect on the outcome of the battle. The Count's army commander started shouting for everyone to finally wake up. What amateurs let them unclench their buns already? Cheer up. They have work to do. This speech had an effect, and the soldiers were as if off the chain. The soldiers cheered each other up. It's no big deal. Let them keep firing. Even just firing the cannon will help a lot. Rather than sticking close to the soldiers and acting as mentors, it was just wonderful. Such a tandem was paying off. Now their army would be much stronger. The soldier said that there was nothing to worry about. They would take care of it. Everything will be fine. He had a wide smile on his face. Apparently the man was completely confident in his strength now. It was just a matter of continuing to fight at the same pace. The guy smirked, good. He will trust them you. In any case, this is just an unimaginable leap. The turret continued firing. The shots sounded like thunder. Flames burst out of its barrels, shooting straight at the enemy. Several energy projectiles flew straight at the warrior, who was already preparing to break through the wall with his powerful body. The rat didn't even seem to notice that its death was approaching it. A few seconds later, the projectiles reached their target and immediately exploded on contact with its huge armored body. The monster let out a scream, smoke spreading everywhere, which was a bright green hue. The monster fell to the ground with a clatter, its bright red eyes slowly fading at first. It had taken a tremendous amount of damage. The monster stuck out its tongue and lay on the ground, seemingly dead. The boy looked down at all of this and realized that this was all just the beginning. Although the monster had been defeated, but not everything was so simple. Smoke was spreading everywhere. There was just a disgusting smell in the air. He clenched his teeth and ordered no one to relax. This isn't over yet. Be ready. He realized that these things wouldn't give up so easily. He had to concentrate all his strength to finally deal with them. That was the key to success. The other two monsters rushed to break through the castle walls. A cloud of the remaining rats rushed after them. They were approaching faster and faster. It was simply monstrous. 
Killing these warriors was a priority. The small army could be forgotten about for a while. He shouted for everyone to fire, don't save shells. This is a battle on which their lives depend. The cannons were firing, they were already at their limit, and the shells flew with astonishing speed. They reached their target, hitting the rats with a bright, righteous fire. There was an unimaginable rumble around. You had to cover your ears not to go deaf. They activated the mana multiplier so Jupiter could fully utilize her powers. The woman prepared herself. She thrust forward her hand that was already fully engulfed in lightning. She prepared for something fun to start now. Her body was overflowing with energy, a smile spreading on her face. She smelled something fiery coming. The woman smirked and prepared to deliver her crushing blow. It was kind of fun for her. Her body was just overflowing with energy. The power was simply colossal. The woman unleashed all of her energy on the rats, transformed into an electric discharge. It was as if the gods themselves began to descend from the heavens. There was a rumble everywhere. Lightning bolts were striking the ground where the rats were accumulating. These monsters literally dissolved in the air. The power was so strong that nothing in this world could not withstand such an onslaught. Everywhere there was an unimaginable squeak, scream, and the smell of fried meat. However, that was not all. Despite all this power, a few giant rats still managed to break through. They were moving at an incredible speed. The endurance of these creatures was simply unimaginable. It had already approached the borders, and in a second it was ready to hit them. Jupiter looked forward. What a bunch of freaks. And not enough. The woman didn't believe in autos that anyone could have survived after such an impact. This was the first time she had ever faced something like this in her life. She didn't believe that these monsters could withstand even half of her power. Considering the damage distribution, even that wasn't enough to knock these monsters dead. The rats were approaching. The warriors stood in vanguard. They were ready to break through the castle's defenses in a single blow. Just to defend themselves, Guy yelled to get the flamethrower ready immediately. The rats were getting closer. If they did get close enough to the castle walls, they would be finished. The girl looked at him that the artifact hadn't recharged yet. The player nodded his head and said that he knew everything. Suddenly it came to the woman's attention what he meant. She realized that the flamethrower would be herself. Immediately the girl shook with horror. Is this what she thought it was? It's a mockery. And I'm just going to have to do it again. But still, there was no choice. Either she would do it or they would all die here. The girl concentrated all her power. A pillar of flame burst out of her hands, which even began to burn her body. The girl screamed in fear, but released a jet of fire forward. She almost cried. She knew it. She knew it. She knew it. The pillars of flame ripped out of her hands and flew straight into the hordes of rats. Still, she had to act as a living weapon again. The girl really didn't want to do that, but she didn't have much choice. The fire reached its target and began to burn the rats. There was a deafening squeak. The monster screamed in fear and pain, but was unable to resist such power. His entire body was consumed by fire. His skin began to melt. The monster screamed with unbearable suffering, but could not stay on his feet, no matter how hard he tried. The fire was consuming all living things in its path, as if God himself had come down to earth and was now sizzling all living things right. The monster did not stand on its feet and immediately died. Its red eyes ceased to blaze with fire. Its huge body began to lurch to the ground, and in a second, it was ready to fall. Another warrior rushed after him, the two of them substituting for each other like a human shield. These creatures had phenomenal stamina. Despite all the damage they didn't receive, the monsters weren't going to retreat back. It was just a nightmarish sight. There's one more left. The last one. The player shouted for them to kill him immediately. His eyes were blazing with rage. Horror overwhelmed his whole body. He realized that if they couldn't deal with them now, they wouldn't get another chance as they would all be dead. As if hearing this order, he drew his sword and prepared for battle. This would be the fateful battle that would decide the outcome. He gripped the hilt of his sword tighter and prepared to strike. Swinging his sword straight at the warrior, it flew with the blade straight forward, slicing through the air with an unimaginable whoosh. The man had charged it with his energy before, and now the sword flew, leaving a bright light behind it. The sword hit the monster in the neck. The monster screamed in pain but did not fall. 
Sticky, nasty saliva spewed from its mouth. Then the knight ordered the gunner to immediately shoot and finish off the monster. One more shot. His heart was jumping out of his chest as the knight realized that the outcome of the battle depended on it. It was an unimaginably nightmarish sight. Everyone was worried. Now there was only hope for the arrows. Ash turned to the boy and shouted for him to shoot quickly. He didn't have much time left, so the boy grabbed his crossbow and prepared to aim. This time, he felt no fear. All he had to do was take the last shot. The guy activated his eye and took aim as best as he could. He used all his power to put it into that shot. The boy realized that if it didn't happen, they would all die here. He couldn't allow any more casualties. Soon he pulled the trigger. The arrow flew out of the crossbow, and with a whoosh began to cut the air inexorably approaching the monster. The boy was ready for anything. The arrow flew a few meters and crashed right into the creature's eye. The monster screamed the shot was accurate. Was this really victory? The rat began to thrash in agony. Blood flew out of its mouth. The wounds were incompatible with life. The player shouted, eat, had they defeated him. A grimace of rage was reflected on his face. He realized that just a little more and the final denouement would come. However, his words were not destined to come true. He hesitated half a word and looked forward. Surprisingly, despite all the injuries he had received, the rat warrior was moving forward with him at an imaginable speed. How is that possible? He still had the strength to move? The monster was approaching them in huge strides, even though it had an arrow sticking out of its eye. The monster spewed blood from its mouth forward. The guy was terrified he still had the strength to move? That's just impossible. Now he really didn't know what to do. They had already spent everything possible. Why won't this guy die? It was as if they were all numb with fear. They couldn't move from their seats and just silently watched as the armored monster approached the fortress closer and closer. The monster began to roar. His eyes were bloodshot again. He was coming closer and closer. No, that's just impossible. They had no time to do anything. They had. There was a deafening rumble and crack. The monster had reached its goal, after all. It had broken through the wall, and now, the way for the rest of the army was free. The castle failed, the wall collapsed, and now it was all over. There was a hole in the middle of the building, just a huge hole through which the rats began to crawl. There was no defense left. Something was wrong. 